Thank you so much for downloading, buying and listening to this audiobook. It's Luke, by the way. I am the author of The Atlantis Agenda, which is the book you're about to listen to. And I truly appreciate you being here. I am an independently published author, which means that I don't have a big publishing house behind me. I do this all myself, which I love because it means I get to record things like this and speak to you directly, which is really important to me. It also means a bigger chunk of the money that you spend, whether that however you spend it, whether it's via a subscription or whether you've bought this directly comes to me and that helps me fund my life and support my family and support the people that I want to support. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really hope you enjoy this book. This is the third in the Eden Black series. It it can be read or listened to standalone as well. So if you haven't listened to or read uh, the Ark Files and the Giza Protocol, that's fine. Although I sort of think they're better read in the series, but then I'm biased. Also, please make sure you stick around after the audiobook because I will tell you which parts of the story are true. Right now, though, I'm going to leave you guessing. Please sit back, relax and enjoy the Atlantis Agenda. 2011. I think I've got something, Richard Beaumont shouted, brushing sand carefully from the object. He turned and glanced behind him but couldn't see anything but the deep blue sky. Two hundred feet to the right stood the world-famous Temple of Bell, a majestic structure that once served as the heart of the ancient city, a city which Beaumont had long suspected had many more secrets to share. He turned his attention back to the sand and continued brushing. Removing the sand, the object was revealed more clearly. It looked like an orb of about four inches in diameter. Beaumont cupped his hands above the object to protect it from the scorching sun. It was currently 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the shader, and Beaumont felt as though he was melting from the inside out. What have you got there, Richard? came a voice from the top of the trench. Beaumont knew exactly who it was. Vittoria De Luca, the only person on the dig who used his first name. He turned and smiled at the woman. Right now I'm not sure, but I think it's something exciting. Some kind of orb. Beaumont described the object as best he could while brushing away more of the sand. No, wait, hold on, there's two of them. Beside the first orb, a second appeared under the soft bristles of Beaumont's brush. DeLuca hopped down into the trench with the poise of a gymnast and sidled up beside him. Shift aside and let me see what we got there. DeLuca wiped sweat from her brow. Chapter 1 Manaus, Brazil, 1990 I've heard you can help me. Alexander Winslow leaned in over the table and eyed the two beefy Brazilian brothers sitting opposite him. The men gave him ice-cold stares, then pulled deeply on their cigarettes. Sweat prickled on Winslow's forehead. The temperature had risen at least five degrees since he'd sat down at the table. He glanced up and down the street. The cafe occupied a corner plot in Manaus's San Jose district. The man on the right, Dennis, stubbed out his cigarette and then spoke for the first time. Depends on what you're looking for. This isn't dusting for dinosaur bones in the desert. Everything out to kill you here. Danis pointed a thumb over his shoulder as through the rainforest lay in that direction. Winslow supposed it probably did. Here in Manaus, they were surrounded by the mighty Amazon rainforest on all sides. Winslow knew from experience that you played by nature's rules in places like this. Perhaps it's better if I explain, gentlemen. Winslow pulled his satchel from the floor and slid out a pack of photos. As I think you know from our... our mutual friend... I head up a team of archaeologists working out of the United Kingdom. Our remit is quite large, to say the least. We're trying to fill in some of the gaps that modern history likes to forget about. The men glanced at each other. Gabriel crushed out his cigarette and sparked up another. Dennis muttered some words to his brother in their native Portuguese. Um, No, I'm not just another European looking for treasure, Winslow said in flawless Portuguese. He had a good handle on several European languages, and could pass muster in Arabic and Urdu too. Anywhere east of the Bay of Bengal, though, and he was as useless as the next Englishman. The brother's eyes narrowed a fraction of an inch. It's quite the opposite, actually. He switched back to English. There are several periods in world history that we just don't know anything about. Historians over the centuries have surmised what might have happened in these gaps. I'm sure some of those theories are correct, but others will be wildly wrong. 
my team and I are just trying to fill in some of those blank spots. As though reacting telepathically, the brothers leaned back in their chairs and laughed. The deep, growling noise caught the attention of a woman walking down the street. She crossed to the opposite side as though trying to steer clear of trouble. I'm really not sure why that's funny, Winslow said. If you can't help me, then I can find someone else. I'll tell you why it's funny, Dennis said, sitting forward and crashing a fist into the table. Two hundred years ago, our family first arrived in this city. Our great-great-grandfather moved us here, from our traditional lands about one hundred miles away, because the Europeans sold the land for logging. An accusatory finger pointed straight at Winslow's chest. Our family had been working that land for as many generations as any can remember, potentially thousands of years. Our ancestors were buried there. We had been there long before the Europeans came to Brazil. Gabriel took up the narrative. The Europeans who came here to steal and destroy, Dennis interjected. While you guys were still working out which end of a spear to hold, we were thriving on that land. We know our history, and we know it was stolen from us. So sorry if we're not, how you say, stoked by your idea to fill in the historic blanks. Winslow swallowed, the colour draining from his face. Suddenly, right there, thousands of miles from home, he felt a strange sensation. Partly it was guilt for the things that people carrying the flag of his home nation and others in Europe had done, but moreover, it was shame for blustering in with his simple ideas of solving mysteries. We done here. Dennis climbed to his feet, Gabriel followed. Good luck in the jungle. No, wait, please. Winslow shot to his feet and scurried around the table in pursuit of the hulking Brazilians. Without these guys, he had nothing. Traversing the rainforest was a specialist task, and there weren't many people up for the job. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry to suggest that I know more about the history of this place than you do. Good luck in the jungle, Gabriel repeated, ambling away. Gentlemen, please. Winslow's voice became high-pitched. He was losing his grip on the only chance he had to make this thing work. Just, just, hear what I have. Once you hear what I have, I think you'll want to know more. The brothers continued walking. Winslow scurried after them, three steps to their one. I think, I think it might be evidence of Atlantis, Winslow shouted. The brothers froze, turned slowly and locked Winslow with an icy gaze. Then, their expressions paled, and they laughed loud and hard. Dennis tilted his head back, throat open to the sky. Just listen to what I've got. Winslow wiped the back of his hand across his forehead. Two minutes, and then if you want to go, you go. Cuffing a tear of amusement from his cheek, Gabriel nodded at his brother. You have two minutes. Tell me then, Mr. Archaeologist, said Gabriel, his tone mocking. How is it you think the sunken city is in the mountains? Isn't the whole point that it was underwater? He sunk back into the chair. Well, yes, some people suggest it was lost in the Great Flood, but of course that's just one theory. It would in all possibility be just as likely that it was covered by a landslide, a volcanic eruption, swallowed by a sinkhole. That's assuming one thing, Dennis interrupted. Atlantis existed in the first place. Yes, of course, absolutely, but look at this. This is what I wanted to show you. Winslow flipped open the packet of photos and spread them across the table. Two months ago, there was an earthquake in the Javan Valley. It caused several landslides all across the region. The Brazilian brothers glanced at each other and shrugged. It wasn't unusual for Europeans to come to the area and assume the Javan Valley was akin to a national park in size, when in fact it was larger than most countries. Dennis picked up a photograph, clenching the fragile paper between meaty fingers. The landslide exposed this structure. It's not just a structure, though, look. Winslow pointed at the picture. It's a pyramid. A pyramid. Look at the formation. Of course, it's a long shot to suggest that this is a whole hitherto unknown ancient civilization, but it's possible, right? The brothers looked carefully at each of the photographs. Clearly taken from a light aircraft, they showed a brown gash in the jungle cover. In the centre of the newly exposed ground, as though ignored by nature, a large stone pyramid poked through the ground. You know exactly where this is? Gabriel asked. Yes. Winslow rummaged through the bag for his notebook, and then showed the coordinates to the brothers. 
Gabriel dug a map from his bag and spread it across the table. That's right up in the... He mumbled to his brother. It would be possible to get there. Ten days, maybe. Up the river here. Then we'd have to travel through this area of jungle. Dennis tapped his chin. The terrain there is bad this way. Gabriel traced another route with his finger. For several minutes, they discussed logistics in whispers. Winslow felt hope flare in his stomach. Dennis looked across the table at Winslow. How did you get... Actually, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Winslow smiled nervously. You know this area is off limits, Gabriel said, his grey eyes locking with Winslow's. Travelling here is illegal and dangerous. There are several tribes in the area that the outside world has no contact with. Run-ins with poachers and drug traffickers have made them hostile to all outsiders. They kill on sight, no questions asked. They're just worried for their own, Dennis said. They've lived isolated in these lands for thousands of years. The common flu could wipe them all out. I'd be aggressive too under those circumstances. Yes, yes, I know. Winslow paused to consider his words carefully. He could see the spark of interest flaring within the brothers. He wanted to stoke, not extinguish. That's why we go in just the three of us. Winslow stabbed at the photograph. We get there on foot quietly. I take photographs, take a sample of the rock. Then we let nature have her way. Winslow looked down at the photograph and felt a strange pang of sadness. Deep in the rainforest, such structures would only remain exposed for a month, maybe two. Then, as before, they would be consumed by verdant undergrowth. This could be a key piece of historical knowledge, Winslow said, almost pleadingly. The secrets here could help fill in some of history's blanks. Dennis and Gabriel shared a glance. They whispered to each other so quietly that Winslow couldn't make out what they were saying. A sorte protégé aux soldazes, Dennis said, looking at his brother. Gabriel nodded his agreement. You won't tell anyone the location of this, Dennis said. The last thing we need is a load of university types traipsing through the forest, Gabriel spat. Absolutely not. Winslow tore the page containing the coordinates from his book and passed it to Gabriel. That's the only copy of the location I have. You keep it until we're there, then destroy it. The brothers shared a glance and nodded. Winslow put his hands flat on the table. We get what we need, then we let the forest have it back. I will deny all knowledge of the temple's location. Oh, so it's a temple now? Dennis quipped, flashing a look at his brother. Two minutes ago, it was Atlantis. Europeans, Gabriel scoffed. They can never make their minds up. We're in, Dennis said. We leave tomorrow. Chapter 2 Javari Valley, Brazil 1990 We'll put it in just over there, Dennis shouted from the front of the canoe. He stopped paddling for a stroke to indicate a small bank at the side of the narrow river. Dennis dropped immediately back into sync with his brother, their paddlers striking the waiter at exactly the same time. In the back of the canoe, Alexander Winslow puffed and wheezed, the muscles in his arms, back, chest, stomach. No, actually, all of his muscles burned as though he'd been lying on a barbecue. This was their fifth day aboard the canoe. Fortunately, for the first three, the brothers had deemed it safe to use the small outboard motor which nipped them through the slow-moving water at speed, and with an ease that Winslow now fantasised about. For the last two days, however, now in the higher reaches of the valley where the only laws were that of local tribes, drug runners and illegal poachers, the brothers had decided it was best to remain as quiet as possible. Ahead, Dennis and Gabriel deftly changed their strokes to manoeuvre the canoe toward the riverbank. The movement caught Winslow by surprise, jerking his paddle almost clean from his grasp. He fought against the paddle just in time, pulling it from the water and almost sending himself into the drink on the opposite side. Winslow huffed, laid the paddle down inside the boat and let the brothers bring them ashore. As though on cue, sand crunched beneath the boat. Gabriel stood up, and with a balance that seemed impossible for someone his size, leaped onto the bank. Landing a few inches clear of the water, he turned and heaved the canoe out of the river, his arms bulging like the trunks of the surrounding trees. When the boat was well and truly ensconced behind the bushes, and resting securely on the sand, Winslow climbed slowly and shakily to his feet. It felt good to get his feet back on solid ground after the gruelling journey up the Javari River. Winslow reached out to steady himself against a nearby tree. Don't touch that, 
Dennis said from a few feet ahead. Winslow froze, his hand outstretched. He glanced more carefully at the tree to see thick spines covering the trunk. He withdrew his hand carefully, then wiped it on his shirt. Each of those spines carries enough poison to kill you ten times over, Dennis said. Game over for sure. He heaved the canoe further into the small clearing and then laid the map out across the bow. Gabriel said some words in a language Winslow didn't even recognise. That's what our great-grandfather used to say, he said, as though that explained it all. What does it mean? Winslow said. Translates as, in the jungle you must only touch yourself. Winslow looked from one brother to the other to see if either of them had realised the crude undertones of the phrase. Two stony expressions came back his way. He nodded sagely. That sounds like good advice to me, Winslow said, trying again to wipe the sweat from his palms. 24 Celsius or 75 Fahrenheit all year round, the jungle was warm, but not hot. With humidity pushing 100, though, you were drenched before you even had your boots on. The site of your so-called pyramid is here, Gabriel said, jabbing at the map. The brothers had taken to using terms like apparently, reported and so-called, to describe the discovery. Winslow wondered what they'd call it when they saw it for themselves. How far away are we? Winslow asked, jostling between meaty shoulders to get a look at the map. Dennis did some calculations. Eleven miles, give or take. Great, Winslow said, rubbing his hands again. He looked at the sky. The position of the sun suggested they still had several hours of sunlight. Maybe we'll get there today or first thing tomorrow. The brothers hooted a laugh. Not through the forest you won't, Dennis said. Look around, do you see any trails? Winslow did as the Brazilian suggested. Thick undergrowth hemmed them in on all sides. As though answering Winslow's unasked question, the brothers drew their machetes from the canoe. We make our own path, Gabriel said. Leave everything you can in the boat and get ready to move. For several hours, Gabriel, Dennis and Winslow took turns hacking their way through the thick undergrowth. The terrain was unforgiving too, leading them up at a steep angle before they descended just as far. Winslow wondered whether they could have avoided the inclini, but was in no position to question the Brazilians' route-finding abilities. They were certainly doing a better job than he ever could. The jungle was disorientating too, surrounding them on all sides, even blacking out the sky to a cathedral-like gloom. Winslow did not know what direction they were going, or what time it was. Winslow paused to catch his breath. Dennis hacked away at a particularly dense bush, and Gabriel checked the compass. Then, standing amid the zing and core of the jungle, Winslow felt something. He froze. His feet locked to a stop amid the tangled vines of the forest floor. He focused on the sensation on his back, certain at first that it was just his damp shirt sticking to his skin. Like a reoccurring nightmare, the thing stirred again. Beneath his sweat-soaked shirt, Winslow felt numerous tiny legs tap across his skin. Standing frozen to the spot, Winslow tried to convince himself that the movement was just a tingle on his nervous system. It was just pins and needles, combined with fatigue and an overactive imagination. It had to be. But then it moved again, jerkily this time, pushing upwards toward his collar. Winslow's breathing intensified, even outdoing the constant hum and buzz of the rainforest. The veritable riot of sound came from thousands of species of creatures, many of which, Winslow knew, would kill a fully grown human like he might swat at a fly. Help, help. Winslow stuttered, trying to speak. His tongue lay in his mouth like the anacondas that called this region home. The dense jungle around him seemed to sway now. Winslow wondered why he couldn't get the words out. Maybe the creature had bitten him already, and several milligrams of nature's most effective poison was rushing through his bloodstream. He tried to focus on something, but just found himself swaying more aggressively. Suddenly, it felt as though his skin was on fire. The creature beneath Winslow's shirt shifted into the crevice between his shoulder blades. If Winslow tried, he could reach down inside his collar and grab the intruder, but it was probably too late already. Help! Winslow croaked, finally able to construct a word. Ten feet away, Dennis hacked away at the undergrowth. He finally broke through the dense bush, which had been challenging him for several minutes. He swung the blade one more time, sending a cloud of moisture droplets up and into the air. Guys, 
Winslow said louder this time. Help! Dennis and Gabriel froze. The machete's blade glistened in a shaft of light, bold enough to fight its way through the canopy. Slowly, they both turned to look at Winslow. Sweat and moisture sparkled on the Brazilian's bronze skin. I've got a bit of a problem here, Winslow murmured, his jaw clenched. He pointed a thumb toward his back. Turn around slowly, Gabriel said, taking the machete from his brother. Winslow did what he was told as the Brazilian approached. Slip off the backpack, Gabriel said, his voice now close behind Winslow. Again, Winslow did what he was told and felt the weight of the backpack pull away from his shoulders. Winslow felt the pressure of the blade against his spine as Gabriel used the machete to force the creature upwards. She's a big one, Dennis said from close by. I haven't seen one like, what? What is it? Is it poisonous? Winslow panted, almost unable to catch his breath. Before he got his answer, the creature darted to the right. No, you don't, Dennis bellowed. He swept his hand down inside Winslow's shirt and grabbed the creature. Winslow felt the thing try to grab against his skin as it was pulled away. For a moment, there was a tussle as the creature tried to get free. Legs flailed against his skin, but Dennis held it firm. Winslow felt physically sick. Several degrees in archaeology had certainly not prepared him for this. The brothers were right when they'd warned him that trekking through the jungle was nothing like excavating a sand-covered temple elsewhere on the planet. Got her, Dennis said, finally withdrawing his hand from the back of Winslow's shirt. Look at that, she's a real beauty, Gabriel said. And is it poisonous? Has it bitten me? Winslow turned slowly and looked into the numerous eyes of the biggest spider he'd ever seen. The creature sat calmly now on Dennis's palm. Dennis stroked a finger across the creature's back. Brown and black hairs covered the creature's long legs. She crouched as though ready to launch a second attack. That is an Amazonian tarantula, Denny said, looking in something akin to awe at the creature, a deadly killing machine. What? I must have been bitten. Winslow groped at his back. What can we do? There's not a hospital in hundreds of miles. Is there an antidote? Do you have it? Gabriel put a thick hand on Winslow's shoulder. He's playing with you. This is a deadly killing machine if you're an insect. To humans, is no more deadly than a wasp. Dennis grinned, then turned and placed the spider carefully on a nearby branch. I was also lying when I said she was a big one, Dennis said, watching the spider scurry back into the jungle. They can grow up to 13 inches across. That was just a baby. Winslow shook his head slowly. I'm going back to university, he said, his expression ashen. Straight after this, I'm going back. A nice lab-based research project sounds so good, right? Another voice echoed through the jungle. Even without understanding the words, Winslow knew it wasn't friendly. The words sounded deep, guttural, and violent. Dennis and Gabriel spun around to face the noise. Their muscles tensed. The voice came again. It sounded as though it was giving instructions. Winslow turned slowly to face the bush through which Dennis had just finished cutting. Slowly and stealthily, a group of men moved through the undergrowth. They moved in such a way that emitted no noise at all. Somehow, even the leaves beneath their feet didn't crunch. Winslow had been warned about the tribes that lived in the jungle. Meeting them was a death sentence for sure. His chest tightened and his muscles tensed, ready to run or fight. Seeing how many tribespeople there were, Winslow decided that running was probably the only option. He whipped around to face the path they'd cut through the jungle. Maybe they could outrun the men and make it back to the boat. That possibility sunk into oblivion as three more men stepped out onto the path behind them, sealing off their escape route. Winslow looked from one man to the next. He could see six, but the surrounding jungle could hide countless more. It wasn't their silent or surreptitious approach that caused Winslow's heart to pound like a jackhammer, though it was the long, red-tipped spears that each man held out in front of him, the spears which each man pointed directly at Dennis, Gabriel and Winslow. Chapter 3 Javari Valley, Brazil, 1990 They say we are to go with them, Gabriel said. We do what they say, Dennis said, dropping the machete. Those spears are poison-tipped, one of those could bring down a panther in seconds. Winslow said nothing. The spear-bearing men shuffled toward Winslow and the brothers. Although the weapons were over ten feet in length, the men handled them with ease in the close confines of the jungle. 
One man barked instructions in a language Winslow didn't even recognise. The men turned and led Dennis, Gabriel and Winslow off through the forest. The tribespeople at the front were now walking with the spears by their sides. They moved through the undergrowth with a strange hypnotic gait. It appeared they knew the position of each tree and bush and could move around them with nothing more than a sidestep. Unlike the way Winslow and the Brazilians had hacked through the forest, these men didn't disturb a single leaf. It was no wonder, Winslow realised, the tribe's people had approached without being heard. Following the man ahead, Winslow was able to replicate their movement, swaying through the jungle step by step. Winslow glanced behind them. The following men had now fanned out. Some were visible and others were too far behind to be seen through the dense undergrowth. Glimpsing a red-topped spear twenty feet behind, Winslow was sure of one thing. Attempting to run away would be futile. These people moved through the forest with a speed and agility he couldn't replicate. After a few minutes, the ground inclined again, and Winslow had to slow in order to negotiate the tricky terrain. Once or twice, he reached out to steady himself against a branch or tree but stopped at the last minute. He'd certainly had enough of this forest's surprises for one day. As Winslow slowed and sped up, the surrounding men did as well. Although the forest made it difficult to see them, Winslow caught glimpses of them every so often. A few paces ahead, Dennis and Gabriel walked in silence. Watching the brothers, Winslow felt a pang of guilt. They had warned him about the local tribes who called this forest home. So focused on what they might find, Winslow had treated their cautions like the ramblings of a madman. Winslow only hoped they could find a way out of this alive. They walked on, sweeping through the forest for several more minutes. Eventually, the canopy receded and they stumbled out into a clearing. Winslow glanced up at the sky, squinting his eyes. They had been inside the dense forest for several hours and the sunlight was dazzling. Winslow stopped and blinked several times as colours danced across his vision. A voice barked at him from behind. Winslow turned and saw one man emerge from the trees, his spear levelled at Winslow's back. Although the language was a mystery, its meaning was clear. Keep moving. Winslow did what he was told and shuffled on. It was easier to move now. The undergrowth only reached the height of his chest. There were no trees either, allowing sunlight to bathe the area. It looked like something had happened here to clear all the trees and the plants. Winslow wondered whether the tribe had cleared the area for their own use. Maybe they were developing the skills to farm the land rather than live on the bounty of the jungle. Then, as though in response to his thought, the answer appeared directly in front of him. They walked on toward what looked like a mountain. Except now that his eyes had adjusted to the light, Winslow saw it wasn't a mountain, but a pyramid. He froze, mid-stride, earning himself another telling off from the spear-wielding man behind. Looking at the structure this closely, it was obvious to Winslow what had happened. Over the centuries, earth had built up on the pyramid's sides, and from that earth, a covering of trees and foliage had grown. In the recent earthquake which had rocked this part of Brazil, one side of the earth had slipped completely from the structure, exposing it again, for the first time in the modern era, to the outside world. The landslide had then cleared the part of the forest through which they were now walking. Winslow risked a look around him. Now in the less dense covering of the clearing, he could see the tribespeople more clearly. There were not around twenty of them, as he had assumed, but many, many more. He looked closely at the man behind him for a moment. Unlike the Amazonian tribespeople Winslow had seen photographs of in the past, this man was pale-skinned. He was muscular and lean with a solid jaw and a bone structure that Winslow thought looked like a northern European. He wore a flowing red gown, which allowed free movement but covered his torso from the shoulders down. Winslow glanced at Dennis and Gabriel, lumbering a few feet ahead of him. They too were the descendants of tribespeople living in these mountains, but they looked completely different. It just didn't make any sense when the group was just 100 feet from the pyramid, a voice boomed from the crowd ahead. A group of tribes people pushed forward, herding Winslow, Dennis and Gabriel together. This doesn't look good, Dennis muttered. Gabriel merely nodded. Both Brazilians eyed the crowd, looking for a break or opportunity to escape. From where Winslow stood, there seemed to be none. Tribespeople surrounded them on all sides now, their spears extended. Behind the first row of people, Winslow could see several more.
some jostled to glimpse the unique spectacle. Others stood still, their spears pointing toward the sky. Winslow tried again to calculate the number of people surrounding them, but frankly had no idea. Two things were simple, though. This tribe was bigger and more organised than any uncommunicated Amazon society he'd ever heard of before. And he and the brothers were not getting out of here, unless these people allowed it. Winslow turned his gaze up at the pyramid, standing several hundred feet above them, three sides buried in trees and earth. A pair of large birds vaulted into flight from the pyramid's apex. Condors, probably. They circled two or three times before soaring out of sight. Aware that whatever happened here, his time was running out, Winslow cupped a hand above his eyes and studied the pyramid. From this distance, it looked like many other such structures he'd seen around the world. Constructed in blocks of stone, the sides were smoothly tapered up to a central point. Maybe strangely, Winslow's fear subsided into frustration. He was this close to a previously undiscovered structure, but couldn't get near enough to really study it. Thousands of miles away from its nearest known comparison, understanding this place could rewrite the known history of humanity on Earth. Get ready, Dennis said, dragging Winslow's attention back to the present. Winslow glanced at the Brazilian. The man reached up beneath his shirt and pulled out a gun. No, don't, Winslow protested. Posing a threat to these people would be a death sentence. Plus, Winslow thought incongruously, then he'd never get to see the pyramid up close. Run on my signal, Dennis said, bringing the gun to bear on their nearest captor. Noticing the threat, the surrounding men issued a great roar. The tribe's people turned the tips of their spears on Dennis. Winslow had expected the men to charge forward to disarm the Brazilian. They did the opposite, stepping backwards to clear twenty feet of space around him. Dennis fired. The gun barked several times, hitting two or three of the tribe's people. Without a sound, the injured people were pulled backwards and replaced by someone else. Each of the tribe's people maintained a fearless focus on their captives. Then the spears flew. The tribe's people surrounding Winslow and the Brazilians kept their spears in hand, while those behind threw theirs high. The tribe's people had created something of a kill zone. There was nowhere to run with the threat coming from above. The first two spears hit the ground. Dennis fired another two shots, flattening another tribesman. He was replaced on the front line even before he fell to the ground. Winslow was strangely impressed by the warrior's bravery. Another barrage of spears whipped through the air. One of them found its mark, striking Dennis in the shoulder. The great Brazilian roared in pain. The gun thumped to the ground. Two more spears embedded themselves in his chest. With the threat now neutralised, no more spears came forth. Gabriel howled as though he himself had been mortally wounded and rushed over to his brother. Gabriel scooped up Dennis's head and looked into his eyes, but the man was already dead. The poison from the spear tips had already done its work. Gabriel looked up at Winslow with fire in his eyes. Winslow heard a commotion amongst the tribe's people. He saw up ahead in the pyramid's direction, the upturned spears swing to the side. It was as though the tribe's people were moving out of the way of something. The swaying motion continued for several seconds like a wave at a sports arena. Finally, the men surrounding Winslow and Gabriel took a step to the side. Their movement exposed a long patch of ground, like a path, up to the base of the pyramid. Gabriel stood up, letting his brother's body rest on the ground. Stay close, he said. If we go down, we go down fighting. Winslow took a step toward the Brazilian who was poised ready to launch into combat at a moment's notice. They were so vastly outnumbered that Winslow knew if it came down to it, they didn't stand a chance. A slick of cold sweat ran down Winslow's back. Winslow watched as a man strolled down the path toward them. He was dressed in the same red robes as the rest of the tribe, but looked to be older than those immediately surrounding him. The way the people stood aside for this man showed organisation and hierarchy. This man carried a spear too. Although he used the spear like a walking stick, his movements were agile, even over the uneven ground. He's the leader, Gabriel hissed. Maybe if we attack him first, the others will let us go. Nice way to get us killed, Winslow whispered so quietly as to be inaudible. We should hear what they have to say, he added, a little louder. The leader picked his way down the path, slowing twice to scramble over fallen trees, but never stopping. As he neared, Winslow's chest tightened. He'd heard folk tales of archaeologists killed by local tribes, but never actually imagined it would happen to him. Some stories even involved the archaeologists being boiled alive in great cauldrons before being eaten by cannibals. 
Winslow had initially catalogued such stories as pure myth, but now he wasn't so sure. The leader entered the circle of tribespeople and stopped. He murmured a barely audible word. The tribespeople behind him shuffled back in place to close the gap. The wave reversed back in the pyramid's direction as the path disappeared. The leader eyed Winslow, then Gabriel, then looked at Dennis lying on the ground. Like the rest of the tribe, he was lean and tall with creamy, pale skin. His greying hair was long at the back but cut short at the front. His brown eyes moved back to Winslow. What happened next surprised Winslow like a punch to the gut. The man spoke in English. You are trespassing here, the leader said, his voice deep and gravelly. He spoke slowly as though the words were unusual to him. Winslow stared at the man for what felt like a long time, not quite understanding what was happening. I speak to you because I assume this adventure is your idea. The eyes bored into Winslow's. Answer him, Gabriel whispered, inches from Winslow's ear. Winslow glanced at Gabriel. Yes, you are correct, Winslow said slowly, as though speaking another language himself. I asked these men to come with me. It's all my doing. The leader shook his head slowly. Why is it always like that with you people? Your actions have now led to the death of this man. Winslow considered pointing out that the spears still sticking out of Dennis's body were the cause of his death, not any curiosity on Winslow's part. Considering the situation, Winslow thought better of it and nodded once. The leader flicked his wrist toward the pyramid. We have lived in these mountains for countless generations. The other local tribes know to avoid us. Even the city people seldom come up here. Why is it a man from... The leader pointed at Winslow with his spear. Where are you from? England, Winslow answered in the meek manner of a schoolboy under reprimand. What is your name? Winslow told him immediately. Why is it you, Winslow, a man from England, should interfere with our way of life? Winslow swallowed. His throat felt as though a friendly tarantula had set up home there. I'm an archaeologist. For several years I've been working on piecing together our understanding of human history. There are several things we don't know and... Let me assure you there is much you don't know, the leader interrupted. But let me also tell you this. As much as humankind has the arrogance to assume it is alone, it is not. The tarantula in Winslow's throat felt as though it gave birth to two or three more. This man was talking about another intelligent race living on planet Earth. This was bigger than even he had imagined it to be. Spools of newsreels spun through his mind's eye. This would be the development of the century. Forget that. This was the discovery of several centuries. Questions bubbled ferociously through his thoughts. Then... The leader's next sentence brought them all crashing down. Of course, we are going to have to kill you. He said the phrase as though it were nothing more than ordering coffee. Gabriel sunk back into his combat position. Tension rippled through the surrounding crowd, too. I'm sorry, there is simply no other option. We have seen the squalor in which many of you live. We have members of our society that walk amongst yours. They bring back news of your depravity. If one of your people was to even touch one of us, myriad diseases would spread through our entire population. The leader flicked his fingers against the palms of his hands, as though trying to remove something sticky and disgusting. We, we, haven't touched you and we won't, Winslow said, his palms outstretched. We will go now and never mention this to anyone. The leader raised an eyebrow and looked down at Winslow. Winslow got the impression the man was a judge about to deliver his fate. That is something interesting about your people. You always think you're more intelligent than others. The leader tilted his head upwards. It's also easy for you to say that now. And maybe, honestly, right now you believe it. But I know that you have, what, 50 human years left to live. It would be a statistical impossibility for you to live all of those years without telling someone of your discovery today. It's a simple calculation of probability. Winslow scowled, knowing deep down that the man was probably correct. I could. I would absolutely. I give you my word. Gabriel nodded in enthusiastic agreement. The leader lifted his head again and laughed. The sound was strange, almost blood-curdling. The laugh stopped as quickly as it started. The leader pointed at Winslow. Now that, I know, is untrue. I have explained our reasons to you. Now I'm afraid it is time. Gabriel raised a bald fist. 
the leader raised an eyebrow. I would very much suggest you don't fight this. We will make it quick and painless. We will also make it look like some kind of accident. You fell down a ravine or something. The tension in the surrounding tribus people rose another notch. Winslow glanced around, the deedly spears inched forward. We will ensure questions aren't asked, the leader continued. We don't want more of your type looking for you. Persistence is one of your civilization's most destructive traits. Winslow stared at the unwavering poison spear tips. It seemed strange that something so simple would end his life. He swallowed, only to realise that the spider's nest in his throat now occupied his mouth as well. Winslow looked from one tribesperson to the next. Each of them stared back at Winslow with a vacant expression. It was as though they neither liked nor disliked what they were about to do. For them, this was a matter of survival. Then Winslow saw a different expression, a grin of sheer excitement. The smile took him by surprise. Winslow looked away and back again. Between the legs of the surrounding warriors sat a little girl. Winslow looked at her for a long second. Winslow realised that, clearly curious, she had crawled through the crowd. She was dressed in the same red robes as the rest of the tribe's people. Although the development of children, unless they'd been uncovered in skeleton form, was an area in which Winslow knew nothing, he estimated she was probably around three or four years old. Enough wasting time, the leader said, putting his palms together. The surrounding warriors lunged forward, the poisoned spear tips now inches from Winslow and Gabriel on all sides. Glancing around and clearly thinking the whole thing was a giant game, the girl leaped to her feet. She stood easily beneath the extended spears, then with a shriek and giggle she ran at Winslow. Reaching him, she scrambled up his leg as though climbing a tree. Totally unsure of what to do, Winslow scooped her up playfully. The girl giggled and shrieked. A united gasp rose throughout the tribe. The surrounding men shuffled backwards, spears wavering. The leader took a step backwards too. He folded his arms, scowling. Winslow could see the man considering his options. A few long seconds passed where the only sound was the girl's playful shrieking. She cannot come back to us now, the leader said, almost thoughtfully. She will already have contracted any modern diseases you are carrying. Coming back here will mean infecting our entire civilization. Winslow swung the girl around and lifted her up in the air. She hooted with laughter, her arms flailing wildly. The leader barked a word and then men took another step backwards, reopening the passage toward the pyramid. It seems you will get your way, Mr. Winslow. You will get to survive this and you will take her with you. Winslow swung the girl into the air again. She yelled with laughter, louder this time. But rest assured, I will keep a very close eye on you. Although it may seem like we live haplessly here in the jungle, we're well connected in your world too. Wait a minute, Winslow said, understanding the man's words a moment too late. I know nothing about children. She can't come with us. The leader shrugged. She can't come back here now. By choosing you, she has saved your life. With that, the leader turned and strode toward the pyramid. Hold on, wait, wait, Winslow shouted after the man. The leader stopped twenty feet away. He turned and glared at Winslow. I, I don't even know what to call her, Winslow stuttered. The leader made a sound and the tribespeople behind Winslow and the Brazilian stepped backwards, opening a passage for them down into the jungle. The leader locked eyes with Winslow. Eden, he said slowly. Call her Eden. Chapter 4 The Bologna, Atlantic Ocean, Present Day Eden, Eden, wake up! When Eden first heard the noise, it sounded as though it was far away. She thought at first the sound was coming from a different ship, slipping silently through the ocean some miles to the south. Then something hit her around the face. It wasn't a hard slap, not something designed to hurt, but it was enough to startle her into consciousness. Eden, wake up, wake up now. Eden opened her eyes slowly and saw Athena standing over her. Athena straightened up and paced across the cabin. From the urgence in the woman's voice and her frantic movement, Eden knew immediately something was wrong. What is it? Eden said, struggling up onto her elbows and blinking several times. We're under attack. Athena stopped pacing and turned to face Eden. The words struck Eden like a typhoon wave. All tiredness was forgotten in an instant. We're not sure how they came aboard, 
Athena said, pacing forward. How many of them there are, or what they want? Athena placed a bag on the bed and unzipped it. Two handguns and several magazines lay inside. Athena passed one to Eden and took the other herself. This is all I have without getting to the arsenal. Tell me what happened, Eden said, grabbing a gun and slipping one magazine inside. The magazine clicked reassuringly, and then she loaded a bullet into the chamber. I was awake in my cabin, working on decoding that report for Helios. Athena pressed the side of her abdomen where she'd sustained a wound a few weeks ago. Although she had almost recovered, she'd confided in Eden she still wasn't resting as she should. Eden suspected her job aboard the ship wasn't as fulfilling as the fieldwork she used to enjoy. I heard rushing feet. First, I thought nothing of it. Maybe it was someone elsewhere on the ship running about. Athena shrugged. But then there were voices. Too far away to hear clearly, but they were shouting. I ran to the window and saw several people in black clothes scale the side of the ship and take out two of our guards. With Athena's cabin on the opposite side of the ship, it wasn't surprising that Eden had heard nothing. She slipped out of the bed and dressed quickly. Fortunately, the clothes she'd worn the previous day were still piled on the dresser. They must have boarded from a small craft, an inflatable maybe. Anything bigger would have been picked up on the Bologna's radar, Eden said. Athena nodded. I don't know if they've reached the bridge yet. I came straight here. Eden glanced at the alarm sounder on the ceiling. No one has triggered the alarm. That means they either haven't reached the bridge or... Her words trailed off. Or they've already taken it by force. Eden stared hard at the other woman. That's not happening, Eden said, her voice razor sharp. Eden cupped her hands around the gun. She checked again that it was armed and ready. That's not happening, she repeated. Not on my watch. Eden paced across the cabin and swung open the door. She signalled for Athena to follow, then checked the corridor in both directions. The doors to the other cabins were closed. This level of the ship was almost exclusively cabins for the crew. Although each unit was compact, it contained its own bathroom facility, a small workspace and a view out across the ocean. At first, Eden had thought it seemed nonsensical for each crew member to have their own space, considering how little time they spent in their cabins. Now, having lived aboard the Bologna for several weeks, Eden had grown fond of her alone time in the cabin. Satisfied she couldn't see anything moving in the gloom, Eden listened closely for any unusual noises. No sound came from the cabins, suggesting their occupants were fast asleep. Right now, that was the best place for them to stay. She listened for another few seconds, quieting her breathing to pick up every noise. She heard the gentle pitter-patter of footsteps drift down the corridor. Eden turned toward the noise. Someone was moving through the stairwell at the Bologna's stern, indicating to Athena they should move out. Eden paced down the corridor, her bare feet padding inaudibly across the linoleum. The women reached the end of the corridor and peered out into the wide stairwell. One dull orange light illuminated the staircase, which zigzagged back and forth on its way up to the bridge, Helios' office, a communal space, and down to the lower decks housing the workshops, the arsenal and the ship's utilities. The staircase on this floor was clear. Eden scurried across to the staircase and looked down and then up the central void. A light swung through the gloom just above her head. She ducked back around the corner just in time to hear the gentle thudding of footsteps on the stairs above. The intruders were coming their way. The beam of light swung from left to right, strobing through the steel balustrades. These men had clearly been sent down from the bridge to secure another part of the ship. Although they were moving swiftly, there was no urgency to their stride. It seemed to Eden as though they already considered the battle won. Using the hand gestures she'd learned while on the Bologna, Eden communicated the threatening activity to Athena. Previously working exclusively alone, she'd no need to communicate with others in pressurised situations. Now the gestures were critical. Athena nodded her understanding, then ducked out of sight. The intruders descended the staircase, turning into Eden's line of sight. Eden and Athena ducked back into the corridor, until the intruders passed and then peered out. Two figures continued down toward the Bologna's lower decks. Each carried a rifle with a light mounted on the barrel. Eden glanced at her handgun, a much less powerful weapon than those carried by the interlopers. She didn't have a silencer either. 
meaning if she discharged the weapon, the entire ship would hear the shot. Eden and Athena simultaneously slipped the guns out of sight. Eden dashed to the top of the stairwell. Now that the intruders had passed, Eden and Athena had the advantage of attacking from a higher position. Eden leaped from the top step, her arms bent and legs extended. She landed a kick neatly between the first intruder's shoulders. The figure stumbled forward, almost colliding with his partner, and smashed into the wall. His hands fell from the gun's grip. The second interloper reacted quickly, swinging the gun to bear on Eden. Athena was already upon him, landing a scissor front kick to the guy's back. He grunted and stumbled forward straight into Eden's uppercut. Athena landed adeptly and silenced the man with a strike to the side of his head. Eden caught him just in time to prevent him clattering down the staircase and lay him to the side. In a matter of seconds, the first intruder had regained his hold of the weapon and swung around, ready to fire. Eden sent a low kick straight into the man's knee. Something crunched in his leg. The strike didn't stop him firing but sent his aim wildly off course. A barrage of metal pinged into the balustrades. Athena parried away from the bullets and swung around ready to disarm the interloper, but Eden was already there. Stepping to the side, she sent two flying fists into the man's neck. He tried to swing the rifle toward Eden, but she was too quick, striking his neck and sending him into oblivion, alongside his friend. Athena caught the wounded man before he fell, preventing a thud, and placed him on the stairs. Although the gunfire likely had already attracted attention, they didn't want to advertise a full-on firefight. Eden and Athena snatched the weapons from the incapacitated men and swung the straps over their shoulders. We best get moving, Eden said, pointing up the stairs. The crew probably heard the gunfire and they'll be investigating soon. Athena nodded and then pointed upwards. Eden raced up the stairs in near silence. Training alongside Athena in the last few weeks, Eden had also learned how to move without making a noise. Tonight, she was putting her training into practice. Eden and Athena reached the top of the staircase and paused. Although they had taken the stairs at top speed, Eden's pulse had barely passed its normal level. The landing on this floor contained just one door, which led into the communal social area. Part canteen, part conference room, part common room. The space was the largest single area aboard the Bologna. Including a separate galley kitchen, it occupied almost the entire floor. This room also contained the only point of access to the Bologna's top deck, where the bridge and Helios's office were located. Eden clicked off the light mounted on top of the rifle. Athena did the same. With the lights extinguished, the landing was completely dark. Eden crossed the landing using only her memory of the layout and stood with her back to the door. Athena followed. The two women stood rigidly in the gloom, listening for several seconds. Although it was unclear at this distance, Eden heard movement. She couldn't work out whether it came from inside the canteen, or if it was reverberating down from the floor above. Eden pushed, and the door swung open silently. No light came from inside the canteen. She turned and peered into the room. The only light came from the floor to ceiling windows at the far end of the canteen. Outside through the glass, water rippled in the moonlight. Eden watched the gently lapping ocean for several seconds. The peaceful scene seemed strangely at odds with the threat the women currently faced. Her eyes now used to the gloom, Eden noticed a figure move in front of the window. For a moment, the figure was silhouetted against the rippling water before merging again into the black. Eden clamped her fingers on Athena's arm, clearly communicating they were not alone. Athena froze beside her. Eden saw a second figure follow the first across the room, trailed by a third and a fourth. Four intruders lurked somewhere in the room. The fact they were moving comfortably in the darkness meant they were using night vision technology. Eden let the door sigh closed. We've got to go through there, Athena whispered. It's the only way, but without being able to see them, they'll pick us off like sitting ducks. That's if we play by their rules, Eden said. Head for the kitchen, get to the serving hatch and be ready to fire. Eden pushed open the door and felt Athena move into the canteen. Eden raised her gun at their unseen foe and prepared to return fire if needed. For several seconds, nothing happened. Good. Athena must have made it into the kitchen unseen. Eden let the door swing closed again. She took a deep breath, 
For a moment, her mind ran through the possible reasons the intruders might have boarded the Bologna. A flame of worry grew inside her as she wondered whether any members of the crew had been injured, or worse. Eden forced the worry from her mind and then pushed through the door. This time she shoved the door hard. It swung open and crashed into the wall. You think you can just walk in here, do you? Start messing around with our stuff. Eden's voice boomed through the dining room. She charged noisily in through the door. Several guns howled, filling the air with noise and lightning flashes. Eden was prepared, dropping instantly to the floor. Athena was ready too. Popping up from behind the serving hatch on the other side of the room, she'd seen where the gun flashes had come from and now liberally peppered the area with rounds. Two groans drifted across the room, indicating at least a couple bullets had found their marks. Fine by Eden, she hadn't finished yet either. Pushing up into a crawling position, Eden scampered to a large dining table. She flipped the table over. The crash reverberated through the room and earned her another two bouts of gunfire. That meant there were two shooters left, not bad. Athena, now having moved to a position within the kitchen, fired again. This time, the shooters had grown wise and already shifted position. They were probably using the tables for cover, Eden thought, just as she was. Eden dragged the table across the room, a few shots sizzled through the air but thumped harmlessly into the thick tabletop. When the table was against the wall, Eden peered over the top. A gun howled from the other side of the room, indicating the intruders had her pinned down. Eden flattened herself against the floor. More bullets thwacked into the wall behind her, chunks of plaster and dust rained down. As Eden had expected, Athena returned fire. Confused by multiple shooters, the assailants would now be challenged to maintain their cover. Eden leaped to her feet and ran her hand across the wall. She found the bank of switches and snapped them on. Lights blazed from the ceiling. Eden had leveled the playing field. Better than that, the sudden influx of light would render their assailants temporarily sightless. They would either have to remove the night vision gear or wait for it to adjust. Eden swung around and immediately spotted a figure crouching behind a table at the room's far side. As expected, he'd taken one hand from his rifle in order to adjust the goggles. Both Eden and Athena fired on the man. He didn't even see the attack coming. His body twisted and jerked as the slugs thwacked into his chest. He fell backwards, lifeless. Eden swept the dining room looking for the final intruder. She'd seen four silhouettes against the moonlit water. Unless one had slipped back upstairs, two were still in here. Sure enough, Eden saw two crumpled figures at the far end of the dining room. They were the victims of Athena's first barrage. She'd got lucky to take out two hostiles in one blind volley. Eden turned and looked toward the door which led upstairs. The door was closed. Then Eden heard a voice, a voice that turned her muscles to lead. If you don't want a bullet in your friend's head, throw down your weapon. Eden turned slowly, instinctively knowing what she'd see. She lowered the rifle. The thing felt heavy and dangerous in her hands. Athena would not die today. Not after all they'd been through together. Athena stood at the kitchen counter where Eden had instructed her to go, except now a man stood behind her, his rifle raised directly at the back of her head. Put it down now, the man barked. Although a black mask concealed his face, rage rimmed his eyes. He looked as though he was having a worse night than Eden. For now, she'd play along. Eden bent over and placed the gun carefully on the floor. She made each of her movements as controlled and smooth as possible. She didn't want to give this idiot any excuse to shoot first and ask questions later. Eden straightened up. The man's eyes darted from Athena to Eden and back again. As well as anger, Eden saw something that looked like fear. This man had seen how Eden and Athena had already dealt with his colleagues. He clearly had a good impression of what he was dealing with. Eden took a slow step forward, her movements languid and gradual. She felt the prickle of grit beneath her bare feet. She glanced at the ceiling. Several rounds had pounded into the ceiling, shattering the fragile ceiling tiles. Eden studied the tiles for a second. Wires hung through the gaps like the intestines of a disemboweled whale. The metal grid which the suspended ceiling hung on was still securely in place, just the tiles had been thrown around. She noticed that one support ran directly from above her across the room and passed three feet above their adversary's head. Eden looked back at the intruder as an idea formed. What now? she said, shrugging. 
You're clearly the man with all the ideas. I don't think this one's got anything between the ears, Athena said, catching Eden's eye. Athena nodded almost imperceptibly in a gesture that said she understood what Eden had planned. We go upstairs to see the boss, the man grunted. He'll decide what to do with you. He's not trusted to make decisions. Athena nodded backwards at the man. Hear that, Eden said, holding up a finger. Is that the sound of two brain cells knocking together? Shut up, shut up! The intruder raised the gun higher. It shook in his grip. Eden and Athena were winding him up exactly the way they intended. Just trying to help you out here, Eden said, holding up her hands in a mock gesture of surrender. It's not my fault you're in over your head. As Eden said, over your head, she pointed up at the ceiling. Athena's eyes followed hers. Eden leaped into the air and seized the support bar. Unable to take her weight, the fragile construction cracked and buckled. The frame from one side of the room to the other came loose. Tiles fell in all directions. Eden pulled down harder on the structure. The sound of scraping metal and thudding tiles pounded through the room. Eden watched Athena duck, spin and land a solid kick in the man's stomach. He stumbled backwards and tried to swing the gun toward her, but the ceiling above him was already falling. The metal bar clanged hard against his skull, thudding down beneath the weight of the tiles. The man groaned and dropped the rifle, bracing his arms in an attempt to stop the tiles crashing against him. Eden dropped to the ground and charged toward the kitchen. She threw open the door to see the thug lying crumpled beneath the fallen metal structure and shattered tiles. He opened his eyes, groaned, and searched around for the gun. Eden took two steps toward him and landed a heavy kick in his stomach. The man groaned and swore in a crude, foul rant. Eden aimed another kick carefully this time and knocked him unconscious. Let's get upstairs, she said, helping Athena from beneath the wreckage. Absolutely, Athena said, dusting herself off. She looked down at the thug, now comatose beneath the twisted chunks of metal. Did you really have to bring the whole place down? Eden shrugged. It worked, didn't it? Chapter 5 San Juan Teotihuacan, Mexico, present day. Victoria de Luca looked up at Teotihuacan's monolithic pyramid of the sun and then down at the hole into which she was about to descend. Deep within her chest, her heart beat irrationally fast. She tried to swallow the cannonball of worry which had formed in her throat several hours ago. It wouldn't budge. She studied the rickety-looking wooden ladder poking three feet from the shaft's opening, then paced across and peered down into the void. The thing was so deep, DeLuca couldn't even guess how far it descended. But DeLuca had no fear of heights. She had abseiled and rock-climbed countless times. She knew it wouldn't be the heights that were causing her this worry. Are you ready to go where no human has gone before? boomed Professor Sergio Ramirez, his arms spread wide. You are now descending into the bowels of history. DeLuca glowered at the professor. Dressed in a light brown shirt and shorts, the professor looked more like he was going on safari than on an archaeological dig. Ramirez ran a hand through his graying hair. A photographer swung around and snapped a picture of them both, then turned his attention back to the hole. Ah. DeLuca tried to smile, but the ball of anxiety made it more of a grimace. She really didn't want to see these photos, ever. When Ramirez, the head of the archaeology department at University of Mexico, had contacted her a week ago with news of the discovery, De Luca had jumped at the chance. Now she was getting the impression that this was more about the publicity than what had been discovered deep beneath the site. De Luca had a good nose, and right now all she could smell was milk gone sour. Ramirez was milking this discovery for all the publicity he could get, and she'd been dragged right into the middle of it. It tasted sour. That said, with Mexican authorities notoriously unenthusiastic toward excavations around Teotihuacan, this was a unique opportunity to get beneath the surface. Give me an abandoned hole in the desert any day, DeLuca mumbled, risking another step toward the shaft. The ground around the shaft's mouth didn't look secure at all. In fact, thinking about it, DeLuca didn't fancy the security of the whole place. Looking down at the shaft, DeLuca wondered if it was the thought of exploring the tunnel network which was making her nervous. Ramirez had claimed the tunnel had been made safe, but how sure could he be? DeLuca knew firsthand that ancient sites love to throw up surprises, especially with tourists traipsing all over the place. But then again, DeLuca wasn't claustrophobic. 
she'd explored hidden tunnels all over the world. Some of them, she'd had to navigate sliding through on her stomach. That wasn't causing DeLuca this strange feeling of anxiety. A flurry of voices caused DeLuca to look over her shoulder. Numerous people stood at the cordon a few feet away. Several filmed the unique spectacle on their phones. Then, in a series of moans, the crowd parted. DeLuca froze, not knowing who would force their way through the crowd. She watched, half expecting a team of balaclava wearing men to emerge. Instead, a young woman wearing a suit and a full face of makeup despite the heat pushed up to the barrier. A rotund and sweaty cameraman panted up alongside her. We're from Mexico today, the woman shouted in a mellifluous voice. She held up a lanyard. Let them through, let them through, Ramirez bellowed, beckoning the TV presenter forward. I'm Professor Ramirez from University of Mexico, as I was just saying. Trying not to think about the repercussions of this many people close to a weakened area of ground, DeLuca turned back toward the hole. This shaft had, after all, appeared of its own accord. One morning a security guard had been inspecting the Pyramid of the Sun to prepare for opening to tourists and had almost fallen into the shaft. He'd quickly fenced the area off and then set about trying to find out how deep it was by throwing coins inside and listening for the tinkle of their fall. Only in Mexico, DeLuca whispered at the thought. A grin stretched across her face. Ever. There was no knowing what caused an opening like this to appear, or perhaps more importantly, when it might happen again. Down, 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 Ramirez roared, one hand crashing into the palm of the other. With each foot we bravely descend, we will pass another few hundred years of history just like that. Ramirez snapped his fingers. Is it dangerous? The TV presenter asked, her eyes locked on Ramirez. Absolutely. This is why we are keeping people at a distance. Only I and world expert Dr. DeLuca, who has flown in especially from Miami, will descend the shaft. Ramirez pointed toward DeLuca. The cameraman spun around to get a shot of the so-called world expert. DeLuca stopped wishing for ground stability and hoped just for a moment that it would open up beneath her. As the number of tourists at the barrier increased, Ramirez became even more ebullient. Clearly sensing DeLuca's anxiety to just get on with it, one of Sergio's assistants clipped a rope onto the harness Vittoria was wearing. He tugged on the rope as though to prove it would hold. Satisfied the rope hadn't disintegrated beneath his rudimentary test, the man smiled, shrugged, and returned to the top of the shaft. It's like the cross-section of history, Ramirez bellowed, Mother Earth's own record, layer upon layer, time after time. Before Ramirez could break into a rendition of Cindy Lauper, Vittoria snapped on her headlamp, checked her dictaphone, and camera were safely secured away, and then stepped to the edge of the shaft. She stepped onto the ladder's first step and suddenly realised the root cause of her anxiety. This is not Syria, DeLuca said to herself. Nothing bad is going to happen. Descending this ladder is like moving through the intestines of time itself, Martinez exclaimed, spinning like a ballet dancer and sidling up to the shaft. Through the intestines of time itself, Vittoria mused, Ramirez's stupid comments distracting her from her painful memories. How did Ramirez come up with this nonsense? DeLuca took another step down, the ladder creaking beneath her. With 30 years in the field, DeLuca had seen more rickety ladders than she could remember, but they didn't get any easier. Now several feet beneath the ground, she glanced up at the opening above her. Two faces peered down, silhouetted against the bright Mexican sky. You're doing great, Ramirez shouted. Almost halfway, just don't look down. DeLuca gritted her teeth in an attempt to stop herself from shouting a string of expletives up at the Mexican. She was on his territory, and, as the first international archaeologist to see the new discovery, she couldn't sour those relations yet, not to mention the fact that Ramirez had agreed to let her take an artifact back with her to the University of Miami, on the condition he chaperoned the artifact every step of the way. Whether DeLuca liked it or not, she was stuck with him for some time. Very good. Nearly there now, Ramirez shouted again. The other man, who had slowly let out the rope as Vittoria descended, disappeared from the hole's aperture, Vittoria felt the rope grow tight. While the harness and rope were reassuring, she counted the seconds until she would be back on terra firma. Yeah. You'd think in this day and age it would be within the wit of man to design a ladder that doesn't wobble, DeLuca whispered. The rope pulled taut, stopping Vittoria's descent. More rope, she shouted up. 
The other man appeared again, now with a cigarette blazing between his lips. Typical, Vittoria hissed. The sooner we get these back to Miami, the better. The smoking man let out another few feet of rope, allowing Vittoria to descend further beneath the ground. She took another step. The ladder shook again. Just a few more steps, Ramirez shouted cheerfully. Keep going. Ramirez turned and said something to the onlookers. Come down here and make me, Vittoria hissed under her breath. Then finally, Vittoria took a step and felt solid ground beneath her feet. She exhaled and felt herself relax, just to be sure she risked a downward glance for the first time since stepping over the void. She had made it to the shaft bottom. I'm down, Vittoria shouted up, unclipping the rope from her harness. You can take this up for you now. Vittoria glanced up and saw Sergio's bulbous shape already on the ladder above her. I don't need the rope, he said, descending quickly. A sorte protege os audaces, he roared, shimmying down the ladder. Vittoria glanced up at the man confused. She'd heard the phrase before. It was Portuguese and meant, essentially, luck favours the bold. She hadn't realised the Mexican professor also spoke Portuguese. I'll need the luck if you fall on top of me, she said as Sergio's shape blocked out the sunlight. Show off, she mumbled, shaking her head. Determined not to waste the few seconds of silence while the Mexican was descending the ladder, Vittoria fished her dictaphone from her pocket. Often the ridicule of her students and colleagues, the device had been loyal to Vittoria's service for over 20 years. She liked the simplicity of the thing. You put the tape in and hit record. When the tape was full, you switched it over for a new one. They didn't make devices like that anymore. She tapped record and described their surroundings. <coughs> Professor Ramirez and I have just descended into the sinkhole. The shaft's bottom is about 10 feet wide at this point. We are now about 100 feet beneath the surface, 50 feet to the right of the Pyramid of the Sun. Vittoria spun around and described the shaft bottom in detail. There is a tunnel which runs in an easterly direction. This was partly discovered when the sinkhole appeared but has been expanded by Professor Ramirez and his team. That's right, Professor Ramirez boomed, leaping down the last few rungs and landing with a thud at the shaft bottom. We've opened it up, removed several tons of earth and rock, and shored it up with these. Ramirez grabbed a wooden support and shook it. Dust floated down from the ceiling. Safe as can be. After you, Doctor. Ramirez grinned at his use of DeLuca's official prefix and folded his arms. DeLuca turned and stepped into the tunnel. The tunnel here is about five and a half feet high, she said into her recorder. Indentations on the roof suggest that it was human-made. What do you make of these, Professor? Tool marks, maybe. DeLuca pointed at a set of scrapings on the tunnel's roof. DeLuca kept the recorder running, allowing it to pick up Ramirez's commentary, too. Exactly what I thought. The same markings run the entire length of the tunnel. That's interesting. Worth noting there are no such markings on the Pyramid of the Sun or the other structures above us, correct? That's right, Sergio's voice dropped to a little over a whisper. What we're looking at here is much, much older. Carbon dating? It's a bit of a guessing game, I'm afraid, as most of what we've got here was constructed from the bedrock itself. We've tested some fragments of wood and pottery found down here. Early suggestions show this tunnel was constructed around 10,000 years. DeLuca pressed on the beam of her light sweeping from one side to the next. <laughs> Did you recover anything while you were enlarging the tunnel? No, it was bare rock and earth. Fortunately, it was easy to remove. Had it been solid like the roof, we never would have got through. The tunnel twists to the left here at an angle of about 30 degrees, DeLuca said. She turned the corner and froze. Her breath caught in her throat. Slowly, as though it held magical powers, DeLuca swung the light one way and then the next. She tried to explain what she saw for the benefit of the dictaphone but couldn't articulate it. This was something amazing indeed. Chapter 6 The Bologna, the Atlantic Ocean, present day Alexander Winslow sat in his office, surrounded by the rest of the Bologna's crew, watching Eden and Athena move through the ship on a large wall-mounted screen. Studying the way his daughter moved, Winslow couldn't help but think about that day in the Brazilian jungle all those years ago. After meeting the tribespeople, Winslow, Eden and Gabriel had retraced their steps back through the rainforest. For much of the way, Winslow carried Eden on his shoulders and Gabriel carried his brother's body. 
Winslow couldn't help but be moved by Gabriel's dedication to give his brother the burial he deserved. That said, Winslow really didn't enjoy travelling with a corpse. Uh, the hours getting late, they'd set up camp near the river. It was strange, Winslow realised now, how young Eden hadn't seemed at all affected by the experience. She didn't show fear she was with people she'd never met before, or frustration she was in a completely new place. At the time, Winslow had thought nothing of it. Children to him were as alien as the lives of the forest-dwelling tribes people. But later, looking back, he felt as though maybe Eden had chosen him after all. After two days of travelling down the river, they'd arrive back in civilization. Winslow had found a place for them to hole up while he sorted the paperwork to bring Eden back to England. Using one of Gabriel's black market contacts, getting a passport had been easier than he'd expected. Eden Winslow was born, officially speaking. Winslow had also attended Dennis's memorial. Watching the proceedings from afar, Winslow felt a growing sense of guilt when he saw Dennis's widow and her now fatherless son pay their final respects. The whole sight slipped him into a sour mood, which seemed to last for days. On the day before they were due to return to England, aware that if he didn't act now, he would never get the chance again, Winslow chartered a light aircraft to fly back over the site of the jungle pyramid. Sitting beside the pilot, Winslow couldn't believe what he saw. The only thing that broke the luscious forest canopy was the lazy green river, oozing its way down from the mountains. The pyramid had disappeared completely, swallowed by the jungle like a snake eating its prey. Look at the way she took that guy down, Baxter said, dragging Winslow back into the present. On the screen, Eden and Athena smoothly dealt with two men in the ship's rear stairwell. The men fell to the stairs silently. They would certainly ache in the morning. She's a dangerous young woman, a technician replied excitedly. The takeover training exercise was the crew's favourite initiation. Everyone aboard the Bologna had been through it when they first joined. So, of course, Eden could be no exception. On the screen, Eden and Athena slipped into the dining room. Baxter pressed a few keys and the cameras turned infrared. Athena ran across to the kitchen and moments later, Eden charged through the door. It was a miracle, Winslow whispered, his thoughts still on the rainforest pyramid. He still didn't understand how something of that size had disappeared in just a few days. It was nothing short of miraculous. What's that, sir? Baxter said. Oh, nothing. Winslow shook his head. Eden was the miracle, really. That he knew for sure. The screen flashed white as Eden turned on the lights. Baxter adjusted the camera back to normal vision in time to see them take down a man. The small explosive devices fitted into their jackets, convincingly replicated the look of gunshots. Of course, all weapons used in the training exercise were loaded with blanks. Not that anyone had ever realised that until afterwards. Let's see how she does without the weapons. Winslow said into a desk-mounted microphone. With the so-called intruders and Athena wearing in ear comms devices, Winslow could change the play at a moment's notice. As most of the council's work didn't involve all-out gunfights, it was crucial that each of their operatives could think on their feet to use what was around them. Eden stalked around the dining room, looking for the final assailant. She froze, then turned slowly. What happened next, Winslow had to confess, was brilliant indeed. Ceiling tiles clattered to the floor, forcing the assailant back against the kitchen counter. Eden darted around the counter and pulled Athena out of the wreckage. Dust filled the dining room. Baxter tapped at the keyboard, struggling to find a camera angle which showed the scene clearly. He settled on the camera by the door. Eden and Athena emerged from the dust and ran up the stairs. The crew assembled in Winslow's office whooped and cheered. Baxter thumbed the keyboard again, flicking to the camera in the stairwell leading toward the Bologna's top floor. Eden and Athena moved up the staircase in a practiced pattern, each constantly scanning for threats. Quiet! Winslow waved his hand to silence the crew. Eden and Athena reached the top of the stairs. Eden indicated they should head to the bridge. Athena nodded, readying herself by the door. Eden charged in through the door, Athena followed. They secured the area in three seconds flat, then turned back toward the door. Winslow raised a hand, reminding the crew silence now was essential. He needn't have done it as every man and woman watched, entranced. Eden and Athena slipped back out into the hallway between the bridge and the office. Again, 
they checked the stairwell. Satisfied it was clear, Eden indicated they should move into Winslow's office. From the other side of the door, Winslow studied his daughter's features. Her lips were now just a determined line, her gaze hard and unyielding. Eden and Athena paused at the door. Eden placed an ear to the wood, clearly listening for any sound from within. The assembled crew held their breath in unison. Winslow climbed slowly to his feet and padded out from around the desk. Eden locked eyes with Athena, held up her index finger in a gesture that said, After me! They pushed through the door. As Eden swung open the door, the room erupted with noise. But it wasn't the sort of noise she was expecting. There were no aggressive shouts, no howling gunfire, not even any running footsteps. The sound, when Eden finally recognised it, was applause. The clapping of several hands combined with excitable cheers. She pushed open the door fully, gun still raised, still unsure. Getting a clear visual on the room's occupants, she let the gun drop to her side. Alexander Winslow, her father, stood in the centre with the rest of the Bologna's crew behind. Eden recognised them all, and still in combat mode, counted them off one by one. It's all right, Eden, Winslow said, stepping forward, his hands outstretched. It was all a training exercise. Everyone's safe. Hearing her father say the words, Eden huffed out a breath. Her pulse raged a two-stroke tattoo in her chest. I... I thought... A hand gripped her shoulder. Eden whipped around to see Athena grinning. You were in on this too, Eden said, blinking hard. Athena pulled a small comms device from her ear. Let me take that. Athena took the gun from Eden's hands. It's an initiation exercise we have here, Winslow said, his hands outstretched. You did well, very well indeed. Baxter nodded and rose from his seat. Eden stepped forward and hugged her father. Then, relief boiling over into rage, she stepped back. You scared me, she said, almost choking on the words. I thought they'd come for you again. Don't you ever do that again. Eden punched her father on the arm. The gesture was playful, but still Winslow winced. Baxter produced a bottle of sparkling wine from a fridge, cracked it open and poured two glasses. Your training's really paying off, Baxter said, handing a glass to Eden and one to Athena. The way you dealt with those men was nothing short of deadly. Eden scowled at Baxter, but accepted the glass all the same. She gulped down half of the wine in one swig. The rest of the crew filled glasses and drank too. Winslow padded back over to the desk and thumbed the button on the microphone. You can come in now. Five men appeared at the door. Four had fake blood splattered all over their clothes, and the fifth was covered in plaster dust. Eden turned to see them, shaking her head slowly. I'm not getting in your way again, said the man covered in dust. He held his hands out in a gesture of surrender toward Eden. He turned to Winslow and accepted a drink. She's a very dangerous woman. Winslow nodded slowly. He knew that more than anyone. Chapter 7 Mona Kay, Belize Present Day Commander Fang stood and gazed up at the pyramid before him. Its ancient stones, weathered by centuries of rain and sun, rose high into the sky like a mountain peak. Like those which stood throughout the region, this pyramid had been constructed several thousand years ago by a long-deceased civilization. Fang turned and looked down at the jungle through which they'd just beaten a path. Beyond the jungle's canopy, he could just see the azure glint of the Caribbean Sea. Forty miles from the coast of Belize, the island of Mauna Kai, had been chosen from over a thousand sites. In the end, it had been selected because it sat within relatively quiet waters, its dense jungle would help cover their tracks, and the rocky outcrop at one end of the island provided good visibility. The presence of the ancient structure was a bonus. There was something beautiful, Fang thought, about his world-changing mission starting somewhere so ancient. It was a strange connection between the past, present and future, which appealed to him in a way he couldn't describe. Fang dug out a handkerchief and drew it across his face. What they didn't consider, though, poring over maps and charts back in Beijing, was how blasted hot it was. Fang's tight-fitting military uniform was already soaked through. He was overheating to such a degree, he almost considered undoing his top button. Almost. Hopefully it would be cooler inside. 
Fang glanced at his team standing at ease behind him. The men lounged against trees or the sides of the pyramid. The unit was a mix of military men and computer technicians, both essential to ensuring the mission's success. Fang stepped toward the structure and pushed aside a curtain of vines which hung down one side. The vines seemed to be as much as part of the structure as the crumbling stones. As Fang expected, there was an opening behind the vines. Emitting a great shriek, several monkeys scurried out, almost knocking Fang over. In a flurry of thick black fur, the monkeys darted past Fang and his men and escaped into the jungle. Fang shouted at the animals and swung his foot to kick one, but the creature had already disappeared. Pass me that light, Fang shouted at one of his men. The man scurried to the commander's side, holding a flashlight. So Fang turned the light on and shone the beam into the opening. The passage ran for a dozen feet before opening into a wider chamber. Fang stepped inside. Sunlight streamed in from small shafts high on the walls. A pair of monkeys yammered, scampered up the wall, darted through an opening and out into the jungle. Yes, this is going to be perfect, Fang said, standing in the centre of the room and looking around. The chamber was about thirty feet square and constructed from thick slabs of rock. Pillars the size of tree trunks held up the ceiling, and sunlight shone in angular beams from openings above. Fang glanced up and saw two small monkeys watching him from a ledge. The monkeys had brown faces, contrasting their black bodies. This isn't your home anymore, he sneered, pointing into the jungle. Go away. One of the monkeys raised an eyebrow in a gesture which seemingly said, we'll see about that. Fang clapped his hands several times. Startled at the noise, the monkeys turned and darted outside. In here now, Fang shouted at his men. The unit pushed through the vines and into the chamber. Fang had spent several months hand-selecting the best from government departments and universities across China. Some of the men had come willingly, relishing in the challenge to serve the motherland in a secret mission. Others had taken a little more persuasion. Either way, Fang now had an enviable pool of expertise, ready to make his endgame a reality. Technicians set up the equipment in here, Fang said, looking at the technicians, who always seemed to loiter at the back of the group. There will be more than enough space. Unit 1, finish unloading the boat, then sweep the beach to cover our tracks. No one is to know we're here, understood? A group of men nodded. Unit 2, set up a perimeter around the pyramid. Establish a regular watch. I don't want any unexpected guests. Yes, sir, the men responded in unison, turning to get on with their respective tasks. Fang nodded and inhaled a deep breath. One more thing, he barked. Sweep this place out. It smells of monkey. Chapter 8 San Juan Teotihuacan, Mexico, present day Wow, this is really something. Something. Vittoria stuttered before shaking herself into focus. She tried to order her thoughts and then lifted the recorder to her lips. We've just emerged into a much larger cave. It again has been carved directly into the bedrock. It's constructed in the shape of a cross with four passages of probably equal length heading off in all directions. I would estimate each of these sections is 50 feet long and 20 feet wide. The most interesting thing, however, is what it contains. DeLuca swept the beam of her light through the chamber. Several stone faces looked back at her. There are figures, many figures. Her voice sounded slow, almost confessional in the tight space. Thirty-five, Ramirez interjected. They are of all different sizes, but most are around twelve to eighteen inches. They're the likenesses of ancient gods, Ramirez interrupted. Placed down here, we think, to establish a connection with the underworld. DeLuca moved forward and took a step across the first row of figures, examining them carefully. Yes, they're all different, all unique, quite a spectacle. She looked around the space. They're all arranged in some kind of formation, as though all looking toward a central point. DeLuca turned to the centre. A small stone pyramid about three feet high sat in the centre of the cross-shaped room. The shape of the pyramid mimicked the colossal structure of the Pyramid of the Sun above them. We've measured it, Ramirez said, for once predicting DeLuca's thoughts correctly. And yes, we are directly beneath the Pyramid of the Sun. This pyramid is right in the centre, as though dropped straight through the earth. DeLuca stepped closer to the pyramid, 
crouched down and gazed entranced at the object balanced on top of the pyramid. And this is it, she said, her eyes wide. Yes, Ramirez said. This is what we need your help with. An orb about four inches in diameter rested on top of the pyramid. It felt to Deluca as though her heart was trying to crawl its way out of her throat. Right then and there, the years peeled away, and she was back in the makeshift laboratory with Richard Beaumont. In the blink of an eye, the evening spooled through her mind, ending with the heartbreaking robbery in the alleyway. I... it's exactly as I remember, DeLuca said, awestruck. What do you mean, remember? Ramirez said, his eyes locked on DeLuca. DeLuca shook herself into focus. Ramirez didn't need to know about the previous set of orbs they'd found in Syria, nor what had happened to them. It's exactly as I imagined from your description, Professor, DeLuca said. She dropped to her knees and crawled in close to the orb. She placed the dictaphone on the floor with the tape still running. She swept the beam of her light across the orb. The surface glimmered and sparkled dully. The surface of the ball was covered in various markings. Even though DeLuca couldn't really see the markings by lamplight, they looked similar to those on the other orb. You haven't seen the most impressive thing yet, Ramirez said, sidling up beside her and dropping into a crouch. No, DeLuca replied like a child in a toy store. Turn your flashlight off. Professor Ramirez, I don't see how that will help. Trust me, Doctor, Ramirez said, his voice barely above a whisper. He raised his hand and clicked off DeLuca's light. Darkness dropped across the cave like a ten-ton weight. The dark was so complete that DeLuca instinctively blinked several times, as though testing her eyes weren't closed. Then, as her eyes adjusted, she saw what Ramirez had been talking about. Without being able to help herself, she gasped in the silent cave. The orb emitted a throbbing, metallic, emerald-tinged glow. The light was only faint, but in the complete blackness, it was a beacon. She had seen the Syrian orbs glowing too, but not as impressive as this one. Now this is something very special, DeLuca said, aware that the dictaphone had been recording her silence for several seconds. She described the scene. Imagine thousands of years ago coming down here, 40 feet beneath the earth, only to feel as though you're standing amid stars. Ramirez's voice took on the tone of a master storyteller. For once, DeLuca had to admit the zealous Mexican had described the scene quite perfectly. She really could see why the people who coveted this orb found it quite extraordinary. A treasure indeed, DeLuca whispered. She clicked the light back on and then dug a jeweler's loop from her pocket, slipped it from its leather case and held it in front of her eye. Much like the tape recorder, she'd owned the loop for a long time and it had never let her down. The thing had been a gift, in fact, from a friend many years ago. She glanced down at the loop's leather pouch. Although the leather was almost worn out, she could still make out the symbol which had once shone from the leather. DeLuca adjusted the loop, moving it forward and backwards until the ball came into focus. There are a series of markings, hatched areas really, but there's more... incredible detail. It looks like... the jagged line moving from north to south. It looks like a map. As DeLuca had expected, the markings on this orb matched the one they'd found in Syria, exactly. If DeLuca didn't know it to be impossible, she might even have considered them to the same orb. The lines looked now, as they had then, like the continental coastlines. There was more detail too, but even beneath the loop's magnification, she couldn't make that out. She focused on what she could see clearly. Hatched areas clearly delineated the orb. Land from water. DeLuca studied the markings in silence for several seconds. The only sound was the gentle grinding of the recording tape. She followed one jagged line which she recognised to be Europe's Atlantic coast, then jolted up on her haunches as though an electric current had just passed through her. You've seen it, haven't you? Ramirez said. DeLuca shook her head slowly, feigning surprise but cursing inside. Ramirez was further ahead than she'd expected. The markings look like the land formations of our planet, don't you think? Ramirez said. You're exactly right, DeLuca said, pointing at the ball. But I don't see how that's possible. If this was made at the same time as the pyramid above... Oh, this was made earlier, much earlier. Remember the tool marks on the cave back there? This style of building predates the pyramid by at least a thousand years. DeLuca had to hand that to Ramirez too. But that makes no sense. 
People in the Americas weren't supposed to know Europe even existed until... DeLuca's voice croaked to a stop. She spun around and locked eyes with Ramirez. The Mexican grinned. That's why we need your help, Ramirez said. This is going to rewrite history. A shadow passed across DeLuca's face. Last time she'd seen anything like this, the evening had finished with them being knocked out cold in a Syrian backstreet. Caution here was paramount. Who knows about this? DeLuca said, spinning back to look at the orb. No one apart from myself and a couple of my leading researchers. It hasn't been out of the cave yet, and we've been careful not to include it in any pictures. Good. Keep it that way. We need to get this under a microscope in Miami. DeLuca slipped the loop back into its weathered leather case. The old symbol glimmered, catching her eye. The key to the Nile. Instinctively, DeLuca thought of the man who had given her the loop many years ago. Richard Beaumont would know exactly what to do. Chapter 9 Atlapexco, Mexico, Present Day Brent Fastlane wandered through the door of Carmen's bar and slumped onto one of the stools. He leaned forward, his elbows on the bar, and dabbed his face with a napkin. A ceiling fan spun lazily, doing little but churning the warm air around the room. Carmen, the beautiful twenty-something woman who ran the place, put down the glass she was polishing and wandered across to Fastlane. Hey, beautiful, how are you today? Fastlane said, his eyes roaming down across the approaching woman's curves. Drink, please. The usual, Fastlane added without receiving an answer to his first question. Carmen looked at him a moment, her lips pressed tightly together and her gaze like steel. Fastlane, a social pariah at the best of times, thought nothing of the expression. Drink rum. Fastlane repeated his request, sounding out each of the words individually as though talking to someone really stupid. Although Fastlane had found English to be spoken widely in Mexico's tourist centres, in the smaller villages and towns, he needed to rely on pointing to menus and shouting. So far, he'd made it work. Of course, it was massively inconvenient. He inwardly, and sometimes verbally, berated the rest of the world for not bothering to familiarise themselves with his language. That was the good thing about the States, he reflected. Yes, Mr. Fastlane, of course, Carmen said in perfect, albeit accented English. You gonna let me buy you one today? Fastlane said, pointing a thick finger in Carmen's general direction. You know you're the most damn beautiful woman in this whole town. Thank you, Mr. Fastlane, but you know I'm working right now. Carmen pulled a glass down from a shelf and slid a single ice cube into it. Say, that ice isn't from the tap water, is it? Not falling for that again, never been so sick. Of course not, we don't drink the tap water, it's made from spring water. Good, don't be tight then. Three cubes at least, is there a shortage or something? Carmen nodded and placed another two cubes in the glass. What time do you finish your shift? Fastlane flicked his hand as though trying to swat away a fly. I'll get you out of this dump, show you a great time. Carmen arched an eyebrow. A dump, is it? You seem to spend enough here. Fastlane leaned forward on the bar, his bloodshot eyes searching and failing to find focus. I come here to see you, of course. I gotta show you I'm just some regular guy. I don't want you thinking I'm some kind of big shot. Oh, I don't, Carmen sighed. I don't want you to think I'm too high and mighty. Fastlane continued, unabated. Carmen grabbed the rum from the back bar and poured a healthy measure into the glass. You know, Mr. Fastlane, we have this conversation almost every day. She set the glass down in front of the American. You know I'm married. Married, pa! Fastlane shouted, pulling out his wallet. That means nothing when you're in here working your fingers to the bone. You need someone to look after you. Treat you good. Carmen's mouth turned into a grin. Having worked in the bar since she was old enough to reach the shelves, she was very used to the unwanted advances of men like Fastlane. They were harmless, although very annoying. She took the notes Fastlane offered and slid them into the till. I used to be the most talked about man on the planet, Fastlane said, straightening up like a champion on the podium. He snagged up the glass and took a great slurp, ice cubes clinking. Yes, you mentioned that before, Carmen said sweetly with a half smile. Yep, pretty much set on world domination I was. I was all over the news both in the States and across in... The door clattered open, emitting a warm draft of the afternoon heat. Carmen looked beyond Fastlane to see another of her locals wander into the bar. Excuse me, Mr. Fastlane. I must go. 
I have customers to attend to. Before Fastlane could respond, Carmen strode off across the bar. Damn fine woman, Fastlane uttered, watching her go. He turned and peered through the windows at the bright afternoon light. Although he'd already been in Mexico several months, he couldn't get used to the unrelenting heat. It was just so damn warm all the time. Always the same. He lifted the drink to his mouth and took a greedy slurp. Sure, it was still early in the day, but Fastlane deserved a drink. Or four. A man of leisure, relaxing was what Fastlane did best. Fastlane's life had not always been like this, he remembered. As he boasted about daily, for a short time he had actually been the most talked about man in the world. Instinctively, he rubbed a hand through his newly grown beard. In the past, he had always kept his hair very short and shaved every day, sometimes twice if he was likely to be photographed. He didn't see the point anymore. His hair was now an oily grey mane which Fastlane had to continually sweep away from his eyes. Thinking back to the Fastlane of old, he now looked and felt like a different man entirely. Fastlane took another sip of the drink and thought through the events which had led to his exile here in Mexico. Fastlane had been on the brink of greatness when it had been wrenched from his grasp thanks to a pair of interfering detectives. If he ever got his hands on them, Fastlane reflected, that would be a day he'd very much enjoy. It hadn't ended up that bad after all, he remembered. The wealth he'd accumulated from the sale of his book, combined with some shrewd investments, meant that things were still good for Fastlane. He could stay in the nicest hotels, travel the world, and not have to worry about something as trivial as money. Fastlane took another sip of the drink. The ice cubes clicked in the glass as they cooled. Fastlane felt the soft burn of the alcohol and exhaled. The drinks here really were the best in the world. Maybe he would stay here for a while after all. Hey, beautiful, Fastlane shouted across the bar, clicking his fingers. I'm empty. One more, soon as you can. Carmen wandered across, swept up his empty glass and made another. There was just one thing Fastlane missed about his past life, though. Something that niggled him like a thorn in his side. He missed the excitement. He longed for the thrill of shouting down his disbelievers, of which there were many. He pined for the excitement of delivering a speech that divided people. The delight when his words riled some into passionate agreement and others into hateful derision. Whether people talked about him with love or hate, Fastlane didn't care. Publicity was publicity. He certainly wasn't someone who was ever described as vanilla. Brent Fastlane was uniquely loved or passionately hated. One drink, Fastlane said as Carmen slid his refreshed glass onto the bar. You let me take you out for one drink. This time, Carmen simply took his money, turned and wandered away. Fastlane grimaced, then took a large sip, swallowing almost half the glass in one gulp. With the evening still hours away and nothing but the drinks to fill his time, a melancholy fell across Fastlane. Although he had a good life now, he missed those old days. Maybe one day, Fastlane thought, he could get it all back. Maybe he could slip back into the public eye. He had thought about it countless times. He longed for it. He could even start now, writing under a pen name or something. But where was the fun in that? He wanted to be in the trenches, reveling in the thrill and spoils of battle. Maybe after a certain amount of time people would forget about him. People's lives were busy and the public memory was short. He doubted anyone would really recognise him at all. But to do that, he needed a story. He needed an angle. He needed something big with which he could return to fame and say, look at me, look what I have discovered. With the right story, Fastlane reflected, he could rise to fortune once again. But the story would have to be right. It would have to be a story so big it would blow all his previous indiscretions out of the water. That was the problem, Fastlane thought, tapping erratically on the table. He needed that story. With the right story, he could conquer everything. Fastlane took another swallow. The alcohol was doing nothing but dropping him further into his malaise. It felt as though, without the rough and tumble, Without the chase, without the fight, his life was pointless. Sure, he was comfortable, but there was just nothing to do. Nothing. Fastlane huffed out another breath. There was no point reveling in feelings like this. He finished the drink and climbed to his feet. Feeling lightheaded, he held onto the table for a moment. He would get back to his villa and relax. His villa, high in the hills, was half an hour's drive from the town. 
it was the perfect place for someone who wanted to remain out of sight. Right now, though, if he was honest with himself, being out of sight was the last thing Fastlane wanted. Being out of sight was so painfully boring. Next time we'll have that drink, Fastlane said, waving at Carmen, who was once again cleaning glasses at the end of the bar. Fastlane peeled off a couple of notes and placed them beneath his empty glass. He staggered across the bar and pushed out through the door. Outside, the street was quiet. Palm trees swayed lazily in the breeze. Distant music drifted from somewhere down the road. Fastlane wandered down the street toward his car. With two strong drinks inside him, there were places in the world where driving would be a bad idea. Right here in the Mexican countryside, no one seemed to care. Plus, Fastlane got a thrill at the thought that he was doing something wrong. He wandered toward his car and thumbed the key. His brand new and top of the range Volkstar GTA flashed as it unlocked. Fastlane had cinched an unbelievable deal on the car several weeks ago, fully electric and with the potential to drive autonomously. Once the correct licenses were granted, Fastlane couldn't believe his luck at getting the car. Fastlane looked at the car's sleek exterior. Although he understood the importance of keeping a low profile, the car was his only vice. It didn't look overly flashy either. To the disinterested observer, it was just another black sedan. Fastlane slipped into the driver's seat and clicked the start button. The car hummed to life. Fastlane stepped on the throttle, pulled a 180 and powered off. He accelerated hard up the hill for a few hundred metres. The dashboard screen flashed, informing Fastlane that there was a curve ahead. For several seconds, Fastlane ignored the warnings. Having lived here several weeks already, he knew this road. He hit the brakes at the final moment. The tyres squealed across the dusty asphalt as he took the switch back at speed, sending a torrent of grit against the wall of a closed-up restaurant. Fastlane glanced out of the window to his left. Fields spread out below the road, their damp leaves glistening like a desert of jewels. Fastlane turned his attention back to the road ahead. He powered past a parked Toyota pickup and then spun into the next incline. The road straightened out now, overhanging trees swayed past on both sides. Sometimes this road was busy with trucks rumbling their way from one small town to the next. Fortunately, today the road was empty. The thin strip of blacktop stretched in front of Fastlane, tempting him to go faster still. Not one to pass up the temptation of a thrilling drive, Fastlane clicked the Volkstar into sports mode. The sound of the engine grew from a gentle hum to a hungry roar. A row of parked cars whizzed past. Up ahead, a water truck sat beneath the curving bows of a tree. Fastlane zoomed past, the Volkstar wobbling for a second. The road curved gently ahead. Fastlane let his speed decrease only slightly, then powered into the bend. The car was running perfectly, the engine humming. This sort of driving was what cars like this were made for. For a moment, Fastlane felt a shimmer of excitement. He felt in control and powerful. This is what life should feel like, he thought. In a fleeting rush, a result of the alcohol and the excitement, the years of Fastlane's life folded in on themselves. He was 25 again, finishing his master's degree in New York. He'd aced it all so far, although with his argumentative attitude hadn't made many friends along the way. The memories spooled through Fastlane's mind as the Volkstar hummed through a tunnel of overhanging trees. Swinging around a gentle corner without slowing, he risked a look down at the controls. It's not over yet, he said to himself, a smile forming across his lips. On this rare occasion, Brent Fastlane was right. It was far from over. Then right at that moment, the car's controls all switched off. Chapter 10 Mona Kai, Belize, Present Day Commander Fang watched as his team pushed on. One group lugged large crates up from the beach, while the other team set about preparing the command centre. The technicians swept out the chamber, then ran electrical cabling from a generator positioned outside, and set up lights and electrical outlets. When that was done, they began setting up the workstations and computer equipment. In less than two hours, the place was starting to look like the nerve centre of an operation, intent on changing the modern world, which is exactly what it was. As the men worked, Fang thought about the reasons behind their mission. Their campaign would soon go live, a campaign which would see China get a proper foothold in the Americas. First, they would head into Mexico, before heading north when they were ready. Within a year, maybe two, they would control the entire continent. 
Of course, such plans had been considered by the paramount leader of the People's Republic many times. In the past, however, no strategy was deemed suitable. The world had moved on from direct attacks. War was messy and unpopular. In the modern age, they needed something more subtle and insidious. That was exactly what Fang had proposed. Of course, world domination was the ultimate goal, but that would take time. The People's Republic hadn't been built in a single year, after all. Fang stepped out through the passage and looked up at the pyramid. This place provided them with the perfect cover for their operations, and the surrounding jungle provided a natural barrier to prying eyes. It was funny, Fang thought, looking up at the crumbling stones that such world-changing events would begin on a small island just off the Belizean coast. A pair of monkeys darted out through the passage, both clutching electrical cables in their mouths. A technician followed, his arms flailing, bellowing at the creatures. The monkeys disappeared into the undergrowth. The man ran to the edge of the jungle and then stopped. He bent over on his knees, panting. The man turned slowly. Seeing Commander Fang, he straightened up and hurried back inside. Fang turned back toward their pyramid command centre. As a child, Fang had obsessively watched an illegal copy of the James Bond film, You Only Live Twice. In communist China's isolationist era, such Western films were said to rot the mind and the ownership of them carried harsh punishments. Whilst the videotape flickered constantly, Fang couldn't help but be enthralled by the plucky attitude of James Bond, but more inspired by the world domination plans of his nemesis, Blofeld. The base inside the volcano, Fang had to admit, was genius. Although he would never publicly admit it, his setup here was a direct inspiration of Blofeld's work. Fang checked his watch and then stepped back into the chamber. How long? Fang snarled at a technician. No, no, no. We're setting up the network now, then we've got to finish the workstations and... Don't bore me with details, Fang shouted. You're paid to know the details. Just tell me how long until we can begin. No, no. We should have the first system online within the hour, sir, the technician said, tapping wildly at a keyboard, sweat pouring from his face. Fang whipped around to face the technician, the man visibly quivered beneath Fang's gaze. Why do you say should? Do you not know what you're doing? Are you making this up as you go along? A slug of sweat slithered down the technician's forehead. Fang had to admit it was warm inside the chamber. He hoped the coming dusk would bring a reprieve from the stifling heat. It's these monkeys, sir, the technician pointed across the chamber, where a pair of monkeys were playing with a cable. We've already lost several cables. We've tried shouting at them and they run away for a minute and then reappear. As Fang watched, a monkey hopped down to the workstation and picked up a screwdriver. The monkey sniffed at the tool and then carried it out into the jungle. You see, sir, we're going to lose half of our equipment this way. We're here to further the influence of the People's Republic. We will not let a troop of monkeys interfere with our plans, Fang snarled and marched across the room. He grabbed one of the food bags and rifled through it, removing a bag of nuts. Two more black-faced monkeys appeared in the shafts above. They watched the goings-on in the chamber with intrigue, jostling for the front position. A fan crossed to a workstation, split the packet of nuts open and poured them out. He then stepped behind a pillar and withdrew his gun. What are you doing, sir? One technician said, panic lacing his voice. These creatures are intelligent. We need to teach them a lesson. Fang checked the weapon was loaded. Make an example of one and the others will quickly learn. The technician looked uneasily from Fang to the nuts on the table. His mouth opened as though he was about to say something, but thought better of it. The monkeys chattered loudly from their perch. Three more curious faces appeared as the black-furred bodies pushed through the scrum for the promise of food. Come on, Fang snarled, peering out from around the pillar. It didn't take long for one of the more confident monkeys to climb down a vine and scamper across the floor. The creature moved silently, muscles rippling beneath its fur. The monkey jumped up onto the table and sniffed at the nuts. Satisfied that the food was good, he scooped up several and stuffed them in his mouth. The monkey sat back on his haunches, small hands grabbing at the nuts, as though enjoying a leisurely picnic. Fang stepped out from behind the pillar and leveled his gun at the creature. This will show them, he snarled, his finger curling around the trigger. As Fang squeezed the trigger, the technician beside him reached up and shoved Fang's arm down. The gunshot howled through the chamber, echoing several times. The monkey charged away unscathed but startled, 
scaling the wall in less than a second. Emitting a cacophony of calls, the entire troop scurried back into the jungle. Fang eyed the workstation. His shot had gone wide, thumping somewhere into the stone. Anger flared through Fang's body, his brow furrowed, and his face reddened. Fang turned to look at the technician. The man visibly quivered, reducing in stature further. I'm... I'm sorry, sir, the technician whimpered. Monkeys are a symbol of good luck. It would be a terrible idea to kill one. Fang's expression soured. His eyebrows inched together as rage bubbled up inside him. Do they look like they're good luck right now? Fang roared, taking a step toward the technician. Anything that impedes our plan will be eliminated, is that understood? A red mist descended across Fang's vision. The gun howled again, and again. The technician cried out in pain. His hands shot to his stomach and blood seeped across his shirt. I kill who I like, Fang roared, his tone animalistic. He took a step back and stashed his gun away. The technician lay still on the floor, a growing pool of blood surrounding him. Mad Fang looked down at the man, his expression remorseless. He turned to the other men. Get this mess cleared up. I want the system online in half an hour. Mad Fang dusted his hands together and stepped back outside. Chapter 11 San Juan Teotihuacan, Mexico, present day. Back on the surface, with the orb safely stowed in a protective case, Sergio Ramirez returned to his ebullient self. He scrambled out of the shaft and paced across to the waiting TV crew. Under Dr. DeLuca's guidance, we have just removed an artifact from the cave, beneath the Pyramid of the Sun. This is an artifact the likes of which has never been seen in the modern era. We will deliver it to DeLuca's lab in Miami this evening, where a full study will take place. Can we see the artifact, Professor? The TV presenter asked. DeLuca glanced over to see the attractive young woman biting her lip at the thought of the exclusive story. That, I'm afraid, is impossible, Ramirez boomed. Remember, this is an object that has not seen the light of day for thousands of years. As such, the utmost care must be taken to make sure it's looked after correctly. Satisfied with Ramirez's response, DeLuca untied the orb's heavy-duty flight case from the rope they'd used to haul it up the shaft. She lugged the case across to a waiting SUV and carefully placed it in the trunk. Despite the orb being small in size, it was surprisingly heavy, especially in the bulky case. We must now go, Ramirez said to the TV presenter and the waiting crowd. Several people had already wandered off. We have important research to complete. Ramirez backed away from the crowd like an opera singer at a concert. When can we go down into the tunnel? The TV presenter shouted, pouting. Call my office, Ramirez said, not missing a beat. We'll get the paperwork started. The TV presenter grinned, the thoughts of exclusive stories no doubt running through her mind. Ramirez and DeLuca climbed into the SUV, Ramirez behind the wheel. Ramirez's assistant climbed in the back, followed by a beefy security guard. She wouldn't get down there in that outfit, Ramirez said, nodding at the TV presenter who had stepped in front of the camera to deliver her sign-off. She might get down there, but she certainly wouldn't look like that when she came out, DeLuca said, slipping a phone from her bag. I'll call the pilot and tell him to be ready. DeLuca placed the call as Ramirez fired up the engine. They pulled out of the complex and headed toward Mexico City. Private plane, hey, how did you manage that? Ramirez said, glancing at DeLuca. It wasn't easy. I'll tell you that, DeLuca said with a grin. She looked back at Ramirez. While she knew Ramirez was a professor at Mexico City University, this definitely wouldn't be the first time he'd flown private. Before agreeing to the trip, she'd spent some time researching Ramirez, his background and previous work. She quickly learned that Ramirez had a considerable personal fortune from a business career earlier in his life. I simply pointed out we were returning to the States with an artifact of unimaginable worth, and there were three options. DeLuca counted them out on her fingers. Trust our artifact to the baggage handlers of Mexico. DeLuca glanced at the Mexican. No offence. None taken. Your country wouldn't run without us. Point taken. I'll rephrase. We either trust the hard-working airport employees, or we could drive the entire way. That would take weeks. Exactly. Or private plane. Ramirez roared with laughter and pointed a thick finger at DeLuca. I want you in my corner, lady. We don't even get lunch paid for in my place. 
and DeLuca doubted that was ever a genuine concern for Ramirez, but didn't say it. Smith, the finance manager, wasn't happy about it, but what could he do? This is big news for the university. They won't risk anything going wrong, not on their watch. DeLuca peered out the window as they neared the city. It was a constant gripe of hers that the modern-day measure of an academic was less about their knowledge or research acumen, but their ability to secure funding. May I say I've been a supporter of your work for several decades now, Ramirez said, accelerating down the freeway. Perhaps in some small way it even encouraged my move into this field. Thank you, that's nice of you to say. DeLuca's mind was still on other things. She imagined finally being able to publish findings about the orb and all the attention and respect that would solicit. Then people would have to listen. For many years now, DeLuca had struggled with her reputation after publishing a theory which was not in the accepted historical canon. She'd spent years stacking up reams of evidence but was still laughed out of the community. It was a period of her life which she now just referred to as the A-word. Atlantis, Ramirez boomed, tapping the steering wheel. I particularly liked your work on Atlantis. We need more people like you in the community. It was brave, very brave indeed. Foolish, more like, DeLuca said. But thanks, that was a long time ago now. It was one of the best works on the subject, Ramirez said, taking the junction toward Aeropuerto Internacional Felipe Angeles. They reached the perimeter fence and Ramirez pulled up at the gate. Two men in military uniforms wandered out of a small hut, rifles slung casually across their shoulders. DeLuca noticed another man watching them from a watchtower, 30 feet above. His rifle was trained on the SUV. Ramirez rolled down the driver's window and engaged in a quick-fire conversation with the men. Passport! The man barked. Ramirez passed them over, and the guard checked DeLuca's especially carefully. Satisfied, or at least not diligent enough to do any further checks, he opened the gate. The guard barked at Ramirez, his tone sounding more like a telling off than a welcome. Ramirez nodded and they set off through the perimeter fence and into the airport. As they rolled down one of the access roads, DeLuca scanned the waiting jets, looking for the one that might be theirs. Several small jets waited on the tarmac ahead. DeLuca recognised a Bombardier Global 600 to be amongst their number. Owned by billionaires and kings, the Bombardier was one of the most luxurious jets in the market. DeLuca rubbed her hands together in expectation and waited for Ramirez to slow the SUV. He didn't. They swept past the Bombardier without a pause. DeLuca turned, her eyes pinned longingly on the Bombardier as they passed. Then Ramirez applied the brake. The SUV slowed, its engine purring as it crawled forward. A Gulfstream G700, the king of all private jets, sat 100 feet ahead. DeLuca grinned, looking up at the beautiful craft as they neared, its fuselage glimmering in the bright afternoon sun. After several decades of hard work, it was about time she got some luxury. Ramirez applied the brake and they slid to a stop beside the Gulfstream. He peered up at the aircraft. The man in the back seat, Ramirez's assistant, spoke for the first time. DeLuca had almost forgotten there was anyone else in the vehicle. Oh, silly me, Ramirez said, tapping the wheel. It's the next one. He clicked the SUV into drive and they moved off. As they slid past the Gulf Stream, another aircraft came into view. You've got to be joking, DeLuca exclaimed, clocking the plane they were heading directly for. Silently, she made a promise to berate the finance manager when she saw him next. One hundred feet away, a discoloured, antique-looking, propeller-driven Cessna sat on the tarmac. Two pilots lounged, leaning against the tail. Ramirez stopped the SUV beside the Cessna and climbed out. His assistant scrambled into the driver's seat with the engine still running. Dr. DeLuca, I presume. One of the pilots stepped forward. At well over six feet tall, he towered over DeLuca. He tugged at the brim of his baseball cap in greeting. DeLuca climbed out of the SUV and brushed herself down. She looked closely at the dust-smeared plane. That's right. She offered her hand and the pilot took it. Pleasure to meet you, Mum. Captain Bigham at your service. The pilot turned toward the plane. DeLuca had his accent down from somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, although she couldn't tell exactly. She's a beauty, isn't she? Bigham said. She's certainly something special. Will she get us there? Pah. Never been so certain of something in all my years. 
had the old girl damn near thirty years and she hasn't missed a stroke yet. Bigham rubbed his stubbled chin with a hand the size of a bear's paw. DeLuca watched a giant airbus several hundred feet away crawl toward the runway, the distant rumble of twin jet engines sung in the breeze. How long will it take us to get to Miami? Bigham turned toward the plane, as though it would tell him the answer. He tapped the wing proudly. She'll get us there, sure as the Mariner's gonna win the series this year, Bigham said, clearly avoiding the question. She better, DeLuca said, flashing a look at the pilot. She didn't have time to interest herself in sports. Not sure how long it'll take, Bigham continued, glancing at his silent co-pilot. The co-pilot was a short and wiry man who Bigham clearly didn't feel like introducing. She's not the quickest, but she'll run until the apocalypse and beyond. DeLuca grabbed her bag from the SUV. Bigham swung open the Cessna's flimsy door and indicated that DeLuca and Ramirez should climb inside. How long exactly? DeLuca insisted, sliding her bag into the cabin. Ramirez carried the case containing the orb and placed it carefully inside the cabin. Hard to say exactly, ma'am. Bigham examined his tobacco-stained nails. Flight plan says around 10 hours of flight time. That's just working on the distance of around 1,200 miles, with a cruising speed of just over 120 miles per hour. There's lots of other things to consider, though. There's air traffic and wind speed. Plus, we're going to have to make a few refueling... All right, we'd better get moving then, DeLuca said, sensing that the pilot could talk about this all day, and during that time they weren't getting any closer. She climbed into the back of the Cessna, followed by Ramirez. The plane's small cabin was about the size of a large SUV. Pilot Bigham and his co-pilot climbed in too. DeLuca sat on the seats in the centre of the cabin, which although designed for two, would have been a real squeeze. Ramirez slid through to the rear seats. He flopped down, causing the whole fuselage to rock forward and backwards. DeLuca slid the case across to the wall and secured it in place with a pair of luggage straps. When she was satisfied everything was as secure as she could make it, DeLuca slumped back into the seat. She shuffled to the left to avoid the stab of a loose spring poking at her spine. Bigham started the engine. The Cessna coughed out a cloud of thick black smoke, and then the propeller whirled. Two minutes later, they set off, rumbling toward the runway. Mona Kay, Belize, present day. Fang stared up at the large screen, which had been placed against the chamber's far wall. It was amazing what an incentive did, Fang thought. Since he'd shot the technician, the monkeys had stayed away, and the other technicians had worked twice as quickly. Like all great leaders, Fang inspired the best from his people. They would thank him later, for that, he was certain. He glanced at the blood stain on the floor and remembered an idiom he'd heard many years ago. You can't make an omelette without breaking heads. The screen flickered as the system powered up. We're connected, a technician shouted, thumping at a keyboard. We'll continue to get the other workstations set up, but we're operational already. That's good news, Fang said. Sir, sir, a young man rushed up to Fang, clutching a tablet computer. We've intercepted a charter for an aircraft, leaving Aeropuerto Internacional Felipe Angeles, just north of Mexico City. Its destination is Miami International. The plane has been chartered by the University of Miami. That's where Dr. DeLuca works. Fang looked down at the tablet. Interesting stuff. They've no reason to think anyone is watching them, not yet anyway. We will assume the orb is on the aircraft. Listen in, everyone. Fang turned and addressed the room. There's a Cessna 172, registration C-145, which has just left Felipe Angeles Airport. I want to know everything about that plane. A quiet hum settled over the control room as Fang's team of technicians got to work. Long shadows settled over the island now with the dying day. Fortunately, the temperature had dropped a degree or two. Fang pulled at the collar of his military uniform. The thing was still devilishly hot. Fang strolled down the row of workstations. He stopped at the final workstation and peered over the technician's shoulder. Suddenly, the velocity of the man's typing surged. I'm hacking into the airport's security cameras, sir. That way we can see who was on the plane. I'm just searching for a vulnerability in the system. Then I'll go in through the control interface. Just tell me when it's done, 
Fang barked and strode on to check the work of the next man. A voice boomed through the speakers. Cessna 172, this is the tower. Do you copy? I've got access to their communications feed, another of the technicians said. From here, we can listen into everything they're doing. This is Cessna 172, I copy, copy. You're clear for takeoff. Wind is calm, visibility is good. Report when airborne. Excellent, Fang said. I've got the feed, yelled the technician at the far end. Fang looked up at the big screen to see a small aircraft pick up speed toward the runway. Through the speakers, the Cessna's pilot and the control tower continued to talk. Run the video back, we need to see who's on that plane, Fang said. The technician's fingers flew across the keys and the video scrolled backwards. The technicians flicked to another camera, showing the Cessna standing alone and still on the tarmac. Play now, Fang said. Leaning in close to the screen, Fang watched as a middle-aged black woman climbed into the Cessna. Thank you for your hard work, Dr. DeLuca, he whispered, talking directly to the woman on the screen. It's a shame we won't get to meet. DeLuca was followed by a large Mexican man. The pilot and co-pilot then clambered in and the small engine chugged into life. The Cessna rolled forward. The propeller picked up speed, appearing to run clockwise, then anti-clockwise, then clockwise again on the computer monitor. Fang watched the pilot through the plane's dirty windshield. The Cessna turned right and sped toward the runway. We need what's on that plane, Fang said. Do whatever you can to make sure that plane doesn't make it out of Mexico. Chapter 12 Hi, Eden. Alexander Winslow said, as Eden padded silently through the doors of his office to join him on the Bologna's rear deck. The sun lingered above the horizon, transforming the sky into the muted hues of dusk. Some hours ago, the Bologna had slipped into the eerily calm Caribbean Sea, its motionless waters resembling a vast expanse of mercury. How could you tell? Eden said with a snort. She'd been learning to move silently as part of her training, but today had failed to approach undetected. Third step to the top creeks. Winslow turned and pointed back inside the office. It's especially designed that way, that's the thing. It's easy to underestimate how far away a person can hear you. Most people do. Eden spun around and glanced back inside the office. Other than that, I wouldn't have heard you, Winslow added, sensing his daughter's frustration. How did you know it was me? Winslow turned and looked at his daughter, there's no one else aboard this ship who would be self-assured enough to stroll uninvited into my office without knocking first. The pair stood in silence for some time. A cool breeze whipped through Eden's hair. Where are we going? Eden said, looking down at the water churning in the Bologna's wake. They had been following a course across the Atlantic for the last few weeks. Occasionally, they'd stop and remain in one place for some time. Then they'd rumble forward for days at a time. Since leaving Egypt... They had only made landfall once just outside of New York. They were heading south, that's all Eden knew. What do you know about the Trident nuclear submarines? Winslow said, turning to his daughter. He had a habit of answering a question with another, seemingly unrelated question. Often it frustrated Eden, but now she knew to surrender to his pace of the conversation and the meaning would become clear in the end. They're expensive, outdated and dangerous, Eden said, shrugging. Well, that is true. Winslow said with a laugh, but they were designed in a time when people really thought they would be needed. When designing a nuclear deterrent system for the United Kingdom, the engineers had a problem. Unlike the United States and Russia, we didn't have large swathes of land in which they could build unseen nuclear bunkers, so they settled on a very different approach. At any one time, one or two of the Trident submarines are out somewhere deep beneath the ocean. Why is that good? Eden said because it means that any attack on the United Kingdom will not destroy the submarines. They will still be there, moving slowly, somewhere in the world, fully prepared to counter. Are they invisible? Couldn't someone locate the submarine and disable it? That's the thing, no one knows where it is. Even the crew on board the submarine doesn't know where they are. They slip beneath the waves, and several weeks later they re-emerge in a different place. Someone must have to set the course, Eden said. Eden turned to face her father. As much as it annoyed her to admit it, the conversation had drawn her in. It's chosen randomly from a selection of hundreds of possible courses. Over two-thirds of the world is water, and beneath any part of it could be that submarine, ready for anything. Then how do they know if there's been an attack? 
No, no, no. Winslow grinned and knocked his fist against the railing. It's the simplest solution of all. They listen to the radio. BBC World Service. You mean to tell me we're doing a similar thing? Eden turned back toward the water. Exactly. We're not quite as surreptitious as a nuclear submarine, but our onboard computer randomly selects a route designed to be counterintuitive. If turning right is the obvious thing, then we turn left, Eden said. Exactly that. How long have you been doing this? Eden's voice became wistful. I remember you going away for long periods of time, but just assumed you were on some expedition or other. In a way, that's true. I was on some expedition. The Council of Selene is designed to run with no one person, me included. But at times of tumult, it's good for me to be here. How long? Eden repeated, shooting a sharp glance at her father. I became a member of the Council over 30 years ago, before you were... Winslow paused, searching for the right word. Before you were in my life, I've only been the leader of the council. Helios. Yes, I've been Helios for 15 years now. Doesn't it tire you to keep so many secrets? Eden watched her father closely. Winslow inhaled a deep breath, then let it go slowly. For once, she felt as though she was seeing the real man behind the mask. Yes, it tires me greatly. Winslow nodded and then turned to face his daughter. Golden sunlight patterned across her face, bathing her in a warm glow. Winslow felt a welling of pride and love for the young woman. He cleared his throat, suppressing the emotions which threatened to choke him. Keeping secrets from you is the hardest. I'm trying now to let you into it all, but it's a slow process. You're not only my daughter, but now you're a member of the Bologna's crew. I have to bear that in mind too. Winslow drew a packet of chamomile cigarettes from his pocket. He slipped one out and stuck it between his lips. Be careful, Eden said. Too many and they'll start eating away your insides. What these? Winslow looked at the packet. No, they're just chamomile cigarettes. Nicotine free. Eden whipped around and snatched the cigarette from her father's lips. She dropped it to the floor, crushing it beneath her foot. I meant keeping secrets. Although you really should give these nasty things up too. But I... Winslow looked at the packet, stuttering. <laughs> Before all of this happened, you said you'd given up. Eden eyed her father. The last time she'd seen him before his supposed death, before she knew him as the leader of an ancient secret society, seemed like a lifetime ago. I... I had... Eden narrowed her gaze. You might be the head of a secret society, but you can't lie to me. She held the cigarettes out over the railing. Twenty feet below, the Bologna's engines churned the water into foam. No more secrets and no more cigarettes. Eden dropped the packet into the water and they quickly disappeared beneath the waves. Then she turned, stomped back through Winslow's office and down the stairs. On the second step, she paused, looking down at the third step. She stepped down and heard the creak. <laughs> Winslow might be one of the most powerful men on the planet, but if a daughter couldn't scold her father for his bad habits, then Eden didn't know what the world was coming to. It was for his own good. Chapter 13 Mona Kay Belize. Present day. I want that plane, Fang said, pacing through the chamber. Around him, the technicians beat furiously at their keyboards. Why is this taking so long? Fang sidled up behind a technician and thumped his fist down on the desk. It's more difficult with vehicles of this age, sir. We've got to search back through the records and check what chipsets were initially installed then we've got to cross-check those chips with our own records to see what sort of control they... I've got it, cried a technician from the other side of the room. All heads whipped toward the man, who didn't even look up from his screen. A pair of monkeys, emboldened by the lack of noise in the chamber, stood in one of the shafts, looking down at the scene. Their eyes followed Fang as he paced across the room. Tell me, Fang barked, peering at the schematic of the Cessna displayed on the technician's screen. There are a lot more manual operations in aircraft of this age and style. The flaps, rudder and throttle are all controlled with a series of cables. What does that mean? It means we can't get control of them. How is that good news, Fang snapped. The engine control system, sir, the technician said, as though it was blindingly obvious. In this case, that's the fuel pump. It's controlled by a chip set of ours out of a plant in Dongguan. The technician yelped as Fang whacked him around the back of the head with an open palm. Stop talking riddles. Just tell me what that means. That means we can shut off the fuel pump. 
We won't be able to control where the plane comes down, but it will come down. All we'll have to do is collect the orb. Fang straightened up and placed his hand on the technician's bony shoulder. Excellent work, young man. Make that happen as soon as you can. Look at this country, Ramirez boomed, peering down at undulating land several thousand feet beneath the Cessna. They'd been in the air for just over an hour, and so far the flight had been as comfortable as a nap in a tumble dryer. Deluca eyed a mysterious stain on the floor between her feet as another shudder shook the fuselage. Pacific on one side, the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic on the other, Mexico really is the centre of the world, the most beautiful country I've ever set foot in. Deluca took a sip of water. It was warm and tasted almost as bad as the air inside the cabin. A combination of exhaust fumes and cigarette smoke, the smell inside the Cessna was making her feel sick. Bigham and his co-pilot had lit up shortly after takeoff, and Chain smoked the entire flight. DeLuca could have sworn smoking was illegal on planes, but these guys clearly didn't care. DeLuca glanced at her watch. They were less than two hours in. It was going to be a long flight. We've got it all. Mountains, beaches, rainforests, history, modernity, and the food. Mwah! A series of thuds shook the fuselage. DeLuca screwed the cap on the bottle of water and held on to the seat. Sergio's constant talking really wasn't helping either. DeLuca was about to tell the Mexican to shut up when the Cessna bounced hard from left to right. Sorry about that, y'all. Air current's coming from the coast. We've caught a bit of a headwind. She's a feisty one, Bigham shouted. DeLuca looked at the box containing the orb and felt suddenly very exposed. With the excitement of the discovery, she'd totally forgotten about her previous anxiety. Now it came back in triplicate. DeLuca had seen an orb like this before, a pair of orbs like this, and it had ended in her being knocked unconscious in a Syrian back street. She peered nervously out of the window, as though scanning for an approaching enemy. The sky was clear. Unwillingly, she imagined all that nothingness beneath her feet. The tiny plane just bouncing around in midair. Beneath them was nothing. And nothing and nothing and then the hard impenetrable ground. Maybe they should have taken the long overland route back into the United States, DeLuca thought. You know, Ramirez said, leaning forward and speaking almost directly into DeLuca's ear. I was the best footballer in the state of Mexico back in my day. Ramirez's breath warmed DeLuca's cheek. That really didn't help either. They used to call me Ramirez the machine. You know, I was a looker too, fit as a fiddle. If we'd met back then. The plane lurched, bouncing from right to left, as though in a boxing match with an unseen assailant. The seats rattled against their fixings. DeLuca felt like her vertebra tie were being played like a giant marimba. She glanced again at the case beside her feet. Although the straps were keeping it firmly in place, she hoped the shaking wouldn't damage the orb. Say. Ramirez leaned forward and examined DeLuca closely. You don't look so good. Are you feeling? DeLuca was about to tell the annoying Mexican to take a hike, preferably out of the nearest door, when something happened. At first, all DeLuca noticed was the silence. It invaded the cabin like a swarm of locusts, hanging thick in the air. Then other sounds swept in. The Cessna's mechanisms creaked. Air rumbled across the windshield. Her eyes darted about, trying to understand what had changed. Realization hit her like a punch to the guts. The Cessna's engine had stopped humming. What's going on? DeLuca bellowed. A mechanism creaked. The plane drifted slowly to the left, as though hanging by a string. The co-pilot took the controls and brought them back to the center. Come on, baby, come on, girl, the pilot soothed, his hands moving from one switch to the next. He pulled a lever several times and then thumbed a button. The engine whirred and coughed, but nothing happened. Tell me this is normal, right? DeLuca leaned forward, looking at the rows of controls. All the needles in the control system sat slumped at zero. Where lights had flashed minutes ago, the controls were now lifeless. The clunky old airplane hung silent in the air. Pilot Bigham and the co-pilot checked the engine instruments, adjusted the throttle, and looked for any signs of smoke or fire. We definitely calibrated the fuel gauge, didn't we? Bigham said to the co-pilot. DeLuca looked out through the windshield, then wished she hadn't. The Cessna's single propeller, 
mounted to the nose, rotated twice more and then stopped. Beneath them, forest-covered hills rose into mountains. We calibrated it twice, the co-pilot replied. The plane's nose dipped toward the ground. Views of the forest below filled the windshield. A scattering of cotton wool clouds drifted gently past. The co-pilot gripped the yoke tightly with both hands and brought the craft back to level. We've got to keep the airspeed up, the co-pilot uttered, the muscles on his arms bulging as he wrestled with the controls. De Luca sat forward, panic starting to shiver through her veins like liquid nitrogen. The chilling realisation crept up and down her spine. The Cessna and all of them on board were in grave trouble. Time appeared to slow as fear consumed Deluca's thoughts. She gripped onto the seat until the muscles in her forearms burned. From behind her, Deluca heard Ramirez ask the obvious question. What's going on? Chapter 14 Mona Kay, Belize, Present Day Fuel pump is out and they're coming down, a technician shouted. Bring up the map, we need to see where they'll land, Fang replied, pacing across to the screen. Two more monkeys slipped in through the vents and peered down at the unusual spectacle. A map appeared on the screen. A flashing blue dot indicated the location of the Cessna. How far away is our target? Fang barked, turning to face another technician. Fingers tapped at the keyboard and a yellow dot appeared on the screen. Excellent. And we have full control of his vehicle? Yes, he has a specially modified Volkstar. We can control everything, down to the air conditioning or what plays on the stereo. Fang grinned to himself. The steady march of technology had revolutionised the lives of people all around the world in the last few decades. The trade-off, however, was one that most consumers didn't think about. The average person didn't realise that the device on which they relied could be turned against them with the click of a mouse. For over a decade, all new cars were built with full remote control systems inside. The brand new ones were even connected to a central server, meaning updates to the operating system could be made even without the user's knowledge. All smartphones now recorded a user's location, their browsing history, and could in certain situations even listen in to their real-life conversations. Airliners used supercomputers to power their flight control systems, weather radar and navigation, systems which again could be brought under the control of their makers with the ease of writing a line of code. It was funny, Fang thought, watching the two dots converge on the screen, how the Western world liked to turn its nose up at his motherland. These countries boasted their democratic ideals, their freedom of speech and their individualism as a colades. They flounced around the world stage, showing off their systems and beliefs as though they were the one-stop answer to life on earth. They waded into conflicts to inflict their banking and monetary systems wherever they felt the need. And they waxed hyperbolical, about all that was good in the great old land of freedom. However, Fang mused, when these people wanted a device produced for less than it would cost in their own country, they were always happy to come knocking at China's door, and the Chinese people were more than happy to assist. So for the last few decades, his country had been filling the world's vehicles, computers and communication devices with microchips that they could control. It was perfect, Fang thought, as the yellow and blue dots drew closer to one another on the screen. Hey, answer me, DeLuca said, more frantically now. What's going on? This is normal, right? The pilot peered closely at a pair of gauges. DeLuca could see that the needles on both gauges sat slumped at zero. I'm afraid not, ma'am. It's not good news, system failure. We'll have to set her down, and soon. The pilot peered out of the window, looking for a suitable landing spot. The mountainous terrain below offered no such opportunity. You can do that, without the engine running. You can land it safely, right? Like that pilot on the Hudson River. Sure, the pilot said, colour draining from his skin. This girl has seen us through worse times than this. She's a fighter. The pilot scanned the cockpit for any change on the lights or gauges. The pilot unclipped the handset from the radio mounted on top of the dash, he depressed the button. DeLuca noticed sweat now running down across his face. Mayday, Mayday. Flight 567. We have engine trouble. Requesting immediate permission to land, please advise. He released the button and waited for a reply. None came. In fact, no noise came from the radio at all. 
he bent forward and scrutinised the radio. That's strange, he said, leaning forward and scrutinising the radio's dials. What is? DeLuca said, her voice rising in pitch. The pilot unhurriedly flicked the radio off and then turned it on again. Mayday, mayday, he tried again. Still nothing. The radio remained silent. The radio should be able to run on battery for several hours, even if the plane's electrical system goes down. But this is dead. Nothing at all. Worked fine on takeoff. Damn it, Ramirez said from the back of the plane. DeLuca spun round in her seat. The Mexican was holding his phone in one hand and poking the screen with the other. He turned the phone around and showed it to her. No signal. It's like the thing's completely dead. The Mexican's final words hung in the air like a curse. DeLuca fished her phone from the pocket of her jacket. She tapped the screen. As expected, there was no signal up here. Not having phone signal is quite normal up here, the pilot said, wrestling with the controls. I can't believe this is happening, DeLuca said, panic flooding her thoughts. I knew something like this would happen. It's just like... DeLuca's words caught in her throat as the pilot glanced her way. She glimpsed at Ramirez and saw that he was watching her closely too. It's just like what? Ramirez said. Nothing, it's just nothing. I'm a bit of a nervous flyer, that's all. DeLuca lied. Ramirez narrowed his eyes a fraction of an inch. It was a gesture that said he didn't believe her for one moment. DeLuca didn't care what he believed. She clamped her eyes shut, but all she could see in her mind's eye was the men who'd taken the orbs from them back in Syria all those years ago. The foe had been unbeatable then, and now it seemed they had the upper hand again. The co-pilot toggled some switches, attempting to restart the engine. Nothing happened. Suddenly, an idea formed in DeLuca's mind. This may well be the end for her, but maybe she could still get the story out. If people knew the orbs existed, and some shady power was trying to keep them hidden, that may be enough to start an investigation. Then she thought of Richard Beaumont. She remembered how their relationship had fallen apart after the robbery. He had wanted to leave the whole thing alone and try something new, but she'd become obsessed with it. She wanted, no needed, to understand the markings on the orbs and work out why they'd been taken. DeLuca felt the shape of her dictaphone in her jacket's pocket. She opened her eyes and glanced around at the men in the plane. It was better if they didn't know about the recording. Right now, she couldn't trust anyone. DeLuca pressed the record button, and the tape whirred. Silently, she gave thanks for the dictaphone's technical simplicity. It looked as though the thing literally would work until the end of her days. Okay, DeLuca said, shaking the fear from her voice. Let's go through what we know and see if we can work out what's causing this. It's simple engine trouble, ma'am, the pilot said. What do you think caused it, DeLuca asked. What are you, some kind of expert now? The pilot gave DeLuca an acidic look. Just entertain me, please, DeLuca said. I agree, tell us, it'll help, Ramirez said. The pilot described the flight so far and what problem had occurred. Okay, DeLuca said, thinking fast. Could it have something to do with the orb we'd removed from beneath Teotihuacan? She wanted to get all the details of their flight and cargo onto the recording without anyone realising. I don't think so. How could it? Ramirez said. I don't know. The thing glows in the dark, so maybe it emits some kind of power. Maybe a magnetic force that knocked out the engine. Not possible, the pilot spat. This engine has been running for years in all conditions. Whatever you've got in that box, it'll make no difference. Suddenly, DeLuca's vision blurred. Sweat pooled on her palms. She knew exactly what this was. Her blood sugar levels were out of control. As a lifelong diabetic, she'd grown used to the daily injections, as well as carefully controlling her diet. Clearly, with the day's excitement and now disaster, she'd forgotten. She scrabbled around on the floor for her bag. Her hands shook as she tried to control her movement. My... my bag, DeLuca stuttered. I need the injection. In my bag. Her hands shaking as much as the stricken plane, DeLuca finally found the bag buried right under the seat. She shoved her hand in the side pocket and removed her insulin pen. Grasping the cool plastic, she felt a sudden calm come over her. She rolled up her shorts and pushed the end of the pen hard against her thigh. She pressed her thumb down on the top and felt the needle sting as it pushed through her skin. DeLuca momentarily forgot about the stricken Cessna, still bouncing around without engine power. 
She actually breathed a sigh of relief as she imagined the insulin coursing through her body. Any moment now she would feel normal again. She chided herself silently for forgetting, even in this crazy situation. DeLuca's vision blurred again, the noise of the pilot's voices muted to little more than a whisper. The world around her warped and distorted like a nightmare. DeLuca looked down at the insulin in her hand. A drop of blood ran from the needle's tip. She had just injected herself with several milligrams of insulin. This shouldn't be happening. Panic surged through her veins. Something had gone wrong with the injection. DeLuca tried to speak, to communicate her struggles with Ramirez or the pilots, but no sound came out. Her breathing twisted into short, ragged gasps. DeLuca's body revolted against her, teetering on the precipice of passing out. For what felt like an eternity, she fought against the encroaching darkness. One by one, her senses faded away. The noise of the plane grew faint now, fading into oblivion. Then DeLuca's vision clouded over and she fell into a black void. A chapter 15 Although it took Fastlane less than a second to realise what was going on, he didn't feel fear at first. That came later. In those first few heart-pounding seconds, he assumed the car must have suffered some kind of electrical failure. He knew this section of the road back to the villa was relatively straight, so figured he had a few seconds to bring the speed down and work out what was going on. Fastlane applied the brake firmly but gently. With the power out, the computer-assisted braking system, which prevented skidding, probably wouldn't be operational. Pushing on the brake pedal, he expected the car to slow. It didn't. The Volkstar continued to glide forward, its speed unaffected. Fastlane tried again, this time jamming the brake pedal to the floor. He gripped the wheel, prepared to course correct if the car slid. The speed still didn't change. Fastlane murmured to himself, thinking quickly. The power outage must have taken out the brakes completely. That definitely shouldn't have happened. Silently, Fastlane cursed the car manufacturers for not considering such a thing. No matter, he thought, pulling himself together. The road here was thankfully flat. He could just roll the car to a gentle stop. Fastlane blinked away the effects of the alcohol and focused on the road ahead. The Volkstar emerged from beneath the low-hanging trees. Fastlane glanced to the right. The hillside reared upwards with a bank of jagged rocks. To the left, the road fell away toward open farmland, 50 feet below. The car shot past the turn Fastlane would normally take up toward his villa. Fastlane watched the small lane disappear in the blink of an eye. Fastlane took a deep breath, forcing oxygen to his brain in the way he had been trained to prepare for high-pressure performances many years ago. The most important thing now was to avoid panic. Once panic set in, decision-making capabilities, reaction speeds and the of survival went through the floor. The Volkstar hummed forward, chewing up the tarmac. Fastlane swallowed. His throat tasted acidic. Despite having removed his foot from the gas, the car was still under power. If anything, it was speeding up. Strange. Fastlane pulled his feet away from the pedals and glanced down at the dash. Although the lights were off, he could still see the needles. The rev counter climbed slowly, passing eleven o'clock. Fastlane felt the tug of acceleration, forcing him back into the seat. There was no doubt now. The Volkstar was speeding up of its own accord. What, what's going on? Fastlane said out loud. Despite the speed, the car emitted little more than a gentle whisper. Fastlane gazed back out through the windshield. Ahead, the road curved aggressively to the left. A wall of rock towered up in front. Fastlane pounded the brakes again. He knew in his gut the action would have no effect. The pedal thudded against the floor, but the car didn't slow. He tried again, kicking the pedal down two, three, four times. The Volkstar accelerated, the electric engine humming gently. Fastlane squinted down at the dashboard. The rev counter slid past twelve o'clock. In just a few seconds, if he didn't do something, the car would collide with the wall of rock. Fastlane pictured the scene in his mind's eye. He envisioned the lightweight nose of the Volkstar careening straight into the jagged rocks, crumpling and shattering in on itself. Was a collision on a Mexican back road how it was all going to end? After all he'd been through, the highs of world fame and the lows of his forced exile, this seemed anticlimactic. Fastlane felt himself slipping toward panic. He shook his head, forcing himself to focus. He didn't have time to panic, not now. Every moment was precious. Fastlane glanced through the window. 
although leaping out of the car at this speed would cause injury, it would be far better than a head-on collision with the cliff. He pulled the door handle. The handle moved, feeling loose in his grip, but the door remained locked. Fastlane shoved against the door with his shoulder. It didn't move. He tried again, harder. A bolt of pain jarred through his shoulder. The door was sealed shut. He jabbed the button to lower the electric window. The glass remained in position. It was as though someone had cut through the cables with a razor. If he couldn't get out, he would have to slow the car enough the collision wasn't fatal. Fastlane turned his attention to what lay ahead. He noticed a pair of parked cars on the side of the road. They were tucked almost out of sight behind a low-hanging tree. In a split second, Fastlane calculated the impact and considered the chances of survival. If he crashed the Folkstar into that row of vehicles, his speed may be reduced just enough that he could survive the impact with the cliff. It was a bleak choice, but it was all he had. Mona Kay Belize Present Day Several hundred miles away, Commander Fang stared at a screen as the Volkstar squealed around another corner. A top-of-the-range vehicle, they even had footage from a camera inside the car. Fang watched Fastlane wiggle in his seat, trying the door and then the window. Slowly, Fang watched as the reality of the situation dawned on Fastlane. Sweat rolled unabated down his brow, and the colour drained from his face. Impressive, Fang exclaimed, his eyes never leaving the screen. The vehicle accelerated, flashing past trees on both sides. I heard this was possible, but have never seen such a good example of it. The Cessna should come down within the next three to four minutes, a technician said, spinning around in his chair and looking up at Fang. For the first time, Fang noticed how young the man looked. The kid had only just left his teenage years behind and already could cause devastation from afar. These technical people really were the warriors of the present day, Fang mused, feeling like a dinosaur from a bygone era. We need to get the Volkstar in position, the technician said, turning back to his computer rendering of the Cessna's position, overlaid with a model of the terrain and a map of the roads. Fang took a step back and let his team work. It was all coming together beautifully. Chapter 16 Eden bit down on the mouth guard and jumped on her toes three times to get the blood flowing. Then she tapped her gloved hands together. She glanced across the Bologna's training space at Athena, who grinned, showing the guard in her mouth too. Combat training like this had become a part of Eden's daily routine on the Bologna. She was learning fast. Her muscles felt taut from the exertion, and her brain spun with all she was trying to remember. Three minutes, ladies. Baxter shouted over the prodigy's fat of the land, which roared from the loudspeakers at an ear-splitting volume. According to Baxter, the music was part of the training regime too. I want a clean fight, no messing about. Eden and Athena tapped gloves as a signal of respect and then stepped backward. Baxter tapped on a tablet computer and an electronic bell sounded. The timer had begun and the fight was on. Eden's eyes locked on Athena's, both gazes narrowing. Although the women were close friends, for the next three minutes they would be adversaries, each trying to batter the other into defeat. Eden rushed forward first, feigning a simple right hook. As expected, Athena ducked the punch. At the last moment, Eden pivoted on her left foot and sent a left hook into Athena's jaw. Athena saw the attack coming at the last moment and parried, softening the blow. She rocked back on her right foot and then sprung forward, landing a low one-two combo in Eden's ribs. Eden growled, biting down on the mouth guard. Before Athena straightened up, Eden spun on the ball of her left and delivered a roundhouse kick into Athena's neck. Although the kick wasn't at full power, as landing such a strike would knock her clean out, it was still destined to hurt. Athena lifted her hands, blocking the kick just in time and sent Eden spiralling backwards. For a moment, the room spun before Eden caught her balance. Athena lurched forward, not wasting a second, and sprung into a savage combo of fists and elbows. Eden parried the first few strikes, but at the last second, Athena switched position, sprung up onto her toes and struck Eden with a push kick to the stomach. The kick landed squarely, sending Eden off balance. Eden took two steps backwards and crashed into a wall. Trying to find her balance, Eden's hands dropped to her sides. Athena closed in like a hungry wolf, rounding Eden to the left. She swung into an uppercut. Eden saw the punch coming and tried to move her hands into a blocking position, 
but she was still off centre. The punch gained momentum as Athena's whole body moved forward. The bell sounded and the music cut. Athena froze, holding the punch in mid-air, the picture of control. Eden glanced down at the fist, just inches from her chin. Good, Baxter said, stepping forward onto the mats. How did Athena beat you? I, I, Eden said, trying to speak with the mouth guard still in. She spat it into her glove and then took some deep breaths. Athena stepped away, removed her mouth guard and gloves. She grabbed a towel from a hook and then dabbed it across her face. She's so quick, Eden said, panting. I can't keep up. It's got nothing to do with her speed, Baxter said. We've seen in training you can move as quickly as Athena. You're as strong as Athena, so how did she beat you? Two steps ahead, Athena said, throwing Eden a fresh towel. Eden tore off her gloves and wiped away the sweat. That's right, she's always thinking two steps ahead. That way, whatever you do, she's ready for it. Eden nodded and then immediately shook her head. She'd try again tomorrow, the next day, and the day after that until... A siren roared through the room. Winslow's voice came through the ship's speaker system. We have a situation, Winslow said gravely. Everyone to my office now. This was no drill that Eden could tell for sure. A few hours ago, an artifact was removed from beneath the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan, Mexico, Winslow said to the assembled crew in his office. The wall-mounted screen showed a map of central Mexico. Eden and Athena stood side by side, still sweating from their bout. Each had a towel draped around their shoulders. We know a professor from Miami University was in attendance, Winslow continued. The team intended to take the artifact back to the university in Miami to do a full analysis study. Eden folded her arms in an attempt to hide her tapping fingers. She clenched her jaw to prevent herself from telling her dad to just get on with it. Winslow glanced at Beaumont, who stood toward the back of the group. His expression was already pale. His Adam's apple bobbed, as though he already knew what was coming. Eden sensed a tension in the air, as though something terrible was about to happen. Dr. Vittoria De Luca is one of the world's leading experts in Mayan artifacts, hence why she was called in, Winslow continued. She's also a friend of the council, having worked with many of us before. Winslow turned back to the screen. He tapped a key and a line appeared on the map. Just after 5pm, De Luca, along with Professor Ramirez from Mexico City University and the artifact, took off from Aeropuerto Internacional Felipe Ángeles. He pointed at the screen. While Miami was their ultimate destination, they were scheduled to land in Cancun for refueling an hour ago. There's been no contact from the plane for nearly 90 minutes now. The entire crew looked at the screen for several seconds. Why is this artifact so important? Eden said, breaking the silence. Beaumont cleared his throat and stepped forward. Well, now that's the question, he said explaining about the newly discovered tunnel beneath the Teotihuacan complex. So far, we know Professor Ramirez and his team have assumed the orb was some kind of totem created by the Mayans. Let me guess, Eden said, pointing at Beaumont. You know something different? Yes, exactly. Beaumont stepped up to the screen, which now displayed an image of the orb. Even though the image wasn't great quality, Eden could see the orb was covered in intricate markings. From what we can ascertain from the images, this orb is much older than Teotihuacan itself. If you look closely, you can see that these marks represent, in incredible accuracy, the continents of planet Earth. The question which then presents itself to us is, how did people know what was on the other side of the planet? Eden interrupted, keen to keep Beaumont's ramblings to a minimum. Exactly, the professor said. It's a mystery indeed and one that completely undermines humankind's understanding of history. That's the sort of mystery we like, Athena said, rubbing her hands together. But there's more. Winslow cut in, his voice grave. He looked at Beaumont. Richard, you've got to tell them. The tension in the room increased with the unusual use of Beaumont's first name. This was more serious than it initially appeared. Beaumont pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and coughed into it gently. Yes, of course, you're right. He looked up and scanned the crew. Eden noticed red blotches surrounding his eyes. 
Many years ago, Dr. DeLuca, Vittoria and I made a discovery. We found a pair of orbs which, from what I can tell, looked similar to this one. He pointed at the screen. Both DeLuca and I got a good look at the orbs. We studied them for several hours. They were like nothing we've seen before. Incredibly light, although as tough as steel with a surface that glowed. Whatever they were made from, it wasn't like anything I've seen before. Eden scowled, questions filling her mind. In every way I can discern, they looked similar to this one here. Beaumont pointed at the screen. I knew it, instantly. You mean similar or exactly the same? Eden said. Well, that's the thing. Beaumont gazed at the screen. Without seeing and examining the new orb, I can't say for sure. I'm almost certain. I know instinctively that... They're the same orb, Eden interjected. Well, I don't think this is one of the orbs we found, no. But I think it's made in the same image. Hold on a minute, where did you find these orbs? Athena asked. Palmyra, Syria. Pretty much on the opposite side of the world to Mexico. Eden felt a tingle move up and down her spine. This mystery was getting more interesting by the moment. You're saying that whoever made these orbs, they not only knew about the formation of the world's landmasses several thousand years before anyone was supposed to, but they left one in Mexico and one in Syria. Beaumont nodded slowly, his face devoid of all emotion. But that's not all. He paused for a long moment. It was awful. It really was awful. I mean, I'll never forget the damn thing. That horrible day will stay branded on my mind until my dying day. I wish we'd never... Winslow stepped forward and placed a hand on Beaumont's arm. Beaumont exhaled and stayed unusually silent for a long moment. Here's the thing. We found them during a routine dig out in Syria, beneath an old temple complex. Vittoria and I had done several similar digs in the past. It was a really busy few years for us. It was great, actually, seeing the world, travelling together. Eden sensed a pain greater than that of a lost artefact or ancient mystery coming forth. The dig site was on the grounds of the Temple of Bell, which is thought to be around 2,000 years old. We were lucky to get there when we did, actually. A couple of years later, the Islamic State did more irreparable damage. So what happened to the orbs? Eden coat. As soon as we found them, we knew they were something special. We recognised the markings within moments. For several minutes, Beaumont explained how they had smuggled the orbs out of the dig site and were planning to leave the country with them in order to study them more closely. He then detailed on the verge of tears how they had been attacked as they tried to leave the city. I came to some time later in the local hospital. They told us we had been robbed by a local gang of thieves who target foreigners. Of course, we couldn't report the orbs missing because no one was supposed to know of their discovery. We were lucky to be unharmed, apparently. We were incredibly shaken up, but unharmed. Beaumont paused and dabbed at his eyes with the handkerchief. Vittoria wanted to do something about it. She wanted to find the men. She would have taken them on too. I said no, it would have been a death sentence. Those men were organised, dangerous and deadly. We spent the next few weeks finishing the excavation and then closed it up. We'd found a few interesting statues, pottery, the usual stuff. The local museum was happy with it and the whole thing was declared a success. No one ever knew the orbs existed, Eden whispered. Only Vittoria and I, and your father. Beaumont pointed at Winslow. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end. Vittoria became somewhat obsessed by the orbs. She believed, actually she had some very compelling evidence to suggest, that it was an ancient map of sorts. A map to what? Eden asked, leaning forward, hanging on the professor's every word. You see, there's one subject in the study of archaeology that will have you typecast quicker than any other, Beaumont continued, ignoring Eden's question. Even alluding to this subject will have you slung in the camp of pseudoscientists quicker than you can say Graham Hancock. Eden smirked at the name of the British writer. Although often referred to as a pseudoscientist, Eden knew that his theories were closer to the truth than mainstream historians were comfortable admitting. If I was called Hancock, I'd definitely use a pen name, Athena muttered. He was definitely teased in school, Eden agreed. Winslow silenced the woman with an ice eye glance. I was afraid. I was just so afraid, Beaumont continued, unperturbed. I'd worked hard on my career and things were looking good to get the tenure at Cambridge. 
I wasn't about to jeopardize all that and just, well. So when Vittoria said she knew what the map was, I told her to leave it. I told her it was bigger than the both of us and dangerous too. In truth, I was scared, not just of losing my career, but I could still see those men, the guns. Beaumont dabbed his eyes again and then looked at the floor. A few moments of silence hung amid the assembled crew. She was angry, obviously. She called me a coward. She was right, I think. We both said some hurtful things and that was that. A long term... Beaumont paused, carefully choosing his next words. A long term e-partnership gone like smoke in the wind. Okay, okay, Eden said, growing impatient. But where did Vittoria think the orbs were leading? It was a map to a place no one knows exists. Beaumont said slowly, a place still inhabited by a society who have been living on the earth for longer than modern humans, a civilization even the council has only heard rumors about. You're not talking about... Realization dawned on Eden with the speed of the setting sun. Yes, Eden, Beaumont said slowly. Vittoria thought the orbs were a map to Atlantis. Chapter 17 Fastlane gripped the wheel, blood draining from his hands. He analysed the distance, waiting for the right moment. He would strike the parked cars on the side, attempting to use the impact to reduce his speed as much as possible. Approaching the cars, Fastlane steeled himself. He held the wheel, tensing every muscle in his body. He analysed the distance as the cars drew near. Streaming past the first car, he swung the wheel with all the power he could muster. He spun the Volkstar's wheel until it was fully locked, he tensed every muscle in his body, ready for the car to jerk to the side. At first, nothing happened. Fastlane waited a few moments, expecting the car to lurch. Still, nothing happened. Fastlane looked down at the steering wheel. It was turned all the way. He spun the wheel all the way to the other side. Nothing happened. It was as though someone had disconnected the steering column from the wheels. He had no control over the car. The Volkstar sped onwards. Refusing to give in, Fastlane tried steering again. He straightened the wheel and spun it back the other way. As before, nothing happened. All the colour drained from his face and arms. He stared up at the cliff, towering above him. He inhaled a sharp, panicked breath. All thoughts of keeping calm evaporated. This was it. This was clearly the end. Careering into an impenetrable wall of rock was how he was going to end his days. Fastlane braced for impact. Then, as though performing a miracle, the car slowed. The seatbelt cut against Fastlane's chest. The car padded the brakes skillfully, as though under control of a master driver. Then, at the last moment, the car turned. The tires screamed across the road, sleeting over looser gravel. The car's rear end swung but stayed perfectly in line. Fastlane gripped the wheel, out of habit more than necessity. The landscape spun through the windshield. On one side, just two feet from the glass, the wall of rock slid past. On the other, verdant trees flashed by in a blur of green. After making the turn, the car once again accelerated. Fastlane shook his head, equal parts confused and amazed. The contents of his stomach crawled their way up his throat. He glanced down at his hands, still gripping the wheel with blanched fingers. Slowly, carefully, one finger at a time, he removed one hand from the wheel. The road curved gently to the left. Without Fastlane adjusting the wheel, the Volkstar took the bend. Fastlane removed the other hand from the wheel. He hovered both hands, ready to grab the wheel if needed. The Volkstar rumbled on, staying exactly in the centre of the narrow road. Amazing, Fastlane whispered, fear now turning into a strange excitement. Although Fastlane had written about technology like self-driving cars for decades, he thought they were still a few years away from real-world usage. Yet here he was, a passenger in his own car. Quite how the car was doing this, or why it had suddenly become autonomous, Fastlane had no idea. The Volkstar approached another sharp corner, and Fastlane forced himself to fold his arms. He gritted his teeth as the car showed no sign of stopping. Then, at the last moment, the brakes engaged, sending him into a controlled skid. For a moment, the Volkstar slid toward the edge of the roadway before perfectly falling under control again. Fastlane shook his head slowly, now completely amazed and exhilarated by the vehicle's unusual behaviour. Around this corner, however, the Volkstar didn't return to its previous speed. Fastlane felt it decelerating. The Volkstar rolled on another few hundred feet, 
then turned 90 degrees on the road, facing out across the landscape below. Fastlane shot forward in his seat, his fear now returned. With one click of binary code, the car could shoot forward, send him flying off the road and tumbling down the hillside. Fastlane gripped the wheel and stamped on the brake, aware that both actions would be completely futile. The Volkstar remained still. The whirring engine gently stopped, as though it had completed the journey a thousand times before. Fastlane looked out through the windshield. The Volkstar had driven him up the only hill for miles around. This area was part of a nature reserve, with thick forests covering the slopes. Down below and a few miles away, Fastlane saw the angular shapes of the fields and vein-like roads winding their way toward distant towns. Then something appeared above him. At first, Fastlane thought it was just a star, so bright that it cut through the afternoon sunlight. But then the light moved. It appeared to be moving toward him at first, and then fell down toward the trees. Fastlane leaned forward in the seat, squinting, trying to get a better view. He craned his neck upwards, his face pressed to the glass. The light got bigger and bigger. It was getting nearer, almost dazzling him. The object couldn't have been more than a few hundred feet away now, flying above the forest. The object moved silently, as though gliding through the air under some kind of magical power. What the... Fastlane muttered. The object slid nearer and Fastlane recognised what it was. It was a small airplane heading directly for the hillside, the hillside upon which Fastlane was trapped in the car. Instinctively, Fastlane shot back in his seat. He pushed himself backwards, trying to put as much space between him and the incoming craft as possible. His eyes bulged in their sockets. He tried the door handle, but the car remained locked. The aircraft drifted on and then, at the last minute, the nose dipped. The craft dropped slowly in altitude, beneath the level of Fastlane and the parked Volkstar. The airplane dropped out of sight beneath the road. Fastlane scrambled forward again, trying to see what was happening. He saw nothing but heard a crash echo up the hillside and then roll back down again. The sound of shattering glass and twisting metal followed. Trees splintered beneath the impact. The ground beneath the Volkstar shook for a moment. What is going on? Fastlane asked himself, not quite believing the events of the evening. After the sound had died out, the driver's door issued a faint click. Fastlane glanced at it and tried the handle. The door swung open. Fastlane climbed shakily to his feet. Adrenaline coursed through his veins. He reveled in the feeling, having not been this excited in months. Fastlane dashed to the road's edge and peered over. There, just thirty feet below, the twisted body of a small airplane hung in the trees. Cessna 172, Fastlane said, reading the model and registration number out loud. Considering the plane had crash-landed into the hillside, it seemed relatively undamaged. Fastlane glanced back at the car. The pilots may have sent a distress call, and emergency services could already be on their way. The last thing Fastlane needed was to get caught up with the emergency services. He looked out at the land below him. He followed the road with his eyes and listened closely for the sound of sirens jarring through the breeze. The only sound was the ubiquitous buzzsaw whine of the insects, it was a sound which had disturbed Fastlane during his first few sweaty Mexican weeks. Now he was used to it. Even if the emergency services were on their way, it would take them ages to get out here, Fastlane realised. For a while at least, he was alone on the scene. Fastlane felt the once familiar pound of excitement in his veins. He hadn't felt like this since. Fastlane pushed thoughts of the past from his mind. The falling plane was a mystery, and Fastlane loved a mystery. He scrambled slowly down the bank. As he clambered, one foot at a time, loose earth and gravel ran down with him. He paused beside the gnarled bark of a twisted tree and let the earth settle. Something scuttled nearby. Fastlane whipped around but couldn't see a thing. Whatever it was, it had already fled away through the brush. Fastlane continued descending into the forest. He pushed past a low-hanging branch, upsetting several insects. He tried not to think about all the creatures who made these woods their hunting ground. He didn't plan to hang around. Shoving onwards through another shrub, whose spines clawed at his skin, Fastlane emerged beneath the plain. Several trees had been crushed in the collision. Fastlane looked closely at one of the twisted trunks. Sap oozed from the places where wood had shattered. He scrambled over a fallen tree and peered up at the Cessna. The plane rested at a 45-degree angle, with the nose and propeller crunched against the ground and the rear of the craft caught in the boughs of a tree. 
Most of the craft was so far beneath the tree's canopy that it would have been difficult to spot if he hadn't seen the crash. Fastlane hustled around the front of the aircraft and gazed in through the windshield. The glass was cracked and blood splattered, which didn't bode well for the two men slumped in the front seats. The men were either dead or had been knocked unconscious by the fall. Fastlane froze, looking for any movement. Hello, are you all right? Fastlane said after several seconds. There was no reply. He moved around the twisted propeller and yanked open the pilot's door. He'd become quite the good Samaritan, Fastlane thought to himself. The door screeched as it opened, the sound jarring unnaturally against the buzz of the hillside. Fastlane paused, listening again for any approaching vehicles. There were none. He pulled again. The plane wobbled, threatening to fall from its precarious position. Carefully, Fastlane pulled once more, forcing the buckled door open. Fastlane leapt backwards, afraid to be crushed by the machine if it fell. The rocking slowed, and then stopped altogether. Fastlane padded back toward the plane. He looked at the pilot's slumped figure. The man was strapped into the seat, although his hands hung limp at his sides. Fastlane held out his fingers and slowly touched the man's neck. The man's flesh was cold and rubbery. Fastlane withdrew his hand quickly, as though the touch had shocked him. In Fastlane's unknowledgeable opinion, this man had been dead for a long time. Then, looking closely, Fastlane noticed the blood staining the windshield and the controls inside the cockpit. Fastlane moved in closer again. Blood ran down across the pilot's shirt, too. Fastlane peered at the other man. This man had blood across his face and chest, too. These guys had been killed on impact, or so it appeared. Fastlane turned his attention to the Cessna's cabin door, he reached up and unfastened the door. It slid open and then jarred to a stop. The Cessna rocked aggressively backwards and forward. Fastlane stuck his head inside. There were two passengers in the back, both slumped forward against their seatbelts. Fastlane looked first at the man in the back seat. Although the man had no visible injuries, he wasn't moving. A woman sat on the seat in the centre, hair hanging over her face. No. Fastlane wasn't about to risk life and limb scrambling inside the plane to confirm these two were dead. They weren't moving and their plane had just fallen out of the sky. The chances are, the passengers were dead like the pilots. Four dead people in an otherwise empty plane, Fastlane whispered. He thought about the options. Could they have been shot while flying and then the wind brought them here? This was the only hill for miles around. Fastlane huffed out a breath and took a moment to think through his options. Was it really a mystery he wanted to get caught up in? The discovery of four dead bodies sounded like trouble, and trouble was the last thing Fastlane needed. His mind made up. Fastlane turned away from the Cessna. He would climb back to the car and, hoping the thing had now stopped playing silly games, drive home. As Fastlane turned, he saw something inside the plane glimmer. Although it was only the smallest flash of light, it was enough for Fastlane to freeze in his tracks. The old flame of excitement flared again, moving through him, Fastlane turned around slowly and studied the plane's gloomy interior. The object glimmered again. Squinting into the shade, he saw what had caused the reflection. Against the far wall, strapped securely in place, was an aluminum case. Fastlane looked at the case for several seconds. About two foot square, the case was constructed from thick metal. Two locking bolts secured the case closed on either side. Fastlane had seen this sort of case before, used for transporting expensive objects. These cases were, literally, able to protect their contents from anything, as proven right here, Fastlane thought, grinning. Whatever was in that case was important and probably expensive. Curiosity bubbling into greed, Fastlane leaned forward and reached for the case. His fingers swept through the air at least two feet away. He leaned forward again, this time pushing himself onto the floor of the cabin. The Cessna rocked. Fastlane was still a foot from reaching the case, he straightened up and looked back at the Cessna's tail. The plane was lodged at the juncture of two branches. Although the tree curved beneath the plane's weight, it looked to be relatively stable. Here goes, Fastlane said, heaving himself up into the cabin. The Cessna swung to the left, the floor tilting to about 30 degrees. The tree groaned and bent, but held firm. Fastlane shuffled into the center of the cabin and the Cessna leveled out. He glanced at the two corpses in the cockpit and immediately turned away. He didn't want to think about what might be behind this mysterious crash. Fastlane shuffled over to the case, 
The Cessna rocked again, now swinging to the right. A deep, groaning, cracking noise echoed through the fuselage. Faslin froze and then shuffled on his knees back to the centre. The plane returned to its level position, and the noise from the tail abated. Faslin looked at the crate, two feet to his right. He gradually, cautiously, leaned forward. He reached the first ratchet strap and played with the catch. The thing was fastened tight around the case. He found the lever to disengage the strap and pressed it firmly. The mechanism clicked, and the strap became loose. Fastlane pulled it from around the case and threw it to one side. He turned his attention to the second strap. This one was hooked to the wall with the mechanism on the far side of the case. Fastlane leaned over, trying to keep his weight in the center of the plane. Inch by inch, Fastlane moved toward the mechanism, his fingers ready to depress the lever and release the strap. His arm fully extended and still some way off, Fastlane leaned forward. The Cessna grumbled and groaned, rolling in its cradle. Fastlane leaned further, his lips set in a snarl of tension. Then he heard another noise, he stiffened, listening hard. The noise came again. Fastlane's blood turned to ice as he recognised the sound of a growling engine and then raised voices. Several of them. Chapter 18 Baxter deftly worked the controls of the Eurocopter as they pounded above the trees of northeastern Mexico. Eden, sitting in the chopper's front seat, assessed the ground beneath them. To the left, a patchwork of low-lying fields stretched out as far as she could see. Farm workers paused and looked up at the craft as they thundered past. To the right, the terrain rose into sharply undulating forest-covered hills. Eden glanced at Athena in the back and experienced a momentary flashback of their last mission. Riding in this very chopper above Cairo, Egypt, Athena had sustained a gunshot wound, which had landed her in the infirmary for several weeks. Although she'd made a full physical recovery, Eden wondered what ghosts lurked behind those calm eyes. Eden knew Athena was tough, but could anyone face death like that and remain totally unscathed? Pushing the thought to the back of her mind, Eden turned and looked out through the windshield. She lifted a pair of binoculars to her eyes and scanned their surroundings. I don't see how this is useful, Eden said. She heard her own voice repeated through the comm system. The plane could have come down anywhere between Mexico City and Cancun. There are thousands of square miles to search. It's like looking for an amoeba in a haystack. While I would normally agree with you, we're not going in blind, Athena said. She passed Eden a tablet computer. The team at the lab ran a few simulations. Considering the weather, the type of plane, the terrain, the route it was taking and a load of other factors, they've nailed it down pretty tight. Eden looked closely at the map on the screen. Parts of it were coded in different colours. The lighter the colour, the more likely that's where we'll find our Cessna. Baxter adjusted the controls and the Eurocopter barreled to the right. And we've just reached the middle of that section. We'll start spiralling out from here. Impressive stuff if it works, Eden said. Oh, it works. The computer systems they use consider many variables. It works out probabilities, statistical likelihoods. It doesn't beat boots on the ground, though, does it? While Eden was very technical, there were some things that were just better kept simple, she thought. She looked from the screen to the landscape beneath them. They were climbing up a hillside, low enough to whip the upper branches of the trees into a manic wave. That still gives us a lot of land to cover, though, and when the tree cover is like this, the plane could easily still be out of sight. Agreed. Baxter flicked a couple of switches on the dash, and a screen turned into a rainbow of colours. That's why we have this. Eden leaned in close to the screen. Some kind of density sensor. Exactly. With this you could find a screw from 100 feet away. Eden glanced at Baxter, disbelieving. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it'll easily show something the size of our missing... Several pings and thuds reverberated through the chopper, cutting Baxter off in mid-sentence. What was that? Eden said, looking around frantically. Looks like we've got a welcoming committee. Athena pointed down through the window. Another percussive rattle hammered against the hull. This time, Eden clearly recognised the sound. Gunfire. Eden knew all too well the sound of bullets striking the hull of this machine. Incoming, Baxter grunted yanking back on the controls and sending the Eurocopter into a steep climb. Eden saw sparks fly as bullets ricocheted from the fuselage. Gritting his teeth, 
Baxter jerked the stick to the left, now banking the chopper beyond its capabilities. The machine strained under the sudden change in direction, but getting out of the way of the gunfire was essential. Eden ducked as the glass in front of her splintered into a spider's web of shards. Don't they make these machines bulletproof? Eden shouted from her crouched position. The memories of their gunfight with another chopper were all too fresh to be doing this again. We are but just the fuselage, Baxter growled, pushing the throttle to the max. We're being shot at from that hill. An alarm sounded, and he glanced down at the gauges. Another bombardment zipped past, a few lucky shots ricocheting from the landing gear. Fortunately, more went wide than hit, sending tracers up into the sky. The successful shots became less frequent as Baxter increased the distance. Eden straightened up and clamped the binoculars to her eyes. Four men, all with rifles, she said, describing the scene to the others. As Baxter had said, they were standing on a road which circled the hill. They're in plain sight on the road below, firing sporadically. Now out of any accurate firing range, Baxter levelled off the climb and the chopper surged forward, away from the threat. Eden swung the binoculars up and down the road which curved its way up and around the hill, hemmed in on both sides by the jungle. Other than a battered 484 which the men stood beside, there were no other vehicles in sight. I always say it's important to get on with the locals, Eden said, watching the men lower their weapons. They were now well out of range. It makes you wonder what they're so keen on us not seeing, Baxter said. Wait a minute, scroll that back. Athena pointed at the screen on which the scans of the jungle below were displayed. Baxter swung the chopper to the left, putting the hillside between them and the men. Eden had been so distracted that she hadn't looked at the screen since the shooting began. She tapped the back button several times. Sure enough, there was something more than just trees on the side of the hill. And you doubted our top-class mathematicians, Baxter said, grinning. I think we've found our Cessna. Eden zoomed in on the image, sitting amid the trees less than a hundred feet from the shooters. That's it, all right, she conceded, noticing the unique shape of the Cessna's wings. Something tells me those guys weren't about to call the emergency services. The knot of worry in Eden's stomach tightened. If anyone had survived the crash, Eden suspected those thugs would finish them off rather than face questions about what happened to the plane. Baxter slowed the Eurocopter. Time to make some friends, Athena said, unclipping her belt and sliding open the Eurocopter's door. Absolutely, Eden said. Boots on the ground is where the real work happens. Math should stay in school. Chapter 19 Fastlane remained still, listening to the voices. Speaking in Spanish, he didn't know what they were saying, but didn't want to find out. The discussion sounded heated and menacing. Fastlane didn't think the men would take kindly to finding him here. These men would claim ownership of anything that fell on their land, and they would take that through force if necessary. Whatever was in the flight case, they certainly wouldn't want to share. Fastlane peered out through the window. Four men stood on the edge of the road, looking down at the wreckage of the plane. Each man had a rifle slung across his shoulder, like some strange fashion accessory. Muttering a few choice words, Fastlane considered his options. He could give up the case and flee through the trees now. The men wouldn't even know he'd been here. With a shock, he remembered the Volkstar parked on the road above. His was the only such vehicle in the area. It wouldn't be difficult to track him down. He could approach the men now and allow them to take the plane and whatever was in the case. If he didn't get in their way, maybe they would see no reason to harm him. Fastlane glanced at the case. That would mean him losing claim to whatever was in the case. He considered another option. He could take the case and get out of this neighbourhood as soon as possible. The shouting from the road above continued. It sounded as though they were trying to decide who should clamber down the bank and inspect the plane. A moment later, the argument between the men abruptly finished. One man stepped forward, clearly having drawn the short straw, and scrambled down the bank. Fastlane glanced back at the case and felt the grip of determination close around his chest. This was the most exciting thing to happen to him in months. He really didn't want to let someone else have all the fun. Fastlane watched the descending man pick his way toward the plane. The three other men watched from the road above, shouting down at their comrade. Fastlane figured he had 20 seconds, 30 at the most, to grab the case and get out of there. If he didn't, he'd probably share the fate of the Cessna's other occupants. He glanced up at the four motionless figures and then made up his mind. 
Fastlane swung around and all care now forgotten, lunged for the crate. The Cessna rocked, grating and screeching against the tree which held it. Fastlane grabbed the locking mechanism and poked hard at the release lever. The lever didn't move and the case remained fixed in position. Fastlane looked toward the descending man. He was nearing the bottom of the slope now. In the next few seconds, he would have a clear view of the plane and see Fastlane inside. The man took another step, slipping on loose gravel. The man caught hold of a tree to stop himself from falling down the bank. The observers on the roadside roared with laughter. Faslan used the distraction to work the lever again, pushing as hard as he could. Still, the thing didn't move. The impact must have bent the mechanism out of shape. The descending man shouted at the observers, straightened up and continued toward the plane. He was now just 15 feet away. Once he had rounded the nose, he would see Faslane lying on the cabin floor. Faslane gritted his teeth, pushing the mechanism as hard as he could. His efforts remained fruitless. Faslane glimpsed the man, shoving his way through the undergrowth. Emerging from behind a tree, the man paused and looked up at the Cessna. Ow. Faslane tucked himself further into the cabin, desperate to remain out of sight. He held his breath and rolled himself into a ball. The man took another two steps forward, now just six feet away from Faslane. The man slipped his rifle from where he'd slung it across his back and held it ready for use. He prepared to step toward the cabin door and then froze. Another noise thundered across the landscape. The men up on the roadway shouted wildly. The man beside the Cessna turned and looked up at the road. The noise grew louder now. Faslane recognised it as the pounding rotors of a chopper. The man turned and ran full tilt up the bank. The men on the road fired wildly up at the chopper. Not taking time to aim, they were just sending bullets into the air. Faslane exhaled. He felt dizzy from holding his breath and the adrenaline thronging through his veins. He looked back at the polyester strap, which held the case in position. At about an inch wide, it was tough but could be cut with a sharp blade. Faslane looked quickly around the cabin for something to sever the strap. One window had shattered on impact, scattering shards of glass across the floor. Faslane grabbed a shard and scratched at the polyester with the sharpest edge. The strap frayed slowly. Man Trees whipped from right to left in the chopper's downdraft. The men on the road continued firing madly into the sky. The chopper howled, pulling up aggressively away from the threat. Fastlane soared at the strap. He'd made progress now and was almost halfway through, splitting the thing in two. Um. The waving trees settled down as the chopper banked into a curve around the hillside. The men slowed their firing to the occasional bombardment, now that the chopper was clearly out of range. With one final push, Fastlane slid the glass through the strap. The strap fell slack against the floor like a dead snake. Fastlane pulled the case across the floor toward him. The chopper's rotors faded and Fastlane heard the men's voices again. They turned their attention back to the Cessna. Fastlane turned around and looked up at the bank. This time, two of the men descended toward the plane. Now clearly impatient, they slid down the first 15 feet in a few seconds. The men pushed through a bush, scrambled over a fallen tree and then looked up at the Cessna. One man shouted something up to the others. Holding his prize, Fastlane cowered in the plane's gloomy interior. The men padded around to the Cessna's nose. Thinking quickly, Fastlane unlocked the door on the other side of the cabin. The gentle click of the lock faded into the noise of the approaching men, and the door slid open. Fastlane waited a few seconds for the first man to reach the plane's nose and peer in through the windscreen. The man gasped at the sight of the corpses and then shouted back to the others. Fastlane used the noise to drop the case out through the door and then slip out himself. Reaching the forest floor, Fastlane wasted no time. He snagged up the case and darted away, pushing trees and branches aside as he went. He sprinted forward, the heavy case knocking against his thighs and the branches clawing at his face. At any moment, he expected raised voices and gunshots to fill the air. None came. The next 30 seconds passed with the speed of pouring molasses. Fastlane spun around, expecting to see the men charging toward him, ready to seize what they thought was rightfully theirs and dump his body in the forest. Only the gloomy, noisy jungle loomed up behind him. Through the trees, Fastlane could hear the men's voices. They spoke to each other in the unhurried cadence of private conversation. Perhaps they'd assumed the noise of his escape was nothing more than a startled animal. Fastlane grinned and patted the case's cold metal. He longed to open it, but would wait until he was somewhere safe. Fastlane pushed on through the forest. After a couple of hundred feet, he turned back toward the road. It took Fastlane several minutes to navigate the incline with the crate. Loose earth ran around his feet, and he struggled to keep his balance without being able to use his hands to support his climb. 
He found the best method was to heave the case up as far as he could, then scramble up behind it on his hands and knees, before heaving the case on again. Fastlane reached the road about 50 feet up from the parked 484. Two men lounged against the vehicle's fender, smoking. It took Fastlane several moments to realise that the Volkstar was gone. He checked his pocket. The keys were there, so the men couldn't have made off with the car. Fastlane looked around as though the car could have moved itself. Then he remembered it effectively driving him up the hill all by itself. It could very easily have driven away of its own accord. A pair of bright headlights flashed from beneath an overhanging tree, 200 feet up the road. Fastlane spun around and stood riveted to the spot. He peered into the gloom and saw the Volkstar tucked away out of sight. Shaking his head in amazement, Fastlane scurried across the road. As he approached, the driver's door swung open. Okay, take me home, Fastlane said, realising it was that or a long walk with the heavy box. He opened the back door and placed the box inside, then climbed into the driver's seat. But I'm selling you tomorrow. Chapter 20 Baxter rolled his eyes and tried, but failed to keep a smile from his face. Get as close as you can while remaining out of sight, Eden said. They'll still hear the rotors from here, Baxter said, glancing down at the hillside. Make it quick before they come looking. It won't matter if they come looking. Eden slid a pair of rifles from beneath the seat and handed one to Athena. The pair swung on backpacks and then peered out through the open door. They swapped their over-ear headsets for in-ear comms devices. The chopper descended quickly toward the road, which ran down the opposite side of the hill. Little more than a dusty track, the rotors whipped earth and grit into spirals. Branches and leaves thrashed wildly from right to left. The chopper kissed the road and the women jumped out. Thanks for the lift, Eden said. They ran across the road, slid down the bank and pushed into the dense bushes. My pleasure, Baxter said, watching the women until they disappeared from sight. He lifted off and powered away. Eden readied the rifle and aimed it up the road toward their quarry. If the men came this way, possibly suspecting that they had touched down, Eden and Athena would be ready. Eden caught a last glimpse of the chopper as it roared away to the west. Baxter would find a safe place to bring it down nearby and await their call. I don't think they're coming, Athena said after two minutes had passed, and the chopper's roar had long since faded into insect zing of the forest. Agreed, what do you think we're dealing with? Local hoodlums, I expect. The plane has come down on their patch and they're seeing it as an unexpected payday. Athena paced up onto the road, her rifle dipped but still ready at a moment's notice. Let's hope that's the case, Eden said. The women set off at a jog up the road. Within two minutes, a result of the added weight of the bag and the humidity, which must have been over 60%, sweat poured down Eden's face. Nearing the summit of the hill, they slowed. Eden took several deep breaths and let her heart rate return to normal. She noticed with some embarrassment that although Athena was sweating, it was nothing more than a sheen. Eden, on the other hand, felt the moisture roll in rivulets down her back. They reached the brow of the hill and tucked back in beside the trees for cover. Athena ran point, allowing Eden more time to recover from the climb. Eden made a mental note to double her time on the treadmill from now on. Athena held up a finger. Hear that? Eden listened closely and heard a large diesel engine struggling toward them. Eden and Athena stepped further into the tree cover and inched over the brow of the hill. Slowly, foot by foot, the curving road on the hill's other side came into view. The four men, the rifles now slung casually across their shoulders, stood beside a rusting 404. They clearly thought their warning shots had the desired effect, Eden said. Further down the hill, a cloud of black exhaust fumes belched into the air. From their position, Eden and Athena couldn't yet see what was causing the fumes. After a minute, an ancient crane belched and wheezed into view. It was followed by an even older flatbed truck. The vehicles groaned up the incline, slipping and sliding on the gravel. Eventually, they stopped beside the 404, the engines grumbling into silence. The crane operator clambered down from the cab, followed by a man wielding a gun. It was clear the crane operator wasn't there voluntarily. An animated conversation ensued between the gun-wielding men and the operator. The crane operator appeared not to like the instructions he was given. With five rifles pointed his way, he conceded quickly, holding up his hands and shuffling back to the crane. The old machine rumbled to life and was inched into position above the Cessna. 
Eden and Athena watched, taking turns with the binoculars, as the Cessna was winched painstakingly from the trees. That's our plane for sure, Eden said, reading the tail registration number. <coughs> Although the front end of the plane was shattered and twisted, the rear looked relatively unscathed. The crane operator adjusted the controls, and the giant beam swung around. The flatbed truck lurched into position. The crane operator lowered the Cessna. With a creak of suspension and the tinkle of shattering glass, the plane thumped down onto the flatbed. Raised voices drifted through the air as the men set about tethering the aircraft in position and then covering it with a giant tarpaulin. Eden looked at the oversized load and handed the binoculars to Athena. The plane hung out over the road on both sides. There was no way they planned to take that thing far. They'll come this way, Athena said, binoculars moving from left to right. There's no way they could turn on this part of the road, and reversing a load like that all the way down the track would be madness. Eden nodded and then pressed the button on her in earcoms device. The men have loaded the Cessna onto a truck, she said to Baxter. They're about to set off. Where does this road lead? Just a couple of nearby villages. It's 50 miles to the nearest town, Baxter replied. They'll be going somewhere nearby then, one of those villages, I bet, Athena said. With another volley of shouted words, the men scrambled into the vehicles. Three engines roared to life. They're setting off, we're going to hitch a ride, Eden said. Did you find somewhere to set down? Yes, I'm about two miles away. Excellent, you just chill out there, Eden said. Don't worry, we've got this. Try not to work too hard. Baxter said something in response, but his voice was drowned out by the thundering engines. The 4V4 led the convoy, followed by the crane, with the flatbed truck at the rear. Eden and Athena ducked back into the bushes as the 4V4 neared the top of the hill. As the vehicle rumbled past, Eden eyed the driver and passenger through the dirty windshield. The men didn't even glance in their direction. These guys were used to being on top of the food chain, Eden realised. That had made them sloppy. She was going to enjoy bringing them down a peg or three. Next, the crane chugged past. Eden felt the ground beneath her vibrate as the giant wheels rumbled past. Then the flatbed inched its way up and over the brow of the hill. Athena was right, the size of the Cessna severely limited its maneuverability. On one side, the wings brushed through the trees, bending and twisting the branches. On the other, it precariously overhung the slope. Let's go, Athena said as the truck passed their position. The woman slipped out from between the trees and ran out into the road behind the truck. Fortunately, the size of the load obscured the driver's view of the road behind. Again, confidence had made these men sloppy. They should have put the payload in the middle of the convoy. Then again, they didn't expect to be challenged. Never Eden and Athena ran a few paces and caught up with the struggling truck. Now, inching its way down the incline in a squeal of brakes, the thing was only moving a few miles an hour. Athena scrambled up onto the back, joined by Eden a second later. Eden lifted the tarpaulin, and they both ducked inside. The truck picked up speed and rumbled down the incline. The tarpaulin rippled in the increasing wind. Eden and Athena crawled beneath the Cessna. They climbed out beneath the wings and into the plane's cabin. The women pulled out flashlights and looked around. Eden froze in position. Her stomach tied itself in knots. Four bodies sat slumped in the plane's seats. Two were the pilots, and the other two, Eden recognised from the pictures they'd seen back on board the Bologna, Vittoria De Luca and Sergio Ramirez. Help, help me, a weak voice filled the cabin. Eden whipped around with the light, First, she looked at De Luca, but there was no movement. Help, I'm... Athena rushed over to Ramirez, strapped into the Cessna's back seat. Ramirez blinked several times and looked around in disorientation. Where am I? What's happening? Chapter 21 Fifteen minutes later, the Volkstar having behaved exactly as a car should, Fastlane pulled to a stop outside his villa. He turned off the engine and climbed out. He looked around to check no one was watching him, then retrieved the crate from the back seat and lugged it up to the door. Once inside, he placed the crate on the kitchen table and snapped on the lights. Without delay, Fastlane unclasped the locks and lifted the lid. He peered inside. Like a fish out of water, Fastlane's mouth moved a few times. His eyes bulged from their sockets. Inside the case, protected on all sides by foam padding, sat a gently glowing orb. Frozen in position, as though the thing was about to jump up and run away, 
Brent Fastlane watched the orb for several long seconds. He blinked a few times and then shook himself into action. What do we have here? He leaned in close to the object. The orb's gentle green glow washed over his face, casting a ghostly hue. Fastlane touched the orb tentatively with a fingertip. The surface was cool, rough and metallic. Fastlane picked the orb up and looked at it carefully, turning it in his hands. Patterns and shapes swirled around the surface. Fascinating, he whispered. Although he had no idea what the thing was, it felt important and powerful. Placing the orb back in its case, Fastlane dragged his laptop across the table. Although he didn't know what the thing was, he knew someone who would. Fastlane opened a video calling app and placed the call. Fastlane had known Viper Steel for decades. Definitely a pseudonym, Viper Steel was one of the world's leading researchers on all things alternative history. The man was a fount of knowledge and had helped Fastlane multiple times in the past, getting him access to records and documents when needed. The man was always up for a challenge and willing to help. Well, I didn't think I'd see the day. If it isn't Brent Fastlane talking from beyond the grave, came Viper's familiar British accent. Apparently the guy was from some place called Norfolk, although Fastlane had no idea what that meant or where it was. Fastlane grinned seeing his friend on the screen. It was true he'd been keeping a low profile of late. If people thought that meant he was dead, then so be it. And look at you, all long hair and bearded, Viper continued. What are you trying to do, join a commune? Something like that. Fastlane said, running a hand through his beard. Although I think that's coming to an end. Listen, I've found something, and I think it's big. I never... Well, it sounds like there's a story coming up. Let me get my cigarettes. Viper said, standing up. The camera refocused on a dark window behind him, reminding Fastlane of the time difference. Although it must be the middle of the night in England, Viper hadn't seemed to care. What you got for me then, old boy? Viper said, returning to the screen, a glowing cigarette between his lips. In the manner of a magician, Fastlane held the orb up to the camera. Viper peered in close. And how, pray tell, did you come to be in possession of such a thing? Let's just say the previous owner wasn't looking after it properly, Fastlane said. It sounds like trouble to me, Viper said, taking a deep drag on the cigarette. For several minutes, Viper examined the orb through the video feed, and asked Fastlane a series of questions. Viper lit a fresh cigarette from the butt of the last and then nodded slowly. I think I know what you've got there, Viper said. Every so often one gets uncovered, then quickly hidden again. I heard rumours an orb was found about ten years back out in Syria. Since then, nothing. Well, what is it? Fastlane interrupted. What does it mean? That, if I'm not terribly mistaken, is one of the twelve orbs of Atlantis. Fastlane inhaled aggressively. Wait. He choked over the words. He shook his head and regained composure. I thought Atlantis was a fairy tale invented by Plato as a criticism of Athens. Am Viper tilted his head back and barked out a laugh along with a thick cloud of smoke. That's what they want you to believe. Viper pointed at the screen. No, Atlantis is as real as me and you. It's not quite how you think it is, though. It's not a sunken city made of gold or some rubbish like that. It's an entire civilization that still exists today. Viper paused and took a drag on the cigarette. Legend has it that all the great cultures of old had an orb. There were twelve in total, scattered around the globe, he exhaled. The story goes something like this. Frustrated with the progress of humankind, the Atlanteans sent out representatives to each of the dominant cultures on the planet at that time. These representatives taught each culture how to build magnificent structures, how to use tools, and how to record their learnings in writing systems which they devised themselves. How do you otherwise explain how nothing happened for ages, and then suddenly everyone starts building pyramids and writing stuff down, all within a few hundred years? There are even ancient records of these visitors, although of course all that's denied by the mainstream historians. Viper took another drag on his cigarette. Anyway, the story says that when their work was done, these representatives left, just vanished, disappeared. Viper made a gesture like a puff of smoke vanishing. You've got to realise these people, while they look like us, their lifespans are much longer. Each representative left in his place, an orb of Atlantis. No one's sure why. Some say it's a record of all the information the Atlanteans passed on to humankind. Others say it's like a calling card, telling the holder how to reach the Atlanteans, 
should you want to. I, along with several others with their eyes wide open, believe that it's a map. Viper paused his story to cough, a great hacking cough, lasting almost a minute. Fastlane examined the orb carefully. I bet if you compare that to any world map, you'll find it's almost identical, Viper continued. I say almost because there are lots of things left out of our current world maps, but that's a different story altogether. Fastlane scowled, trying to grasp what Viper had said. Okay, he drawled. Let me get this straight. You think this civilization, the Atlanteans, live on our planet right now? Viper nodded. Is it so hard to believe? Over 60% of the planet is water, much of it still unexplored. In fact, we know more about the moon than we do our own oceans. Viper let Fastlane digest the point. Also, maps are far more political than you realize. I'll ask you one thing. Who owns the satellites? Viper rocked back in his chair as though his point had been made. Fastlane squinted. Okay, okay, so these Atlanteans live beneath the ocean, you think? Some people say that, but I don't agree. They're more in plain sight than that. We're not talking fishy people with gills and all that nonsense. You've got to remember they look like you and me. You wouldn't know one if you sat next to them on the bus. Fastlane considered the concept through narrowed eyes. <laughs> Some people say they're based beneath the permafrost in Antarctica. Some say beneath the waters of the Atlantic. Some think there are uncharted lands somewhere on the planet. Ultimately, no one knows for sure. Viper paused and pointed at the screen, until now. Fastlane sat back as the realisation brought a lightning strike. What? What do you mean? What I mean, pal, is you've got the map right there. Chapter 22 Eden rushed up to Ramirez and examined him with the light. I don't remember what happened. We... It's okay, Eden said. I can't see any physical injuries. Did you bang your head? She couldn't see any signs of impact, but sometimes these took time to manifest themselves. It was almost completely dark in the Cessna beneath the tarpaulin. The brakes of the flatbed truck squealed as they turned a corner. The Cessna shuddered to the right, pulling against its tethers. I must have, Ramirez said. We were flying. Then, then the engine. The engine cut out. The plane started bouncing around. I, I, and the next thing... Athena pressed her fingers against DeLuca's neck. She's got a pulse, Athena shouted excitedly. It's weak, but she's alive. That's great, Eden said. Ramirez tried to unclip the seatbelt. He fumbled with the mechanism, but couldn't seem to make it work. Just leave that for now, Eden said. Just stay where you are. We'll be out of this soon. Eden staggered to the front of the plane and examined the pilots for signs of life. Neither had a pulse and their skin felt cold. Both looked as though they'd lost a lot of blood. Athena informed Baxter of what they'd found and told him to inform the crew aboard the Bologna. When they'd dealt with the gang, they would be in touch for an extraction. Eden paced back toward Ramirez. She crouched down and locked eyes with the Mexican. His pupils looked dilated and he was having trouble focusing, the early signs of concussion maybe. DeLuca is diabetic. Baxter's voice cut through the comm system. Beaumont says she's always had to monitor her insulin levels. She may have slipped into a diabetic coma. It's important you check her levels ASAP. She should have all the stuff with her. Athena snatched up DeLuca's bag and found what she needed. As expected, DeLuca's blood sugars were far too high. Athena administered an insulin injection quickly. Sergio, do you know what happened to the orb? Eden asked, speaking slowly. It was there. Ramirez pointed to a space just in front of DeLuca's seat. In a case. It's not there now, Eden said. Wait, look at that. Athena crouched down and picked up a strap which had been cut through. Was this holding the orb in place? Ramirez nodded. Someone cut through that, Eden said, leaning forward and looking at the strap. The orb wasn't lost. It was taken. The truck slowed and then turned to the right. This road felt even bumpier than the last. Eden and Athena held onto the chairs for support. Let's search here just to be sure, Athena said. We don't know how long we've got. The truck slowed to a crawl. Eden turned her attention to the front of the aircraft. The Cessna bounced from one side to the other as Eden moved through the cabin. Nothing, Athena said after they completed a thorough search. It's not here. 
The truck slowed further still. The driver shifted down through the gears until the vehicle inched forward. It looks like we're out of time, Eden said. What's, what's happening, Ramirez said. Brakes squealed and the truck wobbled to a stop. The engine died. Don't move, Eden whispered. We'll come back for you when it's safe. Eden and Athena scrambled down and peered out from beneath the tarpaulin. They had pulled into a small clearing. As far as the women could see, thick forests surrounded them on all sides. Doors slammed and raised voices filled the air. We'll get this unloaded tomorrow, it'll be night soon, one man said in Spanish. Keep him tied up in the cab, we'll need him later. Eden heard what sounded like retreating footsteps. She crawled out from beneath the tarpaulin and risked a look around. As she'd expected, the forest surrounded them on all sides. A dilapidated trailer home sat at the far end of the clearing. Sheets of stained plastic covered the roof and cracked windows hinted at an equally decrepit interior. Eden watched the men stomp inside. Lights blazed. Eden and Athena stood motionless for two minutes, and then another man climbed down from the cab of the crane and wandered toward the trailer home. He'd obviously been tasked with tying up the crane operator. You stay here, Eden hissed. Get Baxter to pick us up in two minutes. What are you going to... I've got some bullies to sort out. Athena rolled her eyes and ducked back beneath the top all in. Athena knew that when Eden had something in mind, there was no point in arguing. Eden stalked up to the trailer home and carefully peered in through a cracked window. Inside, the men sat around a small table drinking beers. Someone turned on a stereo and music boomed through the trailer. Eden clocked the countless empty bottles on the table, beside what looked like packets of drugs. This was not just a one-off party. Classy setup, Eden said, noticing a stack of racy adult magazines. These men obviously thought they'd struck gold finding a downed plane just a couple of miles away. Eden thought about the chaos thugs like this caused honest people the world over. Although teaching these men a lesson wasn't their mission, she was determined to do it. Eden turned and ran across to the crane. She pulled open the passenger door and jumped inside. The crane operator cried out, his voice an incoherent mumble because of the filthy cloth the thug had tied around his face. I'm not one of them, Eden said, her Spanish slow but perfectly understandable. I'm here to get you out. Don't shout out. Eden drew the knife she kept in an unseen sheath at her ankle. She quickly cut the man's bindings and removed the gag. Gracias, gracias, the crane operator said, rubbing his wrists. Now show me how to use this thing and then you can get out of here. I need to teach these idiots a lesson. Back inside the Cessna, after arranging the extraction with Baxter, Athena checked on DeLuca's condition. Athena felt for DeLuca's pulse, weak but regular, a good sign. Athena hoped the injection had come in time to prevent irreparable damage. Hopefully, DeLuca's blood sugar levels would already be stabilizing. An engine coughed into life from somewhere beyond the tarpaulin. Standing close to DeLuca, Athena felt something in the woman's pocket. Athena slipped her fingers into the pocket and pulled out a dictaphone. It was the old analogue type with the small tape inside. It looked as though the recording had stopped when it reached the end of the tape. Athena pressed rewind. The tape spooled backwards with a mechanical whir. Then she hit play. Okay, an American female voice murmured from the small speaker. Could it have something to do with the orb we'd removed from beneath Teotihuacan? Deluca, Athena whispered. Having never spoken to Deluca, Athena didn't know for sure. Beaumont and Helios would, though. Athena slipped the dictaphone into her bag and scrambled out from the beneath the tarpaulin. At almost the same time, Eden stepped down from the crane's cab. She brushed her hands together and grinned. Forty feet above them, the trailer home hung from the crane's giant hook. Find anything? Eden asked casually. Oh yes, you're not going to believe this. Athena replied, looking from the swinging trailer to Eden. Forty feet up, one thug opened the door and shouted something down at the women. His movement caused the trailer to rock aggressively backwards and forward. The man peered down at the ground and then gripped tightly onto the doorframe. His face turned a strange shade of green. He shouted something to the others inside the trailer. At that moment, the thundering rotors of the Eurocopter thumped through the air. Eden turned around to see Baxter manoeuvre the chopper into the space beside the flatbed truck. We'd better get out of here before these idiots use us as target practice, Athena said. 
I'd like to see them try, Eden said, giving a thumbs up to the crane operator. The operator nodded and then jerked the controls. The trailer swung from side to side, knocking the occupants squealing like stuck pigs to the floor. Chapter 23 Less than ten miles away, Fastlane stared at the screen. He blinked numerous times, not really understanding the other man's words. Viper lit up another cigarette and inhaled greedily. What I mean, pal, is that you've got the map right there. Fastlane considered Viper's words for a few long seconds, then, like a tropical downpour, the realisation broke. You mean this is the map? The map to Atlantis? Fastlane said, holding up the orb. His hands shook, unable to control his excitement. He felt lightheaded, as though someone had dragged all the air from the room. You all right there, mate? Looks like you've gone terribly pale, even with that tan of yours, Viper chided. Could it really be? Is it possible? Fastlane stuttered, gazing at the orb. How do I read this? Can I read this? It's simple, Viper said. Those jagged lines represent the continental coastlines. It looks like a sort of globe, right? Fastlane peered carefully at the orb. Viper was right. Now that he looked at it in that way, he could see the curvature of the African coast worm its way up one side. To the right, another curve represented the Indian Ocean. Then you've got to look for a symbol like this. Viper scribbled on a piece of paper and then held it up to show Fastlane. The symbol he'd drawn was a circle, inside a circle, with a dot right in the middle. Fastlane scrutinised the orb, looking for the symbol. He turned it gently in his hands, now recognising the shapes of the countries and continents he knew so well. He saw the jagged line of the eastern Pacific coast. He recognised Japan, China and Korea. Then almost a third of the orb was clear until the west coast of the Americas appeared. Fastlane recognised the coasts of the United States, Mexico, and then down into South America. Of course, the orb didn't include any political boundaries, just physical coastlines. Then, turning the orb slowly, he saw something that wasn't a coastline. The circle. Within the circle. Within the circle. There it is, Fastlane bellowed. I found it. I found Atlantis. The man known as Viper Steel ended the call and sat back in his chair. He folded his arms, looked up at the ceiling, and drew hard on his cigarette. At first, he'd wondered whether he'd feel bad for telling Fastlane a bag of lies. He didn't, as it turned out. Fastlane had clearly been out there sunning himself without a thought of his old friend Viper. So why should Viper care? And the money offered was far too much to turn down. All Viper had to do was give Fastlane some information. It was all false, clearly, but Fastlane had lapped it up like a hungry dog. Viper took the cigarette from his mouth and balanced it on the edge of an overflowing ashtray. He picked up a basic cell phone, his hands slightly trembling with trepidation. As he had been instructed to do, he typed out a text message. The job was complete and now it was time to disappear. He sent the text message to the only number stored in the phone. He watched, enraptured, as the symbol of an envelope hovered on the screen for a moment, before sliding upwards and out of sight. Viper imagined the message, winging its way through the digital abyss to the man whose name he didn't even know. Message sent appeared on the screen. Viper wondered whether it was now time for him to enjoy a slice of the good life, it wasn't fair for Fastlane to be having all the fun. Viper grinned and picked up the cigarette again. Taking a drag, he looked down at the phone. All that was left for him to do was destroy the evidence. He placed the cigarette down again and wrenched the back from the basic phone. He flicked out the battery and then slid out the SIM card. He placed the card on his palm and looked down at it for a moment. This tiny piece of plastic was his only connection to the unnamed man. Viper looked over at a suitcase standing by the door. The unnamed man who had already given him £100,000 in cash. He looked again at the SIM card. It was definitely time to sever that connection, just in case the man wanted his money back. Viper stood up and fetched a pair of scissors. He cut the SIM card into a dozen tiny pieces, then paced through to the bathroom. He dropped the pieces into the toilet bowl and flushed. For a second, the fragment spun around in the water, before disappearing down the drain. Viper paced back to his computer and pulled up a ferry timetable. It was certainly time for him to get some sun. Watching Fastlane's video call, Commander Fang couldn't help but laugh out loud. 
The humorless bark echoed around the chamber with the warmth of a rusty nail scraped across a blackboard. The monkeys, relaxing on the ledges above, climbed to their feet and looked around suspiciously, eyes searching for a threat. The monkeys were clearly adamant that they wouldn't be pushed from their ancestral home in the pyramid, although they were sensibly cautious of Fang and his men after the gunshots earlier in the day. I knew he was the right pawn for this, Fang said, pointing at Fastlane on the screen. The call ended and Fastlane disappeared. Fang turned around and strode across the chamber. He lapped up every part of the story and won't be able to keep this quiet either. Sir, Fastlane has just logged back into one of his social media accounts for the first time in over a year. Fang swung around to face the speaker. Excellent. Monitor that. In fact, everyone, I want all eyes on Fastlane. We do everything we can to help him too. Give his content all the reach we can. We need as many people to find his message as possible. The technicians nodded, and the sound of rattling keyboards filled the chamber. Fang rubbed a hand across his face. It wouldn't be long before Fastlane set off on his self-appointed mission to discover Atlantis. Chapter 24 How's she doing? Winslow said as Beaumont strode into the office. The professor looked more flustered and red-faced than usual, which was saying something indeed. They're... they're not sure, Beaumont said, huffing out a deep breath. She's still in a coma. She's stable though, whatever that means. Eden crossed the room and hugged Beaumont. She felt his pain. Baxter and Athena sat behind the computer, and Ramirez sat in a chair nearby. The Mexican had been offered treatment in the infirmary, but insisted on helping recover the orb. She's in a safe place now, Richard, Winslow said, looking at his old friend. Our team here is the best in the world. I just wish I could have done more, Beaumont said. I should have been there for her. It's been over ten years, damn it. If this is... Beaumont's voice caught in his throat. It's not your fault, and this certainly isn't the time for self-doubt. We've got an orb to recover. Winslow said, striding back toward his desk. He picked up DeLuca's dictaphone and showed it to Beaumont. Athena found this in Vittoria's pocket. A ghost of a smile flashed across Beaumont's face. I can't believe she still had that thing. She's had that since before some of you kids were even born. Oh, retro. Let's have a look, Aidan said, taking the dictaphony from Winslow. What's this little thing inside with the two wheels? Winslow and Beaumont exchanged a glance. That, my dear, is a cassette tape. It works by recording sound waves onto a magnetic tape, Beaumont said, taking the bait and launching into an explanation. Eden listened for a few seconds, pleased to see the man momentarily return to usual. Brilliant stuff, Eden said, passing the dictaphone back to her father. Whatever will they think of next? Winslow looked at Beaumont. We're about to listen to it, Maybe she recorded something from the flight. You want to stay? Ramirez watched the exchange in silence. You try to stop me, Beaumont said. We're going to find out what happened. Winslow rewound the tape, clicked the play button and placed the dictaphone on the desk. What do you think caused it? DeLuca's voice came from the small speaker. That's her, Beaumont said, just to clarify. I remember that, Ramirez said. That was just before she passed out, I think. There was a lot going on. It's not quite clear. The pilot's voice followed, describing the Cessna's engine trouble. <laughs> Could it have something to do with the orb we've removed from beneath Teotihuacan? DeLuca said. Eden, Athena, Baxter, Beaumont and Winslow stood around the desk, their eyes pinned on the small device. Ramirez shifted in his chair. He looked uncomfortable sitting upright. Surviving a plane crash was quite an ordeal, Eden thought. <laughs> They listened to the recording in silence for several minutes. For a long time, no one said anything. Then the dictaphone clicked and the recording stopped. It ran out of tape, Winslow said, picking up the dictaphone. He turned to Ramirez. Do you remember what happened after that? Yeah, the pilot spent a long time looking for a place to bring the plane down. I think in the end they just ran out of time, Ramirez said. It would be difficult in a mountainous area like that, Baxter added. I can't imagine how scary that would be, Eden said, looking at Ramirez, who stared morosely at the floor. It sounds like the plane had genuine mechanical problems, Baxter said. That happens with these light aircraft. I don't buy it, 
Beaumont said, one fist grinding into the palm of his other hand. It's just too coincidental. They get the orb, and then this happens. It's too convenient. Then what caused that plane to fall out of the sky? Baxter said. Sometimes the most obvious thing turns out to be the truth, no matter how coincidental. What do you think? Eden asked Ramirez, who was silently watching the conversation. I think... I think... Well, I've never been in a Pliny crash before, Ramirez said weakly. Everything was going normally, and then the engine he just cut out. The power cut out too. The radio wouldn't work. That could be linked to an electrical failure, Baxter said. I see three options, Winslow said, holding up three fingers. One, engine trouble, as Baxter said. Two, the pilot brought the plane down on purpose. Meh. He switched the engine off in midair and faked all of that. Baxter pointed at the dictaphone. He sounded pretty worried on the recording. Ramirez shook his head, agreeing with Baxter. You're right, but it's a possibility. Or three, someone sabotaged the plane and rigged it to break at a certain time. How would they do that? Eden said. There was no explosion, the engine just stopped working. I don't see any evidence. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, Winslow said, striding toward the window and looking out at the Caribbean Sea. The Bologna had slid into these waters just a few hours ago and was now heading toward the Mexican coast. What do you mean, I don't? He means that just because you've not seen it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, Athena said, interrupting Eden. I don't think it would be that difficult to put something inside the engine that stopped it running at a certain time. Could such a device be remotely operated? Ramirez said weakly. The team swung around to face the Mexican, having almost forgotten he was present. I mean, someone could put it there and operated it from the ground. Yes, absolutely, Baxter said. Maybe something on the fuel line that, when activated, stopped fuel reaching the engine. Within a minute or two, the plane would be powerless. Did you see something that made you think that? Winslow said, crossing the room toward Ramirez. Nothing out of the ordinary, but when we arrived at the airport, there was a maintenance crew near the Cessna. I just assumed that was normal. You see things like this all the time in airports, right? Absolutely, we'll check that out, though, for sure. But that doesn't solve the more pressing mystery here, Eden said. The rest of the group turned to face her. What happened to the orb? Yes. Yes. That's right, Beaumont said, tapping his chin. Other than the pilot doing this on purpose. Which I think we can discount because he's dead, Baxter said. Everyone swung around to look at him. I've got the guy's record here. Captain Aaron Bigham had nearly 30 years in the air. If he meant to bring that plane down, he would have found somewhere to do so without him dying in the process. Yes, good point. That means no one knew where the plane was going to come down, correct? Eden said. Correct, Beaumont agreed, which means that whatever happened to the orb, it wasn't planned. Hold up, Eden raised a finger. Do you really think someone discovered the plane wreck, wandered past two dead and two unconscious people, took the orb, and then ran away, without knowing what they had? At the present time, that certainly looks like the most likely solution, yes, Beaumont said. That means we have almost nothing to go on, Eden said. It could be anywhere by now. We'll have no way to... The phone on the desk buzzed aggressively, cutting Eden off mid-sentence. Winslow marched across to it and poked the button. Helios, there's something you ought to see, came the voice of one of the Bologna's lab technicians. It's a live video feed. Put it through to the screen in my office, Winslow said. A picture appeared on the wall-mounted screen. A man with long graying hair spoke into the camera. My name is Brent Fasslane, he intoned, his eyes never leaving the camera. This guy was clearly used to speaking on screen. I speak to you today as the believers of hidden truths and seekers of ancient wisdom. As you'll know, if you've followed my work before, it has always been my duty to throw light into the darkness and uncover the truth. Now, after too much silence, I am ready to do this again. Who is this dude? Eden said, looking at her father. We will work that out soon, Winslow said, not looking away from the screen. For centuries, there has been one mystery that's fascinated humankind more than any others. The search for Atlantis. Fastlane left a moment for his words to sink in. That's right. For centuries, Atlantis has remained a tantalizing mystery. But now, my fellow truth seekers, I have a clue that might just lead us there. I present to you the Orb of Atlantis. 
Fastlane lifted his right hand. The orb sat in his palm, glinting mysteriously. A unified gasp echoed around Winslow's office. Join me, live on this channel, as my team and I decode and follow this ancient map. But let me be clear, my friends. This is not mere speculation or the musings of a wandering mind. The markings on this orb are unmistakable. We stand on the precipice of unveiling the greatest secret of our time, the existence and wisdom of Atlantis. The journey that lies before us will not be easy, for the guardians of conventional knowledge will cast doubts upon our findings and label us as mere conspiracy theorists. But we are united by a burning passion to unearth the truth, to pierce the veil of deception and embrace the wisdom of the ancients. Subscribe, follow and share this video. Fastlane reached off the screen and the camera faded into black. This video has ended appeared on the screen. The occupants of Winslow's office stared at each other in silent shock. Chapter 25 San Pedro, Belize Brent Fastlane stood on the quay looking down at the seaplane bobbing in the swell. Even with the gentle waves, the plane shuddered up and down, grunting and thumping with the movement. The busy waterfront area in the heart of San Pedro town, on the island of Ambergris Cay, bustled around him. A bright blue and yellow water taxi pushed off from further along the quay. The engine growled, sending a burst of exhaust fumes high into the clear morning air. Around here, boats were as ubiquitous as cars, connecting the island with the rest of the country. A vendor selling cold water from an ice bucket bustled past. Fastlane grabbed a bottle and forced a note into the man's outstretched hand. He took a deep sip of the cool liquid, but it didn't seem to help. He took another swig and glanced behind him at the cameraman he'd hired to document every moment of their trip. Fortunately, the young man was too busy recording what he called establishing shots on the other side of the quay to capture Fastlane's anxiety. You want this on the plane, sir? said Fastlane's local fixer, Roberto. The big man lumbered up the quay carrying the flight case which contained the orb. He moved as though the case weighed nothing. Yes, careful, Fastlane snapped. He took another sip of the water. The large Belizean placed the case inside the plane with a delicacy which belied his size and then took a seat ready for takeoff. Fastlane had hired Roberto to help them navigate the island once they arrived. Local knowledge was not to be underestimated. Fastlane's sensation of dread had grown as they made the journey from San Pedro's small airport. As they arrived at the quay, Fastlane realised why he felt this way. He was about to get on a plane very similar to the one he'd watched slam into the side of a mountain just days ago. In his imagination, he could still hear the splintering wood, twisting metal and shattering glass. He looked down at the small craft before him, tethered to a cleat like an animal in the circus. Fastlane pulled out a handkerchief and mopped his brow. The cloth came away sopping wet. Fueling's done, the pilot said, climbing out of the cockpit and removing the fuel hose from the fuselage. Ready to go when you are. A boat arrived on the other side of the quay. Tourists and locals returning home scrambled up and wandered toward the shore. Fastlane glanced down at the pilot's white shirt. For a moment he imagined the bloodstains he'd seen on the chests and faces of the pilots in the fallen plain. Finding the shirt clear of all marks and the pilot grinning, Fastlane shook his head. Fastlane pointed anxiously down at the craft. Are you sure this'll make it on a day like this? Fastlane looked up at the clear blue sky. There wasn't a cloud in sight. The weather changes quickly around here, I've heard. Hurricane season isn't far off. The pilot placed his hands on his hips and rocked backwards onto his heels. He looked down his nose at Fastlane as though examining a specimen in a laboratory. Ah, uh, nervous flyer, I see. The man tapped the craft's wing. This is a Havilland Canada DHC-2 Beaver, the safest machine in the skies. You'll be golden. She's been through more storms than I care to remember. The pilot swung open the Beaver's cabin door and climbed inside. Noticing the cameraman filming them, Faslane stood up a little straighter and tried to act tough. He didn't feel it. The funny thing was he'd never experienced a fear of flying before. There was just something about this expedition that made him feel uneasy. But he had a job to do. This was his opportunity to leap back into the public eye, and he wasn't going to waste it. Are we all set up? Fastlane called over to the cameraman. 
Yes, sir. I've mounted a camera on the nose and one on the left wing. We'll also film from inside. Would you like to start the broadcast now? Absolutely, Fastlane yelled more confidently than he felt. Let's do that now. With the help of the camera operator, Fastlane planned to broadcast the discovery both live and capture enough footage to make a feature-length documentary afterwards. He imagined the TV networks fighting for broadcasting rights. The camera operator climbed into the plane and opened a laptop. He tapped at the keys vigorously for a few seconds. Ready when you are, going live in five and four... The man counted the final three seconds silently on his fingers. Fastlane took a deep breath and then stared into the lens. A mystery that has evaded discovery for thousands of years. Atlantis is one of our world's greatest legends. Fastlane spoke slowly, his voice not even hinting at the fear which twisted in his gut. Right now, he just wanted to get this flight over with. That is, until now. I'm Brent Fastlane. You are joining me in my live search for Atlantis. Fastlane pointed at the operator, who overlaid a picture of the orb onto the video feed. As you know, I came into possession of one of the orbs of Atlantis just a day ago. Now, before we can be shut down by the powers that be, my team and I are heading out to uncover the legend of the sunken city. Camera still rolling, Fastlane clambered inside the aircraft. He turned to face the camera. This is a mission that no one in the modern era has completed. We will attempt to keep the live stream running for as long as it takes. We are travelling to uncharted territories, however, so who knows what we might find. Share this feed with your friends and family. The most important discovery of humankind is about to be made. Fastlane turned to the pilot, who was doing his best to look busy checking the plane's many dials. When you're ready, Captain, Fastlane said, much more boldly than he felt. The operator tapped a few keys on a laptop. Nose camera is live, he said. The pilot leaned out of the cockpit door and untied the plane from the key. Then, back in his seat, he flicked several switches on the console and the seaplane roared into life. The propeller thronged, whipping the azure water into a foam. Fastlane grimaced and gripped onto the armrests. The pilot pushed forward on the throttle and the engine noise grew. The seaplane broke from the jetty and slid out across the bay's calm waters. Picking up speed, the seaplane's bobbing became a shudder. Now rather than sliding through the water, they bounced across it, sending great plumes of spray out behind the craft. Just past 50,000 viewers across all platforms, the operator said, shouting to get himself heard over the roaring engines. Fastlane replied with a thumbs up. He closed his eyes and tensed his muscles. A moment later, as though a switch had been flicked, the shuddering all but stopped. Fastlane inhaled sharply, at first unsure what was going on. He opened one eye and then the other. Everything inside the plane seemed normal. Fastlane peered out through the window beside him. The water flashed past several feet below. The pilot adjusted the controls and the plane's altitude increased. 70,000 viewers, the operator said. Fastlane felt the tightness in his stomach relax and a thrill of excitement moved through him. They were going to discover Atlantis and the world was watching. Fastlane would, once again, be rich, but more importantly, famous. That's the island, dead ahead, the pilot said almost an hour later, pointing through the windshield. Against the shimmering blue water, a forest-covered island appeared. A wave of excitement moved through the plane. Fastlane leaned forward to get a better view. The camera operator angled the camera at the island. Roberto, the large Belizean, sat nonchalantly in the back. Only a mile in length, the island looked to be little more than a rocky outcrop surrounded by beaches. Thick forests studded with rocky crags covered most of the island's interior. As they neared the island, the pilot swung the seaplane into a curve, giving the camera operator an undisturbed view through the plane's side windows. We'll do a circuit and then find a place to set her down, the pilot said. Faslin gazed out at the crystal clear water shimmering in the sunlight and the lush greenery of the island. Excitement pulsed through him now, all worry gone. The camera operator turned toward Fastlane. The camera's red light blinked, indicating that it was recording. We're just arriving at the island indicated on the orb, Fastlane said, looking into the camera. He turned and pointed down at the island as they approached. Although this island is mapped, it's long been thought of as uninhabited, something of a wild and untouched paradise. It's strange to think that for centuries it's been lying here in plain sight, 
and possibly containing history's greatest secret. The camera panned around and focused on the island as the plane continued its circuit. The forest-covered island looked pristine and untouched. That beach looks like our best option, the pilot said. A broad, sandy beach covered one whole side of the island. Palm trees curved over crystal-white sand. The pilot's hands moved swiftly and precisely over the controls, making minor adjustments to the pitch, throttle and flaps. Fastlane indicated the cameraman should record their landing. For once, he had nothing to say. As the plane neared the water, the pilot pulled back on the throttle, allowing the aircraft to glide gracefully over the surface. As the plane came to a stop, the pilot deployed the water rudder to keep the seaplane pointed in the right direction, and then cut the engine to bring the aircraft to a complete halt a few feet from the beach. That's as close as we're going to get, the pilot said, turning around to face Fastlane. The pilot swung open the door, and a sudden wave of heat barreled in. About two feet of water. You'll have to wade in. No problem, Fastlane said, slipping a backpack on and opening the rear door. I've got a sat phone. I'll call you when we're done. Roger that, the pilot said. I hope you find what you're looking for. Roberto took off his boots, tied them to his bag, and then slipped down into the water. Carrying a pack far larger than Fastlane and the camera operator, he made it look easy. Fastlane went next, and the cameraman last documenting the entire process. The water was just below waist height, allowing the men to wade to the shore. Once on the beach, they put their boots back on, and then headed for the forest. The camera operator turned the camera toward Fastlane, who gave an update. We now need to head into the island's interior and see what's waiting for us. He pointed toward the dense jungle. Stay tuned as we discover Atlantis. Chapter 26 Sir, we've got intruders on the island. They arrived via a seaplane and have just come ashore on the island's western side. Understood, Fang said into the radio. With troops stationed around the island, no one could approach without his knowledge. Get me a visual. Fang instructed a technician to play the video feed on the large screen. Fang stepped up to the screen, his face split into a wide grin. Fastlane stood on the beach, talking into a camera. It appeared he had brought a camera operator and another man along for support. Stay out of sight for now, Fang said. We'll let them discover the pyramid and then we'll move in. Understood, came the reply from the radio. Fang put the radio down and stared up at the screen, watching Fastlane turn and walk purposefully toward the jungle. Together, Fastlane and the camera operator strode up the beach and into the shade of the overhanging trees. They picked their way through the palm trees, which offered some protection from the strong morning sun. Fastlane went first, giving the camera operator the chance to film him scrambling over rocks and through the dense trees. He could already see the footage showing him like a modern-day Hiram Bingham, finding lost civilizations amid the jungle. The camera operator paused and adjusted the camera settings. Fastlane pushed on through the branches. The Belizean guide remained a few paces behind. After another fifty feet, the foliage increased to a dense jungle. Fastlane went first, pushing aside branches and tangled vines. The air was thick with humidity. The sounds of buzzing insects, chirping birds and rustling leaves surrounded them on all sides. As the density of the undergrowth increased, Fastlane slowed and let Roberto take the lead. The strong Belizean pushed through the bushes with ease, seemingly impervious to their scratching. The terrain toward the centre of the island has got more difficult, Fastlane said, turning toward the camera. It's clear this part of the island hasn't been visited by humans for some time. Fastlane scurried behind Roberto, struggling to keep up. Roberto led them deeper into the jungle. The tree's canopy above them was so thick now that the camera operator snapped on a light mounted on top of the camera. Fastlane watched a pair of monkeys wander across a branch six feet above him. The monkeys paused and peered down at Fastlane with contempt in their eyes. A monkey cord, a high-pitched, fast-paced screeching noise. Five, six, ten more monkeys appeared on the branches around, staring menacingly down at the intruders. The camera operator focused up on the animals, then shouted in surprise as the primates took a liking to the large, fluffy microphone mounted on the side of the camera. In one swift movement, the creatures swung down from a nearby tree and yanked the microphone away. The offending monkeys swung off through the trees, chirping cheerfully. In less than a second, the creatures had disappeared from view. The little... Come on? 
Roberto said, appearing back through the bushes. I think we're almost at the summit. At the sight of the muscular Belizean, the monkeys scampered away. Their cawing chants echoed away through the trees long after they were out of sight. As you can see, the wildlife and the jungle here are reluctant to give up their secrets. Fastlane spoke into the camera, always keen to sensationalise a dramatic situation. We're facing all sorts of unknown dangers to bring you the truth today. With the terrain becoming increasingly challenging, the small group climbed in silence for the next few minutes. They picked their way slowly up the steep incline, scrambling over rocky outcrops with the help of trees and vines. Roberto paused at the base of a particularly steep section and pulled a climbing rope from his bag. The large man scaled the rocks with the ease of climbing a staircase and then threw the rope down for Fastlane and the camera operator to use. After almost an hour of cutting through the dense jungle, they emerged into an area of less dense forest. Light cut through the trees in angular beams, insects zipping through the light like shooting stars. Fastlane paused and rubbed his eyes. Colours danced across his vision as they emerged from the shade and into the light. When his eyes finally focused, Fastlane gasped in shock. Initially, he'd thought what was in front of them was just another rock outcrop covered in vines and bushes. Now, with his eyes adjusted, he saw it was something else entirely. A stone pyramid rose from the forest floor. With a base of about 40 feet, the structure was not as large as those elsewhere in the Americas. But as far as Fastlane knew, this one was so far undiscovered. He glanced at the camera operator. The man swung the camera around so that Fastlane could speak directly to the viewers. We've cut through the jungle for a mile or so, and look what we've found. Fastlane made a flourish up toward the pyramid like a magician revealing their trick. This pyramid, as far as I know, has not been seen by human eyes for thousands of years. Chapter 27 Aboard the Bologna, the team watched, their faces tense as Fastlane spoke to the camera while pushing through the forest. Broadcasting the whole expedition live in full high-definition quality, Fastlane really had spared no expense at making this the biggest spectacle possible. He's got over a million people watching live, Baxter said, glancing up from the computer. It's all over social media. People are sharing and reposting the feed. It's only a matter of time before the major news networks pick up the story too. Winslow reduced the volume as the camera followed Fastlane up toward the jungle. The team aboard the Bologna stood silent for several seconds. I've got a bad feeling about this, Eden said when the silence had long passed its breaking point. Yes, me too, Beaumont scoffed, tightly folding his arms. A buffoon like that, just wandering into an important archaeological find. There's no knowing what damage he'll do. There should be a proper team in there. They need to catalogue everything as... Absolutely agree, Ramirez said bitterly. This was supposed to be our find. You're right, but that's not what I meant, Eden interjected. I mean, this has all just come far too easy for him. It's too much of a coincidence. How did he say the orb came to be in his possession? During his first live video, he said that a contact passed it on to him, Baxter said. He didn't say anything else. Suspicious, Athena added. Yeah, he must know that people will ask that question, Eden said. I suppose he's hoping that whatever he finds is so amazing that how he got the orb is forgotten about. Thief, Ramirez interjected. Hold on a moment. Winslow turned and addressed Ramirez, who sat in a chair a few feet away. The professor still didn't look well after his ordeal, although was still refusing to rest. Professor, who knew that you'd removed the orb from the dig site at Teotihuacan? Ramirez thought for a long moment. Only myself, DeLuca, and a very small number of trusted colleagues. We wanted to run thorough analysis before we shared what we'd found. It wasn't public knowledge then, Winslow reiterated. Ramirez shook his head. Absolutely not. Then Fastlane wouldn't know that's where the orb came from, Eden said. A thought hovered nebulously at the edge of her consciousness. She tried to grasp at it, but it dissolved before she could drag it into the light. We need to go back to the beginning, Winslow said. We need to work through it all again. Eden rolled her eyes. Although she respected her dad's systematic approach to things, it was never the quickest one. 
She flushed red when she noticed her father looking at her, having seen the gesture. Sure, absolutely, Eden nodded, pretending to be keen. What do we know about this Fastlane character? Winslow said, pointing at the screen. On the live feed, Fastlane was now pushing his way through the jungle. Baxter reduced the live feed to occupy half the screen and loaded the Council of Selene's no-holds-barred search engine. His fingers flashed across the keys as he set a search running. He's a high-profile conspiracy theorist, Baxter said, reading the results. He was working out of New York for nearly two decades. Working? Beaumont scoffed. The guy's a joke. He's the sort of person who shouts over respected journalists in interviews and then smashes up the TV studio. Nice fella, Eden quipped. He claims to be an expert, yet is not affiliated with any university, Beaumont said. He's had several best-selling books, Baxter continued, reading the online profile. The most recent was the most successful. Titled A New World Order, it sold several million copies and was translated into multiple languages. I remember that, Athena pointed at the screen. I got a copy, but after the first chapter, I couldn't read any more. He was just pulling all these so-called facts out of his, uh... Not like a well-researched archaeological thriller, then, Eden jibed. Absolutely not. I love those books. I sent a New World Order straight back for a full refund. All right, back to this, Winslow said, pointing at the screen. That book was released, what, two years ago? Why has he been so quiet since then? Baxter scrolled down the page. Well, he'd set up a publicity stunt to rocket the book up the charts. He essentially faked his own kidnap out in Istanbul, Turkey. It stumped the police for some time, but fortunately, a pair of private detectives solved the case. A picture of the two detectives appeared on the screen. Eden felt a chime of recognition move through her, as though she'd seen one of them, a woman about her own age, before. She was about to say something when Baxter continued. They found him holed up in an office complex and worked out that the stunt had been funded by a defence contractor trying to persuade the Turkish government to buy their new systems. Does this guy have any morals? Eden said, folding her arms. She was taking a real disliking to this fast lane character. Clearly not. In the end, he made a deal with the detectives. He came clean about what he'd done and disappeared, never to cause trouble again. Until now. Athena boomed in a voice like that from a movie trailer. What about personally? Winslow said. Let's try and get to know the real Brent Fastlane. Baxter tapped at the keyboard a few more times. He's been married twice. Both times it ended in a messy divorce after he was caught doing things he shouldn't. It seems his dishonesty isn't just limited to his professional life, Eden said, reading a few of the headlines that flashed up on the screen. An all-round bad egg, Beaumont scoffed, with more seriousness than the phrase commanded. There's nothing on him for the last two years, Winslow said. Baxter shook his head. It seemed he kept himself out of trouble for a while. Until now, Athena said again, even more animated than before. How does he fund all of this? Eden asked, pointing at the screen. He's chartered private planes, hired the camera guy and a local guide. That can't be cheap. Even though the last book got him into loads of trouble, it made millions, and people are still buying it, Baxter said, summarising information from the screen. He's just living on the royalties, Eden said. It appears he has some investments too, and a cash sum in an account in the Caymans, Baxter said. He's not hard up, put it that way. Silence descended as the group watched Fastlane scramble through the forest. Then, after two years of nothing, that orb just fell into his lap, Eden said thoughtfully. The idea shimmered into focus again in Eden's mind. This time, she made an imaginary grab of it before it could fade away again. Wait a minute, Eden shouted, as much at the idea as at the surrounding people. Everyone turned to face Eden. It's like the liar and the truth teller, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? The team shook their heads. Winslow glanced at his watch. She gets like this sometimes, Athena uttered to Ramirez. Sometimes it makes sense later. Sometimes it never makes sense. The liar and the truth teller is a logic puzzle. There are two doors. One leads to certain death. The other leads to freedom. There's a guard stationed in front of each door. One guard will always tell you the truth, the other will always lie. You can ask one question to one of the guards in order to figure out which door is which. Easy, Athena said. Which door leads to certain death? Then I'd take the other one. But if you ask that to the guy who's lying, then you'd be taking the door to certain death. 
No, wait, Baxter said. I'd ask which door doesn't lead to certain death. Same issue. Eden, Winslow said sternly. What's the point here? You need to understand the nature of the guards. One lies and one tells the truth. That's the only consistent in the whole puzzle. Right, Winslow said tersely. Same with Fastlane. There's one thing you can trust a guy like Fastlane to do. I wouldn't trust him with anything, Athena jibed. Yes, that's exactly it. Eden pointed at Athena. You can rely on him not to be trustworthy. If you look at his life, that's the one constant. Whatever he does, he tries to cheat and steal and sneak his way through it. What a nasty piece of work, Beaumont scoffed, shaking his head. Exactly, Eden said, folding her arms proudly. She received blank stares from the rest of the team. Someone's setting him up. There's someone working behind the scenes, pulling the strings. Winslow pointed at his daughter. That's exactly right. That's why this feels as though it doesn't fit. He pointed at Faslane on the screen. There's one thing you can rely on a person like Brent Faslane to do, and that's do exactly what he did in the past, Winslow said. I've got it, Beaumont shouted excitedly. Everyone turned to look at the professor, confused. What would the other guard say? Beaumont shouted excitedly. That's what I'd ask the guards. Then I'd take the other door. That's the only way both the liar and the truth teller would say the same thing. Absolutely right, Eden said, smiling. Gold star for... Hold on, something's happening, Baxter said, enlarging Fastlane's live stream to fill the screen. Winslow turned up the volume. The camera pushed past a bush. Thick dew-covered leaves swung past the lens. Fastlane stepped out into a clearing. Light cut through the canopy, dappling the ground with golden circles, like spotlights on a stage. Fastlane walked forward slowly, his head bent backwards, looking up at something. The cameraman adjusted the light settings and then focused in on what Fastlane was looking at. The team aboard the Bologna took a united intake of breath as they saw what Fastlane had found. There, in the centre of the island, buried beneath the jungle canopy, stood a so far undiscovered pyramid. Fastlane turned to the camera and addressed the viewers. We've cut through the jungle for a mile or so, and look what we've found. He spoke with a soft voice now, as though standing in a place of worship. How, what, this can't be, Beaumont scoffed. This pyramid, Fastlane continued, as far as I know, has never been... Then, as though someone had cut the cable with a knife, the screen went black. Mr. Fastlane, the camera operator cut in, there's a problem. Fastlane stopped speaking and scowled. The camera's just cut out, I've no idea why, it had almost a full battery. The camera operator pulled the viewfinder from his eye and pressed a few buttons. Fastlane scowled. Of all the moments to have a technical failure, this was probably the worst. A moment later, Fastlane heard another voice coming from the trees. At first he thought it was Roberto, as he'd seen the Belizean walk off that way, but it just didn't sound right. The voice had an accent Fastlane didn't recognise. The voice came again and Fastlane realised the owner was speaking in a language he didn't recognise. Fastlane glanced around, confused. His muscles tensed. At first, Fastlane felt no fear for his safety, just frustration that someone else had found this place before him. He spun around and gazed off into the shadows. The cameraman, still absorbed replacing the camera's battery, didn't even look up. Fastlane noticed something move in the shadows at the far side of the pyramid. Roberto, is that you? Fastlane said, his voice little more than a croak. Yes, boss, came Roberto's deep reply. Fastlane saw the Belizean shuffle forward, his hands raised. Roberto took a few steps forward. Fastlane saw several men stride out of the gloom behind him. Each of the men held an assault rifle, and all appeared to be Chinese. It took Fastlane a moment to understand what was happening. A bolt of fear passed through him. Fastlane instinctively raised his hands. We're not here to... A gunshot sounded through the forest startling a flock of tropical birds into flight. In the dense and secluded forest, the noise sounded incongruous. Roberto folded forward like a jack returning to his box. The big man thumped to the ground, blood already spilling into the earth. Fastlane tried to speak, but no words came out. Six men strode out of the gloom, their guns pointed at Fastlane and the camera operator. The camera operator finally looked up from what he was doing. He shuffled backwards and almost tripped over a rock. Even in the dense heat of the Caribbean forest, Fastlane felt a frisson of fear run up his spine. 
the leading man squeezed the trigger. The gun howled, sending several rounds through the camera operator's chest. The man gurgled and then thumped to the ground. The camera shattered, metal and plastic skittering across ancient stones. The men surrounded Fastlane. The leader spoke to the rest of his team. Fastlane had no idea what they said. They didn't translate. Then something smashed into the back of Fastlane's neck. The world descended into darkness. Chapter 28 The first sensation Fastlane felt was a dull throbbing pain in his head. He opened his eyes slowly. Colours and shapes moved around, but made no sense right now. He blinked a few times, trying to clear his vision. Gradually, the surrounding room strained into focus. Ah, oh, Mr. Fastlane, welcome back to the land of the living. Hearing the Chinese-accented voice, Fastlane turned his head in an attempt to see the speaker. The movement sent a wave of nausea through his body. Don't move, the man said. As you'll soon realise, you've been tied to a chair. Mac Fastlane looked down, moving his eyes but keeping his head as still as possible, and saw that his hands were lashed to the armrests of a chair. He tried tentatively to move his feet, only to realise they were bound too. You've also had a nasty bash to the head. It may cause a concussion. Don't worry, though. I have a good medical team on standby, should you need them. Where am I? Fastlane said. His surroundings pulled gently into focus. He was in some kind of command centre. He could see several men working at computer terminals and large screens showing video feeds and scrolling numbers. Then Fastlane noticed the room itself. Rock walls surrounded him on all sides and great stone pillars held up the ceiling. It certainly wasn't a modern building. A man stepped into Fastlane's eyeline. He, like all the men Fastlane had seen so far, was Chinese. He wore a military uniform, although it was a different colour from the others. Allow me to introduce myself, the man said, placing a hand on his chest. My name is Commander Fang, and I owe you many thanks. You have played a big role in our plan, and I'm very pleased. Fastlane squinted up at the man. I don't, I don't understand. No, I don't suppose you do, Fang said, looking pleased with himself. Fang swung his arms wide. Welcome to Atlantis. Fang laughed. It sounded as though he found himself genuinely exciting. This is Atlantis, but, but... No, you idiot, of course it's not, Fang snapped, all humour gone. Atlantis is a myth, an invention of fiction, designed to keep people like you looking for power in the wrong place. Then what is this place? Fastlane said. He was becoming more aware now. The throbbing in his head had developed into an all-out pounding. This is my command centre. Mission control, if you like. Mr Fastlane, you have been part of something much bigger than you could ever know. Fang put his hands on his hips and leaned forward. What? I don't understand. Fastlane's consciousness felt so fragile that he couldn't even be sure that what he was seeing was real. You have been manipulated, Mr Fastlane. You are here because I wanted you to come here. Didn't you question why your car was behaving like that? Fastlane's eyes eventually focused on the man. That was you, you were controlling my car. That's right, Fang said, standing with the pride of an athlete on the podium. Fastlane thought back to the car driving itself. It felt like such a long time ago now. How did you do that? He said. It was as if the thing was possessed. Fang roared with dry laughter. Yes, I suppose it was. That's exactly what it was. We took over your vehicle from this command centre and drove you to where we needed you. But I don't... Mr Fastlane. You see, the government of the People's Republic of China knows everything. This may be hard for you as an American to understand, what with your transient governments of just a few years, but our government is the country. They own and control everything. They make everything. As such, if you buy something made in China, it's controlled and supervised closely by our government. But my car? Fastlane's disorientated mind struggled with the link. How? Microchips, Mr. Fastlane. We've been producing the world's microprocessors for decades now. There's hardly a machine on the planet that didn't start life in a Chinese factory. And of course, we've been preparing for something like this for just as long. Wait, what? Fastlane sat back as he realised the scale of what Fang was saying. That's right, we can bring airliners out of the sky, control military vehicles, turn cars against their owners, all from right here. Fang swung a hand backwards, indicating the bank of computers and technicians working silently. But wait, why do you need me? 
Fastlane wailed. Ah, you are to play a very crucial role in this, Mr. Fastlane. A role you've already taken on yourself so beautifully. Fastlane shrugged but got halfway through the gesture and gave up because it hurt too much. I occasionally think how quickly our differences would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world, Fang said, standing up straight. Do you know who said that, Mr. Fastlane? Fastlane shook his head and then wished he hadn't. That was your president, Mr. Ronald Reagan. He said that in 1987. What do you think about that? Fastlane tried to formulate an answer, but his lips and tongue didn't seem to work. I'll tell you, Fang continued, unabated. At the moment, we are a divided world, but soon we will be united. We will be united in our quest for survival. Who shall be there to help win the coming war? Fang held open his arms like a showman. The People's Republic of China, of course. A war against who? Fastlane said. Fang pointed at Fastlane. I see you're waking up. Good question. Do you know what a false flag is, Mr. Fastlane? Fastlane nodded once. During his career, he had accused several governments around the world of falsifying a conflict to spread fear amongst their citizens. In Fastlane's opinion, these so-called false flag operations were more common than real conflict on the world stage. This is the ultimate false flag operation. The entire human race united against one enemy, Fang said, his voice booming. But who is the enemy? Fastlane said, still not connecting the dots. A super race of beings far more developed both technologically and physically than us mere humans, Fang said. A race capable, should they want to, of causing great destruction to our civilization. A race that could only be defeated if we work together. Suddenly Fang's words made sense to Fastlane. The plan was so far out there, it almost made sense. The people of Atlantis, Fastlane hissed. You plan to attack the human race and blame it on the Atlanteans, then ride in like heroes at the last minute and clear the whole thing up. Fastlane's mouth hung open in astonishment. We won't ride in like heroes, Fang said. We will be heroes, the saviors of the modern world, and you will be forever grateful. Fastlane thought about it for a few seconds, although in his aching brain it felt like a lot longer. How? Fastlane asked, his mental clarity improving with each moment. How do you plan to attack civilization? Fang rubbed his face with one hand and pointed at Fastlane with the other. That is a question we thought about long and hard. Of course, with our control over your technology, we really could do anything we desired. Turn your missiles against you, destroy your cities, break down your transport networks. But we decided we didn't want to unnecessarily cause death when we could do this peacefully. Fastlane leaned slightly forward in the chair, hanging on Fang's every word. We plan to use our technology to replicate the destructive force of an electromagnetic pulse. First, we are going to disable every electrical device within about 100 miles of Mexico City. A couple of days later, we will target Guadalajara. Moving north, we will hit every major city until we reach the border of the United States. Of course, the authorities will look for us in the normal ways. They'll block roads, cut off air links, shipping. The closer we get to the US, the more desperate your country will become. They won't realize that the very technology they rely on, the chips in their phones, laptops and cars, are the things that are holding them back. Fastlane imagined it. Large cities going dark, hospitals without power, shops without supplies, no transport. My superiors believe the US will ask for our help long before we reach their soil. I'm not so sure. Fang peered menacingly down at Fastlane. You are a stubborn and proud nation. It's time to bring that to an end. Blaming it on the Atlanteans, though, Fastlane said. Isn't that a bit far out? Governments will blame some known terrorist group or another government. A smile now lighted Fang's face. That, Mr. Fastlane, is where you come in. Fang shouted across the room in Chinese. Two technicians climbed from their desks and crossed the chamber. They set up a camera and a tripod in front of Fastlane. You are going to record a brief message for us, and you are going to be persuasive. I absolutely will not. Fastlane clenched his jaw. Fang spoke in Chinese again, and two soldiers strode calmly across the room and pointed their rifles at Fastlane. Mr. Fastlane, we both know that everything you've done in your life has been in self-interest. Let us not even waste time pretending that you're some kind of hero or, even more amusing, a patriot. The technician swung the camera around to face Fastlane. A small red light flashed above the lens, indicating that the camera was recording. Recording this video is your only chance to survive this. Here's the deal. 
You are going to tell the world exactly what I want you to. Then you'll get to sit out the conflict here in the luxurious surroundings of our island. And maybe, when it's all over, you'll get to return to what's left of civilization. Fastlane swallowed, looked from the rifles to Fang, then nodded once. Chapter 29 The team stared at the blank screen for a few seconds, expecting the image to reappear. When it didn't, Eden turned to Baxter. What just happened? No idea, the feed just cut out. It's as though it totally dropped off. You mean Fastlane didn't intend that to happen? Eden said. Baxter shook his head. It doesn't look that way. It just cut out, as though the technology died. That's weird, Athena said. It looked as though Fastlane had hired a proper crew with professional gear. Despite the warm breeze drifting through the Bologna's open doors, a chill moved up Eden's spine. Something here was off, and she didn't like it. She glanced around the office. Winslow, Beaumont, Athena and herself stood around while Baxter stared at the computer screen. Ramirez sat in a chair off to one side, watching on eagerly. Damn it, Baxter said, thumping the table in an unusual show of emotion. Now there'll be no way to trace the feed either. Let me have a go, Eden said, pacing across to the desk. Shift. She gestured for Baxter to move out of the seat. Baxter agreed, reluctantly vacating the seat. Beaumont looked from the darkened screen to Eden now sitting at the desk. I'm going to check on Vittoria, he said. Won't be long. Winslow placed a hand on his friend's shoulder and squeezed gently. Although they were all worried about DeLuca, it was particularly difficult for Beaumont. Eden glowered at the screen. I used to run programs like this when I worked out of my truck. Obviously it was important that people didn't know where I was. Baxter peered over Eden's shoulder. You never told us what you did back then, Athena said. Although I have a pretty good idea. Call it lost property. Eden said, her fingers hammering on the keys. I used to find and return important things. She navigated to the streaming website and then tried to access the back end. A dialog box appeared on the screen. Ah, the classic firewall. Eden ran a search, looking for system vulnerabilities. Gotcha, Eden said, discovering a loophole in the firewall's code. She tapped a few keys and passed through to the next level of security. Very impressive. Baxter said, his eyebrows raised. Eden scrutinized the screen, which was now just lines of code on a black background. Although to most people, the code would mean nothing. To Eden, it was the lifeblood of all computer applications. She traced a line of code with her finger and frowned. There was something wrong here. The system is using some kind of encryption. I can't make sense of it. Look at this, it's all scrambled. Baxter peered in over Eden's shoulder and nodded, although it made no sense to him. Eden loaded the decryption tool she'd used many times in the past. The process felt slow and painstaking, but eventually she got through. She hit enter and the code refreshed in the familiar patterns Eden understood. Baxter stood behind her, his mouth open in amazement. Almost there, Eden said, although this is the tricky bit. And that last bit was easy, Athena said. <laughs> it's the streaming service. They've got a multi-factor authentication system. You need a code from a physical token in addition to a password. I'm going to need to bypass it. You can do that? Baxter asked. I hope so, Eden said without missing a keystroke. Eden quickly created a fake login page that mimicked the streaming site's design. She then sent a phishing email to the website's customer services department, asking them to enter their code into the fake page. We've cast our line, Eden said. Let's hope they bite. I hate those emails, Athena whined. They're so sneaky trying to catch people out like that. For almost five minutes, the team watched the screen closely. A dialogue box appeared. They've opened the email, Eden said. Let's hope they've clicked the link. Eden and the team watched closely, not quite believing what they were seeing. The customer services agent navigated through the page and carelessly entered their username and password. Eden imagined their frustration at the intrusion made them less careful than normal. We're in, Eden shouted. Behind her, Baxter gasped. Now we just need to trace the feed. Eden scrolled through the code. An image of the globe appeared on the screen. A dot appeared over Northern Europe. It looks like they're in Riga, Latvia. Then, before their eyes, the dot faded and reappeared somewhere else. 
No, wait, they're in Cape Town, South Africa. A moment later, the dot moved again. Then it bounced once more to the other side of the world. Damn it, Eden shouted, thumping the table just as Baxter had. What's happening? Winslow asked. Whoever is broadcasting this code is bouncing it through servers all around the globe. You can get through that though, right? Athena asked. Possibly, but it'll take hours. Eden hammered at the keyboard again, loading another program. Forget that, Eden said. They're using Sigma-grade encryption. It'll take weeks. Eden slumped forward in the chair. Wait, look, Athena said, pointing at the screen. She wasn't looking at the map of the globe, which was now spinning from place to place so fast that the whole thing was a blur. Athena was pointing at the live feed which had come to life again. Winslow fumbled with the remote and turned up the volume. Eden maximized the video. <laughs> Blurred shadows moved across the screen for several seconds. The camera focused, and Brent Fastlane came into view. The team stood and watched. Even Ramirez straightened up in his seat. Fastlane sat in a gloomy room with a bare rock wall behind him. His face was smeared with dirt. I'm Brent Fastlane, and I have some news to tell you. I have discovered Atlantis, but far from the lost city legend had suggested, what I've found is a hostile civilization. They've taken me prisoner, but fortunately didn't remove my satellite phone. How the signal works here, I've no idea. But listen, listen closely. I have little time. Chapter 30 Hi, Vittoria, Beaumont said, letting himself into the room and shutting the door behind him. It's me, Richard. Beaumont looked at Vittoria lying on the bed in the Bologna's infirmary. Golden sunlight streamed through the window and beyond the glass, the water shimmered dreamily. The colours outside seemed painfully at odds with the clinical contents of the room. Other than the steady beeping of a medical monitor and the hum of the air conditioning, the room was silent. Beaumont took a step further into the room and stared down at Vittoria. A multitude of wires and tubes ran from her to the various machines, which administered medication and monitored her vitals. In his mind's eye, he pictured her as the woman who could stare down the barrel of a gun without a second thought. The image of her in the bed somehow didn't feel real. Vittoria De Luca was not this frail figure lying here in the bed. She was the strongest and bravest person he'd ever met. There must have been some mix-up, some confusion which led to them thinking this was Vittoria. He stepped up close to the bed and peered down at the figure. Beaumont's shoulders slumped as that glimmer of hope drained away. There was no mistaking it. Emotion welled through him as he recalled their last meeting. Over ten years ago, he thought shamefully. He remembered the day in the vibrant colours of recent memory, as though just hours had passed. You know what this means, Vittoria had shouted, slamming her fist against the picture of the orbs. You know where these could lead. At the very least, these orbs raise some very important questions. Vittoria, I know, but it's just not the right time. You mean it's not the right time for you because you want to get the tenure at Cambridge? That's exactly what Beaumont meant, but suddenly he didn't have the strength to accept it. They won't have one of their lead professors talking about things like this. Give me a year, maybe two, then I'll have more freedom to consider alternative ideas. Beaumont pointed vaguely at the photographs. Alternative ideas, DeLuca roared. Richard, this is not an alternative idea. I'm not some pseudo-scientist trying to convince you we're all descended from lizards. We've worked together for decades. Vittoria, I know, but I've waited years for this tenure. It's all I've worked. But what about our discovery? DeLuca bellowed, her finger jabbing at the photograph. You were there. You saw these orbs. You know what they might mean and how important they could be. Beaumont stuttered, but no meaningful words came forth. He didn't want to argue with DeLuca. He had longed to tell her that he didn't care about the job. He wanted to tell her they would solve this together, side by side. He wanted to explain that he would be there with her until the end, but he couldn't. Instead, he said nothing. The problem was, after what happened in Syria, Richard Beaumont had lost his nerve. Now, the quiet life of lecturing in Cambridge was much more his style. The biggest stresses he now faced were the length of the line in the cafe for his mid-morning coffee and football traffic on a Saturday afternoon. Beaumont had got used to it that way. He liked it that way. He was happy to leave the gun wielding maniacs to someone else. Beaumont shook his head, dragging himself back into the present. The Bologna's infirmary suddenly felt very quiet and very empty. 
He sunk into the seat beside the bed and looked hard at Vittoria. Her chest gently rising and falling was the only visible sign of life. Thinking back to that argument, Beaumont felt regret bubbling up inside him. Maybe if he'd stood beside her all those years ago, then this wouldn't have happened. Maybe if they'd worked on this together, then Vittoria would now be okay. You can't blame yourself, you know. A cheerful voice came from behind him. Feeling suddenly self-conscious, Beaumont wiped his eyes and turned around. One of the Bologna's doctors bustled across the room. She carefully checked the screens and entered the information into a tablet computer. Then she took a clipboard from the foot of Vittoria's bed and entered the information there too. How's she doing? Beaumont said, his voice laced with emotion. She's had better days, at least she's stable now. We'll know more in a few days' time. Beaumont nodded. Right now, a few days' time felt like a lifetime away. Anything could happen in a few days' time, especially aboard the Bologna. This place attracted trouble. I'm hopeful she'll improve, the doctor said. We all are. We're doing everything possible for her. Beaumont nodded again. While he was fed up with these nebulous answers, he knew the medical team was doing their best. They honestly didn't know how DeLuca's recovery would go. They didn't even know if she would recover at all. Beaumont felt his stomach churn at the thought. Beaumont glanced again at the doctor. She checked the reading on another machine and entered the data into the tablet computer and onto the paper record. A question suddenly floated up through Beaumont's mind. It seemed weird considering the context, but Beaumont couldn't help but ask it. It felt, in a totally unexplainable way, important. You enter the readings twice, Beaumont said. Sorry, the doctor replied, glancing up at Beaumont. You entered the readings from the machines into the tablet and again on paper. Why do you need them twice? Oh, right, the doctor said, understanding what Beaumont was getting at. Old habits, I suppose. We always used to do them on paper. It just feels right. Also, should there be any system issues, we've got the hard copy. If you've got two, you're always covered, right? The realisation struck Beaumont like a fist to the gut. His muscles froze in position. He looked from the nurse to Vittoria and back again, his eyes almost bulging. You're a genius, Beaumont shouted. Why didn't I think of that before? It's just so obvious. He leaped to his feet, kissed Vittoria on the forehead and ran out of the room. We're stuck, Eden said, looking at the frozen image of Brent Fastlane on the screen. We don't know where he is. We can't trace the feed. And now he says the Atlanteans, or whatever they're called, have got this awful plan to take out the electronics of Central America. That's it in summary, Winslow said, his expression grave. With the modern world so reliant on electronic systems, Winslow had seen this as a weak point for over a decade. It was only a matter of time until someone exploited this, leaving a region or even an entire country without power, communications and supplies. Did he say where the first attack would be? Athena said, pulling a map of Mexico from a shelf and spreading it out over the table. Not exactly, Eden said. She thought back through Fastlane's message. Did anyone else think that the way he spoke was unusual? It just didn't sound quite like Fastlane's normal style. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, Athena said, pointing at the screen. He wasn't as excited as usual. Maybe he was scared. Ramirez said, shrugging. Maybe, Eden said. She didn't have an answer, but something didn't feel quite right. Beaumont crashed through the door, panting. I... I... He stuttered, unable to catch his breath. Everyone spun around to look at him. His face glowed red from the exertion of running up the stairs. There's something we haven't thought about, Beaumont said, recovering enough to speak. It relates to the discovery of the orbs ten years ago. The ones you found in Syria, Eden said. Yes, yes, the orbs of Atlantis. That's what Vittoria used to call them. I must admit, it has a certain ring to it. Beaumont placed a hand over his mouth and stared at the floor. He walked in a tight circle like a trapped lion. I mean, it could very well be nothing, but I really don't know. It could be important. It feels important. There's certainly something here. What? Eden, Athena, Baxter and Winslow shouted in unison. Beaumont froze and looked from one person to the next. Well, as you know, ten years ago, DeLuca and I recovered a pair of orbs from a temple complex in Syria. 
Yes, you told us this, Eden interrupted, keen for Beaumont to get to the point. Do you know where they are? A wave of excitement moved through the team at the suggestion. All took a step toward Beaumont. Even Ramirez, who had seemed disorientated for the last few hours, leaned forward with excitement. No, as I told you, they were taken from us, Beaumont said. Eden huffed in frustration. What do you need to tell us, then? If you don't know where those orbs are, I can't see how they're helpful. Eden looked from Beaumont to Athena, then on to her father. They grinned at each other, having clearly realised something she hadn't. She turned and looked at Baxter. He, too, smiled as though he were in on a secret joke. What? Eden said impatiently. Repeat what you just said, Winslow told her. If you don't know where those orbs are, Eden paused. Wait a minute, she pointed at Beaumont. In Syria, you found two orbs. Beaumont nodded. That means you think there will be two at Teotihuacan too, Eden said. When DeLuca and I found the orbs back in Syria, we genuinely thought we'd found two of the twelve missing orbs. The twelve missing orbs? Legend has it, and read into this as you will, that in the far distant past a strange figure appeared in all the major civilizations of the day. Beaumont explained, in far more words than Eden thought necessary, the myth surrounding the twelve orbs. I heard that before but thought it sounded like nonsense, Eden said, her arms crossed. Years ago I would have agreed with you, but there are a lot of things that hint to it being more than just a myth. Look at the similarities between the pyramids of Giza and those in Central America. We know they all developed writing systems around the same time, Ramirez said. And all these sites are on what we now call ley lines, Winslow said. Eden looked from one man to the next, still not sure if she accepted this jump in logic. Okay, just assume we accept all that, Athena said, clearly keen to get on with the explanation. If we are to believe this, Beaumont began. Big if, Eden quipped. The legend states that there were twelve such orbs hidden around the globe, Beaumont continued. Over the years, we can only assume that as some civilizations conquered and others fell, these orbs either got taken as the spoils of war, or hidden so well that they still haven't been found. Okay, but why are the orbs important? If this dude showed up and taught the civilization everything, why did they need the orbs? Eden asked, hands on her hips. The orb is the record of everything the people were taught and could also contain a lot more, Beaumont said. I'm not saying I totally believe this part, he said quickly, fearing he would lose his audience altogether. But Vittoria and I got a few experts to look at the photos we took of the orbs, and the experts all agree the orbs looked like they were made from something similar to silicon. That's what computer chips are made from, Athena said. Exactly, Beaumont said, pointing at the computer on the desk. In the right hands, there's no knowing what information is stored on these things. Eden nodded slowly. The thing was starting to make a little bit of sense. Anyway, Beaumont continued. Over time, as these conquering armies moved around the globe, the orbs were stolen again and again. Then they fell out of mainstream knowledge completely. It's funny how people forget things like this when we think we're the most advanced civilization of all time, Winslow interjected. Exactly. It feels as though the modern world has lost touch with these old legends. Anyway, it's very possible a civilization the size of the one that built Teotihuacan had more than one of these orbs at their disposal. Eden glanced at Baxter. Memories of their time in the tunnels beneath the Giza Plateau ran through her mind's eye. All we have to do is work out where they put it, Beaumont said, as though it were the easiest thing in the world. Beaumont turned to Ramirez, who was now paying a lot more attention. This one was found directly beneath the Pyramid of the Sun? Ramirez nodded, accurate to within an inch of the center. Hold on, pull up a map of Teotihuacan, Eden said, pointing at the screen. Baxter sat at the computer, his fingers drummed on the keyboard, and in less than a second, a bird's-eye view of the ancient site appeared on the screen. Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. Eden said, nodding toward the screen. Young lady, I think you're right, Beaumont shouted excitedly. If there's another orb, it should be beneath the pyramid of the moon. We know there are tunnels down there, Ramirez said, although we never got permission to excavate that side. We're not going to ask for permission, Eden said, but that does mean we're going to have to break into another ancient archaeological site. I think I've got an idea, 
Baxter said. He checked the date and then ran an internet search. Then he grinned more widely than Eden had ever seen before. Whatever he had planned, Eden didn't think she was going to like it. Chapter 31 I cannot believe I'm dressed like this, Eden said, glancing down at herself. She was wearing what amounted to a gothic ball gown adorned in purple and red flowers. Her hair had been sprayed white and she wore a headband with large flowers. They were in the back of a vintage Volkswagen transporter parked on a side street in the small town of San Juan Teotihuacan. Built in the shadow of the towering pyramids, the town existed to serve the thousands of people who visited the world-famous heritage site every year. Tonight, though, the narrow street were more crowded than ever. So as not to attract attention, the van had been borrowed from a local laundrette. The owner had been paid a good deal of money, probably more than the van's value, to ensure their anonymity. Glancing around the van's limited inside space, Eden thought it looked more like a pantomime dressing room than mission control. You wait until you see your face, Athena said, patting Eden's face with a grey makeup brush. Beside her, Baxter giggled uncontrollably. He was dressed in a suit adorned with the same flowers, and his face was painted like a skull. Strangely, in Eden's opinion, Baxter seemed to enjoy himself. Eden whipped around to face him. Hey, Skeletor, don't know why you're laughing, Eden said, making reference to the 80s cartoon, Masters of the Universe. I'm definitely more He-Man, Baxter quipped, posing like a weightlifter. Will you just hold still? Athena hissed, grabbing Eden by the chin and forcing her back around. And you, stop winding her up. She pointed at Baxter. I don't get why we have to go as dead people. Eden moaned for the umpteenth time. Couldn't we just be street sweepers or security or something like that? We've discussed this, Athena said, putting the finishing touches to Eden's face paint. Athena picked up a black pencil and started drawing lines around Eden's mouth and eyes. All the security will have to identify themselves. Same with the cleaning staff. Security is especially tight tonight. This is the only way you'll get to just walk in there. Yes, but... Listen, it's just great luck we needed access to the site at the time of the annual Day of the Dead celebrations. Otherwise, we'd have had to force our way in. Give me a gun any day, Eden grunted, pouting. You're done! Athena said, putting the final line on the corner of Eden's mouth. You better get going. Don't want to be late for your own funeral. Ha uh ha, -huh. Eden uttered through gritted teeth. Eden stood and let herself out through the van's rear doors. Several streetlights had snapped on now to combat the falling night, although gloom still hung around the street. Before the descending darkness, the buildings of the town shone in cheerful shades of yellow, blue and red. Now they just looked dark. Eden turned and looked toward the main street about 100 feet away. What she saw caused her to freeze. An endless stream of people shuffled past, all dressed as skeletons. Some had colourful masks or great headdresses. Others wore suits and dresses much like Baxter and Eden's. I bet you don't feel so silly now, Baxter said, standing beside Eden. We better get going. Eden and Baxter walked toward the crowd. Eden turned from one way to the other, wide-eyed. The procession of people continued as far as she could see in either direction. They were all dressed in colourful costumes, with their faces painted or covered. Each person held a light, and the effect of thousands of lights all glowing together was like that of the ocean at sunset. It was nothing short of breathtaking. Drums pounded from somewhere in the crowd, providing the beat to which the entire crowd swayed from side to side. Before Eden could protest further, Baxter grabbed her arm and pulled her into the throng. Within moment, they were surrounded. Eden glanced around at the other revelers as they passed. Although the outfits looked sombre and almost macabre, each person was smiling, laughing and dancing. The contrast felt eerie for a moment, until Eden realised it was quite literally a celebration of life. It was a celebration for the precious lives of their passed-on ancestors. Eden felt it was a touching and poignant spectacle. She wished for a moment that she wasn't there on a mission, and could wholly enjoy the unique event. All right then, Eden mumbled to herself, pulling a deep breath. If we've got to do this, we might as well do it right. Eden danced, smiled and hollered like the rest of the crowd. Lifting Baxter's arm, she spun around. She let her hips move to the beat as the crowd inched their way toward the ancient site. Eden glanced down at Baxter's legs, shuffling awkwardly. 
What's wrong with your feet? Nothing, Baxter grunted. I don't know what you mean. I've seen ancient statues move to the beat more than you. You've got to feel the music. Come on, loosen up a little. Baxter tried shuffling forward and swinging his hips from side to side. Eden couldn't help but laugh out loud. Look at this guy. She pointed at a man dancing right in front of them, whose movements completely embodied the celebration. You mean to tell me all your military training didn't teach you to dance like that? Afraid not, Baxter said, studying the guy in front of them, and then trying the movements himself. He twisted his hips in a strange up-and-down motion and shuffled his feet backwards and then forward again. Eden laughed out loud. Sorry, she added guiltily when Baxter shot her a look. We'll have a word with my dad when we get back to the Bologna. Urgent course of dance training required. Eden and Baxter shuffled, danced and swayed, inching toward the magnificent structures of Teotihuacan. Eden swung this way and that, moving through the crowd, eager to see the pyramids as they approached. For a few minutes, she even allowed herself to get caught up in the celebration spirit. A hand appeared through the crowd and, without thinking twice, Eden took it. She was hauled through the crowd, swaying and dancing all the way. The surrounding dancers moved to the beat, which seemed to have increased now to a thundering pace. There was chanting too, but Eden couldn't work out where it was coming from. This noise, the torchlight and the colours all conspired into a swirling, disorientating carnival. She looked down at her hand to see it was being held by a lady of incalculable age. The woman was tall and slim, although age had bent her forward and toward the ground. She had the posture of someone in their later years, but danced more energetically than Eden herself. The thick white face paint of the celebration further added mystery. The woman reached up, took Eden's other hand and pulled her in close. Not feeling any threat, Eden leaned in close to the woman's ear. You are on a mission of great importance, the woman said in hoarse, accented English. I sense things will become dangerous for you, but you must keep going. This is more important than you can know. Eden straightened up, alarmed by the woman's words. The woman smiled, exposing a grin of discoloured teeth. There is more. There is a man who will soon profess his love for you. He may not do it in words, but you will know, and you must acknowledge it, for time is short. Momentarily stunned by the words, Eden stopped dancing. The woman released Eden's hands and threaded her way on through the crowd. Within a couple of seconds, Eden couldn't see her amongst the throngs of people. Eden pushed back through the crowd. She soon saw Baxter, a foot and a half taller than the average person in the crowd. He looked around, clearly worried that Eden was out of his sight. There is a man who will soon profess his love for you. The woman's weird words circled Eden's mind once more. Eden shook her head. This was surely the sort of horoscope nonsense anyone could find commonality with. Eden pushed the eerie experience from her mind and danced up beside Baxter. At that moment, the Pyramid of the Sun came into view. In the first glimpse, Eden thought the thing looked like an object from outer space. The geometric steps and sharp angles makes it look more like a cartoon spaceship than an ancient stone structure. Lit in multiple colours for the occasion, it was an awe-inspiring sight. These ancient builders really did know a thing or two about creating impressive structures. Eden felt her apprehension rise as the procession swayed forward and into the archaeological site. She glanced at a group of police officers standing beside the shut-up ticket office. Each of the men held an assault rifle across their chest. Although the men didn't even notice Eden amongst the crowd, their presence felt like a threat. Eden ducked into the crowd and kept her movement fluid. They shuffled slowly up past rows of closed-up souvenir stalls. The Great Pyramid now towered over the approaching crowd as though they were little more than ants. As the procession snaked across the Avenue of the Dead, Eden looked up towards the Pyramid of the Moon on the left. This structure too was lit in multiple colours for the occasion. She turned to the right and looked in the direction of the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent, but this structure, with its ornate carvings and grand plaza, was out of sight. The crowd slowed as the people descended an incredibly steep set of stairs towards the Pyramid of the Sun. Eden took the stairs slowly, concentrating on her feet. She noticed people helped each other, hands reaching out to assist those who found the descent difficult. At the bottom of the stairs, the crowd picked up pace, heading towards the behemoth structure. It would soon be time for them to break from the procession and make a dash for the dig site. 
Eden peered between the people ahead of them, looking for an indication of the shaft's location. So far, their destination was out of sight. Eden spun around, making the move look like part of the dance, and scanned the crowd for security personnel. Groups of police officers and the site's security flanked the route, watching the crowd for any sign of trouble. None paid any special attention to Eden and Baxter as they shuffled past. Security was tight, as Athena had said, but with thousands of people to hide amongst Eden and Baxter, had a good chance to get alongside the pyramid unseen. Despite Fastlane's warning going viral, it didn't appear that the authorities were expecting problems today. Maybe Fastlane had caused trouble too many times for people to take him seriously. Moving down towards the Pyramid of the Sun, the crowd became more subdued. The drumbeat and the whoops and hollers of the last hour muted into quiet reflection. The sea of lanterns stilled too, now swaying from side to side gently, as opposed to the earlier wild gyrations. Eden peered up at the Pyramid of the Sun as they shuffled closer and closer. Coloured lights blazed in red, then blue, then yellow from the colossal carved stones. I thought we'd had enough of pyramids to last a lifetime, Eden said. Tell me about it, Baxter huffed before turning serious. Up there, three o'clock. Eden turned slowly, trying to limit her movement so as not to attract attention. A large tent sat in the shadow of the Pyramid of the Sun, surrounded by a cordoned off area. Two police officers stationed beside the tent dutifully scanned the crowd, semi-automatic weapons clutched to their chests. It was clear the authorities didn't want anyone slipping into the dig site tonight. Eden and Baxter pushed their way through the crowd, getting in a position which would allow them to pass close beside the tent as the crowd shuffled forward. We're approaching the site of the shaft, Eden said, tapping her in earcom's device. We'll be passing in one minute, but there may be a problem. She described the police officers stationed beside the cordon. Leave that with me, came Athena's voice. For once, Eden wished she was safely ensconced in the truck instead. There was something about this whole mission that didn't sit well, and it wasn't just the dressing up. A moment later, Eden heard a distant voice zing through the police officers' radios. The officers lifted the devices to their ears in unison, then glanced at each other. Then, as though a full emergency was about to kick off, they charged around to the other side of the pyramid. Eden and Baxter broke from the crowd and ducked beneath the cordon. They scurried across the few feet of open ground and leaped inside the tent. Did that do the trick? Athena said. From the tone of her voice, Eden could tell she was smiling. Eden peered out through a small gap in the tent's fabric. The crowd shuffled around the pyramid before doubling back towards the Avenue of the Dead. No one even glanced behind to see where Eden and Baxter had gone. The two police officers stomped their way back to their former positions, scowling. What did you tell the guards? They seem pretty upset. I might have mentioned that Isa Gonzalez was nearby and needed assistance. What nice gentleman rushing to help a damsel in distress. Eden pulled the tent's fabric closed and walked over to the shaft. Chapter 32 Baxter removed a glow stick from one of his several hidden pockets, he snapped the stick and dropped it down the shaft. The stick clattered down through the darkness, bouncing against the sides and settling on the shaft bottom. That's quite a hole in the ground, Eden said, peering down into the void. The stick sat over 100 feet below. Eden reached down and shook the ladder, which had been fastened to one side of the shaft. The ladder rattled, the movement sending a shower of rocks banging down into the hole. That doesn't look very safe, Eden said. Did you bring that trusty rope of yours? How exactly would I carry a climbing rope wearing a suit? Baxter replied, his arms held out wide. I bet you didn't either. Baxter looked at Eden wearing the tight-fitting dress. Afraid not, Eden said, feeling slightly uncomfortable in the outfit. I brought these though. Baxter pulled out a pair of small headlamps and passed one to Eden. At least that's a start. Eden switched the light on and covered the beam with her hand to not attract the attention of the men outside. She stepped toward a table at the back of the tent. The table looked as though it had been set up to make an initial evaluation of anything found below. Now, except for a coating of dust, the table was empty. <laughs> Eden squatted down and searched through a few old crates piled beneath the table. She slid them out one by one and looked inside. Some contained nothing but dirt and had probably been used to transport the artefacts. One contained a few small tools, but nothing Eden thought would be useful. 
The final one contained a length of electrical cable with a light bulb on the end. This will help, Eden said, holding up the wire for Baxter to see. At least if that ladder falls, we'll have something. Eden flipped over the table and snapped off a leg. She removed the bulb and tied the end of the cable to the leg and then positioned it across the shaft's opening. She dropped the cable down into the gloom. It almost reached to the bottom of the shaft. I'll go first, Eden said, crossing to the ladder. She pulled the headlamp down over her hair. Baxter looked as though he was about to say something, but Eden got there first. I'm not having you looking up my dress the whole way down. A girl's got to have some dignity. I wouldn't... I mean... Baxter stuttered a reply, his face reddening. Eden stepped onto the top rung of the ladder. She looped the cable around her waist and tugged. Fortunately, the lower part of the dress was loose-fitting and allowed her to descend without too much difficulty. She took the first few rungs slowly, the ladder shaking beneath her grasp. Twenty feet down, she glanced back up the shaft. Baxter peered down at her from above. Now you're totally looking down my dress, she quipped, using one hand to cover her cleavage. I'm not... I would never. Baxter's head disappeared from the opening. Eden grinned. Baxter was far too easy to wind up. About halfway down the shaft, the first ladder ended and another began. The bindings which held the ladders together didn't look at all safe. Eden tightened the cable around her waist. She scuttled down the ladder as quickly as possible, the old contraption groaning under her weight. And finally, not a moment too soon, Eden stepped off the ladder and onto solid ground. I'm down, she called up the shaft as loud as she dared. Baxter appeared at the top of the shaft. He stepped on the top rung and confidently descended the ladder. Try doing that wearing a ball gown, Eden said, smirking at the thought. Eden turned and stepped into the tunnel. The beam of light from her headlamp lanced down the passage. Look at this place, Eden said, gasping. She hadn't realised it continued so far beneath the Avenue of the Dead. She turned her attention to the tunnel's walls. She'd learned recently that you could tell a lot about a construction like this by looking at the tool marks. The tunnel here was hewn roughly from solid rock. She tapped against the wall gently, confirming that the rock was solid. A great crash pounded down the tunnel, followed by the sound of metal clanging against metal. Something thumped down heavily, shaking the tunnel floor beneath. Eden spun around, searching for the noise. Poised to run or fight, Eden prepared herself for either a tunnel collapse or a chase with the police. Her heart leaped up into her throat at the thought of being entombed down here or crushed beneath tons of falling stone. She would take a chase with the police any day. She stood still, waiting. No rocks fell. The tunnel remained steadfast. Then Eden noticed the ladder was now sitting at a funny angle. A little help! came Baxter's strained voice from somewhere in the shaft above. Eden took a few steps back and peered up the shaft. Baxter hung, gripping onto the electrical cable, about twenty feet above the shaft bottom. What happened? Eden said, grabbing the ladder which had fallen completely away from the wall. She positioned it in such a way that Baxter could climb down safely. The ladder just fell away from the wall, shoddy equipment. Baxter reached the ground and brushed down his suit. You were rushing, weren't you? Eden said, waggling her finger in a patronising way. I told you not to rush. More speed, less haste, or something like that. Anyway, look at this place. Eden led them into the tunnel, their lights sweeping over the walls. When this tunnel was discovered, apparently it had been filled in, purposefully sealed up, Baxter said, looking up at the roof. It's as though whatever they put down here, they didn't want to be discovered. The pair strode down the tunnel and then, as Ramirez had told them, reached a cross-shaped chamber. This section must be directly beneath the Pyramid of the Sun, Eden said, looking up at the ceiling. She tried not to imagine all that rock balancing precariously above their heads right now. Look at this, Baxter said, pointing at the ring of figures arranged in the centre of the chamber. That must be where the first orb used to sit. Baxter pointed at the small, pyramid-shaped rock in the centre of the figures. These guys are pretty tough-looking, Eden said, examining a stern stone figure who continued to stare at the place where the orb had been. Baxter nodded. It's all a bit creepy, actually, Eden said. It feels as though they're not happy about their orb being taken. Eden swept the beam of her headlamp across the figure's carved faces. 
they're not sleepy either, Baxter said, giggling. You get it, like Snow White and the dwarfs. You should leave the jokes to me, Eden said, rolling her eyes. What's down? Athena's voice crackled from the comms device. The hundred feet of solid rock, plus the giant pyramid above them, was clearly messing with the radio signals. We've reached the chamber beneath the Pyramid of the Sun, Eden said. Now we're going to push on to the Pyramid of the Moon. An unintelligible hiss came through their earpieces a few seconds later, proving this deep underground, the communication system didn't work. Eden and Baxter were now on their own. Chapter 33 We'd better get moving, Eden said, sliding out her phone. She used a laser measuring device built into the phone to work out how far they'd come from the shaft. We're beneath the Pyramid of the Sun now, so the Pyramid of the Moon must be that way. She pointed down one of the tunnels which all came together to create the cross-shaped chamber. Do we even know how far these tunnels go? Baxter said, looking down the tunnel Eden had indicated. No, the Mexican government has been cagey about it all. Vittoria De Luca was the first foreign archaeologist allowed down here, apparently. Her visit was quite the news story. Eden paced into the tunnel. Baxter hurried after her. They sped along as the tunnel curved gently to the right. If they were to join the Day of the Dead procession again and get out without a confrontation, time was not on their side. The pair moved down the narrow tunnel in silence for several minutes. The width of the tunnel forced them to run in single file, and the height caused Baxter to lean forward. Eden was just about able to run down the centre of the passage without banging her head on the ceiling. Ahead, the tunnel twisted out of sight. It felt as though they were going in the right direction, but Eden couldn't be sure. After several hundred feet, the tunnel ended abruptly. Dead end, Eden said, placing her hands on the rock wall blocking their path. The slab felt as solid as the surrounding walls. Baxter turned back toward the chamber. Should we try the other tunnels? Eden pulled up the map of the site on her phone and tried to work out where they were in relation to the structures above. From what I can see here, we're about 50 feet short of the Pyramid of the Moon, Eden said. I'm pretty sure we chose the right tunnel. There's just the small matter of getting through a solid chunk of rock, Baxter said, his flashlight beam moving across the surface. Nothing we haven't done before, Eden said, her eyes gleaming with excitement. Look around for any carvings or inscriptions. There will be a way through here, I'm sure of it. Baxter didn't look so sure, but looked anyway. Together they moved around, examining the walls and the slab which blocked the path. There were no inscriptions, no codes, not so much as a creature carved into the rock. That's sort of strange, don't you think? Eden said, panning her light across the smooth surface again. There are inscriptions and carvings in the temples up there, but none down here. DeLuca said on the dictaphone recording she thought the cave system was from an earlier period, Baxter said. Yes, you're right, Eden said, casting her mind back over the recording they'd all listened to. Fortunately, DeLuca had described the tunnel in detail. She said they thought the pyramids above were built as replacements for smaller structures, which were then built on this cave system. Wait a minute, Baxter said, his voice urgent. Do you remember what she said about the chamber looking like the stars underground? Yes, Eden said excitedly. She remembered how DeLuca was amazed by the sight of the glowing orbs. Why didn't we think of that before? Eden switched off her light. The darkness leaped forward, leaving only the beam of Baxter's headlamp. Baxter clicked his light off too, creating a blackness that felt as thick as treacle. The lack of light was absolute. Eden blinked several times, unsure whether her eyes were open or closed. Slowly, as Eden's eyes adjusted, she saw something appear in the darkness. Gentle green dots glowed. Eden gasped, understanding DeLuca's words. The mysterious lights grew brighter as their eyes adjusted further still. Eden turned and noticed the full scale of the twinkling dots. They covered the slab in front of them in a great circle which reached from the floor to the ceiling. Standing among the stars, Eden whispered in amazement, walking up close to the slab. What? Baxter murmured from nearby. That's what DeLuca said, wasn't it? She said that with the orb glowing down here, it felt as though she was standing amid the stars. She was exactly right. 
She was, Baxter said urgently. That's what this is, look. Eden turned from left to right but had no idea what Baxter was pointing at. I think, if I'm not mistaken, these are the Mayan star signs. Look closely. Eden leaned in close. Just inches from the wall, the glowing dots appeared less random and aligned themselves in shapes. She recognised the swirling representation of the owl and beside that, the curved question mark-like shape of the earth symbol. You're right, Eden said, moving from one sign to the next. Eden ran her finger across the rock. It was smooth to the touch. The figures were etched so finely into the rock that she couldn't even feel the indentation. As she moved her finger down over the surface of the slab, Eden felt the rock move. Did you feel that? She pulled her finger away as though it had scalded her. The rock moved, I'm sure of it. No, it can't have. We tried shoving it, remember? Yes, but we didn't try spinning it. Eden placed her hand against the surface and pushed down. The entire face of the rock rotated an inch, changing the positions of the characters. Eden gasped, then looked at the new glyphs now in front of her. Look at that straight up, Baxter said. Eden peered upwards and saw that at the top of the face, at twelve o'clock, there was a symbol marked on the roof. A glowing face with a pointed tongue lolling from between its lips looked down at them. Okay, so I think we have to get one of these signs aligned with the face up there, Eden said. I was afraid you were going to say that. Do you have any ideas what they mean? I once recovered a Mayan calendar from a pair of thieves, Eden said. The owner was so pleased to have it back, he told me a few things about it. I remember a bit. Eden tried to cast her mind back to that day over a year ago. I remember Imix, the crocodile, comes first. The crocodile is a sign of birth and fertility. Sounds obvious when you say it like that, Baxter jibed. The Maya had a different understanding of nature than we do in the modern world. They respected creatures like the crocodile who have been on the earth many times longer than we have. All right, sorry, Baxter said. Where's the crocodile then? Three o'clock, Eden said, finding the symbol which looked like a sun with a wave below it. Together, Eden and Baxter moved the great wheel anti-clockwise until the crocodile was almost at the top. Are you sure about this? Baxter said, pausing before they clicked the symbol into place. Getting this wrong could set off a trap or something. Have you got a better idea, Professor Baxter? Eden's voice cut through the gloom like a blade. No, nope. just checking you're sure, Baxter said. Here goes nothing. Together they turned the wheel another inch. I mixed the crocodile clicked into place. A low rumble reverberated through the chamber. Eden felt something move nearby. The noise increased to a thundering rumble which shook the cave beneath their feet. Then Eden noticed the floor wasn't just shaking, but it was actually moving. She fumbled with her light and clicked it on. Dust drifted down from the ceiling, dancing through the beam as she swung it right and left. She glanced at Baxter, his eyes wide. Look, Baxter roared over the noise, his face set into a mask of fear. Eden followed his gaze and instantly knew why his expression had paled so much. The floor beneath them was sliding to the side. The moving floor had already separated them from the tunnel through which they came with a gap of at least three feet and was sliding further all the time. I don't think crocodile was the right answer, Baxter said. He walked carefully across the moving slab and peered into the gap. I don't think we're the first people to come in here either. Eden crept carefully toward the gap, feeling the floor rumble away beneath her feet. She peered down into the gap. A forty-foot-deep pit loomed beneath them. Several long spikes made sure the landing would not be a comfortable one. A pair of skeletons hung skewered by a spike. Bedraggled clothes hung over the skeletons, giving them the look of macabre museum exhibits rather than real people. It's like a high-stakes game of the Wheel of Fortune, Eden said. She turned to look back at the slab a few feet behind them, but getting closer all the time as the floor retracted. We definitely can't get back now, Baxter said, pointing down the tunnel through which they'd come. The void now yawned at over six feet wide. Yep, we're going to have to figure this out, Eden said, pointing up at the slab. With the lights on, the figures were completely invisible. Eden and Baxter stepped up to the wall and switched off their lights. Once again, Eden examined the twenty figures of the Mayan astrological calendar, which were spaced evenly around the face of the wheel. 
She desperately cast her mind back to that afternoon in which she learned all about the figures and their various characteristics. Chi-chan the serpent, she said, tapping the figure, which looked more like a face than an actual serpent. I think the serpent is something to do with transformation. That could stand for finding this orb. Are you sure? Baxter said. Eden could tell from his voice that he wasn't convinced. No, not at all, but I'm not an expert on this, Eden spat in reply. It's at best a good guess, at worst a foolish mistake. If you think you can do better, then I'm happy to go with whatever you think. That's as good as we're going to get, I suppose, Baxter said. Let's try it. Together, they pushed against the wheel, the stone ground and rumbled as it spun. They moved Chichan to the top of the wheel and then clicked it into place. Another rumble filled the tunnel, but it didn't feel like good news. The floor beneath them continued to slide from beneath their feet. Something clicked, and then the grinding noise of ancient machinery increased in pitch. The floor beneath them actually sped up, sliding out more quickly. Come on, Baxter roared, pushing against the stone. Nothing happened. The slab remained lodged in place. Eden snapped on her light and looked behind them. The void's edge was now just three feet behind them. Eden looked out at the passage beyond the void. Come on, damn it! Baxter snarled, still pushing against the slab. His feet slipped against the floor as he shoved his shoulder into the rock. This will kill us! A realization struck Eden like a slap around the face. She stood there frozen for a second. That's it! she shouted, snapping off her headlamp and looking up at the slab. Turn the light off. Baxter flicked the switch. This will kill us, Eden repeated. You've got it, you genius. Eden, I know sarcasm is like oxygen to you, but right now if you could just... No, listen, Eden interrupted. Simi is the symbol of death. But in the Mayan calendar, death means change, transformation, and rebirth. There. Chapter 34 at first, the voice spoke in Spanish. The words were quick and distorted by the echoes of the tunnel. Although Eden couldn't work out what the man was saying, it didn't sound as though he was there to help. Her body jolted into action, preparing to fight or run. A second voice came a moment later, this time speaking English. Mexico State Police, we have you surrounded. There is no way out. Move toward us with your hands up. Eden glanced at Baxter. Even beneath the face paint, Eden could see that his face had paled. I thought Athena was supposed to be monitoring this for us. Eden tapped the comms device in her ear. We're out of range down here. Baxter pointed down the tunnel. Maybe someone saw us after all. Or heard you silently sneak down that ladder, Eden said. You've got five seconds to comply or we'll come down there shooting. The voice came again. Two options, Eden said. Take our chances with the police or work out where these tunnels go. Baxter squatted down and snatched up the orb. He held the orb in a cupped hand and stared at its glowing surface for a second. There was certainly something hypnotic about the object, he thought. Baxter removed a small drawstring bag from a pocket and dropped the orb inside. The tunnel gets my vote, Baxter said, swinging the bag over his shoulder. It can't be as bad as the one we've just been through. I was really hoping you'd say that, Eden said. It's nice to agree for once. She placed her hands on her hips and looked at the three remaining tunnels. Which one? Several voices echoed down the passage behind them, followed by the sound of crashing metal. It sounds like they've moved the ladder across the pit, Eden said, glancing behind them. We're coming in now. The police officer spoke more urgently. Go for the middle one, Eden and Baxter chimed in unison. They set off, running for the tunnel in the centre. After fifty feet, the tunnel narrowed to just an inch or two wider than Eden's shoulders. The roof dipped too, causing Eden and Baxter to hunch over. Eden hurried on as quickly as she could, although progress was increasingly difficult in the tight space. This isn't looking good, Eden hissed, turning sideways to slip between the walls. You're telling me, Baxter grumbled. Significantly larger than Eden, he was finding progress even more difficult. Twenty feet further on, the passage stopped abruptly. A dead end. Eden reached out and pushed against the rock. We've got a problem. Pounding footsteps drifted up from the chamber behind them, indicating that the police had made their way across the pit. We should have gone left, 
Eden said, slapping the wall. We don't even have time to work out any codes this time. As though proving her point, their pursuers shouted at one another as they reached the centre of the chamber. They would now be splitting up to investigate each of the tunnels, Eden assumed. Hold on a second, Baxter said. Did you feel that? Eden turned around slowly and felt a chilly breeze drift across her face. Yes, I did. It came from up there. Both Baxter and Eden looked upwards. The tunnel rose vertically and then doubled back on itself. It's not the end after all, Eden whispered. Give me a lift. Baxter helped Eden scramble up to the next tunnel, and then Eden helped haul him up. Above, the tunnel ran back the way they'd come. Together, they picked their way carefully and silently along the passage. Now directly above the chamber, they didn't want to make any noise that might give away their location. After another fifty feet, the tunnel rose and doubled back again. The voices of their pursuers faded as Eden and Baxter climbed to the next level. We must be right inside the Pyramid of the Moon now, Eden whispered after they doubled forward and backward several times. I always wondered what was inside pyramids like this, Baxter said softly. They shuffled their way forward and backward several more times. Each time the distance between the climbs got shorter. Eventually they scrambled into a small chamber, no bigger than six feet square. Where now? Baxter said. His face paint was smudged with sweat and dirt. The cool breeze drifted into the chamber from all around them now. The only way is up, Eden pointed toward the ceiling. Give me a boost. Baxter lifted Eden up to the ceiling. She pressed her shoulder into the stone. Shoving against the stone, she felt the block move as though it were designed to slide. Eden pushed the block to one side and the large stone glided as though on wheels. Light from the star-filled sky streamed into the chamber. The comms device in Eden's ear suddenly came to life. Eden, Baxter, come in, please, Athena said, her voice laced with stress. Yes, we lost contact with Eden and Baxter over thirty minutes ago now, Athena said to someone else. Hearing you, Eden said, poking her head out through the gap and looking around. She scrambled through, lay on her belly, and looked down at the scene. The passage had brought them out right on top of the Pyramid of the Moon. From here, Eden had a panoramic view of the Avenue of the Dead, right down to the Pyramid of the Sun and beyond. In the distance, the lights of the town glimmered through the still night air. The Day of the Dead procession had finished now, and the avenue was almost empty. Rising above the sound of the valley, Eden heard the grumble of diesel engines. Someone was heading their way fast. Eden reached down into the passage and helped Baxter up. Once Baxter was out, Eden slid the stone back into position. Eden, where are you? Athena said frantically. When we lost contact with you, I thought the worst. I'm afraid you've been seen. Not sure how, but... Yep, I know, Eden said. Three unmarked black sprinter vans raced through the site and slid to a stop beside the pyramid. Special Agent Baxter made enough noise to wake up half of Mexico. I didn't... It was that ladder. Baxter tried to argue, but Athena cut him off in mid-sentence. You need to get out of there, Athena said. They called for reinforcements over thirty minutes ago. They'll arrive at any minute. Eden watched men pile out of the vans and fan out around the pyramid, guns raised. These guys don't look like police, Eden said. They've been called for through the police communications channel, Athena said. They've arrived already. Two vans full, Eden said, counting at least twelve armed men. Have they set up a perimeter? They've blocked off the site entrance, Athena said. It won't be long before they're patrolling the surrounding roads too. It's an enormous site though, use that to your advantage. They can't block off the whole thing. They really are taking this seriously, Baxter said. Breaking into a site like this during a national celebration is sort of serious. We need to get you out of there now. Eden heard Athena typing furiously. There's a service station just over a mile from the site boundary, Athena said. I'm afraid that's as close as I can get. All going well. If the crowds have dispersed, I'll be there in ten minutes. Eden checked the location on her phone. Gotcha. We will be there as soon as we can. Another sprinter van screamed into the site, disgorging eight gun-toting men. They've sent an army, Eden said, looking out toward the distant site boundary. Something here doesn't stack up, Baxter said. Eden glanced at Baxter. You're right. 
Eden watched the newly arrived enemy start to surround the site. We'll worry about that later. Right now, we need to get out of here before it's too late. Eden and Baxter shared a nod before climbing to their feet and crossing to the rear of the pyramid. This side of the structure was shallow enough for them to carefully pick their way down while remaining unseen. Eden paused behind a wall which jutted out from the back of the structure. Another engine grumbled from somewhere nearby. Eden and Baxter ducked in behind the wall and gazed toward the sound. An unmarked car roared past as more so-called police reinforcements arrived. Eden thought about what Athena had said. They'll have half the force down there soon. Come on, Baxter has said. We haven't got time to wait. Together they scrambled down to the ground at the back of the pyramid. On the opposite side to the Avenue of the Dead now, the area at the back of the pyramid was crisscrossed with old walls, which would once have been temples or even homes. Eden crouched down behind one of the walls and scrutinised the scene. She peered for a long moment at a pair of shapes in the gloom, before realising they weren't men charging their way, but towering cactuses. That way, Eden said, pointing toward the site boundary. We cross that area of open ground, then we can move between those temples. Part of a huge city complex, several smaller structures in various degrees of ruin, would offer them some protection to move unseen. Eden and Baxter set off at a run. They crossed the open ground in ten seconds flat and leaped in behind a smaller temple. Just as Baxter got out of sight, several raised voices reverberated from the front of the temple, followed by the beams of several flashlights. They've seen... Athena's voice came through the comms channel, cut off in mid-sentence by the snapping of gunfire. Chapter 35 Eden grunted in frustration as bullets smashed into the stone all around them. Right now it seemed as though the men were just firing sporadically and hoping for the best. Eden peered into the darkness. Just over a hundred feet away, the site boundary was marked by a rusting chain-link fence. If there was a break in the gunfire, Eden figured they could reach the fence in 15 seconds at the most. Make a break for it as soon as we can, Eden said, pointing at the boundary. On the other side, the rough ground will stop them chasing us in the vehicles, and it'll be easy to lose them amongst the bushes. Baxter looked as though he was about to disagree, but didn't get the chance. Hearing a momentary pause in the gunfire, Eden set off at an all-out run for the fence. Her feet pounded across the dusty ground, threatening to slip at any moment. Baxter followed, easily keeping pace with Eden who was slowed by the flowing dress. A vehicle swung around the temple behind them, scattering gravel left and right. The vehicle pinned Eden and Baxter in its headlights and accelerated hard. Eden glanced over her shoulder. The vehicle's lights dazzled her as it roared across the open ground. Eden felt like an animal trapped in the headlights of a speeding truck, frozen by fear right in the path of danger. She turned back towards the fence, still almost fifty feet away. Their shadows danced frantically in the lights of the speeding truck. It's too far, Baxter grunted. We'll never make it this way. Baxter grabbed Eden by the arm and pulled her to the left. Eden turned and together they charged for the ruins of another temple twenty feet away. Eden slipped on the uneven ground, but Baxter's grip steadied her and pulled them on. Eden again wished she'd been able to wear her normal clothes. She'd worn a dress about twice in her life, and had hated it both times. Just when things couldn't get any worse, Eden heard the report of gunfire behind them. The noise cut through the throaty growl of the engine. Incoming! Baxter shouted. Together, and not a moment too soon, Eden and Baxter leapt headlong across a wall and into the ruined structure. Eden crashed hard to the ground. Without moving, she dragged in several deep breaths. Some bullets scored lines in the ancient stone, while others zipped through the air above their heads. Shards of rock splintered and pinged around. The vehicle thundered to a stop just beyond the wall. The doors clicked open and heavy footsteps hammered their way. Another clip or two pulverized the walls around Eden and Baxter, this is priceless stuff, guys. Don't you want to keep it in one piece? Eden shouted. She pulled herself up into a crouch and looked around. They were in the ruins of one of the city's outer buildings. Used as homes or workshops, there were hundreds of buildings like this surrounding the pyramids. Many of the structures still lay unexcavated beneath the ground or had become overgrown with plants and trees. This one, however, had been excavated and preserved for tourists to meander through during the day. 
the inside of the structure was several feet beneath the level of the ground outside, and the addition of stairs and walkways made the site easily accessible. Eden took advantage of a pause in the shooting to peer across the wall. There were six men directly in front of them, but countless more around the site. Whose genius idea was it not to bring any weapons? Eden said, looking down at her dress. Does that outfit come with a holster then? Baxter said. Eden swung around and caught the ex-pilot looking at her slender waist. She narrowed her gaze as a dozen clever retorts swarmed her mind. She didn't get to say any of them, as the guns roared once more. Eden crouched back down behind the wall and crawled to Baxter. We can use this structure to get most of the way to the boundary, Baxter said, pointing behind them. Eden nodded and together they threaded their way further into the complex. As they got closer to the centre of the complex, the surrounding walls became higher, blocking their view of the pursuing men. Baxter led them into a structure in the centre of the complex, which still had well-defined doorways. In a miracle of preservation, the walls here towered above Eden's head. She paused and looked up at one of the walls in which the stones were decorated with ornately carved snakes, which slithered across one another. Eden stepped through the doorway and into a large open space. It looked as though the area was designed as an enclosed courtyard. The place was incredibly well preserved, with a floor of stone slabs and a dozen surrounding columns. Eden could almost imagine the place used as a private, tranquil oasis amid the bustling city. Footsteps thundered into the courtyard on the opposite side. Eden spun around and saw a man running through one of the doors, his flashlight whipping from side to side. Fortunately, he wasn't prepared to meet Eden and Baxter, so took a moment to raise his rifle. Eden and Baxter made use of the life-saving delay and leaped behind one of the columns. The man swung the rifle and opened fire. The sound of gunfire roared through the courtyard. Although missing Eden and Baxter, the bullets smashed a carved serpent into bits. Part of the face fell beside Eden, the stone eyes gazing eerily up at her. Eden picked up the chunk of rock which was around the size of a house brick. She hated to see archaeological sites like this destroyed, let alone by an idiot with an AK-47. Any ideas? Eden said, placing the block down and glancing at Baxter, who crouched beside the column to her left. Baxter peered around the column, earning another flurry of bullets from their quarry. Definitely don't go that way, he muttered. What about that door? He pointed at an opening about ten feet away which led back into the maze of walls and rooms, Unless you can move faster than the bullet, I'd say that's a bad idea too, Eden said. Whatever we do, we better move soon. I really don't want to be here when this guy's friends arrive. Agree with that, Baxter said, looking around for another solution. You know the problem with law enforcement nowadays, Eden said. They've no respect for life or antiquity. Just because you're dressed like someone from the 19th century, Baxter jibed. Eden scowled and chalked the comment up to be avenged later. Hang on, Baxter said, pointing at a sign beside them. That gives me an idea. The sign was the sort ubiquitous to tourist sites all around the world, giving visitors a potted history of what they were looking at in various languages. Baxter stood behind the column. This is definitely not the time for a history lesson, Eden hissed. In one swift movement, Baxter reached out and shoved the sign. As he'd hoped, the thing was mounted on wheels. The sign rattled and bumped across the slabs. Their quarry fired, bullets tearing the sign into shreds. Out the door now, Baxter shouted. Wait! Eden grabbed up the block which had fallen from the column above her head. No, out now, Baxter roared. Eden was already heading the other way. She ran around the courtyard, using the columns to obscure her movement. Their adversary continued firing on the sign, clearly not taking the time to actually understand what he was shooting at. Eden rounded the final corner and closed the distance between her and the man in less than two seconds. At the last moment, the man saw her approach and swung the weapon in her direction. It was too late. Eden already had the block raised. With all her strength, she smashed the stone into the man's forehead. The firing stopped, and the man crumbled to the floor. His eyes rolled back into his head. We've got to get out of here. Baxter said, running up beside Eden. There are too many men for us to deal with, and Athena said there are more on the way. Yes, I know that. Eden bent down and grabbed the guy's weapon. She passed the gun to Baxter. Hold that. If anyone comes through that door, you know what to... 
Baxter fired and a man who had just appeared in the doorway gurgled and then slid to the floor. Nicely done, Eden muttered, glancing up at Baxter. She turned her attention to the man lying on the floor in front of her. Serpent's revenge, she muttered, noticing the guy had an imprint of the snake's face from the block on his forehead. Eden searched the man quickly. Other than spare magazines and a sidearm which she quickly took for herself, the man carried nothing. No identification of any kind, no wallet, he's not even got any handcuffs. So, Baxter said, glancing around the courtyard, have you ever heard of a police officer not carrying identification or handcuffs? This guy is an assassin, plain and simple. Not anymore, Baxter muttered, looking down at the prone figure. But his friends still are. You ready to get out of here? Yep, let's go, Eden said, climbing to her feet. Another man appeared at the doorway. Baxter opened fire as they backed across the courtyard in the direction of the site boundary. Once through the door, they turned and ran. More of the men closed in on them now, dark figures moving in all directions. Bullets whizzed past, striking stone walls and statues. Eden dove behind one of the crumbling walls, its weathered bricks providing temporary shelter. Baxter followed suit, his eyes scanning the area for an escape route. That way, Eden said, guiding them down another passage and through two small chambers. They reached the wall at the far edge of the complex. Eden stood and looked across the parapet. The rusting wire of chain-link fence shimmered in the gloom. The boundary was just twenty feet away now. We're close, Eden said. The gunfire behind them had stopped, indicating the men didn't know exactly where Eden and Baxter were. Raised voices drifted through the complex, though, as they searched the passages one by one. Eden knew it wouldn't be long before the men made it here. Go now, Eden said. She scrambled up the wall and ran towards the fence. She reached the fence and noticed that the thing had seen better days, thankfully. Eden pulled a section of the wire away from the ground and they both scurried underneath without a second's delay. Eden paused and gazed through the fence. The pyramids now sat in the gloom like great shipwrecks far beneath the ocean. The beams of flashlights whipped one way and then the other, from the complex through which they'd just escaped. Far too close, Eden said, setting off as fast as the dress would allow. Fifteen minutes later, running all the way and keeping to the shadows, they made it to the truck stop. The Volkswagen transporter waited beside the kiosk. Baxter and Eden sprinted across the forecourt, slid open the side door and jumped inside. Athena hit the gas and they tore out of the truck stop without missing a beat. Man, am I pleased to see you, Eden said, sighing. Now I can change out of this monstrous dress. Chapter 36 It'll be best for us to head toward the city, Athena said from the driver's seat, as the old VW rumbled onto a freeway. The party there will last all night. The police will be far too busy to look for us. Agreed. As long as we find somewhere to clean up en route, Eden said, holding up her hand. For almost twenty minutes, Eden and Baxter sat silently in the back of the van. Both reveled in the opportunity to catch their breath and rest their aching muscles. There would be time to report back on everything that had happened. First, they needed to rest. Athena pulled into another truck stop. This far from the trouble, hopefully they wouldn't attract attention. Other than a double-length truck idling at the pumps, the stop was empty. You've got five minutes, Athena said, turning toward Eden and Baxter. We need to keep moving. Sure thing, Eden said, grabbing her bag the small first aid kit, and running into the facilities block at the side of the service station. A little more than a basic concrete building, the facilities block was anything but luxurious, but Eden didn't care. She bolted the door and stripped out of the dress. She tore a strip off the dress and ran it under the hot tap for several seconds. When the water ran clear, she rubbed the cloth against the pale bar of soap. Then she used the strip of material to scrub the makeup and dirt from her face, hands, arms, and neck. After she was clean, she set about dressing the wound on her hand. It was funny that she hadn't even noticed the cut before Baxter pointed it out. It was only afterwards that it had ached. Then again, there was so much going on at that moment, what with them trying to avoid falling to their deaths and all, that it wasn't really surprising she hadn't noticed the minor injury. When she was clean and feeling so much better for it, Eden stared at herself in the mirror. 
she realised then how lucky they were to have gotten out of there alive. Those men had no intention of just arresting Baxter and herself. They were there to kill them. Then a thought rose in Eden's mind like the first buds of spring flowers. It was strange for the police to mobilise such a large force in less than half an hour, especially on the busiest day of the year. It was also strange that the guy she'd searched carried no identification, handcuffs, wallet, or anything else she would expect a police officer keep on his person. And although Baxter had made a fair racket falling down the shaft, that was nothing against the noise of the crowds outside. In which case, how did the police even know that they were there? The question shook Eden like an icy draught. She gripped hold of the sink, then splashed water on her face. As the water ran in rivulets down over her cheeks and chin, the solution appeared all at once. The police, mates or whoever they were, must have known Eden and Baxter were coming. Someone had leaked their plan. Eden dressed quickly in her normal black fatigues. Practical and hard-wearing, she'd worn this personal uniform for years. It was a habit Eden would not deviate from again any time soon. She balled up the filthy ball gown, dropped it in the trash and then headed out to the Volkswagen. Eden climbed into the van and set about disconnecting all of their technical gear. What she was about to say, Eden didn't want any chance of being overheard. Baxter, who had also changed, glanced at Athena. Eden, what are you doing? Athena asked. Eden didn't respond, moving down to the server unit and unplugging a row of cables. She gets like this sometimes, Baxter said, shrugging. I think it's just the pressure. When Eden was satisfied that all the computer gear was deactivated, she turned to the others. Whoever those men were, someone told them that we were coming. How do you figure? Baxter said. They must have seen or heard us getting into the tunnels. No, they didn't see us, that I know for sure. And it's next to impossible they heard us down there, even with your wailing. There were thousands of people wandering around, remember? I knew it wasn't my fault, Baxter said, rubbing his hands together. I mean, you still behaved like an idiot, but I don't think you're responsible for the police knowing we were there. But wait, Athena said. That means someone else told them. How many people knew we planned to retrieve the second orb? Eden glanced at the orb, which remained in its bag like a forgotten Christmas present. Not many, Athena said, listing the people on her fingers. The three of us. Then, Winslow, Beaumont, and... The three looked at each other unable to speak. Alexander Winslow sat in his office and gazed out at the waters of the Caribbean Sea, which lapped gently against the ship. He took a sip of scotch, ice cubes clinking. On this occasion, even the frosty burn of the spirit failed to calm his mind. Something about this whole situation didn't feel right. Winslow knew it. He could feel it as clearly as the smoky burn of the scotch on his tongue, but he just couldn't figure out what it was. During Winslow's career as Helios, the man in charge of the Council of Selene, he'd staked his reputation on being one step ahead. Contrary to the beliefs of many, this wasn't some superpower he'd been born with. He couldn't predict the future by reading the grounds in his coffee, nor did he sneak ashore to consult with an astrologist. Winslow considered such things to be hocus-pocus. Winslow achieved this advantage in the same way he had achieved everything in his life, by slow, methodical and constant work. Before the council deployed its agents, Winslow would work through everything that could happen. He would create contingency plan after contingency plan and have the people and resources ready for each one. Of course, it was important the mission was a success, but it was crucial that the secrecy of the council remained unaffected, and his agents returned safely, in that order. Right now, though, Winslow felt none of that control. He felt as though events had occurred in such quick succession, he'd barely time to work out what was going on, let alone plan their next move. They were being reactive rather than proactive, and that made him distinctly uncomfortable. What's more, Winslow had the burning instinct that the events of the last few days were far more than coincidence alone. For a man like Brent Fastlane to just be in the right place at the right time and witness the Cessna's crash landing was a statistical outlier. A miracle. And there was always more to miracles than met the eye. 
This gave Winslow the uncomfortable sensation there was someone behind all these events, pulling the strings. So far, that unknown entity had been leading them on a dance, but that needed to end. It was time to get one step ahead. What he needed to do, Winslow realised, was go back to the beginning. He needed to run right through the events of the last few days, study the things that didn't stack up, and try to find a link. He pushed the mouse and keyboard aside. This was something he wanted to do manually, with pen and paper. He grabbed a large sheet of paper and listed the elements as he understood them. He noted down the details of Beaumont and DeLuca's discovery of the orbs in Syria ten years ago. Then he noted down the discovery of a similar orb beneath Teotihuacan by Ramirez and his team. That, of course, led to DeLuca being called in. She was, after all, one of the world leaders on such artefacts. Based in Miami, she was probably the closest, too. DeLuca flies out there to see the orb in situ, Winslow said out loud. Talking through his thoughts was one of his habits. He'd read an academic paper some time ago, which said talking to yourself was either a sign of high intelligence or madness. Winslow assumed he had the former, but couldn't be totally certain. They package the thing up and drive it to the airport. They get on the plane, and that's where things go wrong. Winslow tapped the paper with the tip of his pen. Then he froze, the pen hovering an inch from the paper. The plane, Winslow said slowly. His eyebrows shifted together in a look of intense concentration. That's where things go. In one movement, Winslow dropped the pen and snagged up the phone. He spoke to the overnight technician working down below, asking to get access to security camera footage from the airport. Winslow hung up the phone, and less than a minute later, his computer chimed with a new message. Winslow opened the message and tapped on the link. The airport's security camera system filled the screen. That's the one place we haven't looked, Winslow murmured to himself, scrolling back through the footage. He selected the date and fixed the time at around 15 minutes before the Cessna's departure. Then he paged through the multiple camera feeds. Within a couple of minutes, he saw a truck arriving at the airport. Recognising DeLuca and Ramirez through the windshield, Winslow enlarged the video full screen and hit play. Ramirez rolled down the window and spoke to the security team. The professor then handed over their passports. Winslow scrutinised the truck carefully. He thought about the orb sitting there in its protective case, then he thought about what was due to happen in the next few hours. On the screen, the gate slid open, and the truck drove inside. Winslow flicked between the cameras, following the truck as it drove through the airport. They passed several large private jets before stopping beside the Cessna. The surveillance footage here wasn't great, as the camera was some distance away, but Winslow could see Ramirez climb out, followed by DeLuca. The pair spoke with the pilots and then loaded the orb into the plane. Winslow hit pause. On the screen, DeLuca climbed into the Cessna and Ramirez stood looking out into the airport. Winslow studied the image carefully. There was something about it that didn't quite look right. Well, it looked fine, but it didn't look quite as Winslow had imagined it to look. There was something missing. What's not here? Winslow hissed, leaning toward the screen so that his face was just inches from the image. It's exactly as... Wait a minute. The expression dropped from Winslow's face. Then his bald fist crashed into the desk as the realisation shook his body. The maintenance team, he whispered, barely audible. Ramirez said that when they arrived, there was a maintenance crew nearby. Winslow tapped through several more cameras and checked the entire area. There was no maintenance crew anywhere nearby. Questions bubbled wildly through Winslow's mind. Ramirez had at best misremembered, but at worst lied. Just assume for a moment that he is lying. Why? Winslow continued, verbalising his thoughts. The only reason Ramirez would lie is to deflect the obvious truth. But what is that obvious truth? Then Winslow heard a sound. It was faint, but against the silence it was as sharp as a knife thrust. Winslow knew instantly what it was, 
The third step down on the staircase outside his office creaked when anyone climbed the stairs. Winslow pulled his thoughts back to what he'd been previously considering. The only reason Ramirez would lie, Winslow said out loud, is because the only person aboard the plane who didn't end up dead or in a coma was me, came a voice from the other side of the office. Sergio Ramirez stepped into the room, a gun pointed squarely at Winslow's chest. Mr. Winslow, Ramirez said, I believe it's time that we had a little heart to heart. Chapter 37 One hour earlier, Sergio Ramirez had gazed out of the window of his cabin aboard the Bologna. The sun had dispatched her light beneath the waters of the Caribbean Sea a while ago, and the Bologna now rose and fell on inky waves. Ramirez glanced at his watch. Soon it would be time to make his play. The ultimate move of this whole episode, his masterpiece would then be complete. Ramirez inhaled a deep breath slowly and then let it go. Every sense within him tingled with life and vitality. He couldn't quite believe his plan had worked out so well. The plan had occurred to Ramirez almost two years ago, when he'd first heard rumours of Alexander Winslow's involvement in this secret society. Ramirez didn't care about the Council of Selene or whatever they were called. For him, this was a simple tale of revenge. A tale of revenge that had since become his life's work, and now, his masterpiece. The more Ramirez learned about Winslow and his organisation, though, the more he believed this needed to happen. It appeared there wasn't a corner of the globe where the Council of Selene didn't have some influence. The more Ramirez dug, the more his mission became somehow bigger than vengeance. Now, Ramirez didn't just want to bring down Winslow, but sink the council, both literally and figuratively. How to do it, though, that took some planning. First, he needed to get access to the Bologna. With the ship in constant motion and not equipped with tracking devices which were accessible to the open network, even pinning the thing down was a challenge. After he'd planned his strategy for getting aboard, he needed to find a way to get some of the crew ashore and incapacitate the others. Only then would he have access to Winslow and the conversation he desired so greatly. Ramirez thought through the plan and grinned. Although there appeared to be many moving parts, it was really very simple. Ramirez recalled arriving at Fastlane's villa three weeks ago, wearing the uniform of a car delivery driver. Hello, are you Mr. Carlos Gonzalez? Ramirez had said. I'm here to deliver your new car. There's just a bit of paperwork to do first. Ramirez handed the stack of papers across to Fastlane. Scanning the papers, Fastlane clearly realised the mix-up. The car had been delivered to the wrong house. The correct place was over a hundred miles away. Ramirez could almost see the cogs turning in Fastlane's head as he weighed up honesty over potentially getting a new car for free. Ever the optimist, Fastlane had nodded, signed the papers, smiled, nodded again, and fifteen minutes later was the owner of a brand new car. From then on, it had been simple. Of course, the car wasn't fitted with self-driving chips, as Fang had told Fastlane. It had a specially installed system, however, which allowed it to be controlled remotely. On the night in question, Ramirez's team had followed Fastlane and then taken control of the Volkstar from 50 feet behind. More than tipsy and focused on trying to stay on the road, Fastlane hadn't noticed the vehicle in his rearview mirror. That just left the small matter of crash-landing the Cessna in the forest. Of course, Ramirez knew that actually crash-landing in the forest was ridiculous. It could, and probably would be, fatal for them all. So, he'd opted for a clever sleight of hand. Good work, Captain, Ramirez said as the Cessna touched down and bounced across a field two miles away from the proposed crash site. Captain Bigham slowed the plane in a wide arc toward a trailer home at the far side of the field. His powerful arms easily worked the controls, bringing the plane to a gentle stop. That was some good acting up there too, Ramirez said. You had me going for a moment too. All in a day's work, Bigham said, powering down the engine. You're paying us enough. Bigham turned around and looked uncomfortably at DeLuca's slumped figure. For a moment, it looked as though he was going to ask about her, but clearly thought better of it. No less than you deserve, Captain, Ramirez said, clapping his hands cheerfully. He climbed to his feet and slid open the door. I'll sort your money for you now. Ramirez and the pilots climbed out of the Cessna. Ramirez whistled and several men walked out of the trailer home. 
One carried a bag which looked as though it contained a lot of cash. The man walked toward the pilot and held the bag out for the pilot to take. I trust it's all there. Bigham bent over to open the bag. At that moment, the man who'd carried the bag swung his fist into the pilot's face. Ramirez heard a crack as the pilot's jaw broke. The large man grunted in pain and surprise. The second punch sent him down to the ground, landing with a thud like a pile of bricks. The men surrounded the wiry co-pilot. The smaller man whined and tried to back away. Within a moment, he was out cold too. Make sure they're dead and their injuries look like they got them in the crash, Ramirez said. When you're done, put them back on the plane. Where's that crane operator? Just under an hour later, the Cessna was winched into position in the forest, as though it had crashed there. A few minutes after that, Fastlane's car appeared at the road above. The next part, Ramirez thought, was the cleverest bit of the plan so far. A small image projector built into the dashboard of the Volkstar made it appear to Fastlane that the plane flew in and crashed into the side of the hill. The sound of crunching metal and wood pumped through the car's sound system aided the illusion. Then when the doors were unlocked and Fastlane saw the Cessna in the trees below, his assumption was the obvious one. And it all worked perfectly, Ramirez thought, checking his watch one more time. A sorte protege or saudazis, Ramirez said. Luck favours the bold. He'd learned the Portuguese phrase from his father. It was a phrase that he had found to be true throughout his life. In fact, Ramirez found that in the bolder you were, the more luck came your way. Tonight, though, Ramirez didn't think he needed luck at all. Sergio Ramirez crossed the cabin and pulled open the door. He listened closely for any movement. Satisfied there was none, he peered out and checked the corridor in both directions. Empty, good. He stepped out into the corridor and closed the door gently behind him. Walking past cabins on both the left and right, he thought about the people sleeping inside. Many of them wouldn't wake up tonight. He knew they weren't directly responsible for his pain, but that didn't matter. They were part of the organisation that sanctioned such things. He would take revenge against them as though they'd personally pulled the trigger. They were part of this mess and Ramirez was the clean-up crew, Ramirez reached the Bologna's rear stairwell and descended two floors. Having memorised the ship's layout several months ago, Ramirez knew exactly where he was going. He reached the door of the control room and paused. In this room, Ramirez knew, an operator supervised the ship's security. Fortunately, they'd be more interested in watching what was outside. Ramirez knocked gently against the door. He heard movements inside. He slipped out the knife he'd taken from the kitchen earlier that day, and concealed it behind his hand. The door swung open. Ramirez pinned a smile to his face. Excuse me, could you tell me the way back to my cabin, please? I seem to have taken a wrong turn somewhere. It all looks the same around here. The security operator stood between the door at the jam. He was a small man in his mid-twenties who Ramirez was sure he'd seen before. Ramirez glanced behind the man. Several large screens glowed in the gloom. Sorry to bother you so late. Ramirez said. He faked a yawn. In truth, he hadn't felt this alert in years. I came out of my cabin to go for a breath of fresh air on the deck. With all the excitement, I'm tired but just can't seem to sleep. Of course, the operator said, stepping forward to direct Ramirez back toward the staircase. Ramirez struck like a coiled viper. He swung the blade and sunk it into the back of the man's neck. The operator didn't even get the chance to cry out. Ramirez caught the man to prevent the noise of the falling body. Of course, the whole thing would have been caught on camera, but now no one was watching. Ramirez laid the body on the floor and stepped into the control room. He quickly found the central breaker cabinet and powered down several systems. These would make it more difficult for anyone to track the Bologna's location, should they try to. He also disconnected the satellite link, which would stop access to the onboard systems. The ship was now effectively alone. Ramirez dragged the operator along the corridor and down another set of stairs. The operator's feet bumped like the legs of a rag doll. Ramirez paused and listened to hear if the noise had caused anyone to come and investigate. It didn't sound like it. He dragged the man on until they were outside the armory and equipment store. This room contained a cache of weapons and combat technology designed to facilitate any mission the team was presented with. The room was sealed with a solid steel door. The door could only be unlocked with a palm print and retinal scan. 
Fortunately for Ramirez, it didn't test whether the person was alive or dead. He heaved the operator up against the wall and placed the man's hand on the scanner. The system beeped and whirred, then the screen turned green. The retinal scan was more difficult. With the scanner mounted at eye level, Ramirez had to lift the man and hold his head in just the right position. After two attempts, the computer system found what it was looking for and the lock disengaged. Ramirez kicked the door open, dragged the operator inside and deposited him against the far wall. Then he stood back and examined his prize. Shelves of rifles, sidearms, knives, explosives and other combat equipment lined the walls. There was enough here to sink the whole ship, which was exactly what Ramirez planned to do. Chapter 38 Run through this one more time, Baxter said, looking from Eden to Athena and back again. Both women had those looks of determination and conviction that Baxter was starting to know so well. It's just simply not possible a security force of that size with that level of firepower could show up that quickly, Eden said. This has to be an inside job. How do we know it's Ramirez? Baxter asked. And more importantly, what's his endgame? The Bologna, Eden said. He's there now with nothing more than the basic security force. If he wanted to infiltrate the council, that's a pretty good position to be in. Baxter nodded in agreement. Why? Eden said, shrugging. I have no idea. As part of the council's work, we have to make lots of decisions that sometimes negatively affect a person or group of people, Athena said. It's a really tough call to keep a clear head when lives are on the line whatever you decide. My dad, Eden said, the last ounce of colour draining from her face. Ramirez plans to bring down the council by killing my dad. We need to get back there now, Eden screamed, the realisation hitting her like a missile. They had been tricked right from the start, led into an ambush, the true intention of which was only now becoming clear. Agreed. I'll drive. Baxter, can you get a track on the Bologna to see if it's moved? Athena rose to her feet and clambered through into the driver's seat. The VW's old engine roared to life, sending shockwaves through the chassis. Baxter switched on a laptop and set about reconnecting it to the network. The screen came to life, and his fingers flew across the keys. It's in the same place. Oh, wait. That's strange. What? Eden said, moving around the truck and sitting beside Baxter. The Bologna has a device that constantly pings out the location on a secure network. It stopped a few minutes ago. What does that mean? Eden said, stumbling over her words. Could that have happened accidentally? System update or something? Baxter shook his head. The only way to turn that system off is from the control room breaker. It's hardwired in so it can only be shut off on board. That means... Baxter trailed off, clearly not wanting to finish his sentence. That means that whatever Ramirez is planning, he's already started it. A typhoon of worry raged through Eden's mind. Athena hit the gas and the VW squealed back onto the highway. Eden watched through the split windshield as Athena performed several overtaking manoeuvres that pushed the old vehicle beyond its comfortable limits. Baxter wedged himself in position and tried to access the Bologna's onboard systems. They're all shut down, he said. Someone tripped the power, it seems. Keep trying, Eden barked more aggressively than she intended. There must be a way through. Baxter hammered at the keyboard without missing a stroke. The VW's engine yowled as they overtook a bus, filled with weary revelers after the Day of the Dead celebrations. We'll be at the chopper in two minutes, Athena shouted, pulling off the highway and bumping down the gravel track which led to the farm complex in which they'd landed the Eurocopter a few hours ago. The transporter slid one way and then the other on the gravel track. The movement reminded Eden of that scene when Bambi goes on the ice. She shook the mawkish memory from her thoughts and stood up, ready to charge out of the truck as soon as they stopped. Baxter did the same, stashing the laptop away and preparing the bags for a quick exit. Athena hit the brakes hard. The wheels locked. Gravel flew in all directions. Eden grabbed hold of the seats just in time. Everything else inside the truck shot forward, including Baxter. Baxter stumbled, clutching the orb to his chest. Without being asked, Athena pointed through the windshield. 
The chopper sat 100 feet away, surrounded by a small army of gun-toting men. Three black Forerunner fours sat in a circle around the Eurocopter, lights blazing and engines running. Athena killed the VW's lights and flicked the gearbox into reverse. She gently pulled back up the track and away from the chopper. That rules the chopper out, Baxter said, climbing to his feet. Fortunately, the men were too preoccupied searching the craft and hadn't seen the Volkswagen approach and then retreat. Just out of sight, Athena paused for a moment, narrowing her gaze on the men. Eden dug out a pair of night vision goggles, slid open the door and walked silently back toward the foe. Reaching the tree line, she stopped and studied the men. There were at least ten of them, each heavily armed. Looks like private security, Eden whispered. Guns for hire. This is a big budget operation. Hold on a second, Baxter said, tiptoeing up beside her. How did they know where we'd landed? This place was deserted when we arrived. Same as the men who chased us down in the tunnel, Eden added. Eden and Baxter turned and scurried back to the Volkswagen. This has been planned right down to the finest details, Athena said, driving them away from the chopper. And bankroll too, Baxter said. Teams of thugs like that don't come cheap. A few hundred yards down the lane, Athena pulled a 180 and parked at the side of the track. We need a plan, Eden said. A good one. Could we get the chopper back if we... No, those men are heavily armed and very ready to shoot, Baxter said. They're clearly the backup team, waiting for us to return. We could drive to the coast and get a boat, Athena said. How long would that take? Eden asked. Several days at a best guess, Baxter said, even if we get really lucky and have no hold-ups. That's way too long. Eden tapped her fingers, her mind spinning through solutions. She pulled out her phone and made a couple of internet searches. Coming across one, a grin spread across her face. What about in this, Eden said, showing Baxter and then Athena a photograph. It's not the worst idea you've ever had, Baxter said, shaking his head slowly. Eden was about to ask what her worst idea was, but Athena stamped on the gas. The VW roared off back toward the highway. Almost half an hour later, Athena slowed the Volkswagen to a crawl as they followed a set of rusting metal signs which advertised the location of Bird's skydiving school. Athena glanced at the sign, which indicated they needed to continue down the narrow track for another two miles. In the passenger seat, Eden scrolled through the flying school's basic website, which looked as though it had been built for an earlier version of the internet. Pixelated images showed people grinning as they plummeted toward the ground. To Eden, that didn't sound like fun at all. You sure this place will have an operational aircraft? Baxter said, verbalising doubts the whole group shared. Well, obviously I don't know for certain, Eden said. But I hope. You can't go skydiving without a plane, right? Can't argue with that, Athena said. It's not just a plane we need. We need one with a good range, and that's fueled up and ready to go. Baxter grunted from the back seat. Some little micro thing is just not going to... Have you no faith back there? Eden said, feigning confidence. A rusty chain-link fence topped with barbed wire came into view, and Athena slowed the Volkswagen. They stopped beside a gate. The gate was closed and locked. A padlock hung on a hefty-looking chain. This is definitely the place, Eden said, pointing at a sign which showed the skydiving school's logo. The sign's colours had long since faded, and two of the ties had snapped, causing it to hang at a funny angle. Eden peered along the fence in both directions. In many places, the chain link was broken and shreds of plastic fluttered from the wire. The fence didn't look like it would be that difficult to get through. On the other side of the wire, Eden could barely make out a collection of gloomy buildings. She couldn't see a single light illuminating the site, nor the runway. I've got to say it, Baxter said. I think we're wasting time here. Even if they've got the plane we need, flying a light aircraft at night is... Baxter was cut off in mid-sentence by the roaring engine. Athena smashed the pedal to the floor. The truck lurched forward and galloped across rough ground toward the gate. Eden planted her hands on the dash, certain that the ancient Volkswagen was going to come to a screaming stop or break up immediately on impact. The truck's nose struck the chain link, tearing the gate from its hinges and flinging the frame to one side. Sorry, Athena said, slowing the engine. 
I can't stand pessimists. They make me do reckless things. Eden grinned back at Baxter, who held his hands up in surrender. Athena slowed as they cruised toward the collection of buildings. Cracked glass in the building's windows sparkled in the transporter's headlights. That looks like our best bet, Eden said, pointing toward a building on the far side, which looked like an airplane hangar. Essentially a large Quonset hut, the hangar was constructed with a single plane of corrugated metal and two semicircular walls. Noticing that the building was no bigger than a barn, Eden felt her remaining confidence drain. Then she remembered her father, aboard the Bologna, with the mastermind of this whole sorry mess. Athena stopped the VW beside the hangar doors and shut off the engine. Baxter passed around flashlights and the three clambered out. Eden swept the beam of her flashlight across the surrounding buildings, looking for signs of occupation. Nothing. In fact, from close up, the surrounding buildings looked even more decrepit than they had from the fence. Eden noticed a tree growing out through one of the shattered buildings, and another structure which looked as though it had partly fallen in on itself. A mud-coloured windsock hung limp on a wonky pole. The whole place looked as though it was losing a battle with nature. Pushing all negative thoughts from her consciousness, Eden stepped toward the hangar. In the centre of the large doors, a padlock barred their entry. At least someone thinks what's inside is worth protecting, Athena said, stepping alongside Eden. The beams of their light swayed through the gloom. That shouldn't be an issue, Baxter said. We've got a tyre iron in the truck. We'll be in there in a few seconds. You'll do no such thing, came a voice from behind them. Now turn around really slowly. I wouldn't want you to get shot accidentally. Chapter 39 I'm sorry, young man, Ramirez said, looking down at the dead man slumped in the corner of the armory. But stop looking at me like that. It's creepy. Ramirez strolled over and ran his hand down across the man's eyelids, closing his eyes. The body was already cooling in the efficient air conditioning, probably kept that way to make sure the supplies remained in top condition, Ramirez thought. Ramirez paced through the room and quickly found what he was looking for. He grabbed the satellite phone and powered it on. He had several urgent calls to make. He dialed the first number, which he'd committed to memory. When a man with a gruff voice answered, he said, I'll have control of the ship in the next few minutes. The extraction team had been tracking the Bologna all day, staying far enough away to evade suspicion. With no one on board the ship who could fight back, their presence wasn't needed for firepower, just to get Ramirez out of there once his work was done. I'll send you the location. Board as soon as you arrive. He hung up and immediately placed another call. Please report, he demanded as soon as the call connected. They evaded us at Teotihuacan, the man reported. But we have their helicopter surrounded. There's no way they'll be back there before you're done. A flare of frustration moved through Ramirez at the news. He'd planned for his team to catch up with Eden and her team in the tunnels beneath Teotihuacan, that would be a fitting end for them. The fact they were still alive was a frustration, but hundreds of miles away and without transportation, they were unlikely to be an issue. Fine, Ramirez barked. If they turn up, shoot on sight. He ended the call. Finally, he called the man he'd hired to play the role of Commander Fang. This had been an essential part of the plan, as he needed to convince Winslow and his team the threat was real. Fang or whatever his real name was, had done a stellar job. It's done, Ramirez said when Fang answered. How soon can you be out of there? Within a few hours, Fang said. Ramirez heard a strange squealing noise in the background. Get off! Go away! Fang shouted. And what? Not you, sir, these monkeys. Make sure you remove all traces that you were ever there. Even sweep the beach. No trace, understood? Yes, boss. What shall we do with Fastlane? Ramirez thought about it. He considered instructing Fang to kill the guy, but reconsidered at the last moment. Just leave him there, he knows nothing. And the orb? Fang said. Again, Ramirez thought through his options. Sure, the orb had its secrets to tell, but Ramirez figured they were probably more trouble than they were worth. Stay focused on the end game, he thought to himself. Leave it there too, that'll just add to the mystery for the next person who finds it. 
Ramirez ended the call, slipped the phone away and grinned. Now it was time for the real fun to start. Ramirez paced the rows of metal shelving, taking a mental inventory. Although he'd tried to research what weaponry the council kept in stores, he couldn't find a definitive list. That meant, when the time came, he would have to think on his feet. After one circuit of the whole room, he stood back and thought it through. Yes, there was more than enough here to make four explosive devices all rigged to the same remote detonator. Position the devices correctly, and the Bologna would be under the waves before anyone could call for help. Ramirez also selected a large canister of gas, which would incapacitate the Bologna's crew for long enough to meet their watery end. Circumnavigating the room again, Ramirez collected all the items he needed and lined them up on the bench at the front of the room. Four blocks of plastic explosives gave him the requisite firepower. He then connected a wireless detonator to each of the blocks, being careful to ensure the device remained off. Then he selected the device that would fire each of the detonators at his command. The device had the option to either detonate all the charges at once, or one at a time. Ramirez selected to detonate them all at once, one great fireball to end this once and for all. I never... He laid the system out in front of him and checked it through one more time. Years of work had led to this moment, and Ramirez sure would not rush it now. Satisfied that everything was present and correct, Ramirez selected a Sig Sauer P266 for himself. The Sig would do the job nicely. Perhaps it was even too powerful. He only planned to kill one man with the thing, after all. When everything was present and correct... Ramirez wedged open the door and slipped out into the corridor. For the next 30 minutes, he moved slowly around the ship, positioning the explosive devices in pre-planned strategic positions. In isolation, each of the expositions would only injure the Bologna. Like all modern ships, the Bologna had several systems which were designed to isolate an area in case of hull breach. Ramirez needed to cause such destruction these systems were rendered useless. He fitted the fourth explosive block beside the prop shaft on the rear starboard side, deep within the Bologna's engine bay. Two squirts of spray adhesive and the plastic explosive was fixed tight against the metal. Ramirez flicked the switch on the detonation device. A red LED blinked three times and then turned green, indicating it was paired with the remote controller. Ramirez slid the controller from his pocket, Four LEDs on the side of the device confirmed each of the detonators were live and ready for his command. Ramirez clipped the remote to his belt and climbed the ladder out of the engine bay. As he climbed, he thought about Helios, Winslow, or whatever the guy was called. Ramirez imagined Winslow, probably asleep in his bed right now, unaware like Ramirez himself had been the day his life had changed forever. Ramirez reached the top of the ladder, swung open the hatch and climbed through. Beside the hatch, the gas tank sat strapped to a small trolley. Ramirez pushed the trolley down the corridor and unlocked another hatch. He heaved the tank through, the metal striking the door jamb with a clang. Unlike the engine rooms which were quiet while the Bologna lay at anchor, this room whirred with the sound of machines. Ramirez scrutinised the system. Fresh air was sucked in from a vent on the top deck, passed through various filters before being distributed around the ship. The system was powered by a large fan, which ran night and day. Ramirez stepped toward the humming device. He unlocked one of the service hatches and peered inside. Air from the fan streamed out. He placed the tank on the floor below the hatch and ran a hose into the system. Then he closed the hatch and sealed it as best he could with a roll of tape. Pulling on a gas mask, Ramirez twisted the valve on the top of the tank. Within a few minutes, the gas would have made its way into every room on the ship and incapacitated each of the occupants. Ramirez turned and stepped back out into the corridor. He removed the gun from its hidden holster. The metal felt good and powerful in his grip. Revenge really was a dish best served cold. Chapter 40 Eden gritted her teeth. She looked up at the large hangar doors in front of them, blocking their path. She glanced left and then right. The voice sounded close behind them, trapping them against the doors. As though reading Eden's thoughts, the voice came again. In case you think running is a good idea, I've got the business end of this Remington 870 pointing right at your backs. The mystery assailant pumped the gun, as though proving the threat. I won't tell you again, turn around now. Eden glanced quickly at Baxter and Athena. 
then nodded almost imperceptibly. Right now, there was nothing they could do but go along with whatever this person wanted. Together, slowly, the three turned around. The sight of their aggressor took Eden by surprise. A woman in her early middle age looked the three of them up and down. She had a great beehive of black hair tied up on her head. She wore the overalls of an Air Force pilot, open at the front with a red tank top beneath. There was something strangely glamorous about the woman, Eden decided. Her large brown eyes darted from Eden to Athena and then to Baxter. Now then, I think you had better tell me why you're breaking into my airfield in the middle of the night, the woman said, raising the gun to impress upon the three the fact that she wasn't asking. Eden tried to home in on her accent. American, certainly. Maybe somewhere on the East Coast, but she couldn't be sure. We didn't think anyone was here, Eden said. She paused, feigning clearing her throat to give her time to think. She needed a cover story, one that was close enough to the truth without having to tell this stranger all about the Council of Selene. We work for the British Security Service, Athena said in a perfect British accent. Her voice was so convincing it momentarily took Eden by surprise. The gun-toting woman's eyebrows raised slightly in interest. We're on deployment here chasing a known terrorist who was planning an attack against the Day of the Dead celebrations in Mexico City, Athena continued. Eden watched the muzzle of the gun sink toward the ground as their captor took more interest in the story. We foiled the attack, fortunately, but the chopper we arrived in was seized by enemy forces. Now we've just learned they're attacking our ship, which is out in the Caribbean Sea. We need to get back there as soon as we can. Well... I say, the woman murmured, clearly unsure whether to believe the story. The Remington sunk another two inches. Eden was just considering making a grab at the weapon when the woman looked up again, her eyes narrowed, her gaze hardened. Say you find a plane, how do you plan to fly it out of here? Captain Gavin Baxter, formerly of the Royal Air Force, Baxter said, stepping forward. The woman leaned back on her heels and looked up at Baxter, she seemed to consider him for a long time. Where do you train? She said, finally. The Royal Air Force College in Cranwell, Lincolnshire, Baxter said without missing a beat. You serve? She said. I flew in the Middle East three tours as well as a few NATO assignments. I was stationed with British Forces Cyprus for a time too. The woman looked at Baxter for a few more seconds. She lowered the gun as she considered her next question. Favourite aircraft? She asked slowly, as though it was a really tricky question. Baxter looked off into the distance for several seconds. Eden thought it looked as though he was trying to picture the answer. It's a hard question, he said. Choosing a favourite aircraft is like picking a favourite child. It's a tough decision. Baxter thought in silence for another moment, and then his face lit with a smile. I'd have to say my favourite is the Eurofighter Typhoon. Versatile, agile. It's a very special machine. Well, I must say this is a surprise, the woman said, suddenly sounding cheerful. Why didn't you just say you were with the RAF? In the US Air Force, we always support our cousins over the pond. I'm Flight Commander Nora Bird. Wonderful to meet you, even in strange circumstances such as these. Bird extended her hand. Baxter stepped forward and took the hand. The two pilots shook hands excitedly. Bird then turned and offered the same gesture to Eden and Athena. I'm sorry about this, Bird said, glancing down at the shotgun. She broke the weapon and rested it over her elbow. You can't be too careful nowadays. I get all sorts around here. Sometimes kids from the villages break in, other times it's tourists just looking for God knows what. Gotta keep on guard at all times, but once you've served... You're always on guard. Isn't that right, Captain? Baxter was about to reply, but Eden interrupted. You're able to help us then. You have a plane here. Do I have a plane here? Bird scoffed, leaning back on her heels again. I've got more than just a plane. Come with me. Bird beckoned Eden, Baxter and Athena toward the hangar doors. She drew a key from a pocket and unlocked the padlock. She swung open a smaller door set within the giant hangar doors and disappeared inside. A moment later, several fluorescent lights hummed and flickered into action. Eden stepped inside too and gasped. A giant aircraft filled the hangar with just inches to spare. 
Eden peered up at the craft's nose almost fifteen feet above her and pointing skyward. Twin propellers sat as though ready at a moment's notice to roar into life. The fuselage was sleek, silver and polished to a shine. The picture of a buxom woman painted in a 1950s cabaret style pouted down from the aircraft's flank. Beneath the woman, Bird Force One was printed in slanted black lettering. Despite not knowing much about planes, Eden had to admit that this one looked really cool. The Douglas C-47 Skytrain, Baxter said from the doorway. This is a classic. She sure is, Bird said, reaching up and tapping the beast proudly. I liberated her from a collector some years ago. She saw action on three continents before being used to carry cargo. Bird produced a rag and started shining the fuselage. She was in a real mess when I got her. She'll get us back to the Bologna, won't she? Eden said, bringing them back to the matter in hand. She's got a range of nearly 3,000 miles, Bird said. That'll do us easily, Baxter said, unable to take his eyes off the plane. How soon can we head out? Eden asked. Bird turned and peered out of the door. First light, she said. That'll give me and the captain here time to get her fueled up and plan the route. But that's... That's less than two hours, Baxter said, interrupting Eden's retort. Captain Bird's right. We need time to prepare the craft, and you'll need time to practice. Practice what? Eden glanced from Baxter to Athena and back again. They were both looking at her, grinning. Eden sighed inwardly. She was getting really fed up with these private jokes. How do you think we're going to get off the plane? Baxter said. Eden looked back at the giant craft as the solution occurred to her. Bird strolled over to the far wall and unhooked a parachute. She threw it at Baxter, who caught the bag one-handed. I'd better show you how this works, Athena said, taking the parachute from Baxter and leading Eden across to the rear of the hangar. Eden grinned nervously. This felt like less of a good idea by the moment. Chapter 41 Moving through the ship with the gas mask on gave Ramirez the strange sensation of being underwater. Each breath roared in his ears, and his lungs felt as though he wasn't getting quite enough air. On the third floor, he paused and studied one of the air vents. Sure enough, faint wisps of grey gas licked out of the vent like flames. He pushed through the doors into the canteen. He looked around at the state of the place. Half the ceiling tiles were hanging loose, and a few bits of twisted metal sat in one corner. It looked as though there had been some kind of brawl. That was strange, Ramirez thought. He'd imagined the floating headquarters of a secret society with almost infinite funds to be well looked after. He shrugged and strode through the space, avoiding the stack of broken ceiling tiles. He climbed the stairs slowly up to Helios's office and living quarters, on the top level of the ship. Outside the door, he paused, listening for movement inside. He heard the gentle tapping of keys and then some whispered words. Winslow was still awake and working on something. That was good, Ramirez thought. It meant the gas had yet to permeate Winslow's office. Ramirez wanted Winslow alive and alert. He longed to see the moment in which Winslow understood what this was all about, almost as much as he couldn't wait for Winslow to realise that it would be the death of him. Ramirez removed the gas mask, raised the gun and pushed through the door. What well, is to pull us away from the obvious truth? But what is that obvious truth, Winslow whispered, totally engaged in his work. Because the only person aboard the plane who didn't end up dead or in a coma was me, Ramirez said, stepping forward. I believe it's time we had a little heart to heart. Winslow continued tapping at the keys as though out of motor memory. He looked up, his bulging eyes locked on Ramirez. All the colour drained from his face. Ramirez stepped into the middle of the room and glanced around to check there was no one else inside. Satisfied they were alone, he turned his attention to Winslow. I see I've joined you at just the right time, Mr. Winslow. You weren't that far behind me, after all, but fortunately for me, far enough. Ramirez felt a bolt of excitement move through him. This was what he'd waited for all those years. <laughs> Winslow gently slipped his right hand off the table and down into his lap. <laughs> Press the alarm if you want, but it won't do any good. I've disabled the ship's systems, and the rest of the crew are asleep, helped by this. Ramirez held up the gas mask. Incapacitating gas, Winslow said, looking up at the air vents on the ceiling. The gas flickered out through the grills in ghostly grey wisps. Fortunately, you had the door open. The gas didn't reach the right concentration in this room. 
Ramirez said, pointing at the large open doors which led from Winslow's office out onto the Bologna's back deck. Push your chair back now, slowly, Ramirez instructed. Winslow rose, his hands up. Ramirez threw a pair of thick plastic cable ties across the room. Now wrap these around your wrists and around the chair's arms. Winslow's eyes darted around, seeking a reprieve. That is, unless you want to fall asleep like the rest of the crew. I'd prefer you awake. To make sure of that, I need to seal up these vents before the gas level increases. Winslow did what he was told. Ramirez stepped forward and pulled the ties tight. Then, turning his back on his prisoner for a moment, he moved around the room, closed all the air vents and flung open the rest of the doors. The gas no longer streamed into this part of the ship, and the open doors would ensure any gas already in the air drifted harmlessly outside. That should do it, Ramirez put the gas mask on the table. DeLuca didn't just slip into a coma, Winslow whispered. You put her in one. Ten out of ten so far. When I learned she had to inject herself frequently, I thought it was a fine opportunity. You switched her insulin pen with another one, one that you'd tampered with, Winslow said, realising the full scale of the plan. Of course, you couldn't just kill her, because it would look suspicious since you survived the crash and she didn't. Exactly, Ramirez said. Her slipping into unconsciousness because she didn't monitor insulin levels in the chaos of the plane's issues was, well, perfectly believable. She's still in a coma, Winslow said soberly. She won't be for much longer, Ramirez replied, his tone so dark Winslow had no doubt what he meant. Winslow swallowed, his stomach twisted. The situation was dire. Winslow forced all negative thoughts away and tried to think through what options he had. The two men stared at each other for a few seconds. What's this about, Sergio? Winslow said, sitting back in the chair and clearly trying to look as comfortable as possible. You think you can decode the orb and want to keep the spoils of Atlantis to yourself? Ramirez roared with laughter. Ah, the great Helios. You know what? I'm disappointed. I'm sorry to say that I thought outsmarting you would be more difficult. It seems you're still several steps behind. This has nothing to do with Atlantis or any riches that might hold. Winslow looked up at the other man, unblinking. Right now, the cards appeared to be stacked against him, but that could all change in an instant. For now, he just needed to keep the Mexican talking and give him the illusion of being in control. Plus, Winslow was genuinely interested in why Ramirez had gone through all this effort if he wasn't actually interested in the promise of Atlantean riches. That's confused you further, hasn't it? Ramirez teased. He dragged one of the red leather bucket chairs across the room and positioned it a few feet in front of Winslow. He sunk into the chair and placed his gun on the arm. I'm sure you've done your research on me, Ramirez continued, pointing at the computer. You'll have found out that in my early years I ran several very successful businesses before selling them all for $500 million. Then I followed a passion I'd always had and completed a degree in archaeology. That did nothing but awake my passion further, so I went on to complete a master's, a doctorate, and now, as you know, I am a professor on the subject. Ramirez leaned back, relaxed. Winslow wondered whether Ramirez's rise through the ranks of the university had anything to do with the sizable donations he made annually. Of course, I don't need the meagre salary offered by the university, but a man must have a passion, don't you agree? Absolutely. Following a passion is one of life's great pleasures, Winslow said. I would offer you a drink, but... He glanced down at his wrists, bound to the chair. Always the gentleman, I like that, Ramirez said. I'm okay, want to keep a clear head and all that. If you're not interested in the orbs, then what's this all about? Winslow said. Oh, I wouldn't say I'm not interested in the orbs. They certainly hold some secrets. And when this is all over, maybe I'll recover them. Or leave them for someone else to decode. Then what is this all about? Winslow said, trying to shrug. By the way... Ramirez said, grinning at Winslow in the way a snake might upon finding its next meal. Winslow recognised the tactic Ramirez was taking. The Mexican was changing topics quickly to keep Winslow on edge. Eden, Athena and Baxter, Ramirez said after a pause. They're dead. Winslow gasped, unable to stop the shock showing on his face. Yeah, my team caught up with them in the tunnels beneath Teotihuacan, 
They fought bravely, especially Eden, but they were no match for two heavily armed units. Winslow caught a deep breath. Ramirez was showing no evidence of this, so was probably just saying it to throw Winslow off balance. Still, the thought that it could be true twisted in Winslow's bowels. Silence filled the office for some seconds. Sorry to bring the tone down, Ramirez said with the false cheer of a psychopath. Let's talk about something more pleasant. Are you a reader, Mr. Winslow? Winslow swallowed away his twisting emotions and forced himself to focus. Right now, Ramirez wanted him confused and angry. Winslow didn't intend to give in to him that easily. A large part of what I do is research-based. That, of course, involves a lot of reading. Always so serious, Ramirez howled with laughter. That's not what I mean at all. I mean, do you read for pleasure? For fun? To unwind after a hard day of whatever it is you do in this office? Ramirez flicked his wrist to indicate the breadth of tasks Winslow might do on a day-to-day -day basis. I see. Not as much as I'd like, although I have been known. I like mysteries. Ramirez interrupted, his eyes bulging with a sort of mad excitement. I like to see if I can figure out the solution before the hapless detective. You know my favourite, the Queen of Crime, Agatha Christie herself. Yes, I know those stories well, Winslow admitted. Good, good, Ramirez crowed. Well, my favourite is the ABC Murders, a brilliant work of fiction altogether. Throughout the novel, the reader is led to believe that this is a serial killer, when in fact it's all a red herring to distract from the murder of Sir Carmichael Clark. Very clever indeed for a novel, Winslow said dryly, but I don't... Winslow stopped speaking as something occurred to him. You just wanted access to the ship, and the orb was your way to do it. Very good, Mr Poirot, Ramirez said, teasing Winslow by referring to the character name of the detective in Christie's novel... Right about now you'll start to consider. Why? Yes, Winslow said, nodding slowly. That is, I suppose, the question that drives us all. As we haven't got all day, let me tell you, I got my interest, no, my passion, for all things archaeological from my father. He was a great man, I'll tell you that. Unfortunately, he died when I was just a boy. I'm sorry to hit... No, no, you're not. You don't get to be sorry, Ramirez snapped. He drew a deep breath and let it out slowly. My Mexican heritage comes from my mother. My father's family originates in Brazil. Manus, specifically. A chime of recognition sounded in Winslow's mind. He remembered his time in Manus, Brazil, all those years ago. We lived there when I was a child. My father used to work as a tour guide, making trips into the Amazon. When my father died, however, my mother moved us to Mexico City. She had family nearby. The realisation hit Winslow hard. Suddenly, like dawn breaking across the horizon, he understood what this was all about. Dennis, Winslow said. Ramirez jolted upright at the mention of his father's name. The ABC murders, Winslow uttered softly. This has nothing to do with Atlantis. It doesn't even have anything to do with the council. This is just about revenge. A thump echoed through the Bologna's hull. Winslow turned and peered out the window. A pair of dark figures scaled the side of the ship and climbed over the railing. It's not just revenge, Ramirez said, climbing to his feet and slipping the gun away. It's revenge served icy cold. Excuse me. Ramirez walked out onto the deck and slid the door closed behind him. Chapter 42 Two hours passed in a heartbeat as Athena showed Eden the workings of the parachute and demonstrated several times how she should land, whether they came down on solid ground or in the water. Then she explained how to steer the parachute. They would need to bring it down as close to the Bologna as possible. Fortunately, Bird had a whole setup for training first-time parachuters. There were various platforms for Eden to jump off and a system where she hung suspended from the ceiling as though on a skydive. Baxter and Bird busied themselves preparing Bird Force One for takeoff. First, they slid open the hangar's large doors and then towed the plane out onto the tarmac with an ancient tractor which spluttered and coughed the entire time. Once in position, the plane was fueled and loaded with supplies. Then for almost an hour, the pilots pored over maps and weather reports, deciding the best route across Mexico, out to the Caribbean Sea, 
and the Bologna. As the first streaks of colour appeared in the sky and the airstrip's tarmac became visible, Bird gave the order they were ready to go. Baxter scrambled excitedly into the cockpit beside Bird, the pair talking constantly in hushed voices. Isn't it just a plane? Eden whispered to Athena as they settled themselves in the Skitrain's sparsy cabin. A bench ran down either side of the space, with various hooks and bars to attach things to. It's not just a plane to them, Athena quipped in return. It's a way of life. Eden rolled her eyes and then attempted to make herself as comfortable as possible. Bird fired up the engines and suddenly the great machine thrummed to life. Eden turned and peered out of the window. The giant propellers beat the air into submission. They don't make engines like this anymore, Baxter shouted over the noise. Original Pratt and Whitney Twin Wasps, Bird said boastfully. The shuddering of the C-47 increased in pitch as Bird eased forward on the twin throttle levers. She checked several gauges and adjusted the flaps, then slid the throttle toward its max. The C-47 rolled forward, picking up speed down the tarmac. Bird checked the gauges one more time, increased the flap elevation, gripping tightly against the shuddering of the fuselage. With a sudden lurch as though breaking free from some invisible restraints, the plane left the ground and roared into the sky. After a few minutes, the climb leveled off, and the engine settled into a well-tuned hum. Baxter unclipped himself from the co-pilot's seat and strode through into the cabin. Baxter sat down between Eden and Athena and pulled up a schematic of the Bologna on a tablet computer. We should head for the back deck, Baxter said, pointing at the area where the Eurocopter usually sat. Too obvious, Athena said. Plus, once we land, Ramirez would have the higher ground. I say we head directly for the roof. From there, we can drop into Helios's office and search floor by floor on the way down. That won't be an easy landing, Baxter said. It's a smaller area. Plus, there are antennas and vent pipes. I can do it, don't worry about me, Eden interrupted. Athena's shown me everything I need to know. Eden felt Baxter's eyes boring into her, even though she was looking the other way. It was as though his gaze could cut through all her bravado and read her true feelings. Baxter agreed reluctantly after what felt like a very long time. If the Bologna's still in the same place, we'll be overhead in a few hours. Get some rest. This is going to get messy. We don't need rest, Eden muttered to herself. We need a miracle. We're a few minutes away, Baxter said, strolling back into the cabin. So that Eden had lost track of time as they rumbled on for hours and hours. Eden felt the plane lurch downwards. They had been descending for the last few minutes, bringing the diamond-studded water closer into view. Eden had listened in as Baxter and Bird chatted away on the comm system for the entire journey. She understood very little of the conversation about altitudes and aircraft things, but it sounded as though they were both enjoying it. Get the chutes on and then clip yourselves to the line. Baxter pointed at the line, which would automatically engage the parachutes when they were free of the aircraft. They all slipped on the parachutes and then checked and rechecked the straps and systems. When all were secured to the line, Baxter crossed to the rear door. Opening the rear door, Captain, Baxter said into the comm system. Go ahead, Captain, Bird replied. Eden rolled her eyes. All this Captain Captain nonsense was driving her mad. Baxter swung the lever and pulled the door inwards. Air roared into the cabin, tearing and lashing at Eden's skin and hair. She felt it sting her eyes. So Athena put on a pair of goggles and passed another to Eden. Together, holding onto the various straps and handles built into the cabin, they crossed to the door. A thousand feet beneath them, the water of the Caribbean Sea sparkled. The Douglas was descending at a steep angle now, its great snout pointed at the waves. A pair of bulbous clouds drifted past, undisturbed by the lumbering aircraft. Then a couple of thousand feet away, a shape appeared on the water. Got a visual, Baxter said. That's in the right place to be the Bologna anyway. Roger that. I see it too, Bird replied. I'll adjust course to get you right overhead. The Douglas turned slightly to the right, bringing them on course with the ship below. Look at that, Athena said, gazing down at the Bologna. There's a RIB pulled up alongside. Eden and Baxter peered down too. Athena was right. A rigid inflatable boat, the sort used by rescue and assault crews, was lashed to the side of the Bologna. 
Do you think Ramirez has invited some friends over? Eden said. That creep has got no friends, Athena countered. We'll go at a hundred feet intervals, Baxter said, pulling them back into focus. As discussed, head for the ship. If you don't think you'll get a clean landing, come down in the water. It's much better to land heavily in the water. Athena, you first, then Eden, I'll go last. Agreed, Eden and Athena said in unison. After this is over, I'm keeping my feet firmly on the ground, Eden said. Ready on one. Bird's voice came through the comms. Athena turned and looked at Eden. We both know that's a lie. You live for this stuff. Last one there pays for dinner. Athena jumped through the door. For the briefest second, it looked as though she was hovering outside of the aircraft. Then gravity and friction did its work, yanking her down and backwards. Eden's stomach lurched and spun as she watched Athena grow small beneath them. After a long second, Athena's parachute deployed, and she disappeared beneath the colourful strip of nylon. You ready? Baxter said. Eden swallowed. Her mouth felt dry, and her stomach churned as though she'd been snacking on pebbles. Ready as I'll ever be, she muttered. And two, Bird said. Before she could think twice, Eden crouched down and leaped out of the plane. The air roared around her as she accelerated toward the sea. Her speed increased, and the air tore at her mouth and cheeks. She spread out her arms in the way Athena had showed her, to bring her descent speed under control. Her arms and legs felt like jelly. Adrenaline pounded through her bloodstream. Hurtling toward the sea, Eden felt the parachute deploy. For a few moments, her speed didn't slow. Eden's heart shot up into her throat as she wondered whether the system was faulty. Then, as though grabbed by a giant hand, deceleration yanked her backward. Never. Now with the wind's roar diminished, Eden could hear voices through the comm system again. And three, Bird said. Thanks, Captain, Baxter replied. It's been a pleasure working with you. I hope to see you again. And you, Captain. I think this could be the start of a beautiful friendship. Did Bird seriously just quote Casablanca? Eden muttered, grinning. Eden found the cords that Athena had showed her to steer the parachute and spun around in a wide arc. She looked up and saw Baxter, not much more than a speck against the sky, fall from the rear of the hulking aircraft. Baxter, his arms outstretched, fell freely for several seconds before his parachute deployed. He expertly took the cords and descended in wide circles toward the Bologna. Show off, Eden muttered, Above them, the Douglas C-47 wobbled from side to side in the pilot's equivalent of a farewell wave, before its bulky snout pointed skyward and the plane lumbered into the clouds. 43. Alexander Winslow leaned back in his chair and gazed at the ceiling. His stomach felt as though he'd swallowed a whole hive of bees, which now swarmed in the constricted space. He chided himself for not figuring this out earlier. Now knowing the truth of the matter, it was all so simple. The whole thing hinged on the most straightforward motivation of all time. Revenge. Too preoccupied thinking about sunken cities and secret civilizations. Winslow hadn't even considered something quite so, well, human. Revenge was, after all, one of the original human desires. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near and their doom rushes upon them. Winslow thought, remembering the passage from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Winslow turned his attention to what Ramirez had said about Eden, Athena and Baxter. He knew there was no way they were lying dead in the tunnels beneath Teotihuacan. Winslow glanced at the computer screen a few feet away. In the seconds before Ramirez had burst in, Winslow had loaded the radar map reading of the area around the Bologna. In those few moments, he'd seen a craft, probably a plane judging by its speed, heading their way. As he'd hoped, the aircraft was still on a direct course for the Bologna. He calculated the distance and tried to make some estimations about their arrival time. The thing was still miles away, though. If it was Eden, Baxter and Athena, right now that was an if the size of the Pacific Ocean, he needed to buy some time. Set up a patrol, Ramirez said to the men out on the deck. We're not expecting any visitors, but I haven't yet. Ramirez didn't finish the sentence. He glanced at Winslow. If someone arrives, deal with them. The men nodded. 
We'll be out of here within minutes, Ramirez said, peering over the railing. A rigid inflatable boat with a pair of powerful looking outboard motors bobbed against the side of the Bologna. Do not disturb me before then, clear. Yes, boss, the four men said in reply. Ramirez slid open the door, strode back into the office and retook his seat. Winslow peered out the window and saw the four figures stride away. Where were we? Ramirez said. Oh yes, I was just explaining to you how I'm going to kill you and then sink the ship. Sink the ship? Winslow said, sounding almost amused. This is a state-of-the-art vessel with twin hulls, onboard pumps, and a sophisticated system of bulkheads and internal doors. I can assure you this ship is made from metal. It can and will sink. Ramirez dug out the detonator and held it up like a trophy. Recognize this? Winslow nodded. Indeed, he recognized the detonator from the Bologna's stores. How many explosive devices? Winslow asked. Four, Ramirez said. Spread throughout the ship, all beneath the waterline. I would bet my fortune on this ship going under when I tell it to. Winslow made a face as though he'd just swallowed something sour. This was getting worse by the minute. Winslow risked a glance at the screen. The incoming plane slid an inch closer. Ramirez placed the detonator on the arm of the chair. He climbed to his feet and picked up the gun. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Mr. Winslow. It's been everything I've hoped for, and maybe a little more. In another place and time, we might have been friends. But my men are here, and now it's time for us to go. Ramirez leveled the gun at Winslow. Wait, wait, Winslow said, sounding desperate now. The ship will be recovered. How will you explain my body with a bullet hole in it? Ramirez grinned again. You know what these waters are known for? Ramirez glanced toward the door. Winslow shook his head. Sharks. Lots of them. Hundreds. All hungry. Once you're dead, I'll cut off those ties and throw you overboard. You'll be a tasty snack for one of those beasts. The rest of your crew, they will die in their beds. It will look as though there was a failure with the ship's alarm system, and they weren't able to get out in time. Winslow paled. He wobbled slightly in the chair, testing its strength. Why the crew? What have they done? Sure, I'm partly responsible for your father's death, but... Partly responsible, Ramirez roared, spitting out the words. You are wholly, totally, 100% responsible. That's not fair, Winslow said in a soothing tone. He knew how dangerous his work was. There are all sorts of things in those jungles that'll kill you. No, he was used to taking tourists through the jungles. Sure, it's a dangerous place with snakes and spiders, but he wasn't ready to face a thousand spear-wielding lunatics. Your uncle told you? Ramirez nodded, and in that single movement, Winslow saw the young boy he had watched from a distance at the funeral. The boy who, in an instant, had been forced to become a man. Forced to become the man who still carried so much grief. For that, Winslow was truly sorry. In Ramirez's distraction, the gun wavered and slipped down until it was pointing at the floor. He told me you came across an uncontacted tribe up in the hills. He told me that my dad fought them so that you could escape. Ramirez's voice cracked with emotion. Without him and what he did, you would all have died that day. That's true. Winslow nodded, using the movement to glance at the screen. The craft slid closer still. Dennis was a very brave man. Shut up, shut up, Ramirez roared, raising the gun again. You don't get to say his name. You're nothing compared to him. He, he... Ramirez sucked in a deep breath and visibly steadied his nerve. I really have to get going. Ramirez's finger slid across the trigger. Wait, wait, Winslow said. What about Eden? What about her? By killing me, you're taking away her father. You'll be as bad as me. Ramirez paused, clearly considering Winslow's words. Winslow felt emboldened that Ramirez's uncle hadn't told of Eden joining them in the jungle. He hated the idea that Eden would discover her true origins from someone else after he had died. That was far worse than her never knowing at all. No, we will not be the same. You started this. I am finishing it. That, Winslow realized, was the logic of the scorned young man Ramirez had become on the day of his father's death. Flawed logic, that was for sure. But right now, he was out of time. Winslow stared into the single, unblinking eye of the Sig Sauer. He tested the chair again, kicking back gently with his legs. 
This is for you, Dad, Ramirez said. For a moment, no one moved. A strange silence descended across the whole ship. Then Ramirez pulled the trigger. The gun howled. Winslow kicked back hard, sending the chair crashing back against the floor. He flattened himself as best he could. The bullet swished mere inches above him, burying itself in the wood-panelled wall. Ramirez scowled, realising what Winslow had done. Very clever, Mr Winslow, Ramirez said, stepping forward and to the right to get another clean shot at Winslow's head. You've effectively bought yourself another few seconds of life. Ramirez took another step forward, looking down at his prey. He aimed the gun once more. This time, with his back against the floor, Winslow had nowhere to go. But this time, Winslow didn't plan to go anywhere. As Ramirez stepped forward, Winslow rolled toward him. He kicked the man as hard as he could in the side of the leg, just above the knee. Ramirez yowled with pain. The gun dropped to his side but remained firmly in his grasp. Winslow struck again, kicking out as hard as he could. With his hands firmly tied to the chair, he couldn't get up, but hoped he could at the very least cause some injury to Ramirez. Ramirez stumbled and then took a step backwards out of Winslow's reach. Stop fighting this, Ramirez shouted. It's pathetic, you're beaten, just accept that. The gun roared, but the bullet went wide. Ramirez had aimed in anger. Ramirez took another step back, allowed a moment to pass and then aimed properly. He looked down the gun's barrel. It wasn't a clean shot with the chair in the way, but he was likely to hit Winslow in the chest or neck. It would be messy, but the job would be done. He squeezed the trigger gently. Winslow gritted his teeth and waited for either the sound of the gun or... A crash echoed from the roof. It sounded as though someone had dropped a sack of potatoes against the steel. The sound clanged down through the superstructure. Ramirez looked up at the ceiling. Then another bang came, followed by the distinct sound of footsteps. Chapter 44 Eden watched as Athena circled through the air about a hundred feet below her. Athena had explained how they should circle down one side of the ship and then aim to swing around and onto the roof. If necessary, they could ditch in the water. It was easy to describe, Aidan thought, but actually doing it right was something different entirely. The Bologna, which had seemed the size of a discarded beer bottle some minutes ago, now loomed large and menacing below. Beside the Bologna, an inflatable boat bobbed in the swell. Black against the ocean, the thing was almost invisible, but Eden could just make out the metallic seats and controls. Eden hadn't seen the craft before, which was bad news. Ramirez must have company aboard. Drifting above the ship, she thought about how quickly she could pull out her gun. First things first, let's just get down from here, she said under her breath. Athena circled around one more time and then swung hard to the right. She stretched out her legs and landed perfectly on the Bologna's roof. Impressed, Eden copied the other woman's movements. Now getting the hang of the control, she circled twice, getting lower each time. On the roof of the Bologna, Athena shrugged off her parachute pack and shoved the chute back inside. She unclipped her weapon so that she was ready should it be needed. Eden circled around one more time. She was losing altitude fast now. She pulled hard on the cord to go to the right, just as Athena had done. Nothing happened at first. Then the chute spun around in a tight circle. Eden peered down at the roof of the ship, still twenty feet beneath her. At that moment, an air current whipped up, pulling her away from the ship. Eden sailed high above the roof, her legs kicking uselessly. Back over the water on the other side of the vessel, Eden gritted her teeth and swung the parachute around the other way. This time the opposite happened. She lost several feet of elevation in an instant. Eden watched helplessly as she now swung toward the side of the ship. She held on to the cords, trying to get another few feet of elevation, but it didn't work. Eden clenched her muscles and extended her arms, letting go of the cords completely. She swung hard into the side of the ship. The jolt jarred up her forearms and legs, but fortunately caused no damage. A clang reverberated through the superstructure. Eden's parachute continued to drift over the top of the ship. Eden gripped hold of the cables, hoping the chute would snag on something above. The cords slipped through her hands as she slid down toward the water. Eden glanced over her shoulder as she slipped and then fell. Twenty, then fifteen, 
Then ten feet below, black water churned against the side of the ship. The chute jarred to a stop as it caught on something. Eden almost lost her grip. She wasted no time hauling herself up, arm over arm, until she reached the roof. She pulled herself up and rolled onto roof, panting. Athena stood beside her, holding on to the other end of the parachute. That wasn't too bad, was it? Athena said. No comment, Eden said, adrenaline still roaring in her ears. Incoming! Baxter's voice came through the comm system. Eden and Athena looked up to see Baxter circling toward the water forty feet away. Eden quickly unclipped the parachute pack and stuffed the chute inside. Baxter pulled on the cord and swung into another wide arc. Let's see how the expert does this, Athena said. Both women stood to one side. Baxter swung above the upper deck and looked as though he was going to drift straight across the ship in the same way Eden had. He yanked a knife from a sheath on his belt at the last moment and cut through the cables in one swift moment. Baxter dropped fifteen feet and landed in a crouch on the deck. Free of his weight, the parachute drifted overhead. It lost its shape and then twisted into the water. Baxter stood up, dusted himself down and put the knife away as though nothing had happened. Show off, Eden muttered, flashing Baxter a look. It is fair to say I've done that a few times. Baxter's words caught in his throat as the report of gunfire hammered through the air. Eden, Baxter and Athena flattened themselves against the upper deck as bullets zipped past. A strafe raked through the radio antennas positioned at the front of the deck, ricocheting from the metal and shredding the electrical cables. Eden pulled out her weapon and scurried across the deck on her stomach. Without looking below, she snapped off several shots across the parapet. The shooting stopped for a second before returning with a vengeance. It sounds like Ramirez has brought an army, Eden hissed back to the others. They must have used that boat to get on board, Athena said, pointing back at the small craft Eden had seen on the descent. I wish we'd brought some proper firepower. Eden looked at their weapons. Three small sidearms were nothing against an unknown force armed with automatic rifles. We've got the higher ground, Athena said. Help me with this. Athena pushed against one of the damaged radio masts. The whole thing, twenty feet of metal, topped with numerous antennas, rocked on its damaged mountings. Eden crawled across and together they pushed against the mast. The metal cracked and groaned, they pushed again. The mast rocked and then with a screech crashed down onto the deck below. A man grunted in pain. Eden peered over the parapet. A man lay prone beneath the mast, an antenna sticking into his chest. Lucky shot, Eden said. Lucky for us, Athena shot back. Eden and Athena moved across the roof as the men fired upon their last position. Sparks flew from the ship and bullets bounced in all directions. Baxter returned fire, keeping the focus on him for a moment. Eden peered down at the deck below. Three men fanned out across the lower decks. One lay beneath the crumpled antenna. All dressed in black tactical gear, they looked like they meant business. Eden waved Baxter and Athena forward and then opened fire on the assailants below. The bullets hit nothing but forced the men to jump for cover. One hid himself behind a giant cleat, used to secure the Bologna to the quay when it was in port. The other charged in close to the structure where bullets from above couldn't reach. The last man ran down the side deck toward the front of the ship. We're fighting them on one side, Eden boomed. They're going to try and pin us in. You two stay up here. I'm going hunting. She threw her gun to Baxter, who caught it one-handed. Baxter tried to argue, but Eden silenced him with a look. I'll use the knife. Keep in touch, Athena said, touching the comms device in her ear. Eden nodded. Atena laid down some covering fire, keeping the men on the deck pinned in place as Eden climbed to her feet. Eden stalked toward the front of the ship, taking care to move silently. She peered down at the deck below. Just as I thought, she said into the comms, he's, he's trying to sneak around the back. Eden paused and watched the man moving down the side deck toward the bow. This guy was trying to outflank them while the other two pinned them down at the stern. It was a classic technique, which Eden certainly wasn't falling for. Can you take him out? Baxter questions. Does a bear... Another flurry of gunfire cut off Eden's crude remark. If she wasn't mistaken, one gun clicked empty. I'm out, 
Athena said. Take this one, Baxter said. We'll have to keep the cover light. Eden slid her knife from where it was usually stashed at her ankle. Eden tracked the man, keeping pace with him for several feet. Almost directly above him, she stayed far enough away that if he turned, she could move out of sight. Fortunately, he didn't check behind him once. This guy was overconfident. Eden waited until the guy was almost at the rear deck, then leaped from the roof. Half falling, half flying, she collided with the man's back. For a moment, it felt as though she'd collided with a brick wall. The man crumpled to the ground. Eden fell hard too. Her ears buzzed and her vision blurred. Sprawled out on her back, she looked up at the upper deck from which she'd jumped. It was a good fifteen feet. The knife still gripped tightly, Eden clambered up and crossed to the man. He strained up onto his knees, already bringing the gun to bear. Eden lunged forward and buried the knife just beneath the man's skull. He flopped forward, hitting the deck like a fish out of the water. He was dead within moments. Eden snagged up his gun and a spare magazine. Target down, Eden said. And I've got us some more firepower. An AK-47 of all things. Eden ejected one magazine and shoved a new one home. How many bad guy stereotypes are these guys trying to hit? Another flurry of gunfire boomed as Eden paced back toward the rear deck. For every shot Athena and Baxter let off, the others were firing at least ten. Her back to the wall, Eden peered around the corner and onto the rear deck. From what she could see, two men remained at large. One took cover beneath the metal cleat, another behind a chain which wound in the ship's anchor. Two remaining, Eden barked into the comms, pulling herself back under cover. She glanced out at the remaining men. Unfortunately, both hostiles were well covered. One assailant peered out from behind the cleat and fired up toward the roof. Baxter shot back and then, as Eden feared it might, his gun clicked empty. That's me out, Baxter said, confirming Eden's fears. I'll be out soon, Athena said. Eden scanned the scene again, her mind roaming for an idea. Baxter, can we pull in the anchor and then let it go again? I suppose, but I don't see how. Don't worry about that. Just watch for my signal. The assailants both hammered the ship with gunfire now. One of them stepped forward, confident their quarry's weapons were empty. Both Eden and Athena took their opportunity and sent a flurry of lead toward the man. Athena's weapon snapped empty, but the bullets found their mark. The man stumbled backwards and crumpled down onto the deck. Raising the anchor, Baxter said. He'd clearly reached the control panel on the side of the ship. An electronic motor groaned. Eden saw the heavy chain ground up across the deck, curl around the spool, and disappear down the hole into the winding bay. The man hiding behind the spool leaped out into the open, clearly shocked by the noisy. Eden took her chance and charged forward, her finger clamped on the trigger. Several bullets raked across the deck, scarring up the wood or ricocheting wildly around. A bullet tore through the man's leg. He cried out, his hand gripping the wound. Then Eden's weapon too clicked empty. Eden heard the sound before she understood what was happening. She slid to a stop. She had a spare magazine, but it would take a few moments to swap. That was a few moments she didn't have. The man, his face twisted into a snarl of pain, looked up at Eden as though seeing her for the first time. Even though blood was pumping from his leg, the wound wasn't his priority. Standing crooked on his injured leg, he raised his gun. Eden's blood ran like the waters of an arctic river. Now, Eden shouted into the comms device, drop the anchor. The man raised the AK-47 further, the ugly machine's snub nose pointed directly at Eden's face. The motor which had been drawing in the anchor clicked to silence. The man didn't seem to notice. He stepped forwards, his finger curling around the trigged. Eden looked into his ugly face and smiled. She tried not to think about the flurry of hot metal which would spring from the AK's muzzle at any more. The man took another step forward. The noise of the battle seemed to sink to nothing. Then the chain released. Metal ground aggressively against metal as the heavy anchor smashed back into the water. The anchor fell deeper and deeper. The chain snaked violently from side to side across the deck. At first, the man didn't even notice the sound. Then the chain swung out and caught him on the ankle. He tumbled sideways, falling over the twisting chain. For a fraction of a second, his face distorted into a mask of confusion. Then the falling chain dragged him overboard and into the water. His cries streamed out across the water for a moment until he was silenced with a splash. 
Eden exhaled. Her shoulders slumped and she allowed her eyes to close for just a moment. Very good show. A Mexican accent drifted from the door of Winslow's office. Ramirez stepped through the open door, holding a gun against Alexander Winslow's neck. Chapter 45 uh -huh. Tell your cronies to come out from wherever they are, Ramirez said, taking another step out onto the deck. I was really hoping we wouldn't have to do it like this. That's the thing with you bad guys, Eden interrupted. You always think you can do it your way, don't you? Ramirez snarled a dry laugh. You might be good at solving things with your fists, but right now I'm holding all the cards. Ramirez jabbed Winslow with the gun. You harm him in any way and I'll... Eden stepped forward. Her muscles tensed, ready for immediate attack. No, Eden, don't, Winslow said. His voice was calm but firm. Do what he says. Call Baxter and Athena down here now. Eden tapped the comms device in her ear, turning on the microphone. Ramirez, not knowing exactly where Baxter and Athena were, was their last strand of power. Sure, it wasn't much, but it was something. What, but we can't give up like this, Eden said, her eyes darting from her father to their captor. She imagined Baxter and Athena listening somewhere nearby. You don't understand it fully. Let Ramirez explain and then you'll see, Winslow said calmly. Ramirez drew his other hand out from behind his back. He held a device which looked a little like a hand grenade. What is that? Eden said, spitting the words out. This, dear Eden, is a remote detonator, Ramirez said wryly. I have placed four charges on the hull of this ship, and each of them is connected to this detonator. If I should release my fingers, the charges will explode, sending your beautiful ship and her entire crew to the bottom of the sea. Where's everyone else? Eden said, looking around as though noticing for the first time the Bologna was almost empty. <laughs> They're asleep in their beds, dreaming as though nothing has happened, Ramirez said. He's attached a can of immobilizing gas to the ship's air conditioning system, Winslow said, nodding toward Ramirez. They don't even know this is going on. Eden shook her head. They won't even know to save themselves. Eden thought of all the people aboard the Bologna she'd got to know and like. The realisation of their situation struck Eden like a physical blow. Call your friends down here now, Ramirez said, jabbing the gun harder than ever against Winslow's neck. It clearly annoyed him that Eden still possessed this tiny power play. Over Ramirez's shoulder, Eden saw movement on the top deck. Baxter stood up, holding a weapon in his hands. It wasn't the weapon he'd been using to attack Ramirez's men. Eden knew that all of those weapons had been emptied. This weapon was smaller and instead of black metal, it was moulded from bright red plastic. A flare gun, the sort ships used to signal other vessels when in trouble. It was by no means a deadly weapon, but could cause a sizable distraction. Eden placed her hands on her hips. I'm not going to do that, she said. As it stands... They're the only people who could get out of this alive. Ramirez stared at Eden, snarling. They'll be untying that boat your thugs used to get over here and heading out to safety any minute now. Behind Ramirez, Baxter raised the flare gun and aimed it carefully. Not designed to hit a particular target, Eden imagined it was difficult to aim effectively. Ultimately, you destroying this ship doesn't really matter, Winslow said, picking up his daughter's theme. We're all soldiers here, we sign up for this knowing that at any point our lives can be taken from us. An honourable death is all we hope for. Ramirez's face turned the shade of a monkey's bottom. You will not have an honourable death. That's the last thing you'll have. You sent my father to his death and you'll pay for that. Eden glanced at her father. Winslow nodded in a gesture that meant he would explain later. Yes, sir. Yes, we will pay with our lives, but the work of the council will continue. That I can assure you, Winslow said. How? Without your ship, the organisation you've run for all these years can't help but... A hissing, popping noise roared from behind Ramirez. He tried to turn, but something struck him in the back. Colours shot out in all directions like a firework display gone wrong. The explosion fizzed and popped, making great arcs of pink and purple. Designed to fill the sky with colour, the flare boomed against the Bologna's deck. Ramirez howled in pain and spun around, dropping the gun. Eden leaped forward and grabbed Winslow. She pulled him away from Ramirez, shoved him several feet across the deck, behind the metal cleat one of thugs had used minutes before. Baxter and Athena appeared from somewhere, 
and charged toward Ramirez, who was now lying on the deck and howling. The flare gun had collided with his back, and although it hadn't killed him, it appeared to have caused some serious damage. Athena picked up the gun Ramirez had dropped. She strode over to Ramirez and leveled the gun at his head. You'll die here if you don't stop this immediately, she barked between clenched teeth. This is going to happen, Ramirez snarled, pointing vaguely in Winslow's direction. He killed my father. He led him to his death, just to satisfy his own selfish curiosity. Spare me the sob story, Athena growled. We've all lost people. That doesn't mean you have to be a victim your whole life. You don't know any, Ramirez said. Baxter charged over and kicked the man hard in the ribs. Ramirez rolled onto his side and heaved several times. Eden studied the injuries on Ramirez's back. A big gash ran from one shoulder blade to his lower back. Although the man was clearly in a lot of pain, his injuries were far from fatal. Give me that detonator, Baxter demanded, raising his leg to kick Ramirez again, this time in the throat. Fine, take it. Ramirez heaved his arm back and threw the detonator across the deck. As he released the handle, an LED started flashing on the machine. The detonator bounced three times and landed against a coil of rope 20 feet away. Eden charged across and picked the device up. She turned it around in her hands and then pressed the handle again. The LED continued to flash. It's engaged now, Ramirez shouted. There's no way back. The charges will detonate in less than 30 seconds. Eden swung around to look at Ramirez, only to find he wasn't there. In the confusion, he'd pulled himself across the deck and was now scrambling over the railing. Ramirez turned and looked back at the small group, their faces all ashen. Athena charged toward Ramirez in an attempt to stop his escape, but she was just too far away. This is for my father, Ramirez shouted. You'll never be forgotten. With that, he let go of the barrier and fell backwards into the water. Eden listened for the splash as Ramirez hit the water, but it didn't come. An outboard motor clicked into life. Eden cursed under her breath and, together with Athena, charged for the railing. Ramirez powered away from the Bologna in the boat which the thugs had used to arrive. Athena, still holding Ramirez's gun, took aim. Even though she was a skilled markswoman, hitting Ramirez aboard the bobbing craft was a challenge. She fired several times until the gun clicked empty. Leave him. Baxter shouted, we need to focus on this. Two LEDs now flashed on the detonator. Eden searched the device for other buttons or switches. Could we destroy it, Eden said. Then it wouldn't send the detonate signal. They don't work like that, Baxter replied. The charges are already set to detonate, and this needs to send a do not fire signal. Eden turned the device around several times in her hands. But there are no controls here. Leave it. Winslow said, walking across to the crew. There must be a way to stop this, Eden said, shouting now. We have to save the... No. Winslow placed a calming hand on Eden's shoulder. We leave the ship and save the crew. I know that Ramirez used a gas mask to move through the ship unaffected. It's in there. One person to save everyone on board, Eden said. That's all we can... Winslow froze, his voice drying in his throat. The sound at first was little more than a rumble... It shook the Bologna just like the coming of a storm. Then the vibrations increased. Eden ducked into a crouch and stepped toward her father, protecting him as best she could. The rumble turned into a roar, booming up into the sky and echoing across the ocean. Then the Bologna rocked in the ocean like a rubber duck in a child's bath. An explosion ripped through the stern and then through the bow, smashing the ship one way and then the other. Chapter 46 Ramirez glanced back at the Bologna, growing small behind him. Now, well out of firing range, he pulled back on the throttle, let the engine slow, and finally took a deep breath of the spray-filled air. He had escaped and was alive. That was good. He hadn't ended Alexander Winslow's life, an annoying detail for sure. The man would be dead soon enough, though, and everything he'd worked for would sink to the bottom of the sea. As though answering Ramirez's thoughts, a deafening roar pounded across the water. Ramirez clicked off the engines and turned to face the Bologna. He wanted to see this firsthand. The first explosion to detonate was in the stern. A brilliant ball of flame erupted from the ship's side, sending a wall of water high into the air. The front of the ship rocked forward, as though it was being lifted clean from the sea. Ramirez felt the shockwave ripple through the air, the force of the blast pushing against his body. 
he watched with a sense of awe as flames rippled into the sky. Seeing Winslow and his crew crouching on the deck, Ramirez laughed out loud. They had seen nothing yet. Then the two devices in the stern exploded. A fiery burst of flames shot upwards, flickering into the air. The explosions punched two holes in the rear hull, shattering the metal into a million pieces and twisting the framework out of shape. Thick and acrid smoke billowed up in clouds that would be visible for miles. The front of the ship slammed down against the water, sending a sheet of spray so high that Ramirez could no longer see the ship. And Ramirez held onto the control unit as his boat rocked violently from side to side. One more detonation rolled across the water, and then all went quiet. The spray sunk back toward the sea, and the Bologna came back into view again. It sat at a jaunty angle, the bow pointing down into the water. Ramirez imagined the tons and tons of seawater now filling the hull. The ship was on the way to the bottom of the ocean, and no one could do anything about that. Ramirez smiled as he pictured Winslow charging around, trying to save his ship and his crew. Sure, Ramirez was disappointed that he hadn't been able to enjoy watching the man die, but he knew Winslow's end was coming. The Bologna was miles from the nearest land, and even if they could get help, saving all the crew in time would be impossible. Ramirez reflected on Eden's last words to him. Sure, this may not be the end of the council, but he didn't really care about that. This was the end of Winslow and his reign within the council. That was good enough. An eye for an eye, Ramirez muttered, and a debt repaid. Ramirez turned back to the controls. He programmed the memorized coordinates of Monakay Island, Belize, into the system. He would pay the so-called Commander Fang a visit, and together they would get out of here. Ramirez pushed forward on the throttle and left the gently sinking Bologna behind. He glanced up at the sky. The sooner he was on a flight out of here, the better. As the boat crested a wave, Ramirez noticed something in the water beneath him. A large shape moved beneath the craft. He peered into the water and saw there was more than one of them. The shapes slipped this way and that, gracefully, gently, predatorily, circling beneath the waves. It was a shape every sane human on the planet would recognize. Sharks. You're all right down there, he said evenly. With aluminum bases and tough rubber sides, these boats were not a target for sharks. Then turning his attention back to the controls, Ramirez noticed the back of the boat wasn't riding as high on the water as usual. He slowed the engine and stepped across to one of the rubber tubes, which ran down either side of the boat. He poked the tube. It felt soft and flabby. Ramirez swallowed. A stone of worry ignited in his stomach. He hurried over to the other tube and pressed the rubber. It felt the soft, like a punctured football. Somehow the boat was deflating. As the boat slowed further, water lapped in over the rear. A fist of worry smacked Ramirez in the guts. He turned back to the controls and heaved the throttle forward. The outboard engines growled, sputtered, and then gurgled into silence. The boat sat stationary, bobbing on the waves. Ramirez's heart picked up its pace as he noticed the number of sharks increasing. Although he knew little about sharks, hunting in a group like this seemed unusual. Ramirez turned and looked at the outboard engines. Without the buoyancy of the tubes, the heavy engines pulled the craft's stern beneath the water. His hands slick with sweat, Ramirez tried to restart the engines. They coughed and spluttered again, but only dragged more water in through the air vents. Then, with a final wheeze, the engines died altogether. The shapes swirled around beneath the water again, getting closer. Their infamous shapes were clearly visible now, just beneath the water's surface. Ramirez could even see their beady eyes and deadly razor-sharp teeth as the sharks swam in ever-tightening circles. Then Ramirez saw a fin break the surface. It was the stuff of childhood nightmares. A chill ran down his spine. Ramirez glanced down at the pair of now useless outboard engines. Pulled by the weight of the engines, the rear of the boat slanted down beneath the water. The bow stuck upwards towards the sky. Ramirez thought through his options. Without the engines, he would be stuck out here in the middle of the sea. But the boat might at least be saved. He glanced out at the shapes circling him just beneath the water and tried to convince himself that they couldn't attack if the boat remained afloat. The water now reaching his knees, 
Ramirez reached down beside the engines and yanked the handle which attached them to the boat's aluminum hull. He released the first lever, and then the second. The heavy engine on the left of the boat clicked free. Ramirez shoved against the machine it snapped from its mounting and splashed into the water. With the weight reduced, the boat rose by a few inches. Now, with just one engine attached, and the weight on just one side, the boat sat lagging to one side. Ramirez took a step across to access the engine. The boat swung to the right. Ramirez reached down carefully and tried to unhook the engine. The water came up to his thighs as he fought with the mechanism. He managed to unclip the first lever. He stepped again to the right to try into the second. The boat wobbled for a few seconds, now precariously balancing on one deflating tube. Ramirez saw the body of a shark slip just a few feet beneath him. The scarred fleshy back seemed to sparkle menacingly. Ramirez stood still, hoping the boat would stop rocking. The sharks continued to circle, their movements growing more frenzied with each pass. He leaned forward, reaching over for the final clasp. He reached the lever and felt movement in the water behind him. Ramirez looked up at the surrounding water, now foaming with the aggressively moving creatures beneath. He could feel their eyes on him, sizing him up, deciding whether to attack. The boat slipped another inch or two beneath the waves. Ramirez grasped the lever and pulled. He felt the boat shift beneath him. Ramirez saw a fin pierce the surface twenty feet away. It moved gracefully in a wide arc, showing Ramirez its full side profile. Ramirez noticed several deep gouge marks on the grey, glimmering flesh. The fin disappeared out of sight as it circled the boat. Ramirez leaned over further, attempting to disconnect the remaining engine. In the next moment, two things happened at once. First, Ramirez managed to disconnect the engine. He yanked hard on the lever. The engine rocked twice and then disappeared beneath the waves. Then a heavy weight struck the side of the boat. To Ramirez, it felt like a collision with a freight train. The boat shock and then flipped over, throwing Ramirez straight into the water. Ramirez chocked as water rushed into his mouth and nose. It was temporary blinded when salt filled his eyes. He kicked hard, forcing his head back out of the water. Ramirez took a deep breath and assessed the scene. Fifteen feet away, the boat lay upside down like a cast-off plaything. Ramirez froze. Several fins slid around him now. The sharks were just dark shapes now, shimmying beneath the waves. Eden pushed her father down against the deck and flattened herself across him. She held her hands over her ears, trying and failing to keep out the noise. She didn't just hear the explosions with her ears, but felt them with every part of her body. The vibrations rumbled through her skin and bones, shaking every sinew and synapse. The ship's reinforced hull, always stable though the most violent conditions, now lurched about like a fallen tree in a storm. After several long seconds, the noise of the explosions died out, and an eerie calm settled across the Bologna. Eden removed her hands from her ears and lifted her head. She looked around. Baxter and Athena lay on the deck, a few feet away, their expressions pale with worry. Eden climbed unsteadily to her feet. The Bologna rocked gently from bow to stern and back again, playing out the explosion's distant echo. What's happening? Eden said, trying to assess the damage. Everything looked calm, frighteningly calm. Baxter was the first to move. He ran to the side and peered over. What's happening? Eden repeated. Maybe the explosions didn't puncture the hull. They did, Baxter said gravely. Look. He pointed toward the front of the ship. Eden looked up just in time to see a life ring roll down the deck toward them. The ring picked up speed as it rolled, skipping and bouncing over the side and into the water. Eden steadied herself as another vibration moved through the superstructure. We're taking on water in the bow, Baxter said, peering over the side. What can we do? Eden's train of thought felt like it was running with a 15-minute delay. Winslow stood and brushed himself down as though he had all the time in the world. Athena, Eden, you use the gas mask. Take it in turns to bring people up from the cabins. Bring them into the fresh air and they'll soon come around. Baxter, you and I will access the ship's systems from the terminal in my office. We'll see how bad the damage is and if there's anything we can do. Together, the four of them rushed into Winslow's office. I'll go first. Athena said, grabbing the gas mask from the desk and then rushing headlong down the stairs. Eden closed the door behind her, already letting a cloud of chemically smelling air into the office. 
Baxter threw himself into the chair behind the computer and typed furiously. A schematic of the ship appeared, with various warning lights flashing on the bow and stern. Just as I thought, Winslow said. Punctures in the bow and the stern. How high is the water now? Approaching four feet, Baxter said. Good, that gives us a little time. Are all the bulkhead doors closed? Baxter checked the system. Yes, sir, all operating correctly, but they won't hold us for long. How long do you think? Winslow's voice became a conspiratorial whisper. Baxter's fingers flew across the keys as he did the calculation. Forty-five minutes if we're lucky, half an hour if we're not. Athena crashed back through the door, dragging a member of the crew under the arms. Athena had dragged the woman up the stairs as quickly as possible, banging her legs and ankles. With one hand, Athena pulled off the gas mask and threw it to Eden, then dragged the women out onto the back deck. Eden positioned the gas mask and charged headlong down the stairs and into the canteen. Sprinting through the canteen, she saw the hole in the ceiling, which had still yet to be repaired from their training exercise all those days ago. That now felt like another lifetime. Her lungs ached as the gas mask failed to satiate her deep breaths. She took the stairs two at a time and ran to the first level of cabins. With the ship talking on water, corridor ran down at an angle. Eden saw the door which Athena had left open and went for the next one. She tore through the door and climbed up the now-inclined floor towards the bed. A strange, eerie half-light settled across the room with the blinds closed and the lights off. Eden yanked off the cover and saw the young man sleeping there. She recognised him as one of the analysts who worked on the Bologna's many information systems. Eden grabbed the man beneath the arms and pulled him out of the bed. Moving a comatose person, single-handed, was much more difficult than it looked. Eden crouched down and swung the man over her shoulder. Her muscles stung and her lungs burned as she hobbled as quickly as she could up the including passage to the staircase. Climbing the stairs, she felt the ship list further to the bow, the stern rising from the water. That couldn't be good news. A minute later, she crashed through the door, tore off the gas mask, threw it to Athena, ran out onto the deck and laid the man on his back in the fresh air. Eden sucked in several lungfuls of the fresh air. Her head spun and she felt a slight chemical taste in her mouth. She looked down at the two people sleeping on the deck. They had no idea what was going on. They wouldn't even realise that the ship had slipped beneath the waves. At that moment, another shudder moved through the hull. The Bologna rocked first one way and then the other, forcing Eden down onto the deck. She looked through the doors and into the offices to see shelves of books come crashing to the floor. Baxter held on to the computer to stop it falling too. The shaking increased until it felt like the ship was in the middle of an earthquake. An earthquake's not possible at sea, is it? Eden asked. Then, just as Eden thought the whole craft would be torn end from end, the shaking stopped. Chapter 47 What do you mean we've run aground? Winslow said, his voice laced with panic. We're supposed to be a hundred miles from anywhere. Baxter stared at the computer screen, his eyes locked uncontrollably on the data. Eden and Athena continued the relay, dragging crew members up from the bowels of the ship. I've no idea, seriously no idea. There shouldn't be anything here, but the sensors on the bow are saying we've run aground. Baxter leaped from his seat, the force toppling his chair. He glanced around the office. The ship now sat at an angle as though it rested on a giant cushion. There's one way to find out, follow me. Baxter ran to the rear deck where a dozen members of the crew now wheezed their way back to consciousness. Winslow gave chase. Baxter ran to the front of the ship, with the ship resting at an angle, the going was difficult. For the last thirty feet, Baxter pulled himself up using the railing. Standing right at the bow, Baxter leaned over the railing and peered down into the water. Sure enough, beneath the Bologna's slender leading edgy, a pearly white crown of sand rose above the water. Well, I don't... I don't... Winslow stuttered, for once speechless. This has happened before, Baxter said back at the computer. Eden and Athena and two members of the crew who'd come around from their days stood nearby. Now, without the immediate need to abandon ship, they disabled the gas feed and pumped up the fresh air feed to maximum, allowing most of the crew members to recover in their own beds. The men and women would wake up with a killer headache and no recollection of what had happened, but they'd be fine. Winslow would have some explaining to do shortly. In fact, it's happened several times in this part of the world. Banks of sand just appear, 
Sometimes they form into islands. Other times they disappear within a few weeks. Winslow shook his head again. It sounded all too much like unreasonably good luck, and that was something that didn't sit well with him. There was one back in 2017, just off the coast of Bermuda. Baxter continued, flicking through various news pages. Just appeared out of nowhere. It's a nightmare for boats. A new sound hammered through the open doors. Everyone inside the office turned toward the sound, and then looked at each other in a mixture of confusion and excitement. Eden was first outside, followed shortly afterward by the others. A few hundred feet away, a helicopter pounded over the waters, turning the surface into a foamy white blur. The helicopter slowed as it passed over the Bologna, then circled around and hovered over the rear deck. The helicopter dropped lower and lower until it was just six feet above the deck. The water around the Bologna churned into foam. The chopper's door slid open and a figure leaped out. Eden recognised Nora Bird's slim figure and big hair. Bird landed in a squat and then paced up the deck towards Eden and the crew. Permission to come aboard, Captain? Nora Bird yelled against the noise of the rotors. She held onto her large stack of black hair beneath the downdraft. Actually, I don't know who the captain is here. She glanced from Eden to Winslow and then, Eden noticed, to Baxter, who had pulled himself away from his research and was coming to see what the disturbance was. Eden introduced Bird to Winslow and the other crew members. I heard that you all had some trouble, and I remembered this guy I knew used to keep this beauty nearby. Bird pointed up at the helicopter. The man in the pilot's seat flicked a salute. Wait a minute, Baxter said, elbowing through the assembled people. That's not a Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw, is it? Eden looked up at the chopper more closely and noticed it was a bit of a strange-looking machine with a bulbous, whale-like front end. The very same, Bird said, her hands planted on her hips. I thought you might need some help. Plus, this guy loves to give her a fly-out on a good day like this. Any excuse? You've arrived just in time, Eden said. How many people can this thing hold? For the next few minutes, they arranged lifts for the newly conscious crew members. Winslow, using some contact or other, arranged the use of a super-sized villa near Tulum, Mexico. Set within private grounds, the villa was big enough for them to land the chopper and comfortably house the crew. By the way, Bird said as they loaded the first dozen crew members aboard the chopper, there's a capsized boat in the water about two miles away. We slowed down to have a look, see if it was any of you, but it was empty. It looked like, dare I say it, it's been attacked by sharks. There's still blood in the water. Eden glanced sideways at Athena and shrugged. Nothing to do with us, she said, scrambling aboard the chopper. Chapter 48. Mona Kay, Belize, present day. This time Eden screamed. The rush of wind pounded against her body, threatening to tear her limb from limb. Her heart pounded as she plunged toward the ground. She fixed her gaze on the horizon, curving out of sight in the distance. She glanced upwards and saw Baxter leap out of Nora Bird's Douglas C-47 a few seconds after her. An experienced skydiver, he moved his body into position, hurtling like an arrow toward the ground. Remembering her training, Eden copied his position. She angled herself down toward the island on which they had planned to land. Two days had passed since the Bologna ran aground less than 50 miles away. The team had been airlifted by Bird's friend to the villa, just up the coast in Mexico. The place was perfect for them to regroup and plan their next move, and in a wonderful development, Vittoria's condition had improved too. She had yet to regain consciousness, but the medical team was pretty sure that would happen soon. It seemed all she needed was a series of deafening explosions to snap her out of it. Eden looked around her as the sea and sky blurred into a smudge of blue and white. Wind roared in her ears, even beneath the ear defenders. Eden reached out, extending her fingers. The air tore through the fabric of her gloves. As the parachute deployed, Eden shot upwards, the movement jarring the straps across her shoulders. For a moment, it felt as though her insides would continue downward at the same speed. Then, like an elevator reaching the required floor, everything settled down. The roaring muted to a murmur. Eden found the cords and swung the parachute around to face the island. Just a speck of green and grey amid the deep blue Caribbean Sea, it was little more than a jarring, rocky outcrop. At one end, the rocks dropped directly into the sea but at the other Eden saw the wide beach circling the island. She pulled hard on the cords and swung the parachute toward the beach. That was the best spot according to the satellite images. She made several wide circles above the beach and used the descent to get a good look at the island. Little more than a mile across, it appeared to be nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing interesting broke through the canopy of the trees. 
If there was something here, it was hidden either beneath the trees or within the rocks. She swung around again and prepared to land. Eden scanned the sand, looking for signs that people had been there recently. There were no footprints, no vehicle tracks, not even the odd bit of washed-up plastic, which seemed sadly ubiquitous on beaches around the world. The place was clean. A little too clean. Eden landed in a crouch on the sand. She unclipped her parachute and was folding it away when Baxter landed twenty feet away. Baxter unclipped his chute and tucked away while Eden was still messing about with the cables. You make it look easy, Eden said as Baxter strolled over. He shrugged and helped Eden get the last bit of the chute back inside the bag. They dropped their chutes well beyond the high tide mark. Baxter stood and looked up at the island. This is Atlantis. Dry sarcasm laced his voice. That's what Ramirez wanted Faslane to believe at least, Eden said, sidling up beside him. If you look at the orb we recovered from Teotihuacan, which was the same as the one Faslane had, it's easy to think that it leads here. Baxter shook his head. You don't agree? No, I don't, Baxter said. It's all a bit obvious, don't you think? We're talking about a superintelligent civilization. Would they really leave a calling card? Eden shrugged. She had her doubts too. This was a loose end they needed to tie up. Plus, Baxter continued, if Ramirez knew where Atlantis was, he'd have kept that too. Look, Eden pointed beneath the trees. A path had been cut through the dense undergrowth. She looked down at the surrounding sand. Whoever made that path swept their prints off the sand. They didn't want anyone to see them from the air. Eden ran up to the path and looked at one of the bushes. Dried sap bubbled from where the branches had been cut and no new shoots budded. This can't be more than a few days old. Eden pointed up the path, which ran in a straight line up through the forest. Eden and Baxter picked their way up the path, in some places scrambling over rocks and fallen trees. The jungle canopy was thick, casting the path in a premature dusk. The terrain steepened, and Eden took to climbing on her hands and knees. Whoever had made the route had been careful not to damage any of the trees, ensuring the path remained invisible from the air. A troop of monkeys eyed them suspiciously from the surrounding trees. Their small, expressive faces stared intently from amid thick fur. Baxter stood up at his full height, raised his arms and shouted at the watching monkeys. The creatures scampered back into the undergrowth, cawing at one another. That's a bit mean, Eden said, almost out of breath. It's not, if I'm not mistaken, these are spider monkeys. They're notoriously territorial. If you don't show dominance immediately, there's a chance they could attack. It's far better than... Baxter didn't finish his sentence as they stepped onto a plateau. The tree cover became less dense too. What is that? Eden said in awe, looking up toward the sky. A pyramid covered in vines and moss loomed above them. In several places, trees had taken root amid the weathered and worn stones. Eden moved forward, all tiredness from the climb disappearing. Intricate carvings covered the stones. Eden moved closer and examined them. It's not Atlantis, Baxter said, but it's certainly something. You're right, Eden agreed running her hand across a snake carved into the rock and now covered in moss. Then Eden froze, a voice echoed from somewhere nearby. They spoke English with an American accent laced with fear. Hello, who's there? I told you everything I know, I... Eden glanced at Baxter. The pair shared a grin. They knew exactly who that voice belonged to. Brent Fasslane. And he didn't sound happy. Vittoria De Luca blinked several times trying to clear her foggy brain and to overcome the dull ache between her eyes. Her eyes fluttered open. Failing to bring the world in focus, she blinked again. Nebulous, shadowy shapes moved around her, but somehow De Luca sensed she was awake. Then she heard the voice. It sounded as though the speaker was hundreds of feet away, maybe behind a wall. She's waking up, she's waking up, the voice said urgently. A shadow moved in front of De Luca's vision and then disappeared into the ether, De Luca heard the voice shouting again. Her eyes are open. Someone, get in here now. Oh my gosh, what to do? The voice sounded panicked, flustered. Somewhere in the vaults of her memory, De Luca felt as though she remembered the voice. Right now, though, she couldn't figure out where from. She tried to shift herself. The mattress felt lumpy, as though she'd been lying in the same position for a very long time. Her body lay heavy and unresponsive, Questions spun through De Luca's mind. Where was she? How long had she been here? Even though De Luca was used to being in control, she felt no sense of panic. She was calm, and instinctively she knew she was safe. She tried to speak, but her voice came out as a dry croak. 
Where am I? Her throat was so dry it hurt. The figure rushed through the room again and stepped closer to the bed. His face swam into her vision, and Deluca immediately recognised him. Richard, she said, sounding the word out like a jewel. Richard, is that you? Yes, Victoria, it's me, I'm here. I've been here ever since. What happened? Victoria's expression clouded over. You were in a plane crash. Victoria felt Richard Beaumont take her hand and squeeze it tight. Strange memories flashed through her mind, disjointed and blurry. There was a crash, shattering glass, a blinding light, and then... nothing. I've got so much to tell you and I'm not going anywhere, Beaumont said. The room was alive with noise and movement now. Several other pairs of footsteps thundered in. Victoria looked up at Richard. Why are you here? she asked. Last time I heard you were off saving the world or something. Beaumont hesitated for a moment. His eyes became suddenly watery. Vittoria, listen. I'm so sorry for what happened. For not believing you. I wish I could... You soppy old thing, Vittoria said. Move aside, please, the doctor said, taking Beaumont by the arm. I'll be right here, Beaumont shouted over the melee. The answers are coming. A bright light flashed into Luca's eyes. With Richard Beaumont nearby, she didn't feel an ounce of fear. I knew you'd come back, Victoria muttered to herself. It was only a matter of time. Chapter 49 Eden and Baxter hustled around the pyramid toward Fastlane's cries. Some things he said made sense. Others sounded like the ramblings of a madman. The path led to an opening on the pyramid's far side. Two great columns stood on either side of the opening, both carved into the shapes of serpents with wide open mouths. Glistening moss covered the carvings, which gave the serpents a strange, scaly appearance. Over. These people really loved their reptiles, didn't they? Without waiting for a reply, Eden took a flashlight from her pack and stepped inside. No, no, leave that. That's all I've got. Fastlane's voice echoed clearly through the ancient structure. Stop. Leave it. Dust and the musty scent of decay hung in the air. Eden stepped forward tentatively, cautious her footsteps didn't echo. The first room she stepped into was large, a 50-foot cube constructed in the centre of the pyramid. Eden swept her light across the ceiling, noticing the workmanship which enabled the giant blocks of stone to stay in position for thousands of years. Intricate carvings and glyphs adorned the walls and ceiling, and the air buzzed with the hum of ancient mystery. Imposing stone pillars stood throughout the room, stretching up to the impossibly high ceiling. In the centre of the room, a large stone altar dominated the space, also intricately carved. The space looked as though it had been recently cleared of moss and plants. Eden moved the light across the floor. It looked as though the stone floor had recently been swept too. No, leave it, stop. Vaseline's voice came again. Then Eden noticed another noise, the squawking cry of the monkeys. It sounded like several of them were holding a heated conversation. Eden beckoned Baxter in. At the far side of the central chamber, a passage led deeper into the pyramid. The monkey's cawing grew louder. Fastlane shouted again, his words now making no sense at all. Eden turned off her light and stepped forward, deftly treading so that neither the monkeys nor Fastlane would hear her approach. After twenty feet, the passage opened into another chamber. She peered carefully around the corner and quickly squeezed her stomach, holding back a roar of laughter. In the murky light streaming into the chamber from small high shafts, Eden saw Fastlane slumped in the corner. The man looked bedraggled. Thick stubble now covered his face, and his clothes were soiled and stained. He hugged a plastic shopping bag. It looked like the poor man had been here for weeks rather than days. Eden watched as a monkey made a grab for the bag. No, leave it, stop! Fastlane shouted, his voice weak. Go away! Eden shouted, copying Baxter's earlier show of dominance. She snapped on her light and stepped into the centre of the room. She crinkled up her nose at the smell of monkey poo and unwashed man. She wasn't quite sure which was worse. The monkeys screamed and fled, leaping up the walls and out through the shafts. Fastlane looked up at Eden and Baxter, his eyes wild. For a moment he looked fearful, and then his gaze turned hard. You're not Fang, Fastlane said. What are you doing here? Has it happened? What? Eden said. The Chinese takeover of Central America. Fang was planning it. It was going to happen. Maybe all-out war. Fastlane spoke in short, sharp sentences, 
as though he needed to get the information across before his listener was taken away. And how was Fang going to do that? Eden asked. Two monkeys appeared back at the shafts above, curiosity and hunger for whatever Fastlane had in the bag, overpowering their fear. He had control of everything, microchips, made in China. He could turn weapons against people, control planes and cars, everything. First, he planned to take over Central America and then move north until it was his, all his. Now Eden couldn't stop herself from laughing. The sound of her giggle echoed from the walls of the chamber, momentarily forcing the monkeys back outside. Even Baxter laughed too, a very rare occurrence for what Eden called the most serious man in the universe. You can't seriously believe that, Eden said, looking down at Fastlane. Fastlane struggled up to his feet, using the wall for support. He clutched the bag to his stomach as though Eden was likely to snatch it from him. My car, it happened to my car, Fastlane said, his voice louder now. I was just driving home and... and... they took it over. His eyes moved crazily from left to right as though they might still be listening. Was this a new car by chance? Baxter asked. Fastlane's lips twisted together in a snarl. Yes, it was actually, a few weeks old. I... I saw a great deal and bought it. Superb price, actually. Could someone have arranged for you to have that car knowing it was especially equipped to do that? Eden said. Fastlane's eyes closed to slits, then moved left to right. He didn't reply. Eden nodded as though their point had been proved. The airplane, the airplane, Fastlane roared. It fell from the sky, I saw it. He crashed a fist into the palm of his other hand. The pilot was working for Ramirez, Eden said but he was killed in the crash. I saw the blood. Yes, that's what they wanted us to believe, Eden continued. But we have reason to think Ramirez had his thugs beat the pilots to death and then placed the plane in the trees. No, no, it can't be. I know what I saw. You can't take that away from me. Fastlane pointed a filthy finger at Eden and Baxter. You can't cover this up now. I'm going to tell everyone. This is big. Maybe. Just tell me why you left our friend Vittoria there. She was alive and in desperate need of medical attention. You grabbed what you thought was valuable and got out of there. Have Fastlane looked down at the floor, unable to meet Eden's gaze. Wait, didn't you see the command center? Fastlane pointed back up the passage. Just up there. The screens, the computers, the men working. For once, Eden believed what Fastlane was saying. It looked as though something had been set up in that chamber. Now along with the enigmatic Commander Fang, it had all but disappeared. This island is where Fang will orchestrate the attack. The command center is in that next room. Fastlane pointed up the passage. I don't Eden grabbed Fastlane by the arm and led him to the door. No, I can't. Fastlane nodded down to where a chain led from his ankle to a ring on the wall. A padlock secured him in place. Sit down, Eden said, drawing out her knife. Fastlane slumped back to the stone floor. This is the quickest way. Eden placed the blade against Fastlane's ankle. The man roared in fear, scaring the curious monkeys back out into the forest. I'm only joking, Eden said, pulling out her lockpicking tools, which she carried everywhere. She left the cuff attached to Fastlane's ankle and undid the padlock, which secured the chain to the wall. In less than a minute, the padlock was open and Fastlane was free. Eden led Fastlane up the passage and into the larger chamber, the chain attached to his ankle clanking across the stones. Seeing the room was empty, Fastlane's eyes bulged from their sockets. He described the command center to Eden and Baxter in whispered amazement. You've been tricked, Eden said, explaining Ramirez's endgame. We've come to collect the orb. Where is it? I'm very- Fastlane tried to pull the bag close against his stomach, but Eden was too quick. She snatched the bag and peered inside. The bag contained a half-eaten loaf of bread and two packets of potato chips. Eden, Baxter said, pointing across the room. The orb sat on the stone altar on the far side of the chamber. Eden forced the grubby plastic bag back into Fastlane's grasp and strode across the room. She picked up the orb, peered at it for a long moment, and then slipped it inside her pack. Time for us to get out of here, Eden said, glancing at Baxter. Great, you have a boat, Fastlane said. Oh, not you. Eden glanced at Fastlane with pure contempt in her eyes. You left our friend for dead. This is what you deserve. Eden snagged up the end of the chain still attached to Fastlane's ankle, wrapped it around a stone pillar, and then snapped the padlock shut. Fastlane cried out in protest, Don't leave me, not with them! He pointed out of the door to indicate the creatures of the jungle. 
Sorry, gotta go. Eden glanced down at her watch. She drew out a bottle of water and left it for Fastlane. We don't want to keep our lift waiting. Think about this next time you get the opportunity to help someone. With that, Eden and Baxter turned and paced out of the chamber. Fastlane's screamed protests slowly died out as Eden and Baxter picked their way back down the track, observed from all sides by the resident monkeys. Don't you think that was a bit mean to leave him locked up in there? Baxter said. Oh, I didn't, Eden said. I just locked the padlock to one end of the chain without passing it through the other end. He's free to go as soon as he realises that. Baxter shook his head slowly. You never stop surprising me, he whispered softly. Ever. And in a couple of days, we'll send a fishing boat out this way and have them pick him up. Very generous of you. Okay, make it a week. That guy has several lessons to learn. Eden and Baxter emerged onto the beach. Baxter swung off his pack and opened it on the sand. Now you're totally sure this is going to work? Eden said, looking up at Baxter. Baxter nodded. He picked up a square of red plastic and laid it out on the sand. He pressed a button and the plastic inflated into a balloon about four feet across. That's definitely not getting us anywhere, Eden said, eyeing the device. Just wait a second. Baxter attached a cable to the base and then released the balloon. The balloon drifted quickly upwards in the still air. Put this on, Baxter said, handing Eden a harness. She buckled up and Baxter did the same. This is a system called the Fulton Skyhook, Skyhook? That doesn't sound reassuring. Do you want me to explain or not? Baxter said, grabbing a stick and drawing a diagram in the sand. Yes, please, Captain, Eden nodded. We inflate a helium balloon with a cable attached to it. Baxter pointed up at the balloon floating high above them. We then fasten the cable to the harnesses we're wearing. In a couple of minutes, Captain Bird... Captain Bird? Eden sniggered. We'll pass overhead and a system attached to the C-47 will snag the cable and pull us on board. It sounds pretty simple, Eden said, peering skeptically up at the balloon pulling against the cable a few hundred feet above them. It sounds like fishing, just for an airplane. Eden, this is a highly advanced system which has been used for military applications around the world for decades. Okay, okay, Eden said, just clip me on and let's hope we catch a big one. Baxter beckoned Eden in close and clipped their harnesses together. Then he attached them to the line which ran up to the balloon. Baxter scanned the sky, his muscles tensed and ready. You looking for your girlfriend? Eden quipped. Baxter glanced at Eden, their faces just inches apart. She's not my girlfriend, he said awkwardly. Oh, come on. You two calling each other captain all the time. Captain this, captain that. Eden's voice took on a mocking tone. And I saw you talking for hours yesterday. Eden felt her face flush red, but she wasn't sure why. We've got a lot in common, that's all. Clearly. Look, I'm definitely not interested in her like that. I... Baxter's voice dried up in his throat. His eyebrows inched together. You're what? I... I'm not sure what... Baxter stuttered a reply, his Adam's apple bobbling repeatedly. He huffed a deep breath. Nora is just a nice person. She's good to talk to. She's Nora now, is she? Not Captain Bird? Baxter silenced Eden with a look. Eden, can you be serious for just a moment? Baxter's tone shocked Eden. Baxter stopped searching the sky and locked eyes with Eden. Eden's lips opened, and her breathing suddenly became shallow. Time seemed to move at half its normal speed. For a moment, incongruously, Eden remembered the old woman at the day of the dead celebration. The woman's whispered words floated back through Eden's mind. There is a man who will soon profess his love for you. He may not do it in words, but you will know, and you must acknowledge it, for time is short. She couldn't seriously have been talking about. Yesterday I spoke to Nora because I didn't know... Baxter stopped again mid-sentence. I've always... Eden's eyes widened. The realisation of what she thought was about to happen hit her like a brick to the stomach. She tried to think of something to say but no words came forth. Oh, it's nothing really, don't, Baxter said. At that moment, the twin wasp engines of Bird's Skytrain roared above them, cutting through Baxter's words like a siren. The great plane slipped above them impossibly close. The nose-mounted hook seized the wire which ran up to the balloon and yanked Eden and Baxter high into the air. Or maybe not, Eden thought to herself, as the island became just a speck against the glittering ocean. 
Who would believe a crazy old lady in the street anyway? Epilogue. And you won't believe what happened, DeLuca said, one hand slapping the table, the other holding Beaumonts on top of the table. She'd made an incredible recovery in the last day and was now once again the life and soul of the party. Richard and I were coming down this mountainside with a whole heap of Saxon pottery. At least at the time, we were pretty sure it was Saxon. Anyway, good old Richard here strides out in front, so excited to get it back to the lab that he falls face first down the hill. Eden, Baxter, Athena, Winslow and the whole Bologna crew erupted with laughter. The sun had set several hours ago and the team were enjoying some much-needed downtime on the expansive terrace of the Freeman Estate just outside of Tulum, Mexico. Eden glanced at her father. Even he seemed to enjoy it, although his fingers often tapped restlessly on the table. This damned pot had survived in one piece, well in three pieces and some smaller fragments, for over a thousand years until this oaf came along and shattered it. Beaumont took a sip from his wine in a clear attempt to try and hide the flush that was taking residence in his cheeks. Those Saxons didn't reckon on someone in the modern era not being able to walk in a straight line, did they? Athena said, joining in on the ridicule. Okay, okay, enough, Beaumont said, putting out his hands to silence the hordes. There's something I never told you about that. Beaumont peered nervously at DeLuca, then flashed a look at Winslow. DeLuca's eyes locked on him. She folded her arms. Well, you see, that pod I was carrying, it wasn't Saxon. I think, well, at a guess, it was from a different era entirely. Really, DeLuca said, leaning back in her chair with her eyebrows raised. You did tests on it. Well, no, not exactly. Then how do you know? We both saw it there on a Saxon burial mound. It just makes sense that it was... Well, that's the thing, I... Richard, what are you not telling me? Everyone around the table watched in complete silence. All eyes moved from Beaumont to DeLuca and back again. I know exactly how old that pottery was. How? It was so badly destroyed we didn't even carbon date it. Yes, I know, but I know how old that pottery was because I bought it from the supermarket. Beaumont took a sip as though the giant wine glass would protect him from DeLuca. You did what? DeLuca exploded, hands up in the air. Well, it wasn't just me. The rest of us on that dig thought it would be funny to see your reaction. The rest of you? DeLuca gasped. She looked around the table, her eyes locking on Winslow. You knew about this? Afraid so, Winslow said sagely. The group laughed again. For the younger people around the table, you've got to remember this was a simpler time. Winslow said. We were in very remote places, sometimes for weeks at a time, so we had to find our own entertainment. I can't believe... DeLuca crossed her arms tightly. All these years? I'm sorry, Beaumont said. No, you're not, DeLuca hissed, now struggling to keep herself from smiling too. No, you're right, Beaumont said thoughtfully. I'm not sorry at all, it was hilarious. Laughter echoed up into the still night sky. Looking at her father across the table, Eden thought how great it was to hear laughter instead of the whispered words of worry, secret commands, or coded instructions. I've got to say I'm so proud of my dad over there, Eden said, pointing at Winslow. How many days now without cigarettes? Pointless things anyway, Beaumont said, removing a pipe from his pocket. It's just like breathing air. How many actual days or how many days does it feel like, Winslow said. I'm not exactly sure. I've been too busy to keep count. The group laughed again. You know, it sounds like it's been a stressful few days, but it sure has been nice to meet y'all, Nora Bird said, raising her glass of whiskey in a toast. I hope one day we can work together again. To the future, Winslow said as everyone raised their glasses. Whatever it brings. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must visit the bathroom. Winslow stood and walked into the house. Winslow paced through the open rear doors and into a wood-panelled lounge. Several squat leather sofas sat around a table in the centre. If he didn't know they were in the Caribbean, Winslow thought, this could be part of an English country house. Although it was good to see the team relax, Winslow's mind spun at the speed of light. This was the closest they'd ever come to a full breach of the council. Too close, and now systems would have to be analysed and upgraded to make sure it didn't happen again. Winslow strode up the oak staircase to the first floor room he was using as an office. In the last 48 hours, the Freeman estate had become a hive of activity as the entire crew of the Bologna descended upon it. 
Some members of the crew were suffering with migraines and nausea, an after-effect of the gas they'd inhaled. Having been immersed in it for so long, that wasn't a surprise. If they ever used this gas for tactical means, it was only for a few minutes, not the several hours the Bologna's crew had been inhaling it. On reflection, Winslow thought, it could have ended a whole lot worse. Stepping onto the balcony, Winslow looked out at the sea and stars glittering beyond a row of curving palm trees. He peered toward the crew seated on the terrace below, about 50 feet away. Winslow was comfortable knowing the trees concealed him from view. He peered guiltily over his shoulder and then fished a packet of chamomile cigarettes from his pocket. He had promised Eden he would give them up, but after the stressful activities of the last few days, Winslow figured it didn't really matter. Just one. Everyone had their vices, right? He lit up and hungrily drew on the cigarette. Winslow looked out at the stars glimmering on the gently lapping water as he felt the smoke warm his lungs. For a moment, he thought about the secrets held beneath that ocean. Whether Atlantis was one of those secrets, he didn't know. For a long inhale, Winslow considered that strange human trait to want to know everything, every single thing. It was that insatiable curiosity that got him tangled in this mess to begin with. Can't we just leave a mystery alone? He muttered to himself, exhaling. A flurry of laughter drifted up from the terrace below. Winslow recognised Eden's voice as she told the assembled crew about their trip beneath the ancient pyramids of Teotihuacan. They all listened, hanging on her every word. It was good to hear them relax, Winslow thought. His team worked hard. No, they worked tirelessly. Since arriving at the estate, they had also arranged for a secret emergency salvage operation on the Bologna. Winslow wanted the ship removed before the new sandbank either disappeared beneath the waves or drew media attention. Crews were due to arrive in the next day or so and he hoped it wouldn't take too long to get the Bologna in a dry dock and back in action. Four puncture wounds in the hull weren't that bad, after all. You must be very proud of her, came a voice from behind Winslow. Each muscle in Winslow's body jarred into position. A shiver rose through his spine as though someone was using it as a xylophone. He'd been caught red-handed. Instinctively, he held the cigarette out of sight. Then the voice chimed deep within the recesses of his memory. Winslow remembered the voice. He searched for the memory, picking through the layers of his mind until he found it. When he was sure, he turned around. The man looked exactly as he had nearly thirty years ago. Nothing about him had changed. He still wore the red robes, folded around his body in such a way that made the material shift and sway as though alive. The man took a step out onto the terrace and the light cast across his pale features. I know I don't look any older, the man said, his voice baritone. His hands were tucked somewhere within the flowing robe. We live for many human lifetimes, sometimes even hundreds. I bet I've changed, Winslow said, the cigarette now forgotten, hanging limp between his fingers. You are human, the man said, shrugging. You may be a successful human, but you're still built on the same operating system. But we don't look that different. Winslow said, hearing how stupid the statement sounded even as it left his lips. You know it is not the way you look that makes you who you are, the man said. Winslow opened his mouth to speak, but then thought better of it. The man's unblinking eyes stared at him. Suddenly something occurred to Winslow. He didn't know why he hadn't thought of this before. That was you, the sandbank. You somehow made that appear for us, Winslow said, breaking the silence. The man didn't answer. He just stared at Winslow, unblinking. A muscle tensed in the man's face, which Winslow thought was probably the closest he'd get to an answer. It was enough confirmation for Winslow. You have something of ours, it's time for it to be returned, the man said, finally speaking. His words held a menacing ring. Another waft of conversation drifted up from the terrace below. Winslow again recognised Eden's voice above the noise. Eden, he whispered, on an in-breath. I feared this day would come. I feared it. Winslow felt suddenly light on his feet. The world swayed around him. Had he fought so hard to bring his daughter into the fold, just for her to be taken away again? I can't let you take her, you mustn't... The muscles in the man's face tensed and then relaxed again. No, he said, after several seconds of silence. Eden is more of your kind now than of ours. But, but... Winslow stuttered, relief and confusion washing over him but she was born of your kind. As I have said, there is more to this than flesh and bone and muscle. She is now of yours. She, we now know, is what humanity's future needs. The stars hold great things for her. 
the man flicked a hand toward the inky sky. I require what you call the orbs of Atlantis. You have them. The man's tone indicated that he wasn't asking a question. Yes, they're in... Winslow's voice dried up as he pointed into the room. The man nodded in such a way that said, get them then. Winslow stubbed out his cigarette and hurried back into the room. He picked up the flight case and carried it out onto the terrace. The man indicated that he should open the case. As Winslow opened the case, a green glow streamed out. He flipped the lid back and was almost dazzled by the orbs. Now glowing more brightly than he'd ever seen before, the man removed his hand from within the folds of the bright cloak. It appeared larger than any human hand Winslow had ever seen. We were impressed you retrieved the second orb from the chamber, the man said. Yes, it was Eden and Baxter, Winslow said. They had to solve some kind of code, something to do with the Mayan astrological symbols. The man raised an eyebrow. Very inventive, but I'm afraid that's wrong. It takes the blood of one of our people to open that chamber. Winslow thought back to Eden's explanation of events. She'd cut her hand opening the chamber door. The man held his hand out over one of the orbs. The orb floated up into his palm as though attached to a string. Tucking the orb inside his robe, he completed the motion with the second. When both orbs were out of sight, Winslow and the man locked eyes for a long moment. Yes, I am, Winslow said slowly. The man tilted his head as though asking Winslow to explain. I am so incredibly proud of Eden and everything she's become, Winslow said. Muscles twitched in the man's face again. Winslow wondered if that was his version of a smile. Finally, the man said, So you should be, and so am I. Another long moment passed. Will I see you again? Winslow said. Not in this lifetime, the man replied. By the way, the man said, removing an orby from his cloak and looking at it closely. You understand these aren't maps, don't you? Following the markings will get you nowhere, but it is true there were twelve buried around the globe. Some have been returned to us, others are still out there. Winslow was about to speak, but the man held up a finger to silence him. There's someone at your door. A knock echoed through the room, startling Winslow. Winslow looked from the man to the door and back again. Winslow's mouth opened, toying with words, although speaking none. Your daughter needs you, the man said, pointing toward the door. The knock came again more aggressively this time. Winslow paced across the room. He snapped off the lock and pulled open the door. Eden stood there, looking up at him. Her eyes narrowed, questioning what had taken him so long. Turning back toward the terrace, Winslow already knew what he'd see. Stars twinkled across the ocean, but the terrace was empty. I've been thinking. Eden strolled past Winslow and into the room. When we get the Bologna fixed up, and now that we have both orbs, we can use them to find the real Atlantis. There's definitely a mystery here we still haven't solved. Winslow paced out onto the terrace and knocked the ashtray off the wall. It thumped to the earth. Eden didn't flinch. He'd go down early in the morning and retrieve it. What do you think? Eden continued, her tone excited. It's one of history's great mysteries, and we have everything we need to solve it. Winslow took a deep breath, turned, and looked at his daughter. Aiden, you're not going to like this, but it's important you understand. Winslow took a step toward the young woman who had come into his life like a whirlwind, but had actually had the opposite effect. She'd pulled his life together, bound his otherwise meaningless acts with purpose. Sometimes in life, Winslow said, if you spend all your time looking for new things, you miss the beauty of what's right in front of you. There will be other mysteries, other cases to solve, but this isn't one for us. Winslow wrapped his arms around his daughter and pulled her in tight. Eden stood motionless, not quite sure how to receive such emotional outbursts from her father. Listening closely, she could have sworn she heard a sob, which he caught in his throat just in time. Then, mysteriously, an image swam into Eden's mind. It was the image of the woman who she had danced with at the Day of the Dead celebrations. The woman's lithe limbs swung around as Eden stared into her ageless eyes. There is a man who will soon profess his love for you, he may not do it in words, but you will know, and you must acknowledge it, for time is short. The words echoed through Eden's mind, chilling her to the bone. Eden wrapped her arms around her father. For what seemed like minutes, neither father nor daughter moved. When Winslow straightened, Eden spoke. You know, Dad, I love you, but sometimes I just don't understand anything you say. As she walked toward the door, she turned and said, And you smell like smoke. 
And there you have it, the Atlantis Agenda. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for listening to this. It's Luke again, by the way, the author of the Atlantis Agenda and all the other Eden Black books. By the way, the Titanic Deception is out now. It's available for audio as well. Here is what it's all about. What if the Titanic never struck an iceberg? On April 15th, 1912, the unsinkable Titanic went down, taking 1,500 souls with it. But what if the sinking was no accident? Cut to the present, Senator Everett Van Wyck survives an assassination attempt thanks to a small-town doctor. But now, the doctor knows too much and becomes the target himself. Q. Eden Black What starts as a simple rescue mission soon becomes a high-stakes conspiracy led by the senator's reclusive father. But when Eden learns that a relic in the bowels of the stricken ocean liner hold a clue to the Van Wyck's shady success, she knows there's only one thing to do. From the British Museum to the ocean's darkest depths, and finally to the clandestine passages of the Van Wyck estate, the Titanic Deception is the latest pulse-pounding chapter in the Amazon number one best-selling Eden Black archaeological thriller series. So if you enjoyed the Atlantis Agenda, please consider grabbing that wherever you got this book, or you can get it in paperback and in special edition copies on my website, pulsepoundingthrillers.com. As promised then, in a moment I'm going to tell you which bits of the Atlantis agenda were true and which bits I've sort of, not invented is a strong word, but which bits I've used a bit of um, sort of dramatic license with. First of all, though, I will ask a favour of you. If you've enjoyed this, please consider a couple of things. Firstly, a great way to keep in touch with me and to learn about my new stories as and when they come out, as well as Uh, learn about my travels and my life outside of writing is to join my mailing list. You can do this over at my website lukerichardsonauthor.com. Also I am on social media, Instagram and um, what's it, Facebook and TikTok and these sorts of things as well. If you search Luke Richardson author on all of those I'm pretty sure you find me there. I really appreciate having that connection with you. As I said at the start I am independent at this. I do this all under my own steam. I've got no big you know (laughs) no big publisher behind me which is great for me because it means I you support me directly it's also great for you because I don't have to pay for lots of staff and big offices in New York like the publishers have you know I haven't got a managing director that drives a Bentley for example (laughs) so I can I can afford to do things a little bit cheaper as well like the price of these books that you will have noticed you're now listening to it Okay, so I know what you want to know. I know what you're here for. What parts of the Atlantis agenda are true and where did that story come from? Author's note, the Atlantis agenda. Of course, thank you so much for reading this book. It's been my pleasure to bring Eden and her crew back to the page and I hope you've enjoyed it. I love how these books incorporate my love of travel and the Atlantis agenda is no exception. Actually, when this book was released, I was in Mexico. I purposefully held off completing the final draft right until the last moment, just so that I could add in some of those details that make the book ring true, if you know the setting. In fact, I remember one morning still suffering with the jet lag, having flown from England, where I lived, to Mexico, getting up at 5am in my hotel room to, to rewrite, to rework those um, Tio, Tio Khan, uh, scenes because I'd been there and I'd worked out the sort of location of them having walked around the place. Those sorts of things are really important to me. Several readers have told me that they feel my books transport them into the setting along with the characters, and that really is a fantastic compliment, I think, and one I take seriously with all the books I produce. Now, if you read the author's note in the back of the ARC files and the Giza Protocol, you'll know what to expect here because in those previous books I described the various part of the stories that were based on true events and the curious ways in which those stories came to me. Yet again, this story is based around ideas that are considered by many to be true. And yet again, my anonymous friend helped me order some of the facts, get them right for the basis of the story you've just read. On another note, this mysterious researcher is currently working on a book of his own. 
it will be a modern retelling of the pre-Diluvian diary that started this whole adventure. He was given this diary over four decades ago and has spent his life researching the various elements of it. The diary has since been rewritten and published under the title The Diary of a Loma by none other than Alexander Winslow. Yes, Winslow is a real man, although I've learned since that that's actually a pen name. But I honour his research in the books by using that name. After reading the diary, my friend was asked a simple question. Is it fact or fiction? He answered assuredly that it was fiction. It had to be, right? It was only years later, of course, when researching another subject that he realised he'd come across this same information before. That led him to revisit that old and dusty diary. Reading the book again, things slowly started to make sense. Maybe the diary wasn't as fictional as he first thought. He's since spent decades checking the etymology and researching the historical details in that original text. Strangely, the diary makes several claims that weren't historically known at the time of writing in 1878, and one particular detail that wasn't discovered until the 1990s. Unfortunately for my friend though, what he writes is based on fact, so he can't just gloss over the details of 6,000 years of history like I had the privilege of doing in these books. He says the book is at least a year away as I write this, although believe me, I'm nagging him weekly and making sure he gets on with it as quickly as possible. This does promise though to be an incredibly important publication as a written account from that time changes everything we've been taught by the established historical view and all alternative theories on our history. None of these are right but all have something to offer to the true events. This publication will discuss why previous writers published what they did and how newly emerged physical evidence has changed our understanding yet again. It promises to be a truly explosive book. If you're interested in the background of these stories, you'll love it. I keep people on my mailing list informed, so head over to lukerichardsonauthor.com Tap the button to join my mailing list, which is at the bottom of the page there. Join up there and I will, uh, as I say, keep you informed with that book. Right then, the Atlantis agenda. I must confess I've taken more dramatic liberties with this story, as you'll probably have guessed. Ultimately, this story is less about secret societies, hidden relics and lost civilizations, and more about things I think we all understand, family acceptance and the mistakes even the most knowledgeable people can make along the way. In that way, it's much more of a human book, I think. I certainly enjoyed getting to know Eden and Alexander Winslow better in the writing of this book. That said, there are still parts of this book which hinge on legends that could be true. The idea that there is another race of intelligent beings living on planet Earth has been explored by many writers, documentary makers and philosophers. In research for this, I read several articles and watched several documentaries that suggest this super race are either aliens, angels or an ancient species which predates us, or even something we've created and lost control of. Personally, I think they're less likely to live in a pyramid in the Amazon rainforest, but more likely to walk among us. If these people look the same, how would we even know? And ultimately, I suppose, if they meant no one any harm, would it really matter? We live in a world that can feel so divided sometimes anyway, that maybe it is best we never find out. Interestingly, just to come off script for a moment here for this part of the author's note, a few months after I wrote this book, there was a news article published that they actually discovered a previously unknown city in the Amazon rainforest near the place that I put the pyramid at the start of Atlantis' agenda. So maybe, just maybe, I'm closer to truth here than I ever actually realised. <laughs> One documentary gave me the idea of Commander Fang's false flag operation. The makers of this documentary start by telling us about alien technology before suggesting that it will be used by humans to control other humans. It's a compelling and interesting watch. With this book, I wanted the aim to be simpler, however, hence the final twist which brings us back to plain old human revenge. I also teased the idea here of the crystal skulls, calling them the orbs of Atlantis, 
This was partly my homage to Indiana Jones, without whom these books would certainly not be the same, and, of course, my way of saying, everything is not quite as it seems. The legend of the Crystal Skulls has captivated imaginations for centuries. These enigmatic artefacts, allegedly carved from solid crystal, are believed to possess extraordinary powers and mystical origins. Legend has it that the crystal skulls were created by ancient civilizations as vessels of ancient wisdom and knowledge. Some believe they have the power to channel cosmic energies, while others attribute them with healing properties and the power to unlock a higher consciousness. Despite scepticism, the crystal skulls continue to inspire curiosity, leaving us to wonder if they truly hold the secrets of our ancient past or are merely intriguing works of art. As for the lost city of Atlantis, does it really exist? This is certainly one of the greatest archaeological mysteries of all time. The legend of Atlantis has captivated historians, archaeologists and enthusiasts for centuries. According to ancient Greek philosopher Plato, Atlantis was an advanced civilization that flourished thousands of years ago. Described as a utopian island with advanced technology and a highly developed society, Atlantis allegedly met its demise in a cataclysmic event sinking beneath the ocean. The exact location of Atlantis remains a subject of debate, with various theories suggesting locations ranging from the Mediterranean Sea to the Caribbean. Whether Atlantis was a real place or a figment of Plato's imagination, its allure lies in the tantalising possibility of a lost world of advanced knowledge. Ultimately, there are the sites of countless ancient cities around the world. Whether one of these is Plato's fabled Atlantis is very much up for discussion. Some of these sites have been built on anew and we still use them today. Others lie beneath the ground or beneath the water. In my research for these books, it has become clear to me that civilization, in one form or another, is probably older than contemporary history suggests. Teotihuacan, where the orbs in this story are found, is one example of this. I visited the ancient site shortly before releasing this book. Flourishing between the 1st and the 7th centuries AD, Teotihuacan was one of the largest and most influential pre-Columbian civilizations. Home to monumental pyramids such as the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, Teotihuacan showcased advanced urban planning, intricate murals and a complex social structure. However, little is known about its origin and ultimate decline. Abandoned before the arrival of the Aztecs, Teotihuacan left behind a rich cultural legacy. It made me wonder, while exploring the structures, that as we know so little about the society that built the place, what other civilizations are there out there that we know nothing about? I don't think it's a far stretch to assume that we're not the only race to once have inhabited this planet. The planet was around for a long time before humans and will no doubt outlast us too. With that in mind, I think it's highly likely that there are the unknown remains of a lost civilization beneath the permafrost, under the ocean, or even, as I suggest here, buried beneath the jungle. In this story, Eden and Alexander don't get to find Atlantis. I think, though, that they get to understand something far more important – and that's the value of being connected to each other. That doesn't mean they won't discover the fabled lost city in the future sometime though. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> Once again, thank you for your company on this adventure, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. So that's it from me. That's it from the Atlantis Agenda. I hope that you'll join me for the Titanic Deception as soon as you possibly can. And I hope that you will consider joining my mailing list over at lukerichardsonauthor.com. It's always great to connect with people over there. Thank you again, and I hope to share another adventure with you very, very soon.